from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe McNabb, Northeast Indemnity, Johnny. Oh, hi, Joe. What's up? At the moment, my blood pressure. Too much work? No. Prospect of having to pay off on a $100,000 life insurance policy. Uh Uh-oh. Fella, I think you know, Johnny. Art Wesley. Oh, sure. Been a pal of mine for years. Reporter. Yeah. Apparently, he's working on a story right now that somebody doesn't want him to report. What do you mean? Night before last, he got beat up in an alley. Yesterday, a car made a pass at him at high speed. What about today? It's early yet, Johnny. Oh, yeah, sure. But let's hope it's not too late. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northeast Indemnity Affiliates, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Big Scoop matter. Expense account item one, $18.40. Transportation and incidentals to New York City. I called Art Wesley's paper. He wasn't in and nobody seemed to know where he was. Then I remembered a small bar called Tony's over on 3rd Avenue. I took a cab. That's item two, a dollar and a quarter, and found him in a corner booth. Sorry, Johnny, no bodyguard. The informants I'm working with will take off fast if they spotted one. No informants, no story. That insurance policy your paper took out on you. Who's the beneficiary? A dear departed wife, Joan. Departed? I thought... We split up a couple of months ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Art. Yeah, we were living in two different worlds. I wanted a home and family. She wanted a trip to the moon every night. Where is she now? Who knows? On her way to the moon, I guess. Hey, look. This story you're working on, Art... It's hot, Johnny. And big, real big. A national gambling syndicate. And run by a guy right here in New York. Who? I'm getting close, but I'm not sure yet. When I am, then out come my articles. What's this guy going to do when you push him into a corner? Look, I'm worried about you. You look, Johnny, I'm not as foolish as you think. I've got his name written down and put in a safe deposit box with what evidence I got. That's my real insurance. Oh, all right, look, we've been friends a long time. I'm not going to let you do this alone. Sorry, Johnny. I've got to go it alone. Since I'd gotten nowhere with Art, I decided to try his wife, Joan, even though they were separated. I found her in an apartment on East 68th, but she was hardly what you'd call cooperative. Look, Mr. Dollar, so you're a friend of Art's. At the moment, I'm not. Mrs. Wesley, your marriage with Art is none of my business. But that insurance policy his paper took out on him is. And incidentally, you're still the beneficiary. So? So he could be in danger, those articles he's writing... Why doesn't he drop it? Oh, look, you know Art better than that. Then what am I supposed to do about it? That story is his business. How I feel about things is my business. And come to think of it, I can't see that either of those things is your business. Item three, a dollar eighty cab fare to police headquarters in the office of my old friend, Detective Lieutenant Rastelli. Sure, sure, I know about those attempts on Art's life. So I talked to him and got nowhere. He told me the stories about a national gambling syndicate. It's more than he told me. Supposedly the big boss is here in New York. Now, what are you going to do about it? Look, the minute Art quits thinking he's got to hit the jackpot all by himself and lets us in on it, we'll give him all the protection he... Lieutenant Rostelli. Yeah, yeah, just a minute. It's for you, Johnny. Oh, thanks. Hello? Art Wesley, Johnny. They told me at your hotel where to reach you. Anything new, Art? I'm leaving town for a few hours. This could be it, Johnny. Tonight could be the jackpot. Well, listen, let me go with you. Sorry, I gotta go alone. It's part of the deal. Art, it could be a trap. I can take care of myself. Call you when I get back. Wish me luck. Well, look, wait. Art! Art! <laughs> Item four, a dollar eighty cab to Art's apartment, where I persuaded the manager to let me in. I was looking for anything that would give me a lead. Then, near the phone on a scratch pad, I found where he'd written the word Watika several times. Sure, Lake Watika, upstate. Art had a lodge there. Item five, $25 even for a rented car. It was a three-hour drive to Lake Watika, which was bad enough. But to top it off, it started to rain, and rain hard. (laughs) 
When I finally got to the highway turnoff, the side road of the lake was a mass of mud. Then I got two quick breaks. It stopped raining, and I spotted the six-mile road into Art's place. Half an hour further on, I saw a light. Art's car was parked at one side, and the front door of the lodge was wide open. When I got to it, I saw why. Art was lying in the doorway. Yeah. He was the one who wanted to hit the jackpot. But you can't hit the jackpot with a slug, particularly when that slug is right between your eyes. I drove to the sheriff's office and reported it. Sheriff Tompkins and his boys took over. But in the darkness and the mud, they could only make a routine check. He asked me to meet him at the lodge the next morning, so I did. Uh, uh, Buddy was right here in the doorway, huh, son? Yeah, Sheriff, I didn't move it. And uh, Wesley probably got shot when he answered the door by somebody standing out there on the ground. Because of that bullet hole in the roof? Yeah, right over that shelf that's stocked with canned goods, sugar, salt, and the like. Apparently, he used this place regular. Yeah, he used to do some of his writing here. Were you able to determine time of death? Coroner says between 10.30 and 11 last night. Uh, what time did you arrive? About half an hour after the rain stopped. I'd say quarter to 12. Means it was uh, still raining a good half hour after the killing. Eh, no wonder we found no tracks. Hey, look, Sheriff. I was working on a hot story about a national gambling syndicate. Could be that he found out who the boss was last night, the hard way. Oh? Then uh, you think the killer was from out of town. Maybe New York. Yeah. Yeah, now where would he stay? Is there a hotel around here? Lake Watika Inn, just outside the village, about six miles from here. Sheriff, I'll check it out. The guests here at the inn, Mr. Dollar, well, we have only two who checked in yesterday. It's the off-season, of course. Yeah, clerk, who are they? Well, uh, Mr. Cooper yesterday afternoon and a Mr. Buckley around dark. Uh Uh-huh, are they still here? Mr. Cooper is sitting right out there on the terrace, but... uh, Mr. Buckley paid in advance and left quite early this morning. I see. Did Buckley give any reason for stopping here? He said he was a traveling man and didn't like to drive in the rain. (laughs) Okay, okay. I'd like you to write down a description of him. I'll pick it up on the way out. Oh, I'll be glad to, sir. Hi. Oh, good morning. Enjoying the scenery? Yes, immensely. Oh, sit down, won't you? Sure, thanks. My name's Dollar. Mine's Cooper. You just check in? I'll just drop by. Uh, I came yesterday. Uh Uh-huh. Pretty up here this time of year. Yes. Yes, certainly is. I I really enjoy places like this in the off-season. It's a nice change. Too bad the weather hasn't been better, huh? The rainstorm last night? (laughs) Oh, I enjoyed that, too. You were out in it? Oh, no. (laughs) <laughs> no. No, I enjoyed it the way a storm should be enjoyed. In front of the fireplace in my cottage with a drink and a good book. No, Mr. Dollar, I stayed in last night. And that was that. I picked up the description of the other guest, Buckley, from the clerk and gave it to Sheriff Tompkins, who got out a bullet in mine. Then I drove back to New York City, turned in my rented car, and took a cab. That's item six, a dollar seventy, to Joan Wesley's apartment. Yes. They notified me this morning about Art's death. I don't know what to say. What is there to say? (laughs) Good question, Mrs. Wesley. If only he hadn't been so stubborn. If only he'd given up that story about the gambling syndicate or whatever it was. Yeah. You, uh, you figure somebody in the syndicate killed him? Why, of course. Mrs. Wesley, did you know Art had gone on up to the lodge at Lake Watika? No. Mr. Dollar, I'm rather tired. One more thing. Did you go out last night? No. It was raining. I stayed here in the apartment. All evening? All evening. I see. Well, thanks, Mrs. Wesley. Maybe I was imagining, but it seemed to me Joan Wesley hesitated just a little before telling me she hadn't been out of her apartment last night. And if she had gone to Lake Watika, I checked the basement garage. Her car was clean. Too clean. 
Item seven, five dollars to the garage attendant for some very interesting information. Joan Wesley had ordered her car washed first thing this morning. Why? Because the wheels were covered with mud from last night. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Better schools mean better citizens, better neighbors, better families. But we can't expect our children to respond, to learn and grow, if we ourselves are indifferent to their school environment. CBS Radio urges that you write to Better Schools, 9 East 40th Street, New York 60, New York, for information about how citizens can spark community action to improve their schools. That address again is Better Schools, 9 East 40th Street, New York 16, New York. Now, Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Big Scoop Matter. I tell you, I didn't leave this apartment last night. Your car says differently, Joan. Car. You had it washed today because it was all muddy. And the reason it was muddy was because you had it out in the rain last night. Look, Another I... thing. You told me you didn't know Art had gone to the lodge. You hadn't heard from him. But the switchboard operator told me you had a call from him yesterday. Now, why else would he call you except to tell you where he was going? Well, how about it, Joan? All right. Art did call me yesterday and told me he was going to Lake Watika. And how about last night? Yes. I went out, but not to Lake Watika. Art wouldn't give you a divorce. By killing him, you get your freedom and a hundred thousand bucks. I didn't kill Art. I didn't go up there last night. And where did you go? Might as well know. The reason I wanted a divorce from Art was because I'd found someone else. Oh. That's where I went for a few minutes last evening. Why did you lie about the phone call from Art yesterday? I don't know. I don't know. I was confused. I was. I was afraid it would look bad for me if it came out that I knew Art had gone up there. It doesn't look good for you this way, believe me. Oh, Johnny, I'm telling the truth. Who is this fellow you're interested in? I don't see why he Who is he? To... His name is Ted Nash. Will you... will you have to talk to him? I sure will. And right now. But I was wrong about talking to Ted Nash right now. I called his apartment and got no answer. Item nine, a dollar sixty cab fare to police headquarters in the office of Detective Lieutenant Rastelli. You figure this guy Nash and Joan Wesley could have killed Art and used a gambling syndicate threat as a cover, huh? It's a possibility, Lieutenant. Well, I'll see what I can find out about Nash. How'd you do at Lake Watika? Two guests checked in the day of the killing. One a man named Buckley. He left early this morning. Sheriff Tompkins has a bullet knot on him. Who else? A fellow named Cooper, who apparently likes to go places in the off season. Nothing to tie him in particularly. Cooper, huh? We had a rumble some time ago that a guy named Cooper was involved in that gambling syndicate. What? The trouble is, we got no proof. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? I told me he'd put the name of the man he was after in a safe deposit box. If we could find the key to that box. How about Art's apartment? Let's take a look. So we looked, and we found the key, tucked away in a desk, but only a number on it. Nothing to tell where it was located. I gave it to Lieutenant Rastelli, and he promised to check every bank in town if necessary. While I went on back to Lake Watika to see if the man named Cooper at the inn was the same one Rastelli told me about. When I got there, after a frantic three-hour drive, I found him comfortably sitting by the fireplace. Well, uh, Mr. Dollar, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Cooper, I want to get right to the point. You told me you came up here to enjoy the scenery. Yes, that's right. Why? The man who was killed last night, Art Wesley, he was trying to expose a national gambling syndicate. Oh, that's very interesting. So? So, I know a police detective in New York who thinks you're a member of that syndicate. Well, now, Mr. Dollar, that's a very serious charge. I presume you have proof. Well? Uh-huh. No proof. Well, in that case, I don't Mr. think there's any... Mr. the long-distance call for you. You can take it on that phone right beside you. Thanks, clerk. Johnny Dollar. Rastelli in New York, Johnny. Hi, Lieutenant. You locate that... Yeah, the safe deposit box. And in it, we found the name of the man Art Wesley was closing in on. It's Cooper. Thanks very right, much. So you... Well, Cooper, 
You want a proof? We've got it. Evidence that ties you in with the syndicate. Clerk. Well, now, this is ridiculous. Is it? Let me tell you the facts about this thing. Is is something the matter, Mr. Dollar? Get Sheriff Tompkins on the phone, Clerk. Tell him I've got Art Wesley's killer here. You mean Mr. Cooper? Oh, now, wait a minute. Now, look, Dollar. If you'd get your facts straight, you'd drop this silly notion of yours. What kind of facts, Cooper? What time was Wesley killed? Between 10.30 and 11 last night. But, Mr. Dollar, Mr. Wesley's place is some six miles from here. That's right. Why? Well, then Mr. Cooper couldn't have killed him. What do you mean? Last night, I took a drink to Mr. Cooper's cottage here at the inn. What time? Around 20 to 11, and I chatted with him for at least 15 minutes. Are you sure about that? Oh, quite sure. Well, Mr. Dollar, I'll buy you a drink sometime. Cooper strolled back to the bar with a satisfied smirk on his face. So the one man who had to be Art's killer couldn't have killed him. I collared the clerk again and had him repeat his story in detail. If you recall, it rained heavily last night, Mr. Dollar. Yes, yes, I drove through it on my way up here. Well, I was making the rounds of the inn, checking windows, things like that, when the house phone rang. It was Mr. Cooper calling from his cottage. He wanted a drink. You say that was at 20 to 11? Uh, yes, I always jot down the time when I am called away from the desk. All right, go on, go on. Well, when I got to Mr. Cooper's cottage, he was sitting in the living room in front of the fire with a book. Yeah. We chatted a while, and then when I returned here to the desk, I jotted down the time again. 10.55. Well, that does it. What do you mean? Oh, it's a good 20-minute drive from here to Art Wesley's lodge. If he was killed between 10.30 and 11, and Cooper was here at that time, he, he couldn't have done it. Well, I'm sorry, but facts are facts. And, uh, oh, excuse me. Lake Watika Inn. Uh, yes, just a moment. Sheriff Tompkins, Mr. Dollar. Oh, Mr. thanks. Hi, Sheriff. Thought you ought to know, son. Remember that man Buckley we were looking for? Yeah, sure, the other guest at the inn. Yeah, we picked him up. I've been questioning him for an hour. Any luck? No, sir. He's just a traveling salesman who stayed at the inn because he didn't want to drive in the rain. You sure? Buckley swears he doesn't even know Cooper. Just between you and me, Johnny, I think we got the wrong fella. No place again. I decided to start all over. Got into my car and drove to Art Wesley's place. Nothing was changed. I remember the trip I'd made the night he was killed, how it rained heavily until about half an hour before I arrived. How I'd found him lying in the open doorway, a bullet hole in his head. Yeah, and the hole in the ceiling over the shelf of provisions, marking the path of the bullet. It was there, so were the provisions. Canned food, mustard, sugar, a package of crackers. There was some... Wait a minute. Sugar. The sugar bowl. I stared at it for a moment. I remembered a couple of things the room clerk at the inn had told me. And suddenly the whole deal slid neatly and quietly into place. I drove back to the inn fast. Cooper's cottage was empty, so I went inside to the bedroom and took a look around. Then I spotted one of the pictures on the wall, a little out of place. I looked behind it. Yeah, just what I expected. Outside, I found Cooper sitting on the terrace in front of the main building. I slid into a chair across from him. Well, Mr. Dollar, what fantastic crime are you going to accuse me of today? Cooper, I got a one-track mind. And it's still stuck on murder. Oh, now, look, Dollar. We've been over this before, and personally, I, I find it quite boring. So much so that it's interfering with my vacation here. That's too bad. Yes, it is. So I'm leaving this evening. I don't think so, Cooper. Oh, come now. That Art Wesley no... was trying to expose a figure in a gambling syndicate. You. Well, that's a matter of conjecture. You had to stop him for keeps. Oh, now, look, Dollar. The time of Art Wesley's death has been established as between 10.30 and 11 last night. That's right, between 10.30 and 11 last night. And I'm sure you remember the room clerk telling you he was with me in my cottage living room from 10.40 to 10.55. I sure do. So that I certainly couldn't have killed your friend Wesley six miles from here during that time. Except that Art Wesley wasn't killed at his lodge. What are you talking about? You see, I remembered something else the clerk had told me. The night of the killing had stopped raining a little after 11. All right, what difference does that make? All the difference in the world, believe me. Here's what really happened, Cooper. 
You killed Art Wesley in the bedroom of your cottage here at the inn. I don't mean to read. You immediately called the room clerk over and chatted with him in your living room for about 15 minutes. He didn't know there was a corpse in the next room. Oh, really? After he left, you took Wesley's body the six miles to his place and planted it in the doorway. Well, now, look, Dollar... Your problem was to make it look like he'd been killed there. Then you remembered. The slug that had killed him hit the wall in your bedroom. That gave you an idea. You figured out the right angle at the lodge and fired a shot upwards from the outside the door. It went through the ceiling at the back. All right, Dollar, I've had enough of your half-baked theories with no proof whatsoever to back them up. Correction, Cooper, this time I've got proof. There was a shelf of food under the bullet hole and a bowl of sugar directly under it. A bowl of... So what? When sugar gets wet, it gets crusty and it stays that way. But the sugar in that bowl was dry. Now, if the killing was between 10.30 and 11 and it rained heavily until after 11, then some rain would have dropped through the bullet hole into the sugar. I see. But, Cooper, the sugar was dry. So the bullet hole was made after the time of the murder when you planted Wesley's body there. Just a little detail, Cooper, but it nails you. That and, of course, the fact I found the slug that really killed Wesley just a couple of minutes ago. Oh. Buried in the wall of your bedroom behind a picture, you'd move slightly to cover it. Well, Dollar, I may as well tell you that I saw you come out of my cottage a few minutes ago. I figured you knew. So ever since you sat down here, I've been holding a gun on you under the table. You know, Cooper, I may as well tell you. Ever since I sat down here, I've been holding a gun on you, too. Well, you... Let's have it. Well, you... You didn't have any gun. A big-time gambler bluffed right out of the game. Cooper, you're slipping. Mm-hmm. Item 10, 37.50. Transportation and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total $187.40. Remarks? Cooper's awaiting trial. About Art Wesley... Well, I guess that sugar bowl was a dead man's revenge. And come to think of it, that revenge was pretty sweet. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. In days long since gone by, one had to go out in search of Daring Do... But in a fast-moving world, exciting things are happening right around the clock. Things you can be in on no matter what else you're doing, as long as your radio is nearby. With CBS Newsmen on the job, you can make CBS Radio your listening post for world events. Stay tuned now for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by the FBI in peace and war. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, colorful New Orleans, from nightlife in the Latin Quarter to the dismal deadly swamps. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Russell Thorson, Barney Phillips, Stacey Harris, Larry Thor, Parley Bear, and Les Tremaine. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Dollar. This is Ed Porter, Mr. Dollar. You called my office? Yes, I'd like to see you as soon as I can, Mr. Porter. Well, of course. How long have you been in town? About a half an hour. Are you all squared away? I've got a room and I've had a bath, if that's what you mean. Well, then I guess you're ready to go to work. I will be as soon as I put on some pants. You sound in a rush. I'm always in a rush when I think somebody might be chipping us out of $100,000. Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Western Life and Trust Company, 826 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Markham matter. Expense account item one, $143.69, air transportation from Hartford to San Francisco. Item two, $17 for incidentals along the way, including transportation from the airport to the St. Francis Hotel. I walked the eight blocks to the Commodore building where Ed Porter had his office on the fourth floor. He was a short, thin insurance broker with a face like a tight drum. He apologized for the clammy weather as though it were his fault. He asked me how things were out on the East Coast and invited me to sit down and looked as uncomfortable as he was. I uh, got the telegram you were coming last night. Investigator, I've never met one in all my years in the business. Must be very interesting work. Yeah, yeah. Look, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Mr. Porter, but I would like to get some information from you. Oh, certainly, Mr. Dollar. What can you tell me about a man named Floyd Markham? Markham? Well, he's the husband of a client of mine. I've met him, but I really can't tell you too much about him. My dealings have always been with Mrs. Markham. She's my customer. Then tell me about Mrs. Markham. Oh, certainly. I, uh, I'm not going to ask why. I'm sure you have a good reason for coming all the way to San Francisco. The home office thinks I have an excellent reason. Uh, yes. Uh, Mrs. Markham. Well, uh, I've known her for 20 years as a customer. She's wealthy, always has been. And she handles her money well, and she lives rather well. Mrs. Markham's the one who has the money, huh? Uh, Mr. Markham is a salaried man, an industrial engineer. Frankly, I think he depends on Mrs. Markham for his livelihood. Oh, yeah. These two checks were issued to Mrs. Markham this year. Recognize them? Mm, yes, yes. Uh, full payments on two endowment policies, uh, $50,000 apiece. And they've cleared the bank. Anything wrong with them? Nothing wrong with the checks. On payoffs like this, I always take it in person. It's a uh, custom, of course, to call and make an appointment and deliver the check to the client. Mm -hmm. And try to sell a little more insurance in the bargain. Huh? Well, <laughs> that's about the idea, yes. Yeah. Anything strange about Mrs. Markham when you delivered either one of these checks? Well, no. Before I left Hartford, I looked up her insurance records. Her premiums are always paid right on the button. Mrs. Markham doesn't have a business office or a business manager handling her affairs. The checks are always personal checks on her personal account. Now, can you explain why someone like that might forget a third endowment policy? Why, no. Well, there is a third endowment policy. It matured this month. I have the check with me for $50,000. Well, yes, but this business of forgetting... Floyd Markham called Hartford and spoke to the head of the endowment division. He explained that Mrs. Markham was ill and didn't know whether or not a third policy existed. He said he was checking for her. Uh-huh. Now, you say you've known Mrs. Markham over a period of 20 years. Well, is she the kind of person who'd forget $50,000? Oh, no one forgets $50,000. Did you notice that both of those checks were deposited in the Markham's joint account? Well, no. Hmm. So they were. Maybe Mrs. Markham's feeling generous these days. Why do you say that? Well, they have a rather strange relationship as far as I've been able to perceive. I mean, what money he makes is his and what she has is hers. Oh, yeah. yeah. I always like to get out of that house because they never seem to me to be a very close couple in, in any way. But this seems to make sense now. How's that, Mr. Porter? Well, now, I called up and made an appointment to deliver both of these checks. The first time I went over, Mrs. Markham was ill. And the second time, she had just stepped out for a few minutes. Well, who accepted the checks? Mr. Markham. Both times? Yes. As a matter of fact, now that I think of it, he made the appointment on the phone both times. 
When was the last time you saw Mrs. Markham? Last spring. A check with the bank revealed that Mrs. Markham had not personally made a deposit since June the 18th. The deposit slips were initialed by Floyd Markham. The checks were endorsed by Leslie Markham. There had been no unusual withdrawals. Expense account item three thirty dollars stenographic and notary services for the attached statements. Mrs. Markham has been having her hair done here for nearly ten years now. Once a week, every Thursday morning. Then she just stopped. I called her home, and Mr. Markham informed me that she was away on an extended trip. Mr. Markham called us, uh, it was last June, and informed us that Mrs. Markham was resigning her membership in the bridge club. I telephoned the house twice to see what was the matter. Mr. Markham answered both times and said Mrs. Markham was out. Well, she used to come in here two or three times a month. Made us go over the car from top to bottom. She hasn't been around now for seven or eight months. I don't know who's taking care of the car. Expense account item 430 cents, three phone calls to the Markham residence. I didn't state any particular business. I simply asked to speak to Mrs. Markham. Each time I called, a male voice answered. Each time, the male voice told me Mrs. Markham was out, she was ill, and she was away on a short trip. Industrial Management Limited, Floyd B. Markham President, has a three-room office suite near the Embarcadero. Ten years ago, it had been sensationally new and glassy. When I got there, the carpet was a little too thin and the varnish a little too thin, too. The whole place smelled faintly of mildew. Yes? I'd like to see Mr. Markham, please. Do you have an appointment? No, no, not exactly. My name is Harris. I'm with the Cleveland Pump Company. Pump Company? Yes, we're setting in 38 of our installations at the new plant in Valparaiso. Didn't you get my letter? Well, I'm sorry. I'm afraid... May I ask your name again? Harris. Stephen B. Harris. Cleveland Pump Company. Oh, yes. Well, Mr. Harris, I'm afraid Mr. Markham never received your letter. When did you mail it? Uh, Thirty days ago. Maybe it was two weeks. Well, tell Mr. Markham I'm here and I'll... I'm sorry, Mr. Harris. Mr. Markham isn't in the office just now. Oh. Well, I'll wait. Uh, well... Well? Uh, he won't be in today... As a matter of fact, he won't be in the rest of the week. Where can I call him? Well, I'm afraid that's impossible. Can't I call him at home? No. Now, look, is he in business or isn't he? Mr. Harris, Mr. Markham hasn't been in the office for six months or more. He's he's tied up on a rather long-range project. What's your name? I'm Miss Bidler. Why didn't you say that in the first place, Miss Bidler? Well, Who else uh... can I talk to here? No one, I'm afraid. You mean that's all there is in this office? Just you and him when he feels like coming in? I'll tell Mr. Markham you were here. The Markham house was on Fiera Della Street, about six blocks from the Fairmont Hotel. Stone walls, iron grill work, tangling ivy. An old house that had been built by rich people for rich people to live in. The kind of shabby-looking place that only New Yorkers and San Franciscans can get by with and still be called wealthy. I used Ed Porter's car with the Western Life and Trust Company emblem on the door, parked it in the driveway as close as I could to the entrance. It was exactly one o'clock when the door opened. He was tall and pretty with black hair and broad shoulders. Yes? What is it? I'd like to see Mrs. Markham, please. I'm Mr. Markham. Can I help you? My name's Dollar. I'm with Western Life and Trust Company. Mr. Porter called you? No, he didn't. Oh, well, it must have slipped his mind. He said he was going to call. What's it about? I brought a check from Mrs. Markham on her third endowment policy. Oh. Well, I'll give it to her. She isn't in right now. Well, I'm supposed to deliver it to her. I'll come back another time when she's in. No, you can give it to me. I'll see that she gets it. I'm sorry, Mr. Markham, but I have Look, to Look, I know you want to give her the check and try to sell her some more insurance. She's just not in the market. And you can save your little spiel where it'll do some good. Oh, you misunderstand me, Mr. Markham. I have to deliver this to her in person. What's your name again? Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Come in. I'll wait till she comes back and make an appointment. Mr. Porter told me he'd made it for three today, She's so... here, she's here. Just come in. Why the runaround? Mrs. Markham is desperately ill. I don't want to disturb her with things like, like this. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. 
What's the trouble? Very serious anemia. So if uh, if you'll just give me the I have check, a report uh, to make out when I deliver this. I just only told... take a minute to hand her the check. Then it'll be off my mind and off your mind. Now look here, Mister. Didn't you call the company's home office about this check? I I called because Mrs. Markham requested me to call. Oh yes. Just uh, wait here. In the little swirl of his exit, I smelled shaving lotion and guessed at the brand name. I also guessed that his suit cost $300, even if I didn't know what San Francisco tailor had made it. The shirt, the tie, the shoes were expensive, too. Yeah, Mr. Floyd Markham liked expensive things. I wondered if he dyed his hair to keep it all black. I wondered if he was 45 or 50. I also wondered why, in a house of that size, on that kind of street, a servant hadn't answered the door. This way, Mr. Dollar. He led me up a flight of stairs and finally into a high-ceiling room with a fireplace at one end. A gray-haired woman with a sharp, angular face was seated near the window, looking out over the city and the bay. She didn't turn her head when we came into the room, but I could see that her eyes were watery and slightly glazed. Please, don't take too long and don't upset her. Leslie. Leslie, dear. Yes, Floyd? This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. He has something for you. Be a good girl, Leslie. Speak to Mr. Dollar. How do you do? And and ask him... Yes. How is Mr. Porter? Oh, he's uh, fine, Mrs. Markham, fine. He'll be sorry to hear that you've been ill. I really would rather that you didn't tell Mr. Porter. Oh. I'm satisfied to... Make my own slow recovery and not worry any of my friends. We'd like some sherry, Floyd. Now you know what the doctor said, Leslie. Mr. Dollar, you'd like some sherry, wouldn't you? Why, yes, I'd like that very much. Floyd? No, I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. It's absolutely forbidden. And you know that, dear. Uh, do you have the check, Mr. Dollar? Yes, right here. Here you are, Mrs. Markham. Thank you. Is there anything else, Mr. Dollar? Well, uh... Mr. Dollar, I... Now, Leslie... Leslie. Yes? What is it, Mrs. Markham? I'm very tired. Excuse me if I seem impolite. Good day. Good day, Mrs. Markham. Expense account item five ten cents. Phone call to Ed Porter at his office. Yes, Mr. Dollar. Look, Mrs. Markham's five five, about one twenty, black hair, gray streak to the right of the part, blue eyes. Looks about forty years old, a good forty. Why, yes, that sounds like her. You mean you've seen her? I've seen what's left of her, Mr. Porter. Oh, good lord, she's not dead. Almost. What? He's killing her, Mr. Porter. My guess is he's been at it for about six months. <laughs> Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Nobody will take a frown at face value anymore now that the word has gotten around about Jack Benny's return to the air. With Mary Livingston, Dennis Day, Rochester, Don Wilson, Mel Blank, Frank Nelson, and Mr. Kitzel, nothing less than your very best smile will do for the occasion. Tonight, and every Sunday night, hear CBS Radio's Jack Benny Show and give your sense of humor a real workout. Now... Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Markham Matter. Take a rich old house on a rich old street in San Francisco. Walk in with a legitimate insurance check for $50,000 and tell a man named Floyd Markham you want to deliver it to his wife. Tell him this when you know that no one has seen or heard from his wife in six months. Just tell him you want to see her. Insist that you see her. Then stand around and listen to him lie a couple of times. Then let him take you to her. Give her the check. Say goodbye. Twenty minutes after I walked out of the Markham's house and picked up Ed Porter, we drove back to the house and parked a hundred feet from the entrance. 
This is the darndest thing I ever heard of, Mr. Dollar. I'm not sure it's all clear to me. What's our position? Oh, I wouldn't know that, Mr. Porter. That's up to the legal department. This much I'm sure of right now. Markham's already deposited $100,000 of her insurance money into a joint account. If I'm not mistaken, this last check will go into that account, too. Right now, while we're sitting here, she's probably endorsing that check. Well, then I don't see where it's any of our business. He's making her endorse the check. He's making her stay in that house, in that room, away from everybody. Well, how? What way? He said she was ill. You said she appeared ill. I don't I don't know how he's doing it, but I'm going to find out. Are you sure this isn't all surmise on your part? You weren't in the room when she said, let's have some sherry. Please, let's have some sherry. I must be pretty dumb. She was dumb, really see. saying, trying to say, she wanted him to leave the room so she could talk to me. So she could have one little minute to tell me what the matter is, what's going on. His next move is to deposit that check. Then one big withdrawal, the whole 150000 and bye-bye Floyd Markham. Mr. Dollar, I'm just an insurance broker. I don't understand that... Well, how'd you like to be an investigator hmm? for about ten minutes? Me? Yeah. You see that car that just pulled up in the driveway? Well, yes, The yes. girl driving it holds down that dummy office of Markham's. Her name's Bidler. She might be in on this with him. A- and that's Mr. Markham leaving the house. Good. Now, look, here's what you do. Follow them. I think I know where they're going, but you follow them and make sure. Well, where are they going? To the bank to deposit that check. Oh. Well, uh, where are you going? To have that glass of sherry, Mr. Porter. Ed Porter pulled his hat down low over his face and put both hands on the wheel and took out after that 55 Cadillac sedan. I crossed the street, went back up on the porch of the house, and knocked. I didn't expect her to answer. I didn't expect anyone to answer, but I wanted to make sure. I went around to the garden. There wasn't a sound in the big old house when I opened the garden door and went up the stairs again. The door to her room was closed. She wasn't by the window anymore. She was stretched out on the divan. I felt her wrist for a pulse. It was there, faint, but there. About three inches up her arm, there was a series of little marks. I lifted one eyelid and felt her neck muscles. She was doped to the ears. Mrs. Markham. Mrs. Markham, can you hear me? Look, I've come to help you. Me? Yes. Yes, I'm going to take you out of here. Now, don't be frightened. Mr. Dow? That's right. That's right. That's the ticket. An insurance company. Yes. Now I remember. Yes, that's right. Thank you for bringing my check. I don't want... Want... Want what, Mrs. Markham? Want any of my friends to worry. Oh. I'm improving... But I don't want them to know I'm ill. Just say I'm out of town for a while. He told you to say that, didn't he? Yes. He told me to say exactly that. Mr. Dollar, don't fool me. Please don't fool me. What? You will help me get out of here. You aren't fooling me, are you? Are you? I carried her downstairs and put her in my car and drove her to the St. Regis Emergency Hospital. Expense account item six one hundred dollars deposit with the hospital office. I explained as much as necessary to the intern who promised to advise me when Mrs. Markham became rational. After that, I drove back to the house. Ed Porter's blue coupe was parked across the street. I didn't know what to do but come back here. And when I got back, I didn't know what to do either. Slow down, slow down. You're doing fine. Oh, you were right. You were absolutely right. They went straight to the Bank of America to deposit that money. I kind of thought they might be back here by now. No, no, they're over at Angelo's having a drink and some dinner. I followed them there. You're getting to be quite a sleuth, Mr. Porter. Well, I try to do my best and use my head. Uh, Mr. Dollar, did you talk to Mrs. Markham? As much as I could. She was doped. I took her out and put her in the hospital. Oh. Well, should you have done that, Mr. Dollar? I could have left her up in that room to die, Mr. Porter. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, uh, what's our next move? Ours? Well, certainly. I can't quit now, Mr. Uh, Johnny. (laughs) Well, let's go to Angelo's, Eddie. (laughs) Ed Porter settled the hat lower on his ears and gripped the wheel harder, and we took off for Angelo's on Stoker Street. 
When we got there, we didn't have to go inside to see if our people were still around. The Cadillac sedan was in the parking lot. So we took up a plant across the street. Well, why wait? Why not go in and take them out of there and take them down to the police? Well, that might blow the whole thing. Now, we have to wait and see what Mrs. Markham has to say when she's well enough to talk. Yeah, but... Uh... I'm sure she'll have some charges to prefer. In the meantime, we wait and see what's what. Yeah, what do you think he'll do when he goes home and finds her gone? <laughs> well, that'll be pretty interesting. What do you think he'll do? Well, I, I imagine he'll, um... Uh, he'll think she got up and walked no, out. No, no, he knows better than that. He's had her doped up for six months. He knows he can go out of the house and she'll stay right where he left her while he's gone. No, that isn't it. Oh. But then he'll know that she had help. That's more like it, Mr. Porter. Uh, I I liked Eddie. It uh, gives me kind of a feeling. Okay, Eddie. Now answer the question. Oh, uh, what'll he do? Well, uh, it's, he'll try to get out of town. That's it. He'll try to leave town. He'll know that he's had it. Come on. Huh? They're pulling out. We followed them to a cocktail lounge near the Presidio. We waited around outside the place for two hours. Expense account item 7, 25 cents. I called the St. Regis Receiving Hospital. Mrs. Markham's condition was unchanged. Item 8, two dollars, two hamburgers, two Cokes and cigarettes for Mr. Porter and myself. We had just finished eating when Floyd Markham's Cadillac turned out onto the street. We followed it for ten minutes. When Markham parked on a dark hill, we cut our lights and came to a stop. Mr. Dollar? Yeah, Eddie? Can you see what they're doing? Yeah. What? Necking. Huh? Necking, you know. I should have telephoned my wife. At 12.10, Floyd Markham turned the car around and drove back into town. We followed once more. We saw him double park outside a four-story apartment house on a steep hill, let the woman out, then drive on. Eddie? Hey, yeah, Johnny? Think you can handle something else alone? Oh, I'd love to. Women sometimes talk a lot easier than men. You keep on him. When he finds his wife absent, I want to know where he goes. Wherever it is, I'll let you know. Are you going to shake her down? Uh, something like that. Yeah. Get going. I watched my new assistant investigator follow out after Markham's Cadillac. Then I went inside the apartment house. I, Bidler, was on the mailbox of apartment 104. I walked down the hall, listened a minute, and gave it a try. Yes? Well, what on earth are you doing? I'm here to see you, Miss Bidler. It's important. You're, um, Mr. Harris. I'm Mr. Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. There was something about you today. I, I wasn't sure. Now you're sure. Oh, what are you doing? Right now, I'm working for Western Life and Trust Company. You better sit down. Well, I don't know that I'd better do anything, Mr. Dollar. You're rather rude. Then you can stand. We've been checking into Floyd Markham. I don't think I have to tell you what we found out so far. I think you also know that by this time tomorrow, he'll be in jail and you might be right along with him. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I simply oh, don't... don't be un... sorry. Just use your head. I said you might be right along with him. On the other hand, if you have some useful information, the insurance company might be useful to you. What do you mean? Well, I figure he sold you on a, an island trip or uh, an estate in the country bill of goods. It'll be hard at getting it out of him, but we'll get it one way or another. We'll get it all right. Now, what do you want to do? I... I want a drink. You? Oh, thanks. I'm... I'm not bad. I'm... I'm not a criminal. I, I've never been in trouble. You are now. Why? Because I fell in love with him? Because you were helping him kill her. What are you talking about? Mrs. Markham. She's in a hospital right now. What? I took her there myself today. He's had a dope with I don't know what for months... Having a signed checks and doors deposit slips. Oh, funny. Is it? He told me that Mrs. Markham was out of town, divorcing him. I wondered how I... You were right. It was a country estate in England. A genteel life, he said. The London theater, walks in the country... Little harmless things that most people can never do. 
He said we could do them as soon as he cleaned up his affairs. Why, tonight he said we could start pack... packing. I took Iris Bidler with me back to the Markham house. The Cadillac was in the garage and Ed Porter's blue coupe was pulled up across the street. When he saw us in the cab, he walked up. Hi. Hi. How's he doing? Uh, you can talk in front of her. Well, he, he hasn't done anything. No, I mean, I saw the light go on upstairs in Mrs. Markham's room, then it went out again. He's downstairs now, sitting in the living room. Okay. Wait here. Uh. Markham. Hello. If you're worried about your wife, which I doubt, she's in the hospital. Are you a policeman? Insurance investigator. That's Miss Bidler in the taxi over there. Oh. I want you to come with me now. Of course. Yes. You said your name was Dollar. That's right. Why couldn't you have come around, say... Next week. She'd have been dead by then. That's the way she should have been for 16 years. Dead. Yeah. Come on, Markham. Expense account, item 9, $102, hotel and board in San Francisco. Item 10, $116, airfare back to Hartford. Item 11, $42.16 miscellaneous. Remarks? This one will wind up in court. Mrs. Markham's charges will include attempted homicide, attempt to defraud, attempt to... In the end, it was his attempt to run away, and it didn't work. It never works. Even if you get away, you find something new to run from. Total expenses, $968.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Before I do, I want to say something to you about Thanksgiving. Now, there's a day that deserves celebration. And heartfelt thanks to the God who made us for being able to live in the most free and peaceful and bountiful country in the world. And yet, why wait for next Thursday or any Thanksgiving day? For Americans, it seems to me, Thanksgiving should be every day. Think about it, won't you? Next week in our story, New Orleans, the French Quarter, a beautiful girl, and high adventure. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in tonight's cast were Lois Corbett, Frank Nelson, Virginia Gregg, Bert Holland, Paula Winslow, and John Daner. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Why, man? How's your stomach, Johnny? Why? Rich food give any trouble? Who is this? Why, your old buddy, Angie Orsati. Oh, hi, Angie. Glad you got my message. Yeah. How about dinner tonight at Antoine's, Johnny? Shrimp gumbo, oysters, Rockefeller. Yeah, sounds fine. Only I've got to do some work first. Man, I thought you was here in New Orleans on vacation. Nope. Little matter of fire insurance and the company's check for 16000 Somebody trying to cheat him out of it, huh? You won't believe this, Angie. Somebody turned it down. What? Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Providential Fire and Marine, 787 Greenleaf Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Royal Street matter. Expense account item one, $103.82, transportation to New Orleans. Item two, $4.20, cab from the airport to the Roosevelt Hotel. After unpacking, I put in the call to my old friend Angie Orsatti. Nobody knows the French Quarter or the people living there like Angie does. For three months of the winter, he stays in the swamp, trapping muskrats. The rest of the year, he lives with his mother near the Cabildo. Angie wasn't in, but his mother said she knew where to reach him, and five minutes later, he returned my call. We arranged to meet for dinner, then I phoned the agent who had sold the policy in question. His name's Benford, and naturally, he was anxious to see me. C.D. Benford's office is on the third floor of the Hibernia Bank building. He's a stocky, red-faced man, probably in his late 50s. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in, come in. Thanks. Help yourself to the chair. Say, hey, you fellas sure don't waste any time, do you? We try not to, Mr. Benford. C.D., boy. What? You call me C.D. like all the other folks do. Oh, okay, C.D. Yeah. Now, like I was saying, you boys sure don't waste any time at all. Why, I didn't even call the home office till the day before yesterday. I know. When was the fire? Last week on Thursday night. What did they tell you about it? Well, not very much. Figured I'd get all the information from you. Well, it's a doozy. First time I've ever run across a policyholder who wasn't yelling for us to pay him yesterday for his loss today. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, who is the insured, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, C.D.? man named Dupa, Henry Dupa. Took out a policy for 48000 That's full coverage on his antique shop down on Royal Street. How long ago? August, just three months back. I've been after him for, oh, maybe five, six months to buy some protection, but he kept saying he didn't have the money. Didn't have the money. And one day I dropped in to see him about his car insurance, and right off he told me to write a policy giving him full fire coverage on the shop. Well, how do you arrange to pay it? Cash. In full the day I delivered the policy. He tell you why he changed his mind? Yeah, not exactly. Bet he mentioned something about times being better. <laughs> I reckon there must have been. Why did he say that? Well, a few days later, he had the back part of his shop all painted and fixed up. And that's the part that burned. And he hired himself a girl to work in the office. A real good looker, too. Well, what caused the fire, you know? I sure do. Antique kerosene lamp got knocked over accidental. According to what Dupa told the fireman, he was in the back of the shop with a customer showing him the lamp. Uh-huh. When it fell, the fire started. The two of them tried to put it out. I reckon that's why they didn't call the fire department right off. Uh-huh. And did Dupa tell you the same thing? Dupa? <laughs> he didn't tell me nothing. Well, he reported the fire to you, didn't he? He did not. And that's what's got me so riled up. I wouldn't know about it now if I hadn't dropped in there the other day. Was Dupa there when you stopped in? Yes, sir, he... And when I saw how the place look, the whole back of the store gutted out and the slew of his antiques destroyed. I let him have both barrels, I tell you. Oh, what'd he say to that? Well, nothing too much. Just acted like he wasn't interested in whether we paid for it or not. Didn't even ask for a claim for him. <laughs> That's funny. Sure is. I-, I thought maybe he was so upset over losing some of his valuable antiques, he didn't know what he was doing. Mm. So, after I checked with the fire department, got a copy of their report... I typed up a claim for him. 
You figured the damage at 16000 right? Mm-hmm. I uh, knew how much he spent fixing up the back. When I'd issued the policy, I'd gotten an estimate on most of the antiques. So what happened when you gave him the claim? He signed it? He did not. Said to forget about the fire. Huh? And when I kept after him, he called me a busybody and told me to get out of his shop and stay out. What do you think, C.D.? You have any idea why he didn't report it or sign that claim? If I had, boy, I wouldn't have sent for you. I left Binford's office and walked over to Canal Street. The sun had gone down and a cool breeze was coming in off the river, bringing with it the smell of coffee beans and fruit from the banana boats. I crossed Canal and turned onto Royal, heading into the French Quarter. When I reached Henry Dupas' antique shop, I stopped. There are a lot of antique shops on Royal. All of them look pretty much the same. The buildings as old as the fine rosewood and mahogany pieces they shelter. There was nothing different about this one, at least from the outside. The fire had started and finished in the rear of the building. I tried the front door, but it was locked. I didn't think anyone would be there that late, but I knocked anyway. Yes, who is it? Mr. Dupas? Who is it? My name's Dollar, Mr. Dupas. I represent the Providential Fire Marine. Why do you people persist in annoying me? Well, we wouldn't if you'd tell us about the fire There's you There's nothing here. special about that fire, Mr. Dollar. It was an accident. Well, then why didn't you file a claim? You're entitled to enough money to cover your Mr. loss. Mr. Benford explained that to me quite carefully. If you haven't talked to him, Mr. Dollar, you should. Oh, I've talked to him. Well, then go away. Well, not until you answer a few no, questions. No, leave me alone, please. I'd noticed an alley next to the shop that ended where the rear door had been. I started back along it, not quite sure what I was looking for or what I expected to find. But I was sure of one thing. Dupa was a frightened man. It was too dark to see anything at the end of the alley, so I returned to the street. Item three, thirty dollars fifty cents, phone call, taxi, and dinner for two at Antoine's. Oh man. Kinda nice, ain't it, Johnny? Hmm? Oh, the way it never changes. Same waiter, same chef, same clientele. Yeah. Like another Cafe Royale, Ashy? No, no, thanks. Well, Johnny? Yeah. Well, when are you gonna ask me? Ask you what? Oh, don't kid me. John, you've had that old bloodhound look in your eye ever since we sat down. What's the question? <laughs> okay, Angie. What do you know about a man named Henry Dupas? Dupas antique shop? That's right. Oh, not much. Seen him around some, so. Yeah, where? Oh, you, you know what kind of places I like, Johnny. Yeah, but I can't picture Dupas liking them. Well, maybe he don't, but... Maybe that little old blonde he's been carrying with him does. Blonde? Yeah, you know, female, girl, bleached hair. I know, I know. Yeah. How old? Oh, 24, 5. Yeah, real nice for old coot like him. Real winter and spring, huh? Yeah. You seen him together often? Oh, a few times. Saw him about two weeks ago at Butch's place. Hey, you know something? I walked in there that night with a five and I walked out with 200. How about that? Great. You know who the blonde is? No, but I might be able to find out. You want? Yeah, I want. I left Angie and started back toward Royal Street. On the way, I ran up item four, one dollar and eighty-five cents for one flashlight and batteries. The shades on Dupas' shop were drawn, but I could tell there were lights on inside. In the alley, a small pickup truck was parked near the side entrance to the shop. In the back of the truck, looking like they'd just been taken off the boat, were several stalks of bananas. There wasn't much else to see except the charred wood and refuse left in the alley after the fire. I started back toward the street when a man, a much larger man than Dupas, came out the side door and got into the truck. He turned over the engine and switched on the lights before I could get clear. Hey, what are you doing there? Hold it, mister, right there. Yeah, buddy, you just hold it. What were you doing back there, huh? Well, right now, mister, I'm wondering what this load of bananas is doing in an antique shop. What is it, Carl? Well, I just caught this guy snooping around in the back. What? It's Mr. Dull. Yeah, that's right. You you know him, Dupas? He's one of those insurance men I told you about. Oh, well, 
What are you here for, Dollar? Didn't DePa tell you he doesn't want any money from you people? Now, why not? Because he's afraid we might have to take a good look around before paying no, off. Sir, n- well, no, son. Is... Now, now, look, Dollar. Mr. DuPa has been okay with you people, so you got no reason to come snooping around. Especially after he's told you he don't want you around. So now maybe Mr. DuPa will have to do something to keep you away. Ain't that right, Mr. DuPa? Uh, you know what I mean. Yes. Yes, all right. I'll do it, Carl. And he'll never bother us again. Go on, Dollar. Get out of here. At the time, I had no idea what they meant to do, so it wasn't easy to turn my back on them. But I did. And nothing happened. I went back to my hotel and hit the sack, and I must confess I slept later than usual the next morning. I was still in bed when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Boy, hey now, where's my dynamic northern friend? Oh, he's off today. I'm taking his place. Uh, well, then the news I got, well, I reckon it'll keep till tomorrow. Yeah. Well, so long. No, no, wait, 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 Angie. Yeah. Did you find out anything about that blonde DePaul's been seeing? Oh, sure, everybody around the French Market coffee shop used to know her. Uh, used to, meaning up till she went to work for Mr. DuPont. She worked for DuPont? Yeah, in the office at his store. Started in there about three months ago. Well, come on. Well, since then, nobody sees her anymore. At least none of her old gang. You know where she lives? Yep. The Ponte Alba Apartments. That is, unless she has moved. Well, what's her name? Rose Allen. What? Yeah. She used to be a dancer. Had enough for you to go on? Yeah, and she thanks. That's plenty. Expense account item five, one dollar and forty cents cab fare from my hotel to the Pontalba Apartments. The list of names on the register near the manager's office told me Rose Allen's apartment was number two fifteen. But when I got up there, the girl who opened the door wasn't a blonde. Yes. Oh, I'm looking for Miss Rose Allen. She is in. Oh. She at work? Who are you? I mean, are you a friend of hers? My name's Dollar. Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Invest? Well, she hasn't done anything, has she? <laughs> well, not that I know of. Uh, look, Miss... Um... Garbo. Garbo? May Garbo. Uh-huh. You're a dancer, aren't you? How'd you guess? Oh, I'm good at recognizing talent. Oh? Would you like to come in? I've got some coffee on. Well, that'll be just fine. Say, you've certainly got a nice view of the square from here. I suppose. Don't you think so? Oh, sure, if you like that sort of thing. Me, I just think the square's kind of square. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's very good. I brought good. it up the day we moved here. You and Rose move in here together? Uh-huh. Oh, sit down, Johnny. Make yourself at home. Well, thanks. Gee, you're so polite. You wait to be asked. Yeah. Look, tell me, what time do you think Rose will be home? Oh, I couldn't say. Uh, May, this is important. What time does she usually get home? Well, I don't know. I mean, after all, she's got her own life to live, you know, and I'm not her keeper. Okay, okay. Sometimes she doesn't get home for days. Oh, I better get the coffee. She ever say anything to you about the fire? Huh? What fire? The fire down at the antique shop. No, you want cream and sugar? No, thanks, just black. Good. When was that? The fire? Last Thursday night. That's funny. What's funny? That was the last time I saw her. What? Yeah. Rose went to work last Thursday. But she never came home. Act two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. You don't have to be a special investigator to know that Americans don't take their civic responsibilities lightly. The Election Day turnout proved that beyond any shadow of doubt. So now it's time for you to face up to another responsibility to the nation in just as straightforward a way. Our Grand Observer Corps needs volunteers. We at CBS Radio urge you to write or telephone your nearest civil defense center to learn how you can help in this vast program that patrols our skies. 
Now, act two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Royal Street Matter. This was the screwiest deal I'd ever seen. A guy refusing insurance money he was entitled to. Rose Allen was my one lead, so I continued questioning May, her roommate. May told me this was the first time Rose had been away so long without at least sending for a change of clothes. I asked about Rose's boyfriends. She told me Rose had been going with one other man beside Dupas, but she didn't know who he was. After May promised to call me if she heard from Rose Allen, I left. Expense account item six, one dollar and ninety cents, taxi from the Pontalba Apartments to the Hibernia Bank Building. My insurance contact Benford wasn't in. So while I waited for him, I wondered again why DuPont had refused to sign the claim for the fire damage to his shop. Could he afford a loss of sixteen thousand dollars? I wondered if something had happened in that shop. Something DuPont had tried to cover up with a fire. I was wondering what it could have been when Benford walked in. Well, I'm glad you're here, Johnny. We got trouble. Huh? I hear you paid Dupa a call last night. That where you've been? Yeah. He phoned me about ten. Wanted me there fast. Oh, boy. I wish I had sense enough to stay away. Well, what happened, C.D.? Now, before I tell you that, you tell me what he said to you last night. Nothing important. Just something about fixing it so I couldn't bother him again. Oh? Well, he did. How? He canceled his fire insurance policy and every other policy he ever bought from me. Cancel? Yeah. So you might as well go on back to your hotel and pack, Johnny. It's none of your affair now, no matter what he's up to. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's too bad it had to turn out this way. You want a drink before you go? No, nah, I guess I need one. Yeah. What'll it be? Scotch or rye? Scotch, neat, please. Good. Saves making a mess. When you, uh... I reckon you leave. Oh, I don't know. I'll check with the airline when I get back to the hotel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Better luck next time. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that's that. Uh, CD. Hmm? What about the policy? Policy? Did he return the policy to you? Uh, no, I said do it tomorrow. But he's covered until he does return it. Does he know that? Why, no. I don't reckon he does. Good, good. He might get careless. And as long as that policy is in force, I can bother him as much as I want. Oh, I don't see what's the use, Johnny. He'll have it here by tomorrow evening. That still gives me 24 hours to get lucky. C.D., you said something about a customer being with him when that kerosene lamp was knocked over. Mm Mm-hmm. According to what he told the fire department, there was. You had that person's name? Well, I should have. I took it from the fire department report. I've got that right here. Uh, Yeah, yeah, here it is. Now, let's see. Mm Mm-hmm. The name is Andrew W. DeLong. Address, 1515 West Claiborne. There wasn't any Andrew DeLong at that address. We checked the telephone book and the city directory, and the only Andrew W. DeLong we found was out in Metri, in a mausoleum. So we drove back towards C.D.'s office. Well, now what, Johnny? Dupont. Huh? Find out everything we can about Dupont and everybody who works for him. But ain't nobody but his secretary and his assistant. Tell the name Carl. Yeah, how long has Carl been working for him? Oh, about as long as she has. Does this Carl own a fruit stand? A fruit? Well, not that I know, Bob. Why? Oh, I just wondered. Hey, what time is it, C.D.? Uh, uh, 2.15. Say, if we're going to check on Dupas' credit, we better get to the bank before the close. You're driving. Let's move. Expense account item 7, $22.80. Telephone calls and a couple of gratuities to obtain a lot of information about Dupas. I learned, among other things, that he'd banked almost $11,000 in the past three months. Before that, almost nothing. But there's no law against making money, so I still had nothing concrete to go on. At 5.30, I left Benford, went back to my hotel, and there found a message from May, Rose Allen's roommate, asking me to go to her apartment immediately. So I did. Oh, Johnny. Yeah, hi, May. Oh, come in. 
Johnny, you know what you made me promise. Yeah? Well, it happened. You mean you've heard from Rose? Well, no, not exactly. But a man called this afternoon and talked about her. Oh, well, I hope he had only nice things to say. Oh, yes. He said she's just fine. What? Didn't you hear me? Yeah, he said she's fine. Fine. Well, what else did he say? Well, he said he was going to come by at 4 o'clock and pick up her clothes. I should have them ready. Oh, but of course he didn't. Well, he did so. He did? Oh, what man? You know him? You get his name? Mr. Dollar, you don't think I'd let Rose's things go out of here with a complete stranger, do you? Of course he told me his name. Well? You aren't nearly as polite as you were this morning. All right, I'm sorry. What's the man's name, darling? Oh, well, that's much better. It's Grant. Grant? That's right. That doesn't register. From the way he talked, he must be the one Rose was going with while she was dating that old antique. You ever see this guy, Grant, before? No, but I'm sure he's the one she talked about. Really, it used to get so tiresome. Carl this and Carl does that. Oh. What? I said, oh. May, tell me, where did he say he was taking her clothes? Well, he didn't say. He just put them in that old truck. Thanks, and... sweetheart. See you later. I needed a fast car and a driver who could handle it, so I called Angelo Arsati. Twenty minutes later, we parked in front of Dupas' antique shop. There was a dim light on inside. Now, look, brother, there's really no reason for you to get mixed up in this thing. Oh, are you kidding, sir? Hmm. Looks like Dupai ain't going to answer. All right, let's see what this hunk of stone will do to the glass. Here. Hey, that got it. I can reach through to lock. Looks like nobody here. Well. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, I see him. Carl, what happened to you? Don't. Angie, call an ambulance. Tell him a man's been stabbed here. Yeah, right, Johnny. Dollar. Get to her before he can. To pa? Gonna kill Rose. You, you got to help her. To pa wants to kill her? Why? She, she found out. Smuggling. Is that what to has been up to? Smuggling in banana shipments. Rose found out. Where is she? He thought I'd killed her, but I love her. Yeah, well, look, tell me. You, you got to get to her before he dies. Where is she? Old Spanish fortress. Yeah? Out on Bayou Slidell. Old Spanish fortress on the Bayou Slidell. Yeah. You know where that is, Angie? Oh, sure. An old ruin out in the swamps north of town near the highway bridge. It goes over to the Gulf Coast. Carl, how long ago did DuPont leave? Ten or fifteen minutes. Yeah, well, we could beat him, Johnny, by cutting across the swamps. That is, if you could take it. What do you mean by that? Well, it's rugged. Like what? Johnny, did you ever ride a swamp buggy? <laughs> Brother, yeah. how much farther, Angie? Well, should be right up ahead. How can you tell? All I can see is swamp and marsh grass. Yeah, well, I've done a lot of trapping out here. I know the channel. Think we'll make the old ruins before Dupont? Well, we got to, don't we? Hey, that's it. That old wreck is called a fortress? Man, that's it. Well, get us up as close to it as you can. I don't see anybody parked... Somebody approaching the bridge. There we are. Come on, let's go. Uh, hey, hey, look, John. There she is at the side end. Yeah, I see. Rose! Rose Ellen! She's scared. She ducked back inside. Rose! We're friends of Carl's. He sent us to help you. Well, come on, Johnny. We can get inside to her through this here doorway. Okay. This place looks like it's about ready to fall apart. Rose! Yeah, man. Dark in here, too. Yeah, don't step on them falling bricks. Okay. Rose! Rose Ellen! Yes? Where's... Where's Carl? Dupont tried to kill him. Oh, no. Rose! Come on out here where we can see you. 
Rose! Pa, he found out that Carl didn't kill me, is that it? Yeah, but Carl's all right now. Look, Rose, I want you to tell me all you know about the fire at DuPas' shop. Were you there? Yes. Well, what happened? Pa had me tied up. Told Carl I'd found out what they were doing. Smuggling, I mean. He told Carl to kill me. He didn't know Carl and I was going to be married. Go on, go on. Carl argued with him. That's when the lamp got knocked over. They didn't stop arguing until DuPas said he'd kill us both. So finally, Carl told DuPas he'd take care of me. Well, he had to or DuPas would have killed us. But instead, Carl brought you here. Yes. Oh, come on, Johnny. Let's get out of this dark Wait a minute, Angie. Rose, do you know why DuPas was afraid to report his fire to the insurance company? Some of the things he smuggled in was lost in the fire. Anybody come poking around, they might have found out what he's doing. What was he smuggling? Do you know? Little tiny boxes filled with white powder, hidden in the bananas. Johnny, narcotics. Yeah, sure. No wonder he banks so much money so fast. I bank much more. That's how I get rid of you, Dollar. Look, look at that. There he is in the door. Yeah, watch it. See, I ain't fooling, Dollar. He can't see us. No, but what a target he makes in that doorway against the light. No gun, no. No, no. We can try one of these bricks. Yeah, man, but if you miss. Dollar! Wish me luck. Yeah. Dollar! Right here to pop! Come on. Oh, man, dear. You could qualify for the New York Yankees, Johnny. All right, Japa. On your feet. Let's get out of here. Expense account total, including rental on the swamp buggy, incidentals and transportation back to Hartford, $517.20. Remarks? Well, where he's going, Japa wouldn't have any use for the insurance money anyway. Carl Grant turned state's evidence and clinched the smuggling charges against him. Because of that, Carl may get off easy. I hope so. He and Rose could make a very happy couple. And a remarks and a report. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. If we are to remain alert to possible acts of aggression, we need the continuous operation of the Ground Observer Corps. And if the Ground Observer Corps is to remain on the job around the clock, seven days a week, your help is needed. Tomorrow, telephone your nearest civil defense center and volunteer a few hours of your time each week to the Ground Observer Corps. Join our Ground Observer Corps at the civil defense center nearest your home. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... Three sets of twins, two men, two girls, and two fires that hit the coast of Flora with the impact of a hurricane. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Forrest Lewis, Lou Merrill, Lawrence Dobkin, and Frank Gersel. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fortino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Earl Porman here. Porman? Uh, Tri-State Life and Casualty. I'm the branch office manager down here. Oh, sorry, Mr. Porman, but the answer is no. Uh, Well, this is an arson case, Dollar, and we're already having to make one payoff on it. I'm sorry, but it'll have to wait. I'm going to get as far away from this New England winter as I can. Well, for that, I don't blame you, but there's no reason you shouldn't come Look, I've had a rough year of it. I'm tired and I'm cold. And unless I can get down to where the warm, balmy breeze is wafted in... Dollar, I have got to have you on this case. There's a lot at stake. Now, my office is down here in... No, sir, I'm sorry. You see... Down here in Sarasota. I just can't do it, Mr. Foreman. I've already made a plane reservation for Sarasota, Florida. And this is one time I'm going to... Where did you say your branch office is? Sarasota, Florida. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the burning car matter. Expense account item one, which I'd thought I was going to have to absorb myself. $129, transportation and incidentals to Sarasota, Florida. It was nearly 5 p.m. when I got there, so instead of checking into a hotel, I taxied, that's item two, a dollar even, I taxied to Earl Foreman's office in the Conroy building. He turned out to be a tall, lanky, easygoing fellow with clear blue eyes and a ready smile. Sit in an office and talk business this time of day? You're in Florida now, Johnny. Well, I thought from your call this was a pretty urgent matter, Mr. Foreman. It is. Arson, you said. Yeah, probably, but here's no reason we can't go out to my little shack on the key and be comfortable while we talk about it. Besides, Mike will want you for dinner. Mike? Uh, My wife, Gertrude. Oh. Uh, Come on, my jalopy's right out at the curb. Come on, Johnny. Poor man was a misnomer for this man because his jalopy turned out to be a spanking new Cadillac, complete with air conditioning and all the fixings. And the shack, anything but. It was on St. Armand's Key across Sarasota Bay from the mainland, a beautiful two-story concrete and stucco job. The big yard backed on a quiet bayou, and there tied up at a private dock was a 24-foot lap strake speedboat, ideal for fishing the Gulf of Mexico. After all, as long as you're down here on expense account. Yeah, but it's charged to your company, remember? Oh. <laughs> hey, there she is at the door. Huh? The big, fat, overbearing broad I'm married to. This was another switch. For Earl's wife standing in the doorway was the cutest little trick I'd seen in a long time. Petite, pretty, and blonde... And with eyes that you noticed right away because they were almost green. Eyes that suddenly narrowed as she looked at me. And I wondered why. Johnny? Dollar, did you say? That's right. Insurance investigator down here to look into those fires. Oh. Any objections? No. No, of course not. Just set your bags here in the hall, Johnny. All right, thanks. And wouldn't you like a drink after your long trip? Yeah, and you can get me one, too. Scotch, Johnny? Martin ZVO. Oh, great. Well, soda, please. Yeah, sit down, sit down. Thanks. I, uh, I take it Mike isn't too interested in the insurance business, huh? <laughs> uh, you know, she used to be a singer, dancer. Oh, well, this is a little different. But now, tell me all. Well, actually, I guess we ought to wait until Arnold Carr gets back. Carr? Uh, Carr Brothers, Lumber Enterprises. Arnold runs the business, and his brother Edward... <laughs> Well, Ed just shares the profits. Real black sheep of the family, from what I've been able to learn. Oh. Anyway, they have yards all over the state. There's one here in Sarasota, one up the coast a ways at Fort Pierce, and still another at Arcadia. That's about 40 miles inland, just east of here. And there was one up in Orlando. Was? Completely destroyed by fire a couple of weeks ago. And a $120,000 claim has been filed. A hundred and... Wow. That's where Arnold Carr is, then, in Orlando, trying to clear things up. Here's your drink. Oh, thanks. Here, Earl. Yeah. Well, to the gods and goddesses and us. But shouldn't I be up in Orlando, then? Uh, Arnold's on his way back here now. He lives here. 
He just went up there to arrange for clearing off and selling the property. You mean he's planning to just pocket the money? If Tri-State pays off, I mean. Looks like it. But I take it you suspect arson. Yes, Earl suspects arson, Johnny, and so does Arnold Carr. At least he says he does, but they have no reason. No? How about the other fires? Or attempted fires? Oh, where? At Arcadia, for one, but they got it out in time. At least that's the way Arnold Carr reported it. The way he tells it... Let me tell it, Mike. There was another at the yard here in Sarasota. Arnold himself discovered it one night when he was just driving around. But nothing to indicate it was attempted arson. No, well, uh, and the authorities up in Orlando found no indication of it there. Mike, you know as well as I do that a lumberyard fire will obliterate signs of arson better than any other kind of fire in the world. Yeah, uh, but she has a point, though, Earl. Unless there's some evidence of arson. Of course. Yeah, why send for me? Well, mostly because... Actually, of... because Arnold Carr suspects him. But he's given you no real reason. None at all. I think he has a real reason, but he just won't tell us. Wait till you see him. He's going to call when he gets in. We'll run over to his place on Longboat Key. What about his brother? Edward, did you say? I've never met him. He's always stayed in Orlando. I was wondering if he might tell things that Arnold is holding back. Oh, Ed? Edward Carr wouldn't know anything. Uh, you can never be too sure. Ed, Ed, uh, look, why can't you agree with me for a... Uh, that must be Arnie now. Excuse me. Hello? Uh... This is Arnold Carr. Oh, hi, Arnie. Uh, Johnny Dollar arrived, so we'll be... Uh, well, here, I'll let you talk to him. Here, Johnny. Uh, no. Okay. No, Earl, listen. What? Uh, I told you before it was arson. It was arson again tonight. Tonight? What's that? Uh, Arcadia just went up in flames. The whole yard. Good Lord. Did you hear that, Johnny? Yeah, I heard it. Well, can you prove it was arson uh, tonight in Arcadia and before in Orlando? I... I have proof. Well, Arnie, we'll be over just as fast no. as... No. What? No. Wait for me there at your home. Well, but look now. You mustn't come here. And I, I mustn't stay here because I... I... Uh, now, listen, man. You, uh, uh, Arnie? Well, I guess he's ready to tell us now. A suspicion began to grow in my mind. A suspicion that Mike apparently shared with me, that Arnold Carr himself might be responsible for the fires. After all, he was the only one who had seemed to know about the two unsuccessful attempts. He himself had planted the idea of arson. He'd lost no time in filing claim for the Orlando burnout. But Earl said I was wrong. Arnold was too honest a man. Earl had also said we were only 15 minutes from Carr's home. So when half an hour passed, we called him back, got a busy signal. After the fourth try, the three of us took off in Earl's cab. As we pulled into Carr's driveway, we could see him through the picture window, sitting at his desk, telephone in hand, apparently engrossed in a call. Then, as we walked up to the door, I noticed something else. Arnold Carr looked enough like me to be my brother. Maybe that explained Mike's reaction when she first saw me. Hey, Arnie! Can't you see? He's on the phone in there. Well, the least he can do is hear his own doorbell. Earl, wait. Good Lord. What's the matter? Through the window. Oh, no. Earl? Stand back. Earl, for heaven's sake, what is it? Couldn't you see from out there? No, what's wrong? I... I... Well, Johnny... Right through the forehead, Earl. Looks like a thirty-eight. Before I could stop him, Earl took the phone out of the dead man's hand and called headquarters. Mike turned pale and slumped into a chair. And I gave the place a quick rundown, checked doors, windows, etc. A few minutes later, an officious young sergeant named Larkin arrived and took over. Thirty-eight caliber, straight through the middle of the forehead. Were all three of you here when it happened? Mr. Foreman, Mrs. Foreman, and uh, who are you? The answer to your first question, Sergeant, is no, none of us was here. And this is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Yeah. You insurance guys work pretty fast. You related to Mr. Carr? No, why? You look a little like him. Who busted in the front door? The killer? I did. When we drove up, we saw Mr. Carr sitting there at his desk. We rang the doorbell and knocked, but... And when he didn't move, you took things in your own hands and busted in, huh? That's right. You haven't moved anything, have you? No. Except I took the phone out of his hand to call you. Dollar, if you're any kind of investigator, you should have known better than let him touch anything. Now, now, let's see. The shot must have come from somewhere near this window by the fire. Ah, sure, here we are. Bullet hole right through the pane. Bullet was fired from outside. 
You're sure, Sergeant? Sure, I'm sure. Look for yourself. You call yourself an investigator? Hey, Cummings, will they? Check the area around that window beside the chimney out there for footprints. Maybe an empty cartridge case. Now, you folks get out of here so I can call Doc Hanley over and get on with my investigation. And no, Dollar, I don't need any of your help. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Your job is fires, not... Hey, where did Mrs. Foreman go? Out to the car. Why? Who told her she could leave? Who told her she had to sit here looking at a corpse? All right, Dollar, all right. Just be sure the three of you stick around town in case I decide to question you further. Oh, of course, Sergeant. Yeah. Yeah. Not shot by somebody standing outside? What do you mean, Johnny? Oh, I spotted that bullet hole in the window, too. So? I also noticed there were no particles of glass on the inside sill. But there were some on the outside. Yeah. The shot that made that hole was fired from inside that room to make it look as though it had come from outside. Then somebody was in there with Arnold Carr. Yeah. Either somebody he let in or who had normal access to the house. And he had to stop Arnold from talking about the fire in Arcadia. Hey, how much do you know about his brother, Edward? Well, nothing really outside of what Arnold told me. Was either of them married? Family of any sort? Arnie wasn't. But I... Arnold's death means Edward will own the business then. Well... Yes. And he lives up in Orlando, scene of the first big fire. Yes, very good heavens. Johnny, you don't think his own brother... Where can I rent a car? Take Mike's Chevy. It's in the carport at the house. But what are you going to do? Drive up to Orlando by way of Arcadia. When I got to Arcadia, only a few people were standing around the remains of the fire. One hose company was still working on it, and a couple of police were poking about in the embers. Walking toward it, I almost stumbled over a little old man sitting alone in the darkness beside a palm tree, hunched over, his head in his hands, sobbing. He didn't even look up when I stopped beside him. It's like losing part of my own life, it is. You, uh, you lost someone in the fire, sir? No, son. Only part of my life. I helped build up that yard, me and Mr. Arnie. Arnold Carr. All along, he's been worried about it. And last week, when him and me smelled smoke and come over here and put out the barrel of trash that was smoldering, he knew. Knew what? That somebody was trying to burn him out? That's why he stopped by tonight on his way home. That's why we drove over here, him and me. And I brought my gun just in case. Yeah. Well, we got here too late. It was already blazing. And when he seen the automobile pulling away... What auto? Yes, Frank, he said to me. I knowed he was the one trying to burn me out, he said. Who? Who, old timer? Who do you mean? He he didn't say. Then he called the fire department. That car that pulled away, what was it? Just an auto, big white Buick. But he tied it in with whoever set the fire. All he said was, I knowed he was the one. Do you know who it was he meant? Well. He told me even if I did know, I should never tell. Even the police. Well, who do you think it was? Break my word to Mr. Arnie? Uh Uh-uh. Never, son. All right, look, old man, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. Mr. Arnie's dead. What? But he... But he can't be. He was... You. Huh? Uh, Maybe you thought in the darkness I wouldn't know you. But I do know you, you... Oh, you, now, just a minute, old timer. If Mr. Arnie's dead, it's because you killed him. What? Just like you set the fire. No, no, I'm not who you and think I'll I am. I'll kill you. That's what I'll do. Put down that gun. I'll kill you. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Back in the old days, the very old days, that is, a girl named Cassandra had a corner on the Oracle market. But nowadays, you can do some foretelling yourself. On Jukebox Jury, for example, you can help decide which of Tin Pan Alley's new recordings are destined for the hit brackets and which ones are likely to spiral all the way down to oblivion. Remember, Jukebox Jury is yours to hear on most of these same stations every Sunday. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the burning car matter. A 
Expense account, item three, $5.15, gas for the borrowed Chevy to keep me going to Orlando. Either the old man's eyesight was bad or he was just a lousy shot. Either way, it was okay by me. I hated to slap him down, but there was no point hanging around Arcadia trying to explain things to the local authorities. So after making sure I hadn't really hurt him, I appropriated his gun and took off fast. He'd thought I was someone else. Even I had noticed a family-type resemblance to myself in Arnold Carr. Sergeant Larkin had asked me if I was related to him. And now the old man at the fire had apparently thought I was the one who... Oh, well, I'm afraid I made the rest of the trip to Orlando in somewhat less than legal time. And at police headquarters, I barged into the office of Lieutenant Cal Hudson without bothering to be announced. So early in the morning? Sit down while I finish up report, Mr. Carr. Uh, thanks. I was trying to reach you, but we got no answer to the phone at your house. Well, that's very interesting, Lieutenant. I'm afraid I have the painful duty of notifying you that your brother Arnold down in Sarasota last night... Why did you say very interesting, Mr. Carr? Or had you already learned... Well, I'll be doggone. Yeah. You're not the first one. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I can't believe it. You... Dollar, you look enough like Edward Carr to be his twin. You even sound a lot like him. I take it you haven't located Edward yet? Well, no. Lieutenant... I think Edward Carr is the firebug we're after. And the killer. Wait a minute. Briefly as possible, I told him of Arnold Carr's phone call to Earl Foreman. His emotional upset just before he was killed. I told him Arnold had been murdered by someone inside the house, someone close to him. And that everything indicated that someone could very well be Edward Carr. That's still all just theory, Dollar, without any proof. I will admit that Edward is a pretty worthless playboy living off the profits of the lumberyard. In any event, the lieutenant promised to put out an APB on Edward Carr. That was at breakfast for the two of us, item four, three dollars and a quarter. Before I left him, he gave me Ed Carr's address, 1726 Allen Place. As I expected, there was no answer to the doorbell at 1726, so I tried visiting up the street. It quickly became clear that Ed Carr wasn't very popular in this otherwise quiet, well-ordered neighborhood. Those big, noisy parties at all hours of the night, cars parked up and down the street, blocking respectable people's driveways. Yes, ma'am, You know, well... once in a while you expect a person to have callers and such. Me, I have the Ladies' Bridge Club every third Wednesday, for instance. Well, that's nice. But these are all ladies, not like some of the trash that that man and his friends have, dancing and drinking and carrying on at all hours. Yes, you mentioned cars, Mrs. You know, Oh, people like Mrs. Herford Robbins. She's awfully nice. And Janet Osterworthy. Now, she's a widow. Well, and you know, she could have her pick of anybody she likes. But does she ever look at another man? No, sir. And then there's Mrs. Mrs. Harper. Uh, yes? You mentioned cars. Do you know what kind Mr. Carr drove? Why, yes. It was a big white one. And the make? Well, no. My husband, when he was alive, always drove a Maxwell, and I guess that's the only kind I ever got to know by name. But Mr. Cars is white. Only I guess that isn't much help to you, is it? All the white cars here in Florida, I mean. Look. Now, even that blonde hussy who's around him all the time drives a white car. Oh, I really shouldn't use a word like that, though, should I? But it fits Wait a minute. What blonde, Mrs. Harper? Mr. Dollar. I don't pay any attention to people like that. Why, you'd think she owned that house of his. The way she keeps popping in and out all hours as if she belonged there. Mrs. Harper. And drives all the way up from Sarasota, too. Do you know who she is? I do not. I refuse to pay any attention to people like... And the way she dresses, too, like a newly rich chorus girl with all her fancy clothes and furs and things. How do you know she comes from Sarasota? By the license on her car, of course. Every city has its own number. You know that very well. And hers is 12WW something. And you don't know her name? Of course not. Flaunting all those expensive furs as though she bought and paid for them herself. And if there's anything I hate to see, it's a little shrimp loaded down with furs. Now, a tall person I like see. me and well, her thanks. eyes... <gasps> if there's anyone I don't trust, it's a person with green eyes. Well, Thank you, Mrs. You... Harper. Her description of Carr's girlfriend stopped me in my tracks. That description could fit Mike Poorman to the letter. Petite, blonde, green eyes, and she came from Sarasota. And then I remembered Mike's reaction when she first saw me. 
Her dismissal of Edward as a possible suspect. There was obvious friction between Earl and Mike, too. I figured it was just normal in a couple who'd been married for a while. But now... Item 5, a dollar thirty phone call from the nearest booth I could find to Earl Poorman at his office in Sarasota. No, she isn't, Johnny. Why? Well, do you know where Mike is? When I woke up this morning, I could hear her talking to her girlfriend, Betty, on the phone downstairs. Betty? Uh, Betty lives here in Sarasota. They used to be on the stage together, sister act, you know. Yeah, well... Uh... Uh, well, then when I went down for breakfast, she was gone. Took my car, too. I had to come here to the office in a taxi. Yeah, well, okay, Earl. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah now, wait a minute. How are you doing? You found out anything I ought to know about this arson and murder business? Uh, no, Earl. Nothing that you need to worry about. Meyer. I sat down at a corner drugstore. That's item five, 80 cents, over a sandwich and a Coke to try to think things out. But I'm afraid I didn't like anything that I thought. Finally, I drove over to Allen Place again. I parked a couple of blocks away and walked to 1726. I rang the front doorbell, knocked a couple of times. Then I slipped around to the back door, finagled a lock on it with a little celluloid pocket calendar, finally got it open. I left it open for the sake of a quick exit if such became necessary. But I guess that was a mistake. For a couple of minutes later, as I rounded a corner from the den into the living room, I felt the barrel of a gun poked into my back. Out of town, huh? Eh? Now, wait a minute. Don't move, Eddie boy. Trying to stall off, pay me the five grand by saying you're going to be out of town, huh? Okay, so you think I'm Edward Carr. You kidding. Don't you know what happens when somebody tries to stall me? This! I don't know exactly how long I was out, but when I came to, it was dark. Except for the glow from a streetlight outside. And what roused me was the sound of footsteps, feminine steps, cautiously entering the back door. Then, briefly silhouetted against a window, I saw a trim, petite figure that was all too familiar coming toward me. And she saw me, too. Oh, darling, you're hurt. What happened? Uh, what do you think? Who did this? Who struck you? You don't know? Yes, of course. It was Tony. Because you didn't pay him soon enough for the Arcadia job. Here, Eddie, let me help you. No, no, just let me rest for a minute. I thought that was Tony I passed on the road in from Sarasota. Why'd you come over from Sarasota? To see you. I knew you'd be here. Oh, why? Why? So the police could surprise you with the news of your poor dear brother's death. But why did you come to the house? Because I hoped you'd come here, I guess. Eddie, you should have waited until I could raise the money to pay off Tony. You mean for killing Arnold, too? Of course. No. Are you trying to say you didn't kill Arnold? But I saw you from outside in the Buick. You'd swear to that, wouldn't you? I, I don't know what you... Eddie, you sound like you don't trust me. We're in this thing together. Yeah, you sure of that? What are you talking about? Whose idea was it to knock off Arnold? But you had to. When he saw you at Arcadia, he, he knew that you were having the yards burned up. That's the way you figured it from the beginning, wasn't it? Now look, baby. First burn up the lumber yards and collect the insurance on them. Then convince me that you and I should have it all by putting Arnold out of the way. But you had to kill Ar... I don't understand you, Eddie. Yeah... I wish I didn't understand you, Mike. Mike? Come on. Let's turn on the light. No. No. Somebody sees us. Eddie, you... Who... Who are you? Are you kidding, Mike? I... Wait a minute. Who are you? You're that insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, that Mike told me. Let me out of here. Oh, no, you don't. You're staying right here. Mike Poorman's sister, aren't you? Well? Oh, sister. So we once did a sister act before she married that poor man guy. Now, let, let me go. Not by a long shot. You may as well, Dollar. What? Eddie. Don't move, Dollar. Get his gun, Betty. Get it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Here, Ed. Good. Ed Carr, huh? That's right. And you know, we do look alike, you and me. Yeah, sure. Enough for Betty here to have told me all I need to know. Don't believe him, Eddie. He's lying. I heard, No, baby. Eddie, I, I thought he was you. Don't you see? Sure, him? sure. Why'd you come up here anyway? Because Mike told me that Dollar was coming up here. You've been shooting off your mouth to her, too? She knew about us. She thought you might have something to do with the fire. She was my friend. She was trying to get me out of this whole mess, and I wish I'd listened to well, her. Well, it's too late now, baby. Eddie, what are you going to do? Now i got to get rid of both of them. No! And figure some way to shut up Tony's mouth. Ed, please! You know you'd never get away with it, Carl. Oh, no, I'll call him. That's what I'll do. 
Yeah, Betty, and he'll come here to get his money. Then I'll call the police, see? Tell him to come right away. Tell him I found out about you having Tony start the fire. What? That's right, that you had him burn up the yard so there'd be even more money for you to bleed from me, like all the dough you got from crazy. me already. You're crazy, Ed. I'll tell the police to meet me here. And when they come in, it'll just be in time to see me kill Tony in self-defense. After getting here too late to save you, I'll tell them. You're out of your mind. They'll check that gun of yours so fast. And that'll prove it. Because the only shot out of my gun will be the one that gets Tony. This gun of yours is the one that's going to knock you two off. And they'll think it's Tony. Oh, Eddie, please, you're drunk. Are you crazy? Crazy to save my own life, to keep you and Tony and Dollar from putting a noose around my neck? If you think that harebrained scheme of yours will ever work, you're it's off your rocker. It's got to work, because it's my only chance. So it's going to work now. <laughs> Thanks, Lieutenant. I'm afraid I was too late to save it, Johnny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But Eddie Carl lived to face a jury. What brought you here anyhow? I did, Johnny. Mike, stay there. Stay right here, Mike. I know. I don't want to see it. She was my friend. Where's Earl? I came alone. When I talked to Betty this morning, I knew your suspicions about Ed were right because, you see, I knew Betty and Ed were going together. Earl didn't know. Yeah. Maybe you better call him. Expense account item six, nine dollars eighty cents, gas and incidentals for the drive for the two of us back to Sarasota. Remarks? Betty, of course, has already paid for her part in the deal. And I guess it's pretty obvious what'll happen to Ed Carr and Tony Ricardo. The insurance money in the Carr estates will be distributed according to Florida law. Further remarks, the apparent friction between Earl and Mike was only part of a normal married life. They're a pretty nice pair. Oh, and I thoroughly enjoyed three days of fishing in the Gulf, thanks to Earl. Expense account total, including all the incidentals I could think of, Three eighty-five twenty-six. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. You don't have to be an efficiency expert to figure out that it's easier to lend your support to several worthwhile fundraising campaigns all at once than it would be helping one campaign at a time. That kind of efficiency is yours to enjoy through the United Community Campaigns. CBS Radio hopes that when the United Community Campaigns are underway in your town, that you'll remember how much good you can accomplish with one gesture of support. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case with a real twist. One that I think will just about tear your heart out. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harley Bear, Victor Perrin, Bob Bruce, Harry Bartell, Vivi Janus, Tony Barrett, and Junius Matthews. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, my name is Hardy, Mr. Dollar. Yes? I'm returning the call you made to Mr. Ellis Rasmussen. If you will state your business, I shall be glad to transmit it to him. You tell Mr. Rasmussen I'm an insurance investigator from Hartford and the matter involves a member of his own family. Oh, uh, young Mr. Rasmussen? Yes. Uh, oh, uh, could you hold on a moment, sir? I could. Uh, Mr. Rasmussen will send a car for you at six o'clock. Look, I can take a cab. It does... Oh, well. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Rasmussen matter. Expense account item one, $204.35. Airfare from Hartford to San Francisco to Los Angeles. Trying to compile the details of the Rasmussen case. I'd been on it three days when I was stonewalled in Los Angeles with a Holmby Hills address and the phone number of Ellis Rasmussen. At six o'clock, a liveried chauffeur in immaculate uniform stepped up to me at the desk. Mr. Dollar? Yes? My name is Stauffer, sir. I have Mr. Rasmussen's car outside. Well, gee whiz, Stauffer. (laughs) Ain't it the truth, sir? A few minutes later, when we turned into the lush green Holmby Hills section, I had a suspicion I was about to deal with a bona fide millionaire. When we parked in front of the big two-story colonial home and a man with graying hair and swallowtail coat stepped out of the door... Well, I knew I was going to meet the real article. I'm Hardy, sir. Hello, Hardy. Uh, Mr. Rasmussen is waiting for you. Uh, This way, please. We stopped in front of a huge panel door. Hardy tapped on it once, then pulled on the knob. As we entered, a tall man with a shock of pure white hair rose from his chair and turned toward us. Uh, This is Mr. Dollar, Mr. Rasmussen. I want about four fingers of sour mash. What do you want? You took the words right out of my mouth, Mr. Rasmussen. Uh, Very good, sir. He's a pretty nice fellow. We're all pretty nice fellows around here, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Thanks. Could you hand me that lighter? Oh, sure. Here. Thank you. What are you doing in Los Angeles? Why, federal underwriters of Hartford wrote a blanket policy for all Imperial Rubber Company employees... Your son was an executive with Imperial when he was killed in Malaya last spring. Federal owes his widow $25,000. I don't know where she is, Mr. Dollar. I see. I doubt if you do. Let me put it this way. I never met the young lady. Fred married her one night in Elko, Nevada. Two days later, they were on their way to Malaya. Six months there, and the development station was raided by guerrillas one night. And... I suddenly no longer have a son. Have you eaten your dinner, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I wouldn't want to trouble you. Uh, Hardy, set a place for Mr. Dollar. Uh, very good, sir. Well? Well, I thought she might phone me when she got back to the States. She never did. Never a letter, nothing. I'm old and sick, but I still want to see the girl my son married. Not an easy thing to lose a son, Mr. Dollar. And I lost a good one. I lost the best son a man ever had. I'm sure you did, sir. To your son. To Fred. During dinner and afterward over coffee and the cares, I listened to the story of Ellis Rasmussen's life. It came from the lips of an old man who was dying but in whose eyes I could see reflected the memories of a brawling, bustling life that started in an Oklahoma oil field and moved to Alaska and Arabia and Africa. More and more during the talk, I began to know his lost son. For in everything the old man had to say about himself, I could sense an unmistakable reflection of his son. Finally, I thanked him and left. 
Uh, if I may say so, I do hope you'll call soon again, sir. Mr. Rasmussen enjoyed your visit very much. I haven't seen him so much like his old self since we received the terrible news of young Mr. Rasmussen's death. He must have been quite a man, Hardy, young Fred Rasmussen. Uh, he was, sir. All of us miss him dreadfully. None of us ever met Mrs. Rasmussen, and we were most anxious to receive her, especially after young Mr. Fred's death. I imagine so. Uh, the car is all ready, Mr. Dollar. Uh, good night, sir. Good night, Hardy. Fine night, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Stomper. Uh, yes, sir? I didn't want to press the point with Mr. Rasmussen, but... Now, maybe you can straighten me out. Did he approve of his son's marriage? Mm, let's put it this way, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Rasmussen approved of Mr. Fred. And if Mr. Fred got himself married, then Mr. Rasmussen approved of the girl. Between them two, they had that kind of understanding. Real people. Expense account item two, $1.98, telegram. To Personnel Division, Imperial Rubber Company, requesting a copy of all information they might have on Laura Olson Rasmussen. Item three, six dollars, one long-distance phone call to the Universal Agent working the case in San Francisco. Mrs. Rasmussen left the Malaya Peninsula by boat from a town called Cochetti three days after the news of her husband's death. A week later, she booked plane passage in Hong Kong with Trans-Pacific Airlines. She changed planes in Honolulu. She cleared the port authority in San Francisco. From there on, we lost her. Get a list of all the passengers who were on that plane. Okay. Get someone checking the hotels in the Bay Area. She might have checked into one when she hit Frisco. Okay. Now listen, we're looking for a woman whose husband was brutally murdered about two weeks before she got back to the States. If she's anything like I think, she was probably about at the end of a rope. Now start asking questions at places where people like that go. Right. <laughs> On Wednesday morning, I rented a car. That's item four, twenty-five dollars and made the rounds. First stop, Los Angeles Board of Education. By four o'clock in the afternoon, I had found 35 Laura Olsons who had attended public school in Los Angeles and were more or less in the proper age bracket. The next day, the folder arrived from Imperial Rubber Company. Among other things, it contained a passport picture and a complete description of Laura Olson Rasmussen. She was a blonde girl with a pouting, sultry kind of mouth and wide, dark eyes. Yes? What do you want? I'm looking for Mrs. Frances Olson. Are you Mrs. Olson? I don't want to buy nothing. Do you have a daughter named Laura Olson? Are you a policeman? No, I'm an insurance investigator. I'm trying to locate Laura Olson Rasmussen. Well, how'd you get this address? What's that? A picture of her. I see. Ask my Laura what about her. I've been trying to locate her for some time. Is she here? No, no, she ain't here. She ain't been here for five years. Do you have any idea where I can find her? Friends, maybe? Other relatives? <laughs> you say her name's Rasmussen now? Yes, she married a man named Fred Rasmussen. Married? Well, ain't that just something? You didn't know your daughter had been married, Mrs. Olson? How would I know? How would I know anything about her? Saturday at noon, a registered letter arrived from the agent in San Francisco containing the list of passengers who had been on the plane with her. Three of the names were in the Los Angeles area, including a Mr. Oberlin, who lived in Pasadena. For sure, I remember her. Real pretty. We sat together all the way from Honolulu. <laughs> What's up? We're trying to locate her, Mr. Oberlin. Did she happen to mention her plans when she returned to the States? Plans? You know, what hotel she might be staying at in San Francisco? Or if she was going on to another city? Uh-uh. <laughs> no, 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 not her. You say that very emphatically. Yeah, I guess I do. <laughs> you didn't have to show me a picture. You know, a guy always prays he'll meet someone like her on a plane, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, live it up. Yesterday's gone, she said tomorrow ain't here, and the only thing we got is today. Yeah, we had a swell time. You're sure about this? We were pretty chummy, pal, if you want the truth of it. Mr. Roblin... Did she mention anything about being in Malaya before she boarded that plane? Uh-uh. Then she didn't tell you that her husband had been killed a week before. Killed? Oh. He was murdered by gorillas in Malaya. Well, no, she didn't mention that. She didn't mention that at all, Mr. Dollar.
Johnny Dollar. Uh, this is Hardy, Mr. Dollar. How are you, Hardy? How's Mr. Rasmussen? He's not so well, sir. That's why I called. Could you possibly find time to visit him? Tonight? Uh, may I send a car right away? Is it serious? He's dying, sir. I knew why he wanted to see me. Have you located my daughter-in-law yet? No, I haven't located her, Mr. Rasmussen. But I know something about her. I know she drank whiskey and flirted with a fat salesman on an airplane all the way from Honolulu to San Francisco. I know her mother's a drunk. I know she didn't think enough of you or your son to contact you or anybody else when she got back. Mr. Rasmussen, it looks to me like your daughter-in-law is a first-class bum. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Our daily lives are sharply affected by world news. And for a complete roundup of the news every single weekday evening, just keep your dial on CBS Radio for the news broadcasts of our famous CBS newsmen, Edward R. Murrow and Lowell Thomas. Hear up-to-the-minute news with Edward R. Murrow and Lowell Thomas on CBS Radio. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Rasmussen Matter. There was a black coupe with M.D. on the license parked in the driveway of the Rasmussen house when we pulled up. In the bedroom, a silvery-haired man in a black suit was sitting beside the bed that held Ellis Rasmussen. He was introduced as Dr. Butler. Then I shook the hand of Mr. Rasmussen. Someone suggested that Dr. Butler might like to use the library for his calls. And I was alone with the old man. If you want some whiskey, uh, keep it in the sideboard over there. Uh, not now, thanks. I, uh... I wish I had some news for you, Mr. Rasmussen. We're finding out things, but we haven't found her yet. What things? Oh, things. Nothing important. Dollar, if I judge you right, you know your business. And if you haven't found my daughter-in-law by now, you've certainly found out what kind of person she is. So tell me. I haven't met her. I don't know. You're being evasive. I don't work for you, Mr. Rasmussen. I'm an insurance investigator trying to locate a woman and pay off a claim. If I don't find her, the case will just have to sit. Unless you or someone else concerned makes a report to missing persons. Then the cops can take over, and maybe they should right now. My son was a fine man. I can look back on all the years I had with him and be proud of every year and every day. He married a girl named Laura Olson. I don't know where she came from or who she was... But I know my son wouldn't have married her unless he loved her, unless she loved him in return and was worthy of his love. You know a lot, Mr. Rasmussen. Perhaps I should go to the police. No. No, don't do that. We'll find her, Mr. Rasmussen. We're getting it narrowed down. Well, I'd better leave now. As you say. Uh, Mr. Dollar. Yes, sir? I want to see her. Yes, sir. I'm sorry I talked to you the way I did. Phone call for you, Mr. Dollar. Would you like to take it in there? Oh, yeah, sure. Keep an eye on him, Hardy. Uh, trust me, sir. Johnny Dollar. This is Officer Daly, Los Angeles Police. Oh, yeah. You the insurance guy looking for a Laura Olson Rasmussen? Yeah, have you got anything? We got her. Huh? She's here with the rest of the girls in the drunk tank. A drunk tank will always smell of disinfectant. This one was no different. There are no bunks, no chairs, no blankets, no nothing. So you stand to sit on a concrete floor and wait for something to happen. The legal period is 24 hours. You get rebooked or you get released. It all depends. What's the story on her, Dollar? I've got a check for $25,000 for her. Gee, insurance money? Yeah. Quiet! 
Quiet in there. All right, quiet down. You girls better learn to get along. Which one? Back there, sitting on the floor. Oh, good. What's the situation? If somebody comes up with bail, they're going to have her. Expense account item seven, one hundred dollars bail. While I was waiting around, Officer Daly broke open a file on her. A dozen aliases, a dozen charges, and one conviction for shoplifting. A career of petty thievery that began at the age of 16 and ran up into a 22nd year. Expense account item A, $35 telegrams. I sent wires to all parties concerned, all parties except Ellis Rasmussen, ordering a stop on their activities since Laura Olson Rasmussen had been found. Who are you? My name's Johnny Dollar. Thanks for getting me out. Why? I did it for a friend. Friend? I didn't know I had any. Expense account item nine, 20 cents, two cups of coffee. We had it in the diner across from the women's section of the main jail. I looked at Laura Olson Rasmussen while she drank the coffee. Looked at the blonde hair and the wide eyes and the pouting mouth. Looked at the woman who had once been the wife of Fred Rasmussen. What's the catch, mister? No catch. You put up a hundred dollars for me. I don't know you from a load of coal. No, you don't. Where do you live? I've been staying at the Piedmont Hotel. You know where it is? No. No, not many people do. Especially people with clean shirts. What have you been doing since you got back from Malaya? I've been getting along. You got something to do with Fred? You know about Malaya? I know about a lot of things. I've been looking for you for a month. So what? Why didn't you contact your father-in-law when you got back? Why should I? What would he care about me? He never met me. What do I mean to him? Right now, since he no longer has a son, you mean everything to him. You're kidding me, mister. I wish I was kidding you. I wish to heaven I was kidding you. Well, what now? Oh, I want you to come over to my hotel with oh, me. Oh, now, look. Just sign it... some papers... I have a check for $25,000 for you. What was that? Your husband was insured. You're his beneficiary. All you have to do is fill out an application. I'll give you the check. I don't believe it. It's true. Come on. Expense account item 10, $2, cab fare to my hotel. I took her upstairs with me, stood over her while she filled out the necessary papers. Outside of that, we didn't say a word. Johnny Dollar. Uh, this is Stoffer, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Hardy asked me to phone you to see if there's any word. Oh, yes. Well, uh, what'll I tell him, Mr. Dollar? Tell him no luck yet, Stoffer. How is... How is the old man? About the same, sir. Counting on you, I think. I'll talk to you later. Yes, sir. Here you are. Okay. Thanks. Here's your check. Anything else? Nope. That's it. Okay. See you around sometime. Sure. Fred told me about a man named Stoffer who worked for his old man for years. Was that him on the phone just now? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know what I was going to say to the old man, but I did know I was hoping that if Rasmussen had to die, that he'd die before anybody told him the kind of daughter-in-law I'd turned up. I didn't want to be in on that. Expense account item 11, $83, hotel bill. I checked out at 5.30, picked up my airline tickets at the desk, that's item 12, then sat around the lobby for five minutes. Item 13, two drinks for myself. Mr. Dollar? Yeah? Oh. I read in the paper that 
Ellis Rasmussen is dying. Is that true? That's true. Can I sit down? Suit yourself. What are you drinking? Nothing. I know why you didn't tell them you found me, and I don't blame you. Fred's dad is anything like Fred was, and I know how you felt finding me the way you did. Let's forget it, Mrs. Rasmussen, shall we? I'd like to meet Fred's father. So you want to meet him, huh? The human thing would have been to see him when you came back. But not a line, not a word. That old man in that house knows his son was really a man. And on that basis, he believes without seeing you that his son married a real woman. He had love and sympathy and help and devotion and, and all the things you don't seem to have any use for waiting for you in that house. He... Oh, never mind. I loved Fred. Loved him from the first minute I saw him. You know what I was doing when I saw him? I was serving cocktails in a place like this. He didn't ask me what kind of a family I came from. Whether I was good or bad. He just put one of those big arms around me one night and said, you're mine. He said that to me. He said it because he loved me. No one ever loved me. No one. <laughs> but he did. I told him who I was and where I came from, and all he said was, you're with me now. We, we went to Malaya together, and I never knew in all of my life what I knew then. How it was to be wanted by someone who was decent, kind. And then he was killed. He told me one afternoon when I was in Kachetti. I took a boat and then I took a plane back here. Go on. I want to see Fred's father... I took a car to the house and I saw what kind of a house and what kind of people his family were. I didn't go in. Couldn't you see me, cheap, rotten, dirty little me? Couldn't you see me walking in there and saying, I'm me? Couldn't you see that mother of mine moving in? What would that have done to the old man? It would have crushed out his whole memory of Fred. But don't think, Mr. Dollar, I haven't got my memory, too. I didn't drink that away. I was... I was loved by a man. And I loved him back. I've still got that. I'm going out there pretty soon. Would you like to meet him? I think I can. I think so. I think so very much. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I've been waiting in the lobby. I thought you might be here. Uh, how'd you do, miss? Stoffer, I'd like you to meet Mrs. Rasmus. Well, my, my. I'm mighty pleased to meet you. The boss will be mighty happy. She dried her eyes in the car. I didn't say much. She didn't say much. But in the half hour it took to get out to Holmby Hill, something happened to her again. The something that must have happened when the big arm went around her shoulders the first time. Good evening. Mrs. Rasmussen, Hardy. How do you do, Mrs. Rasmussen? We're very happy to see you. Thank you, Hardy. Fred spoke of you often. That was kind of Fred. Uh, this way, please. Come in, come in. Uh, I think you can introduce Mrs. Rasmussen, Mr. Dollar. Uh, ring if you need me, sir. I'm scared. Laura, if there ever was a man for you not to be scared of, it's that man in there. Oh, how, how can I tell him about myself? I've been in jail. I can't... Watch. 
Well, Mr. Dollar, come in. I'd... I brought someone for you to meet, Mr. Rasmussen. Come here. You'd be my son's Laura. Yes, you're Laura. Hello. Yes. Oh, now, there, there, here, here. Now, look, look, us Rasmussens mustn't meet like this with tears. There's so much I have to tell you. No, there's nothing you have to tell me. What? Let me put my arm around you. There. Now, feel it. Mm Mm-hmm. You're my daughter. Do you understand that? Yes. Oh, yes. Then that's all the explanations we need between us. Yes. Uh, uh, Hardy, Hardy. Uh, yes, Mr. Rasmussen? Uh, bring, uh, bring Mrs. Rasmussen some brandy, I think. And I'll have some sour mash, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Make mine sour mash, too, Hardy. Very good, sir. Expense account item 14, 40 bucks, miscellaneous. Item 15, 35 dollars, stenographic. Expense account total 1,965 dollars. Remarks? The old man's got a few weeks more. Laura's moving into the house with him to take care of him. She won't be telling him a lot of things about herself. She doesn't have to. You should have stood there like I did and seen that big arm go around her shoulder when he said, You're my daughter. Yeah. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Folks abroad want to know more about us Americans. How we live, how we eat, what we do in our leisure time. You know something? You can help promote international goodwill by corresponding with someone abroad. For the name of a correspondent, write to Letters Abroad, 45 East 65th Street, New York. That's Letters Abroad, 45 East 65th Street, New York. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by the FBI in Peace and War. Now here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one cute tiny little mouse, that's right, mouse, almost scares a big insurance company out of business. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum, Eric Snowden, Roy Glenn, Will Wright, Frank Nelson, and Jack Crucian. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Who that? George Reed. Well, Merry Christmas, George. Is it? Oh, what's the matter? You ever hear of Jediah Gillis? Uh, eccentric? Owns about half of Rhode Island? That's the boy. A couple of weeks ago, he wrote a special policy on an item he wanted insured. And it's up and disappeared, huh? 
How'd you know? Oh, just a wild guess. What did he lose? I hope you're sitting down, Johnny. Yeah? Why? Because the insured item is a mouse. House? Mouse. What? <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American Branch Office, 443 North 15th Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the missing mouse matter. Expense account item one, 85 cents. Taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office. He was on his feet waiting for me. His Ivy League suit looked as though it had been slept in and he needed to shave. Close the door, Johnny. Yeah, sure. Johnny, I'm going to level with you. This thing has me going. Well, it serves you right. Anybody who'd insure a mouse deserves what he gets. Yeah, but it isn't an ordinary mouse, Johnny. No. Not according to Mr. Gillis's original application. Yeah, take a look. Uh, item to be insured. One unusually talented grayish-brown mouse. Unusually talented? Like how? I don't know. What? I tried to find out, but Gillis wouldn't tell me. And still you issued the policy. Well, you know our company, Johnny. We have a reputation for insuring almost anything, but we have to draw the line occasionally, and we would have here, except for one thing. What's that? And believe me, it better be good. It is. Gillis carries all of his insurance with us. Yeah, but even so. Just one of his several policies is a straight life for 350000 Wow, Well, we. King-size premiums, huh? Exactly. So when he called asking us to insure this fellow's mouse for a few weeks... Well, wait a minute. Gillis doesn't own it? No. Well, who does? It belongs to a friend of his, a man named Glazer. He's spending the holidays with Gillis. Gillis didn't want to be responsible if something happened to Glazer's mouse while he's there, so he asked us to write the policy. How much did you insure it for? All the company would allow, 5000 Oh, now, George, you think I want to get all worked up over a lousy five grand loss? What kind of a commission can I possibly make on Look, that? Look, give me a chance to finish, will you? All right, but only because it's Christmas. All right. Late last night, I received a call from Gillis. He wanted to know whom we considered the best investigator in this part of the country. When I told him, he told me about the mouse and insisted I send you up to help look for it. No, no, George, I'm sorry, but I'm going to pass. I've handled some screwy cases in my time, but this is... Please, far... wait till I finish, will you? I told Gillis you wouldn't be interested. That's when he started putting on the squeeze. Squeeze? How do you mean? He said if I didn't get you, he'd cancel his policy. Oh, come on. You don't believe that, do you? I don't know what to believe. Gillis is a screwball of the first water. We've known that for a long time, and frankly, I'd rather not take a chance. Well, you've got to. Maybe not. Hmm? I've received an okay from upstairs. On this one, you can write your own ticket. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? You didn't give me a chance. Look, there's a train for Providence at 3.30. Here's Gillis's address. He wants you to stay with him. That'll cost more, Georgie. It figures. Merry Christmas, Johnny. Same to you, Santa Claus. <laughs> Expense account item 285 cents, cab fare, back to my apartment. I was intrigued by what George had told me and by what his company was going to add to my bank account, so I didn't really mind changing my plans for the holidays. Expense account item three eighteen dollars and ninety cents transportation, including a round trip ticket, Hartford to Providence, and cab fare out to the Gillis residence. Palace would be a better word for it. It stood in the middle of a large wooded park. It must have been half a dozen acres, all of it surrounded by an old fashioned iron fence. I dismissed the cab and had started toward the front door when it opened. And standing against the light, watching me, was a tall, beautiful girl. Careful the steps. Why? There I see. Oh, oh, thanks. We've been expecting you, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Well, hi. Mr. Glazer and Father are in the library. Would you like to meet them now or wait till after you're settled? Oh, I'm I'm afraid I'd better see them right away, Miss Gillis. Marion, Johnny. Well, come along. You know, for the first time, I'm glad I came home for the holidays. Home from where? New York. Here we are. You'll have to come visit me, Johnny. Maybe I'll do something drastic like losing a mouse to guarantee it. 
Mary Ann, I told you to keep that door closed. Oh, Mr. Doll is here, Father. Oh, oh, well, have him come in. <laughs> yes, by all means, have him come in. <laughs> See you later, Johnny. Yeah. Well, Dollar, glad you finally got here. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, this is my friend and associate, Bert Glazer. Hi, Mr. Glazer. Uh, Bertie and his pals, Mr. Dollar. Beg pardon? Uh, my dog act. Uh, you investigators are supposed to have good memories. I hoped you might have caught us at some time or other. No, I'm afraid not. Oh, would you like to have a drink, Mr. Dollar? Uh, no, thanks. Now, suppose I get... got anything you want to drink. I got an eggnog, hot buttered rum. Well, uh, maybe later. Right now, I'd like to hear the details of your loss. You mean that insurance agent didn't give you all the information? He didn't know it all, Mr. Gillis. All he did know was that a so-called talented mouse so-called. has disappeared. So-called. And he hasn't disappeared either, not at all. He's been kidnapped, that's what. Kidnapped, yes, sir, and we know who did it, too. And why? We know why, too. And it's your job to get him back, Dollar. Oh, now, wait a minute. And I... I'm not going to pay one red cent for ransom. Not one cent. Not one cent. Okay, okay. But what makes you so sure the mouse was kidnapped? Well, I... I'm afraid I can't tell you that without Bert's permission. Well, Mr. Glazer? Well, if we tell you, we must have your solemn promise you won't repeat it to anybody. Uh, until Christmas Day. Well, I... I'm not sure I can do that. If you can't, we don't open our mouths. Right. Well? Okay. Till Christmas Day. Good, good. Uh, Dollar, suppose I told you Gulliver was worth at least $50,000. Gulliver? The missing mouse. Oh. You'd be surprised if I said he was worth that much? Depends. You claim he's talented. Does that have something to do with this uh, valuation you put on him? Something. Something. It has everything to do with it. Yes, sir. Well, what does Gulliver do that other mice can't? Nothing. But it's how he does it that counts. How he does what? Sings. What? Can't you hear the man, Mr. Dollar? Can't you hear him? Gulliver sings. He carries a tune. You know. With the clarity of a clarion, the fervor of a female opera star, and the tone of a tenor. It, that's how we plan to bill him. I, um, <clears throat> I see, um, uh, well, uh... But he doesn't believe us. Ah. Oh, no, wait, I, I I didn't say that. <laughs> There's no need to. We can tell by your face. Can't we, Bert? But a mouse... Mr. Dollar, it is a scientific fact that mice sing. Mice sing? Well-known magazines have published articles proving it. Unfortunately, most of them sing in a scale too high for human hearing. Ah, uh, but not Gulliver. Well, not Gulliver. Yeah, that's right. He's a basso. A basso. Uh, by mousy standards, that is. Oh, no. <laughs> no, Bert, he still doesn't believe us. Very well, Jediah, there is only one thing to do. There's only one thing to do. You follow us, Dollar. We'll erase the doubt in your mind forever. I took a good look at Bert Glazer, then reluctantly followed the two of them out of the library and down a long hall. At the moment, this thing had all the earmarks of a good old-fashioned con game. Or better still, a benefit on behalf of Bert Glazer with Jodiah Gillis and Floyds of England as the sole cash contributors. We wandered for what seemed like blocks through the old mansion and finally reached a large playroom. On top of one of the billiard tables was a small brass cage. In it were two small grayish-brown mice. Glazer opened the cage and let them out. Mr. Dollar, allow me to present Hecuba and Esmeralda. Oh, how do you do? I mean, uh, I suppose they sing too. Oh, they certainly do. But not nearly as well as Gulliver. Just don't have the instrument, you know. Instrument? The voice, the voice, Dollar, the voice, the vocal cords. Oh, oh, yeah, I I see. But, uh, now, where did you keep Gulliver? Uh, In here with the others. Bert didn't want to separate them. Uh, That's right. I originally started to make the three of them into a singing, uh, you know, trio like the Andrews sisters. But Gulliver advanced so rapidly, I decided he should be a soloist. Oh, sure. You aren't afraid of mice, Mr. Dyer? No. No, well, that's fine. Nice sensitive you are, you know. It upsets them. It upsets them. All right, now, Hecuba, move over a bit. Give Esmeralda some room. That's it. Now, up on your haunches. Up, 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 Esmeralda. There we are. <laughs> now, what would you like to hear, Mr. Dollar? Oh, anything at all. <laughs> oh, Bert, how about my favorite, Dan? Over the way. Good, good, good. Hey, you got it, Esmeralda? Over the waves. That's it, Hecuba. All ready then? Mm. Good, that'll be fine. Ready now? One, two, three. One, two, three. 
Oh, that's it. Oh, beautiful, Esmeralda. Beautiful. Yeah, da 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 Well, I won't say I was convinced, but I won't say I wasn't. But I will say those mice were singing something, or giving a mighty good imitation of it. We returned to the library, and this time I sampled the eggnog liberally. <laughs> Is that all right, Dollar? Oh, fine, thanks. Well, Dollar, you know now why we believe Gulliver was kidnapped? Well, I'm not sure. To exploit him, what else? Exactly. Do you have any idea who did it? Harry McQueen, that's who. McQueen. Who's McQueen? Used to be my agent. Theatrical agent? Uh He's been snooping around here lately, Johnny. We figure he's gotten wind of our mice. What do you mean by snooping around, Mr. Gillis? Oh, you know, he's been out here twice this week wanting to see me. Had to kick him out of here yesterday morning. How'd he get in? Well, my daughter answered the door. Uh, Yes, I... She didn't know McQueen from Adam. So when he asked for me, she figured he belonged in here, rehearsing the show with the rest of us. Rehearsing what show, Mr. Gillis? What show? The show for the children's hospital. (laughs) Jodiah puts one on for the sick kids every Christmas Eve. Of course. You know, Dollar, Variety Act, Santa Claus. Uh, This year, though, we got a radio hookup. Go all over the state. And Gulliver, well, he was going to headline. And that's why I sent for you, Dollar. I figured you can get him back by tomorrow afternoon if anybody can. How long was McQueen in here before you noticed him? Long enough to lift Gulliver. This was our dress rehearsal, darling. We'd asked some of the kids from around the neighborhood in to watch, so it was pretty crowded. Where were the mice during the rehearsal? Well, that's where I made my mistake. What do you mean? We were keeping them a secret till the real show. Well, where were they? In their cage, over there on the mantel. Now, we were using this part of the room for the stage, so McQueen could have just reached in and taken Gulliver without us seeing him. Now, what makes you so sure McQueen did it? We told you. Besides, who else would want him? Who else? And it was right after I kicked him out of here that I discovered Gulliver was missing. What'd you do then? Why, well, called off the rehearsal and started searching for him. McQueen? Big Gulliver. And I put in a telephone call to the Providence House where McQueen was taken. Did you talk to him? Nope. They said he checked out. After questioning them for a while, I finally had a nightcap with Judiah, then went to the phone in the hall and made some calls. Including one to George Reed. Well, how's it going, Johnny? It's not. That's why I'm calling. Look, they think a theatrical agent named Harry McQueen stole the mouse. He has offices in Boston and New York. I placed a person-to-person call to both offices, but with tomorrow Christmas Eve, he might not get the message. So, what do you want me to do? Find out his home number. Ask him to call me here. Okay. Anything else? Hello? Johnny? Johnny, you there? Yeah. And so is a cat. A big yellow cat. What's so unusual about that? Oh, nothing. Except he's got a grayish brown mouse between his two front paws. Act two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. You can't buy happiness by the pound or the yard, but you can have it by the hour with no strings attached every Monday through Friday evening and each Saturday in the daytime when the Robert Q. Lewis Show is on the air. Join him and his fun-loving gang five nights a week and Saturdays in the daytime on most of these same stations. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Missing Mouse Matter. I was standing in the hall of Jediah Gillis' home looking at a big yellow cat that had a mouse between its two front paws. As far as I was concerned, a mouse is a mouse, and this one could be Gulliver. I cut short my phone conversation with George Reed, then started toward the cat. Here, kitty. Here, kitty, kitty. Nice, kitty. Pretty kitty. Mama, Here, kitty. Mama, where are you? Here, kitty, kitty. That's a good kitty. Ah, kitty, let me have the little mouse. Mama, you naughty cat. Where... Oh... This cannibal belonged to you, Marion? Yes, I promised Father I'd... What do you mean, cannibal? Take a look. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And he's very, very dead. Oh. You don't think it's Gulliver, do you? Well, Mr. Glazer will have to identify him. And if he is... Well, that's that. Oh, no. No, Johnny. What do you mean? Oh, Johnny, please. You don't have to tell him, do you? Well, sure. If it's Gulliver, this thing's cleared up. If it's not, your Rama gets a reward for being a good mouser. Oh, Johnny, please. Dad almost had a fit when I arrived here with Rama. He made me promise to keep him in my room. This the only time he's been out? Well, no. Oh. He was out for a little while yesterday while they were rehearsing. I didn't notice he was gone until after lunch. Then the corpse could be Gulliver's. 
Oh, Johnny, if it is, there's nothing we can do about it now. And if you tell my father besides making him angry, it'll break his heart. All right. I won't say anything until tomorrow night. Oh, thanks, Johnny. Night. Good night. <laughs> Christmas Eve morning came cold, crisp, and clear. The Gillis grounds were covered with new-fallen snow, and the trees were heavy with icicles, giving the whole place the look of a winter wonderland. I dressed and went down to join Gillis and Bert Glazer at breakfast. I was on my third strawberry when the phone started to ring. Yeah. You expecting a call, darling? Mm. Well, yeah, matter of fact, I am. Yeah. And you'd better answer it. If it's somebody at the broadcast station for me, tell them I'll be at the children's hospital at noon. They can call me there. Right. Hello? Johnny Dollar? Speaking. Look, I don't know what's going on down there or why you're going to pester me about it. Who is this? Harry McQueen. Who did you think? Well, I wasn't sure. Well, your friend Reed got me out of bed this morning, Dollar. He told me you wanted to ask me some questions about a mouse that's missing from Jediah Gillis's place. Hey, that's right. What do you know about it? Well, I've done a lot of pilfering in my time. I've taken towels from hotels from Maine to Miami and Seattle to Bridgeport. But I never had to stoop so low as to steal a mouse from any hotel, garbage dump, trap, or field. Do I make myself clear? Perfectly. Except for one thing. Yeah? This particular mouse was a performer. Was a what? He was trained, did tricks. Still doesn't interest me. Well, then why were you trying to see Mr. Gillis? To get some of my people on his Christmas show. Anything wrong with that? No. There'll be a lot of publicity about it. Would have done him a lot of good. And you're sure you weren't interested in the mouse? Look, Dollar, when I went into this business 18 years ago, I swore then I'd never handle kids, belly dances, or animal acts. But you handled Bert Glazer's dog act. His what? Dog act. Bertie and his pal. Oh, somebody's feeding you a line, Dollar. That act was Bill Bertie and his pal. And the pal is a dummy. Glazer's a top-notch ventriloquist. He's a master. You hear me, Dollar? Yeah, Harry. I hear you fine. I had to do some thinking, so I put on my coat and went outside for a walk around that wooded park. What I had just learned about Glazer confirmed what my instinct, my common sense, had been telling me all along. Except for one thing. The performance given by Hecuba and Esmeralda the night before. If Glazer had been doing the singing for those two mice, he was a master ventriloquist. Which was exactly what Harry McQueen said he was. I'd started back toward the house wondering if I should get Jediah aside now and tell him or wait until after the show when something soft and cold hit me on the back of the head. Hey! <laughs> Sorry, Johnny, I couldn't oh. resist such a serious target. Anything new? Uh, well, if you mean have I found Gulliver, the singing mouse, no. Dad told me to tell you, if Gulliver does turn up before 1.15, rush him over to the hospital. Yeah, sure. But I think that's extremely unlikely. You think Rama got him, don't you? If he did, he got a very ordinary mouse. He didn't get one that sings. I'm afraid I lost you. Doesn't matter. Oh, now, I wonder what he wants. Hmm. That boy on the porch. Oh, well, if this was Hartford, I'd say he was the paper boy coming around to collect. Well, it's not Hartford, and he's not a paper boy because Dad doesn't subscribe to anything but fortune. Oh, well, then he's selling something. Well, if he is, he's not going to give us a chance to buy any. Johnny, looks looks like we scared him off. Hmm, that's funny. Hey! Hey, come back! He sure tore out of here when he saw us. I wonder what he wanted. Do you suppose he was one of the kids they invited in to see the dress rehearsal? Well, if he was, what would he be doing back here today? I don't know. Let's take a look around. We found it in the playroom, near where Gulliver's cage had been. It was a roundish metal clamp, the kind of boy wraps around his trouser leg when he's riding a bike. I was about to call the hospital and ask Judiah for a list of all the kids they'd invited to the rehearsal when the front doorbell rang. Johnny, it's that boy again. Better let me get in. Hi. 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 Uh... I was over here to see the show the other day. Oh? Yeah. You see it? No, I uh, I wasn't here then. Oh. Jeez, sure is calling. Yeah, sure is. Oh, why don't you come in and get warm? Oh, no, that's okay. No, come on, come on. Nobody's here. No? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure, come on. 
I don't want to bother nobody, you know. I was just riding by and I thought I'd stop and tell old man Gillis what a swell show they put on. You really liked it, huh? Yeah. All except for that Santa Claus. Oh? What was wrong with him? Nothing. Just that, well, who believes in all that smushy kid stuff? Hmm? Kids, I guess. How old are you, uh... Bobby. Uh, Bobby Neves. How old are you, Bobby? Almost 11. Well, being that old, I can understand why you weren't impressed with the Santa Claus. All that other stuff, too. You know, like giving presents and singing those hymns and junk like that. You gotta cut it out when you when you start growing up. You sure do, boy. Yeah. You know, you and my mom, you, you get along just fine. Oh? Yeah. She feels about Christmas. She feels about Christmas just like you and me do. All right. Yeah. Boy, this this log fire sure makes your eyes smart, don't it? Yeah, it sure does. Where do you live, Bobby? Uh, Cross Tom's Gully Avenue. Well, how'd you happen to be over here the other day? Well, I I was riding my bike when I when I saw this dog. Well, gee, he was. Anyhow, when I, when I tried to catch him, he ran from me. I followed the silly muck clear over here. Uh-huh. You ever catch him? No. Nah. I was about to when this man hollered and asked me if I wanted to see a free show. So I I came in. I see. Well, dear, you must like dogs a lot, huh? Sure. You got one? Used to have one. When my pop was with us, but we can't have no pets where we're living now. Oh, that's rough. Yeah. You know that poem? Which one? You know, about all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not, not even a mouse. Yeah? Well, that fits our place. Especially now. How do you mean? Well, I didn't think he'd miss it, you know. Man with a house as big as this one and also when I saw this cute little fella up in that cage. What? Well, I didn't really mean to take him on hold, but leave it. When he got under my sweater and was real quiet, like he liked me. Well, I... you know what I mean. Yeah, Bobby, I know. But I got to thinking, decided to bring him back. So would you give me the old man to Mister Gillis for me, please? No. I think you'd better do that yourself. Oh, no, no, please. He might be awful mad at me by now. No, Bobby. In fact, you're going to get a reward. Yeah? <laughs> Word of honor. Now, what do you say we go down where Mr. Gillis is putting on that Christmas show and see it? Okay? Oh, sure. Bobby. Yeah? Did you notice anything unusual about this mouse? Yeah, I sure did. What was it? He got some white on his right hind foot. Expense account item four, one dollar and sixty cents. Cab fare from the Gillis residence to the children's hospital for Mary and Bobby and myself. Inside, we followed the sound of children laughing and reached the auditorium. Marion found a seat among the nurses and I took Bobby backstage. When Jadaya saw Gulliver, his face lit up like... Well, like one of the trees he'd had delivered to the wall. Oh, ah, Gulliver! By golly, by golly. I knew if anybody could do it, you could, Dollar. I didn't do a thing, Mr. Gillis. All the credit goes to Bobby. Oh, to Bobby Whale. I'll speak to you after the show, young man. Yes, sir. <laughs> Bert, Bert, look, look, he's back. Oh, Bert, oh, my. Oh, Gulliver, oh, I do declare I have never been so glad to see a person before. Yeah, you better hurry, Bert. He's scheduled to go on in just a minute. Oh, he will, he will. Well, I'll go check on the microphone when everything be just so. <laughs> Don't go away, Dollar. No, he won't. Bobby, why don't you sit over there where you can see the stage? Yes, sir. Uh, Bert, you think Gulliver will sing today? I think? I know he will. Oh, get ready, Gulliver. But that boy had Gulliver all day and all night, and he didn't sing once. Ah, did the boy ask him to? Maybe don't get a man, boys and girls. For the first time in the world, one of the wonders of the world, Gulliver, the singing mouse. King 
Mr. Dollar. Can that mouse really sing? That is what we're going to find out, Bobby. Uh, exciting, isn't it, Dollar? Sure is, Mr. Gillis. All right, thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now, for Gulliver's first number, he'd like to sing with... Uh, what's that, Gulliver? <laughs> oh, I, I see. Uh-huh. Uh, he's going to sing Jingle Bells. But he wants me to get off stage so everybody will know it's really him doing it and not me. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Is he all right, Bert? Oh, fine, fine. Just feeling his out. Well, why doesn't he start? He's going to listen... Well, Dollar. Now I have seen everything. Me too. She. Bert Glazer had a logical answer for having lied about his old vaudeville act. He knew I wouldn't believe the mice could really sing if I'd known he was a ventriloquist. And you know, well, after all, yet sometimes. Ah. Expense account total, including camp fare, Hartford Station to my apartment, $38.20. As for my separate and additional fee, as agreed upon before I took this matter, well, there's a boy named Bobby Neves who lives on Scully Avenue over in Providence. See that he gets it, huh? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will tell you about next week's story in just a moment. Meantime... Yeah, I'll make a deal with you. Oh? Let me have the mic for a second, then you can tell them about next week's story. By all means, be my guest. All right. I just don't want to pass up a chance to do two things. First, well, Pam and Eric and Fran, Mr. and Mrs. Froelich, Helen, Will, Scotty, oh, all the rest of you nice people who have written in to tell us how much you like the program. Thanks. I really appreciate hearing from you, and believe me, I'll answer your letters just as quickly as I can. Second, well, I'm sure you know what this is, and I want you to know it comes from the heart. Merry Christmas to you. God bless you. Now, next week... Next week, the case of a prize fighter who could win only by losing, because his life depended on it. Right. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is written by Charles B. Smith and produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Mary Jane Croft, Howard McNear, Parley Bear, G. Stanley Jones, Bill James, Lawrence Dobkin, and Richard Beals. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Paul Kendrick, Johnny. Over at Eastern Allied Casualty, remember? Oh, sure, Paul. How are you? Seen any good fights lately? Prize fights, that is? Yeah, the championship bout at the stadium over in Mulville last week. Were you there? No, I had to miss it. But it didn't miss me. Huh? The minute Georgie hit the canvas in that fourth round, it cost me 50 bucks. Johnny... 
You remember Al Coronado? Are you kidding? I've watched that boy come up from the Golden Gloves. Well, he fought in one of the preliminary bouts. I know. I lost on him, too. Twenty bucks. Come on over, will you? And I'll tell you why the company may lose 50000 on him. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eastern Allied Casualty Insurance Company, 422 Spital Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the squared circle matter. Expense account item one, a dollar ten cents, cab from my apartment to the offices of Eastern Allied. When I got upstairs into his personal cubicle, I found Paul Kendrick pacing the floor. Sit down, Johnny. Uh, have a drink if you want one. No, no thanks. Hey, looks like you're the one who could use a drink. What are you worried about? Don't tell me you've been hitting the company till for big money to bet on the fights. Johnny, I'm worried about murder. Listen. I'm all ears. How long since you've seen Al Coronado fight? Oh, six months, a year, maybe. But before that, when he was working all the local arenas, you and I were present every time he put on the gloves. So? We knew him when he had reflexes quick enough to... Well, do you remember how he'd show off by picking a fly or mosquito out of the air, grabbing it between his fingers without even hurting it? Yeah, sure. He was no metal giant, not by a long shot, but he had the fastest eyes and hands I ever saw in a man. Right. But something has happened to him, something very wrong. And I think I know what it is. Listen. I'm listening. A few years ago, his manager, Ricky Malone, took out a $50,000 policy on him. Annuity. So what? A lot of managers take out policies on their boys. And then get them killed? Look, Al is fighting again tomorrow night in a small town outside of Joplin. Joplin? Missouri? A little place just across the state line. Johnny, I want you to be there. You mean as a sort of bodyguard? I want you to see the fight, that's all. See Al Coronado fight. Yeah, but this murder crack... I'm having a copy of the policy made, and you can pick it up at the Joplin Post Office. General delivery. Now, Paul... I know, I know. I may be all wrong. This may only be a hunch without a single legitimate reason for suspicion. That's why I took a whole week to think it over before calling him. That's why I want somebody who knows Al as well as you and I do to... Look, will you go down there and see him? Well, I... We'll pay the freight. Hand your expense account. Anything you like. Oh, now that's an attractive... But do it, Johnny. Will you? Item two, another dollar ten, back to my apartment to pack. Item three, one hundred twenty-four dollars even. Plain fare and incidentals to Joplin. By your leave, Paul, the incidentals included a new sports shirt, loud enough to startle the whole state of Arizona, an extra pack of razor blades, and a new toothbrush. Also, item four, three bucks, flowers for the stewardess, who managed to find me an extra bottle of champagne. I arrived at Joplin shortly before noon, and after checking into a hotel, found that by some miracle, a copy of Al's policy was waiting for me at the post office. A quick glance at it brings up item five, four dollars and a quarter, phone call. What do you mean, holding out on you? I thought you said Ricky Malone took out the policy. He did, and pays all the premiums. But the beneficiary named is Frankie Fortina. Now, who's he? I don't know yet. Well, his address is in New York City. You better look him up, will you? I've been trying to. But the last time Fortina was at the address on the policy, it was a racetrack bookie joint. Oh, so that's why you're worried. Well, that's one reason. Well, if you learn anything about him, let me know, will you? I'm staying at the Beverly Arms. Okay, Johnny. Johnny. Yeah? Call me again, will you? After the fight tonight? Sure. I was tired, so I had a big lunch. That's item six. Went up to my room and slept. I overslept. It was nearly nine o'clock when I woke up, so I grabbed a cab, that's item seven, and went out to the arena in the nearby town of Mount Elba. For five bucks, item eight, I managed to get a seat at ringside in time to catch the end of the last preliminary. The winner in one minute, ten The program told me Al was scheduled for the main event against some local boy named Rafe Cummings. I never heard of him, and I doubt if anybody outside of Tucson ever had. I understood why when he stepped into the ring. This kid looked like the rankest kind of amateur. Strong, sure, and in good condition, but clumsy. He almost tripped over his own size 15 feet. And it was no act to fool an opponent either. 
Al, when he came in, looked as good as ever. He gave me a quick glance of recognition, though I'm sure he knew nothing about me except possibly my name. At the opening bell, he came out fast. All the old speed and timing were there. Faint weave and flick out that light, but punishing left. Same old pattern, same old... Wait a minute. Those quick left jazz were only landing about one and four. As though he touched Cummings only when the clumsy ox happened to walk into him. But because of his speed, Al took nothing but a few light ones on the body. He kept his face well out of reach. Oh, yeah, his timing was perfect, but his aim was terrible. Every time he shot out his fist, he was three, four inches wide. Then a funny thing happened. At the end of the round, when Al went back to his corner, and remember, Rafe had only tapped him a few times on the body. When he went back to his corner and started to sit down, he almost missed the stool. Would have if one of the seconds hadn't named it under him. Funny. The second round got underway the same as the first. Al was all speed, dodging, weaving, keeping his face out of the way. But again, he wasn't hitting his mark. And then it happened. He missed Cummings wide, then practically ran into his glove, catching it hard in the cheek, and down he went. Why, there wasn't enough steam behind Cummings' glove to hurt it. But Al took the count. He'd been hurt by that tap on the face. Then another thing. The second he was counted out, his handlers practically hauled him out of the ring and back to his dressing room. And believe me, Al looked terrible. His eyes had a strange, almost faraway look. As though that little smack had knocked his brains loose. Had... My seat was on the far side of the ring, but I elbowed my way through the crowd and back to the row of dressing rooms in a hallway built on one end of the building. Al! Al Coronado. I told you on the way up the aisle, Doc, huh? we don't need you. The boy's all right. Go on, Doc. Beat it. You hear me, Doc? Listen, this is Johnny Dollar. Huh? Old fan of Al's from Hartford. I want to see him. Some other time. No, no. Right away. Come on, open up. I said some other time. Don't you understand? We're pulling out of this, Berg, and we ain't got time to stand around and talk. Now, look, buddy. Malone's the name. I'm Mel's manager, see? And when I say get out, I mean Van Moose. Al, are you okay, boy? This is Johnny Dollar. Oh, no, you don't. Brother, that's what you're wrong. Hey, Al. Al. Good Lord, Al. What's the matter with you? Uh, Oh, hello, hello, Johnny. Hey, Al. Look at me. No, no, I mean straight at me. Here. Al. I'm I'm all right, Johnny. You're in bad shape. You should never have fought tonight. Oh, that that's all right. Where are your seconds, your trainer? Uh Ricky, he don't don't let nobody in after fight. Look, Al, can you get up off that table, stand up and walk? Oh, sure, sure, Johnny. Then come on. I'm taking you out of here to no, the doctor. Johnny. Easy, Al. No, look, look behind Al, you, Rick. Please, He's come up. On. He's got it. You bet I am, Dollar. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Each Monday through Friday evening, most of these same stations bring you the Amos and Andy Music Hall, variety entertainment at its best, for top songs, informal visits with top stars, and for a never-ending supply of fun. Turn your home into the Amos and Andy Music Hall five nights a week. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Squared Circle Matter. When I came to, the dressing room was dark and quiet. After carefully falling off the table where they'd left me, I groped my way to the light switch, stumbling incidentally over the remains of the chair Ricky Malone had used on me. It was well after midnight, so I left by the dressing room window. The second I reached my hotel room, I put through a long-distance call, hoping Paul Kendrick would be in home, in bed. He was. Yeah, hello. Johnny Dollar. And Paul, you're right. It'll be murder unless I can stop it. Hey, you awake? Oh, hey. you mean Al Coronado? What's happened, Johnny? Plenty. And listen, that boy is more than punch drunk. He's had a brain injury of some kind. I'll bet on it. That's what I was afraid of. The tap on the face that knocked him out tonight wasn't enough to hurt a kitten. But a good solid blow would probably kill him. That's why he kept protecting his face. But Ricky Malone is making him keep on? Who else? I just met the gentleman, by the way. Well, what'd he say? Did you question him? Before I could, he cracked me over the head with a chair. Where is he now? Oh, I don't know. What are you going to do? See if the police can track them down. Malone said something about leaving town right away. Well, keep after him. Did you read that policy carefully? You kidding? I haven't had time. It's an annuity. That much I saw. Beginning in three or four years, it'll pay Al a nice little income for the rest of his life, if he survives. But the beneficiary named... Yes, Frankie Fortina, who gets the full face value of the policy if Al dies. Johnny. Yeah? 
I got a rundown on Fortina. You said he was a bookie at one time. That was the least of his crimes. He has a record as long as your arm. As I see it, he owns Al Coronado. Then you're probably thinking what I am. But Al hasn't been doing so well lately. He's taken a big drop in class. Isn't making the purses he used to. You know that? Yes. The ANBA keeps a complete record. So with this injury to his brain, the only way Fortina can clean up on him is by seeing him dead. That's right. Well, what about medical examinations before these fights? Ricky Malone could bribe his own mother, especially in some of the towns where Al has been fighting lately. Yeah, that's possible, of course. Also, what you and I believe is wrong with Al is one of the hardest things in the world to detect. Yeah, yeah, I must admit he looked great when he entered the ring. Okay, Paul, one thing's in our favor. Neither Al nor Ricky Malone knows who I am, outside of being a fight fan. Just so Fortina doesn't learn different. Where is Fortina, by the way? I don't know. So, Johnny, whatever you do, be careful. Expense account item 9370 for a couple of phone calls, some breakfast, then a taxi to police headquarters. I'll say this for the gentlemen police. When they go into action, they really get things done. Within less than two hours, Sergeant Danny Ruskin dug up all the information I wanted. Well, that ties in with what Conroy found out at the airport. No, that does it, Herm. Thanks very much. Something? And I think it gives us the whole story, Johnny. Al and his manager, Ricky Malone, checked out of their hotel, the Rayberry, at one o'clock this morning. Just the two of them? Right. There was no third party by the name of 14 or anything else. Just the two of them. Uh, they caught the 140 plane for Oklahoma City. Oh. And there they bought tickets routing them to Monterey, Mexico. Mexico? How soon can I get a plane? You're going down there, huh? I told you. I got to save that guy's life. All right. Look, in Monterey, look up Sergeant Romelia Garcia, Main Homicide Division. You mention my name, he'll give you anything you want. Good. Now, what about that plane? <laughs> on plane connections turned out to be bad. The best time I could make was by way of El Paso. That's item 10, $127, including incidentals. I finally pulled into Monterey shortly after 8 p.m. I parked my bag at the airport, taxied into town. Item 11, I went straight to main headquarters of the Policia. Sergeant Romilio Garcia was off duty. He had gone to the fights. Item 12, $4 American for a fast taxi ride to the Plaza del Fisticuffs, or whatever they call it. There for item 13, 5 bucks, I had the sergeant paged over the PA system. After two or three minutes, a short, stocky, important-looking figure in police uniform stood up to the door. Senor Johnny Dollar? Yeah, that's right, Sergeant. How are you? You Americanos. Now, what is so important I must leave the excellent fights to talk with you, huh? The possible murder of an American fighter right here in your own ring. So what is that to be excited about? Something that happens all the time. It's because the Mexican fighter is more better than the Americano fighter. So if that is all that is bothering you... Incidentally, Sergeant Danny Ruskin of the Joplin Police... Sergeant Danny! Why do you not say so at the beginning? Well, you didn't give me much of a chance. <laughs> How is it, my good friend, Sergeant Danny? Boys, it's too long I have seen here. Yeah, well, look... Excellent man, Sergeant Danny. When I have trouble with one of our Mexican nationals who escape across the border and go all the way to Missouri, Joplin, it's Sergeant Danny who... Uh, but, but you have a problem, eh? Yeah. A fighter named of Al Coronado. Coronado... Oh, but of course, tomorrow night he is fighting here, and he will lose. Why do you say that? Come, look. Here on the, what do you call, uh, a billboard, a picture of the man he is to fight. So, El Toro Negro. That sounds more like the name of a bull than a... Holy... See, si. big man, is he not? Is this picture real? 240 pounds, senor. But Al Coronado only weighs in at 181. See. Si. El Toro, big man. The Senor Dollar, he is a killer. Our best. Three men he's knocked out of the ring. But nobody hurts him, so no wonder you're worried. Sergeant, unless you and I can stop it, that won't be a fight tomorrow night. It'll be a premeditated, cold-blooded killing. Oh? How so? I showed Garcia my credentials. Then told him what I knew and what I suspected. Until we have proof of this, senor, to start what you call an international situation, you are not now in your own country, you know. Still, he agreed to cooperate. First thing, of course, was to locate Al and his manager. In this city of nearly 200,000, that could be pretty rough. But he said he'd try. He drove me by the airport to pick up my bag, then to a hotel. And there, as the bellhop unlocked the door of my room, I got a real break. The next door down the hall opened. Hey, kid, uh, how'd you like to bring me up a glass of warm milk, huh? Al. Al Coronado. Huh? 
Oh, oh, hi. Here, boy. Just put in my bags inside and leave the door open. Yeah, gracias, senor. Hey, Al. Are you alone? Oh, sure. Hey. hey. You're Johnny, ain't you? Yeah, that's right, Johnny. And I want to talk to you. I used to see you inside all the time up in Hartford, huh? You saw me in Joplin, too. Only you don't remember. Where's Ricky Malone, your manager? Oh, uh, he said he had to go meet somebody. He's always going out. Look, Al, I'm an insurance investigator. Oh? Oh, I got some insurance. Yeah. One more fight and somebody's going to collect it. Oh, no, Johnny. That's my retiring money. The only one who'll retire on it is Frankie Fortina. Hey, Frankie, he's my owner. You know him? Hey. Who takes all the aspirin around here? Me. I get a lot of headaches all the time. But maybe that's why I ain't been hitting so good lately. Yeah. Here, catch this bottle. Hey, now. Ah, uh, now look what you did. No, no, Al. You look what you did. You missed that bottle by three inches. Uh, For the same reason you haven't been hitting well. Why you have these headaches. All right, I'll give it to you straight. You've had a brain injury, Al. One good wallop on that head will kill you. And that's just what Ricky and Fortina want. Ah, uh, no. Ricky always says they keep my head protected. Uh, so you must be wrong. Am I? Well, Ricky's good to me. Why, you numbskull, he's trying to get you killed. I, uh, you, Johnny, you are wrong. You know the man you're up against tomorrow night? Well, I know his name. Well, he's the one scheduled to finish you off. Johnny, I, I don't believe that. Al, Al, listen, you gotta believe it. Now, where's the tell? Here. Uh, uh, who are you going to call? Hello, this is an emergency. Get me Sergeant Romilio Garcia at Central Police Headquarters. Uh, cops? That's right, Al. And a doctor. Uh, no, look, Ricky says to stay away from doctors. All they do All is they, they can they... do is stop you from ever fighting again. And that would make you worth just $50,000 less to Frankie... For... Sergeant Johnny Dollar, I found Al. Hotel room right next to mine, room 915. Bring a doctor, a brain specialist if you can, even if you have to drag him out of bed. Oh, look, we'll fight the international situation when we come to it. You get a doctor up here, you hear me? Sir? You hang up or I'll blow your head off. Well, Mr. Fortina, I First believe. First, Kim Ricky. Sure, boss. He's clean. Huh? I hate to shoot an unarmed man, Dollar, but if you make one phony move... So you know who I am, huh? Ricky here may be stupid in some ways, but he had sense enough to call me from Joplin after you broke in on him there. Finding out what you're up to wasn't difficult. Finding out what you're up to wasn't very tough either, Fortina. But it's all over. Not for me, Dollar. That's where you're wrong. That phone call I made was to the police. I know. To central headquarters. That's over three miles from here. By the time your sergeant finds a doctor and gets here, you'll be dead. And I will be gone. Have you forgotten that you have a border to cross, you Fortina? You think I'm stupid? Frankie Fortina has never been here. He's never been even in Mexico. Because my tourist card reads Charles Edward Smith. And since the next plane leaves for the States in about 20 minutes, Ricky... Yeah, boss? I think Mr. Dollar had better have an accident. Fall out of the window, perhaps. Oh, now, wait a minute, what? boss. I mean, well... Listen to me, Malone. I had two reasons for coming down here. To see if you were right about Dollar and to make sure of that fight tomorrow. You've been stalling with Al. You've taken too long. The heat is on up north. I need the dough. I told you, boss, that El Toro will I do it tomorrow. Fellas, Shut up. Uh... And look, if you take care of Dollar, what about me? What? Maybe you can get back to the States, but me, with, with Dollar laying dead here, and, and if Al talks... Al won't talk. You won't either. Frankie. Dollar has given us a perfect setup. He came here to Al's room. You found him here. Hmm? You had a fight... Dollar ends up in the street below. But what happens to me, Haven't then? I always taken care of you in the past when you were working for me? You know what will happen if you ever try to cross it. No, no, All right, listen, all right, I... all right. I have contacts down here. I have plenty of them. I have lawyers, good ones. It's going to be self-defense, pure and simple. But what if Al talks? I told you before, Ricky. You've taken too long with hey, him. Frankie, listen. While I hold this gun, you're going to take care of Al, too. The way you should have a long, long time ago in his Frank, fights. I, I don't no, understand. no, listen to me, Frank. You listen. I You've been in this whole thing just as deep as I have. And deeper. Because you're the one who's kept Al fighting. You've paid off all those phony medicos. You set him up for this El Toro tomorrow night. 
You'll do it, Ricky. No. Then I'll use the gun on all three of you. Frankie! You're out of your mind, Fortina. Am I? It will still look like a fight between you and Ricky. Boss. Al just happened to get hit accidentally by the gun that will be found beside your body. Boss. Hmm? Boss, I'll do it. <laughs> you bet you will. I'll do anything you say if you just help me get out of it. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Dollar is first. And, brother, if you think it's going to be easy. It's either the window or this gun, Dollar. So far as you're concerned, I don't care which. Go on, Ricky. Okay, Just remember, boss. your own life depends on it. You bet I... Why, <laughs> dirty, will you? The window, Ricky. The window, I said. Remember, it's your own life, Ricky. <laughs> All right, Fortina. So you have got a gun. Al. <laughs> uh, yeah, Johnny, I, I, I hit him, but... What I'll be. See, Senor Dollar, with one very fine, clean left hook. Well, Fortino was watching you and the uh, unfortunate Ricky. Yeah. You got here a little late, Garcia. You see, but uh, tell me, Senor, what makes you think this Al Coronado has lost his punch? Expense account item 13, $100. Legal expense, mainly a deposition for a lawyer to take to court. Just now, Garcia got me out of having to stay in Monterey for a hearing. I will never know, but he did. As for Al Coronado, I suggest the company make some adjustment in his policy that'll permit paying his annuities immediately. And why not? The company should have investigated more thoroughly before issuing this policy anyway. And if it doesn't show a little heart, well, I'm sure it will. Item 14, 50 Hotel and incidentals and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, four ninety one twenty. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a fast trip to the West Coast to an impossible case involving an impossible man. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Harry Bartell, Herb Ellis, Victor Perrin, Jack Crucian, Les Tremaine, and Lawrence Dobkin. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by the FBI in Peace and War. Dan Coverly speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, Universal Adjustment. Oh, hi, Pat. What's on your mind? The sleek, lovely, beautiful Ellen Deer. On the strength of that description, I'll take her. And she's loaded. $325,000 worth of jewelry. Hey, that girl needs a bodyguard, sleek. Yeah, yeah, Johnny. Needs a guard of some kind. Only she isn't a girl. She's a boat. I've just lost my enthusiasm. What's the matter with the old tub? That's what I want you to find out, Johnny. That last crack suddenly got me interested again. Okay, Pat, I'll be right over.
Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Western Maritime and Property Insurance Company, Los Angeles, California. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Ellen Deere matter. Expense account item 190 cents taxi from my apartment at the offices of Universal Adjustment Bureau in Hartford. Pat McCracken's usual smile was noticeably missing when I walked in on him. Come in, Johnny, and sit down. Thanks. Oh, and you're to bill Western Maritime and property on this one instead of us. Okay, but how are you involved? We handle all their claims that are of any size. Story, you ever hear of Randolph Berman? Mm, I know of a jeweler down in New York. That's the Berman. one. And if you know him, Johnny, you've been putting too much gravy in your expense account. I said no of him. Hmm. Didn't he bring in the uh, star of Cape Town and the Common Dew Emerald? That's right. Everybody seems to think he's a crook, and yet somehow he manages to handle some of the finest jewels in the world. How could an honest man afford it? Uh, this time it's the Betten House collection. It's out of Hungary. Oh, yeah, I read about that. Only I, I thought somebody down in Mexico owned it. Yeah, a fellow named Rigo Mariani, down in Guadalajara. He's the one who sold it to Randolph Berman. Okay, now. Is this Ellen Deere you mentioned, Berman's wife? Uh, no, no, no. Former, former wife. He's on about his fifth. All beautiful dumb dolls. But more important, it's the name of his 72-foot motor cruiser. Mm -hmm. And the Burmans have been traveling around in it, down the coast, through the canal, along the coast of Central America, and so on. Anyhow, when he got word that the Betten House collection could be had, he wasted no time in getting to Guadalajara. And that's where Western Maritime and Property comes in. Right. They had already written a policy on the boat for 52000 Their main office in Los Angeles was close at hand, so he had them write the policy on the jewels. Is that where Berman is now in Los Angeles? Oh, no, no. He's still in Mexico. Didn't want to move with those priceless rocks until he was certain of the insurance. And before Weston would write it, of course, they wanted the collection of prey. Naturally. But who in Mexico? Uh, Jacques Jean-Pierre, the famous gemologist, was right there in Guadalajara, you know, to look over the collection himself. Ah. So he made the appraisal. The policy has been issued. 325,000. I still don't see anything wrong with the whole deal, Pat. Well, there isn't anything wrong with it yet. But in spite of Berman's standing in the profession, he... His reputation, it isn't everything it might be. Yeah, come to think of it, wasn't there a killing or two involved in this acquisition of the Star there of Cape There have been Town? several things like that. He's been involved in attempts to smuggle in some valuable pieces. He's... Oh, well. He always managed somehow to come out smelling like a rose. Legally, perfectly clean, you understand? But you still don't trust him. Oh, that. no, no. And with his planning to carry that load of stuff around in his yacht. Yeah, see what you mean. If anything happened to those rocks or the boat, over 300 grand right out the window. Exactly. Now, belatedly, Western is worried about it. And they'll pay good money to have you assuage their worries. You have a Mexican tourist card? Sure, from my last fishing trip down there. And I think you better go down and guard that collection until Berman gets it safely up into the States. He's considered quite the host. He'll probably be perfectly willing to have you aboard. Now, this is the kind of assignment I like, yachting in the Blue Pacific. But surely he hasn't got his boat parked in Guadalajara. That's over 100 miles inland. Oh, it's at Mazatlan. And from what I've been able to learn, it's surrounded by armed guards day and night. Well, he has some engine work done. But as soon as that's finished, he'll head north to the state. So he says. Got a branch office in Los Angeles. He'll probably deliver the collection there. I just want to be sure he gets there, Johnny. Hmm? Okay, Pat. You can wire the boys at Weston that I'm on my way. <laughs> Item 2, 40, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Mazatlan via Los Angeles. The first leg of the flight to L.A. was uneventful. Except for a good-looking young blonde from Santa Barbara, whom I promised to look up as soon as his case is... Well, that's not for the expense account. <clears throat> when we arrived at the Los Angeles International Airport, I learned that I'd have a three-quarter-hour wait for my plane to Mazatlan. 
So I grabbed a magazine, that's item three, 35 cents, when I heard my name being called on the PA system. Johnny Dollar, report to Pan American Airways desk. With a thought in mind that perhaps my little friend from the plane might have decided to stay over in L.A. Her name was Rita, by the way. I lost no time in getting over to the Pan Am desk. Uh, Mr. Dollar? Yeah? Uh, Johnny Dollar? That's right. I'm Arthur Arthur, Western Maritime and Property Insurance Company. Oh, yeah, how do, Mr. Arthur? Planning to go on down to Mazatlan with me? Uh, no, no. But, uh, meet Monsieur Jacques Jean-Pierre. Monsieur Dollar, I am honored. How are you, Mr. Jean-Pierre? Uh, this is the gentleman who appraised the Batten House collection for us. Oh, yes, right. yes. I so am an expert. So could issue the policy on it to Mr. Berman. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he's done this sort of thing for us many times. Oh, I had not know I'm afraid that he's brought us rather bad news. Something's already happened to the collection? Well, not exactly. Not for the whole collection. No, I no, mean. not the, the well, whole collection. Uh, uh, please. Uh, that is, I'm not quite sure. What I mean is... Yeah, just what do you mean, Mr. Arthur? Uh, perhaps I should explain to Monsieur Dollar, eh? Well, I think somebody better. Yes, you go ahead, Jacques. Yeah, very well. And while you're doing it, I'll cancel the rest of Mr. Dollar's reservation to Mazatlan. Yes, I'll do it. Oh, clerk... Oh, no, wait a minute. First, let me find out what this is all about. Ah, uh, oui, oui, oui. Oh, oui. very well. Jacques here was in Guadalajara when the Betton House collection became available for purchase. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, Monsieur Dollar. I had gone there in the hope that some of the pieces might be purchased separately. So? Alas, such was not the case. The Mariani firm decided to dispose of the collection only as a whole. I see. Well, what's this bad news you have? Ah, I am getting to yes, that. Yes, you see, it's this way. No, please, please. Ah, yes, please. Well, then, then go ahead, John. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Monsieur Dollar, interested as I was, I looked over the collection very carefully, each individual piece. Oh, yeah, oh, and you know, must so. believe me, to an expert like myself, every facet of every gem has a character all its own. A precious stone is like a face to me, always to be remembered. Yeah. Well, go on, please. I simply wish to make it clear to you, monsieur, that every item in the Bettenhouse collection is completely familiar to me. Oh, it is? As are many other important gems throughout the world. You know, each is like a friend. And each stone in them is like a face. Ah, precisely. Always to be remembered. Yes, yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, well, uh... The, the, the collection is purchased by Monsieur Randolph Berman. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Yes, Berman. Please, please. Uh, uh, he wishes to insure it in Monsieur Arthur's company. Yeah, I know all that. Well, Monsieur Arthur requests by telephone that I appraise it. Three hundred and twenty-five thousand. Ah, then you know. I know. So, I stay at Guadalajara a few days to wait Monsieur Arthur's check for my service. Yes. You want to be sure uh, the check please, please, please. I visit some of my old friends among the jewel setters. And then... Then, on the third day, what do you think happened? You tell me. Johnny, this is it. In the shop... No, no, please, yeah. monsieur. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. In the shop of my friend Garcia, Hernandez, I watch him work on the mound for a beautiful diamond. And suddenly, I see that the stone is an old friend. One from the Patton House collection? Are we? The caliber diamond that was supposedly in the possession of Monsieur Berman. You're sure of the identity of that stone, Mr. Jean-Pierre? Oh, please. As I told you, monsieur, a precious stone to yeah, me... Yeah, yeah, it's like a face to you. So what you figure, Arthur, is that you've insured a boatload of $300,000 worth of gems on the way to the USA, and maybe they're not on board. Exactly. Unless, of course... Mr. That... Jean-Pierre, did you tell Mr. Berman about this one stone? Oh, I went immediately to Mazatlan, where I knew he had his boat, the LND. Well, what did he say? Uh, alas, he had sailed away. Did you learn his destination? Oh, he, yes. Uh, 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 Los Angeles, Johnny, right here. He has a branch office. Well, has he had time to get here yet? I don't think so. Have you tried radioing to his yacht? No, no, I've done nothing. You see, I didn't learn about this until Mr. Jean-Pierre arrived just a few hours ago. Yes, I came up on the aeroplane. The better to arrive and speak with Mr. Arthur before Monsieur Berman would arrive. Do you know where Berman plans to dock his boat? Well, I... I, I, Probably the, the port in San Pedro, if he is coming here. But who can be sure? Usually on vacation trips, he docks down the coast of Balboa, the yacht club. Or, who knows, he might even... Yeah... He might have no intention of coming up to the States at all. He might not even have the jewels with him. He... Arthur, do you know where his branch office is? Oh, oh yes, it, uh, it's in Los Angeles. Well, actually, it's in Beverly Hills. Got a car? Uh, yeah. Then let's go. Though he couldn't quite put his finger on it, Arthur was convinced that Randolph Berman was up to something and that his insurance company was going to have to take the rap. On the way into Berman's Beverly Hills office, we dropped Jean-Pierre at the Beverly Hilton and told him to sit tight in case we needed him again. Berman's office was in a nice modern building on South Beverly Drive, tastefully furnished with pictures of various famous jewels on the walls, but with nothing of particular value in evidence. However, I did notice that one wall held a built-in vault big enough for a reasonably sized bank. 
We were approached by a hand-rubbing, obsequious little character dressed in striped pants and cutaway coat and wearing thick glasses. Good morning, gentlemen. Is there any way I may be of service to you? Yeah, I think there is. Are you oh, the... Oh, Mr. Arthur, forgive me. I didn't recognize you for a moment. Uh, Mr. Carello, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Hi. How do you do? Is there something I may show you, Mr. Dollar? Some little uh, bauble, perhaps, for a charming lady? Well, not at the moment, Mr. Carello. Oh. Oh, Mr. Arthur, there's no reason to mail this to you. Uh, let me see now. Oh, yes, here it is. Uh, here is a request for slight revision of the policy on the Bretton House collection. Oh? What's this? Well, the wire was sent by Mr. Berman just before he embarked for Mazatland. I was going to put it into letter form to be more What's proper. What's But, well, uh, now here, I'll, I'll read this. Please request Arthur revise Benton House policy. Exclude Calabar Diamond. Value 4000 which I have sold private party in Guadalajara. Oh, well, we kind of guessed wrong, didn't we, Johnny? Hmm. Mr. Carello. Yes. Has Mr. Berman wired you whether he's coming here? Oh, of course he is, with that collection. When? When is he going to arrive? Well, his lovely yacht, the El India, should reach San Pedro Harbor late tonight. But that's what he wired me, and I intend to meet him there. Then I'm sure you won't mind if I go with you. Oh? Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar is a special investigator. Investigator? Well, actually, I'm here just to help Mr. Berman protect that collection. Oh, excellent. Then you can arrange for the police escort. Yes, and alert the harbor police to guard the El India, as Mr. Berman requested. Did he request that? Oh, indeed. But apparently he hasn't been worried about anything happening to the collection while he's at sea. At sea? Oh. Surely you don't mean pirates or anything like that in this modern day and age. (laughs) You know something? At this point, I'm not quite sure what I mean. Or even why I'm here. Uh, Well, of course. um, Well. Well, of course what, Arthur? Oh, excuse me while I answer that. Well, I mean... Berman uh, Jewel. Uh, that is... Uh, what? Uh, well, at least I'll feel better when the stuff is here in the vault. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, no. Carello at the phone paled visibly, then gasped and clutched the back of a chair for support as he listened on the phone. His jaw dropped, his eyes widened, and he shook his head once or twice in horrified disbelief. Finally, slowly, he hung up and came unsteadily toward us. Mr. Carello. Yeah, what is it, Mr. Carello? The, the Coast Guard. Yes? They said the Ellender, the yacht. Yes? Sunk. What? In 600 feet of water in the outer channel. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. What has it to do with money, the medium of exchange of mankind? A couple of thousand years ago, it was said that money alone sets the world in motion. That's one way of saying that money and economy are virtually one and the same thing. The economy of a nation depends on its commerce. Commerce depends on manufacturing and services. It has been proven that those nations which practice democracy have the greatest economics. That means money, more money for more people, and a greater freedom of opportunity to earn a higher standard of living. That's why democracy provides mankind with its richest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Ellen Deere Matter. Expense account item four, seven dollars even for a fast taxi ride to Coast Guard headquarters in San Pedro, which is really the port of Los Angeles. By dint of elbowing my way in, I got directly to Captain Barney Thorson. I'm afraid you got only half the story, Mr. Dollar. All I know, Captain, is that the Ellen Deer went down in some 600 feet of water in the outer channel. Total loss. That's correct. However, what you don't know is that the passengers, Mr. and Mrs. Berman, and the crew were picked up and brought in here. Oh, Outside of a little soaking and a little scare, they were perfectly all right. You see, the Ellen Deer had apparently had some engine trouble before she left Mazatlan. Yes, so I understand. Mexican authorities, with whom we fully cooperate, notified us we'd better keep an eye out for her. So when she reached the channel, we weren't surprised to get a radio call from her asking us to stand by that Universal joint was kicking up. Is that what happened? By the time one of our cutters got within hailing distance, she was on the way down. That propeller shaft had whipped loose, torn through the hull, and the Ellen Deer was sinking fast. Ask me, that boat was overpowered, Dollar. 
How do you mean? Well, it must have been because sheer torque tore the whole engine loose from its mountings. And it plowed through the bottom along with everything else on board that was heavy. It was a big safe, for instance, anchored to mid. There was a what? A safe. A safe, you know, a small, heavy steel vault. Yeah, I know. That went down, too? Yeah, with the engine. It was all our boys could do to keep the owner from diving over after it. It was crying like a baby. You'd think he'd had the crown jewels in it. <sighs> Maybe you're not too wrong at that. What? Not the crown jewels, perhaps, but a collection worth something over 300 grand. Now, what about salvage? Salvage operations in 600 feet of water in that channel? Oh, yeah. No, no, Dollar. Salvage, even if it were possible, it'd cost a couple of times the worth of that stuff, at least. The only passengers were the Burmans, huh? That's right. Prove three. And they weren't able to save anything? Nothing. Not of any consequence, that is. One of the crew didn't even have his shoes and his shirt on. What about Berman and his wife? <laughs> it's funny what people will do in an emergency sometimes. What do you mean? Well, you've heard about the man whose house catches fire, he gets panicky, throws all the china and the glassware out the window, and carries out the mattress. What are you getting at, Captain? The only thing that Berman saved in his excitement was two beat-up old hats and a fishing rod. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. And all his wife brought along was a handful of nylon stockings. She was hanging on to them for dear life. Oh, yeah, a big hat box with an evening dress half hanging out of it. And that's all? That's all. Hey, you know, that Mrs. Berman's quite a dish. Not too bright, but a real looker. Where are they now, Captain? They're headed for Beverly Hills. Yeah. Beverly Wilshire was the hotel, I think. In any event, Dollar, I'm afraid your company is going to have a big, fat claim to pay. On the yacht, yes. What's that mean? What do you think? <laughs> Item 5, 320, long-distance call to the police in Mazatlan. I wanted to be sure that the Benton House collection had been on board the Ellen Deer when she left port down there. Inspector Romulo assured me it had, that he'd checked the safe on the boat himself before allowing it to sail. Furthermore, he had insisted his own maritime service keep tabs on it up to the point where it made contact with the U.S. Coast Guard. In other words, the loot couldn't very well have been passed to someone else at sea. Item 6, 580 cab fare to Beverly Hills, where I dropped in at Berman's office. No, Mr. Dollar, he and Mrs. Berman are at the Beverly Wilshire. I'm sure you understand it's been necessary for them to buy a lot of clothes and things. Yeah, but he will come here. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, from his last phone call, I'd say he'll be here within the hour. All right, then I'll come back. Please ask him to stick around and wait for me if he doesn't mind. Of course, Mr. Dollar, I should be glad to. Oh, incidentally, he has had me phone Mr. Arthur and ask that claim forms for both the Bettenhaus collection and the loss of the cruiser be brought here to the office just as quickly as possible. Yeah, I'd figured as much. <laughs> Berman wasn't wasting any time. Oh, I know there still wasn't any concrete evidence that Berman was trying to pull a fast one. Ostensibly, the only reason for my trip out here was to watch over that fabulous jewel collection. A lot of good I'd been. He'd lost the collection and his boat, and the company'd have to pay. Then a wild idea hit me. I suddenly remembered something that had happened months ago. Last July, to be exact, when a big passenger liner... The Andrea Doria had sunk off the Atlantic coast. According to the papers, when the survivors were brought into the port, the usual customs inspection was waived. And it occurred to me at the time that every one of those people could have easily smuggled in anything he could carry or conceal in his clothing. I'm not saying it did happen. I'm sure it didn't. But it could have. And if such an idea occurred to me, why not to a man like Berman, who was already pretty well known for his tricks to evade customs? Item 6, 20 cents. Phone call to the Coast Guard and Captain Thorson. Thorson speaking. Johnny Dollar, Captain. Answer me just one question, will you? Sure. What? When you brought them in, were the Bermans required to pass through customs? Well, no, of course not. There'd hardly be any reason to... Thank you very much. <laughs> Item 7, 10 cents. Another call. This time to Arthur Arthur at Western Maritime and Property Insurance. You caught me in the nick of time, Johnny. I was just walking out the door. On your way to Berman's office? Why, yes. With a handful of claims forms? Yes. Now listen, get there as fast as you can. Get there ahead of him. What? So that you can see if he brings anything into the office, like the Betton House collection. What? Though I doubt if he'd be that foolish. Foolish or not, how could he, Johnny? That collection, unfortunately, is at the bottom of the ocean. Listen to me. Keep him there. Maybe on the pretext of having to wait for me. Any reason you can think of. I'm afraid I don't understand. Just hold him until I get there, understand? Very well, Johnny. But what are you going to do? Arthur, I may have to break in and rob a hotel room. 
I went out and stationed myself across the street from the Beverly Wilshire. Five minutes later, I saw Randolph Berman walk out the front door and head east on Wilshire Boulevard in the direction of his office on Beverly Drive. I waited a few minutes to make sure he didn't turn back, then entered the hotel. At the desk, I learned the number of Berman's suite on the ninth floor. Break in? It would have taken a battering ram. So I tried knocking. You forget your key and... No. Get out of here, buddy. Randy said not to let anybody in. He's out buying us clothes. Oh, he'd tell you to let me in, baby. Hey, who are you? Hernandez sent me up here from Guadalajara. Oh, then come in. Oh, you are in. Yeah. Well, have a drink, then. No, thanks. A girl's entitled to a couple of drinks after that dousing in the ocean, and you might as well... What about Hernandez? Your husband sold him the wrong stone from that collection. Sold? Oh, he gave it to him. Oh, then you know about it. Oh, sure. So he could make a legit-looking change in the insurance and convince everybody he was on the up and... You sure you're from Hernandez? You kidding? How else would I know about the whole deal? I don't know. Hey, Randy said not to let anybody in here or he'd kill me. Dumb blonde, he called me. You? A smart, beautiful girl like you? Hey, you're okay. My name's Vi. Come on, let's have a drink. No, no, thanks. Uh, Listen, Vi, I've got to get the right stone from that collection, the caliber diamond. Then I'll leave this one I've got in my pocket here. Which one you got? Let me see it. Oh, no, no, only Mr. Berman. And only when he gives me the calabar. Well, which one you got there, huh? Well, never mind. I'll show it to Mr. Burns. I just want to see it. Not until I get the calabar from the collection. So, if he isn't here, if he's taking it to the office, uh-huh. I'll just... You think he's crazy? Let everybody know he... Well, let me see the one you have, huh? Look, I just told you. Anyway, how do I know where I can trust you? I didn't even see you in Guadalajara. Oh, now you sound like Randy. Dumb blonde, he says. Keep the door locked. But I let the bellboy in with the drinks, and I let you in, didn't I? Now, let me see the one you got. Will you, if I get you the other one? From the hat box that didn't have to go through customs? How did you know? Hey, you're cutie. I bet you read about the Andrew Dorsier, just like Randy did. Come on, now let's take Where a is look. the hat box, Vi? Now, wait a minute. Maybe I am dumb. Who did you say you are? Where's the hat box? No. No, I won't tell you. You get out of here. Now, without the collection, Vi. No, you can't. He... Randy would kill me. He'd kill me if he even knew I let you in here. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Oh, please, Johnny, get out of here. The stuff in the bedroom? You can't go in there. I mean it. He'd kill me. Sorry, but that's your worry. Oh, no. Stop it or I'll set your eyes out. Hey, no, you can't. Pull in those claws, baby. No, you... Well, I hate to do this, but... No, no, help! Help! Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. Get the manager up here. Get the police up here. Police? No. Oh, yes. Then you'd really be in trouble. You'd be better off if Berman tried to kill you. Now, where's the stuff? It's in the closet, on the floor, in the hat box. Thanks. Well, well. Just a handful, but worth a fortune. Well. Oh, now, wait a minute, girl. Put down that bottle. I, I, I gotta stop you. He'd kill me, don't you understand? Just for letting you in here. You don't know him. Look, baby, you're in this thing deep enough as it is. Don't try to make it any worse for yourself. But when he finds out that I... Listen. Yeah, he's come back. Don't I open up? Get my hands full. When I do, where will I go? Right here, behind this closet door. Quick. Ah! Johnny, Just I... stay there. Hang on to that bottle and think over what I told you about getting in deep. Hi, where'd you get these drinks? You got somebody in here. Bellboy? Hi, you half-witted bird brain. I told you. 
Who are you? The name is Dollar, Mr. Berman. Insurance Dick? I just dropped by to pick up the Benton House collection. Put it down, Dollar. I'm a good shot with this thing. Yeah. And it wouldn't be the first time you killed over a handful of jewelry, would it? That's right. Won't be the last. But you'll never know about it. Now, where's Vi? How should I know? She let you in here? I'll murder that dizzy blonde. That dizzy blonde is a lot smarter than you think. Where is she? What do you mean? By helping me, she has a chance of getting out of this mess you've involved her in. Of getting out clean. That dirty two-time and... Dollar, I'm going to kill you. You'd even like to involve her in that, too, wouldn't you? Thanks for the idea. I'll make it look like she killed you. Oh, no, you... (laughs) Nice work with that bottle, Vi. But he missed you. Please, you won't let him... No, no, don't worry, baby. He won't bother anybody. Not for a long, long time. Item 8, $245 even. Incidentals during a couple of days of relaxation under the California sun and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $453.95. Remarks? By way of getting off as easily as possible, Vi sang like a canary. And incidentally, cleared up a couple of other of his shady deals. Result? By the time his prison term runs out, he'll be too long dead to collect the insurance on his yacht. End of remarks, end of report. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the DeSalle matter. And I promise you a double barrel thrill in it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Howard McNear, Jay Novello, Jack Edwards, Barney Phillips, and Raymond Burr. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hillary Fuchs, Johnny. How's your time these days? Time to live, time to die, you know. What's up? A claim on a $100,000 policy. I want it investigated. 100000 What kind of policy? Straight life. You sound worried. I am. I think we're going to be taken this time, Johnny. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Continental Insurance and Trust Company, 657 North Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the DeSalle matter. I'd heard of Dave DeSalle. I guess everybody in this country's heard of him at one time or another. DeSalle Television, DeSalle Radio, DeSalle Electronics, DeSalle Appliances, Racetracks, Theaters, DeSalle this and that. But up until the time I talked to Hillary Fuchs about the case, I had never put a man behind the name. Expense account item one, two bucks, two drinks for Hillary Fuchs and myself. We had them in his Hillary office Johnny out of my bottle over his desk. Thing. Just plain worn out with it. <laughs> stuck. <laughs> Ooh, have some water. Mm. Oh. But I'll tell you this. I'm not going to make a present of $100,000 of stockholders' money to anybody. I wouldn't do that either. Drink your drink. Here's to war. Salute. Now, while that's settling, maybe you'll settle down and tell me what it's all about. Dave DeSalle. Know him? I've heard the name, yeah. Well, he's dead. Drowned four days ago out on the coast. So? Did you ever see our K-Policy series? I've heard of it. Well, the premium's about triple a normal life policy. It's designed only for people with big money. Sure. But it's got a feature that makes those people with money look at it a long time. Uh-huh. This clause isn't anything more or less than the old accident clause paying double indemnity. Broken down, we aren't taking much of a chance. The incident statistics are with us. All right, I'll look it up if I need it. Okay. Three months ago, we insured Dave DeSalle on one of those K policies. Four days ago, he fell off the back of a yacht and drowned, and we're hooked for $100,000. Accidents happen. You betcha, all the time. But I'm not sure it was an accident. At least there's not enough proof in this coroner's report to convince me. You say it happened four days ago? Yes. Has a claim been filed yet? Yes, and the beneficiary is the deceased's widow. Inquest? Inquest, burial, everything. Was there an autopsy? No, there was not. Investigation? Yes, it was handled by the local police in San Ladeo. San Juan? San Ladeo, a little place about 30 miles south of Los Angeles. Four days ago. Why didn't you put someone on it then? I did. Bert Kenyon. Here's his last report. Uh. No evidence available to dispute coroner's verdict of accidental drowning. Recommend claim be honored. Kenyon. Uh, sounds like cold turkey to me. It may sound that way to you, but I still don't like it. I want it warmed up. Now, look, Bert Kenyon knows his way around. And he can miss like anyone else. I want you to go out there and work with him. Cover it all again. Get it to Saul's widow. She stands to gain most by his death. Maybe the two of you can come up with something. Well, what do you do about the claim? Deny liability on the grounds that the accident is not proven. Hillary, you will be sued. I'll take that chance. Fuchs was an old chance taker who had been raised in the insurance business. The kind of man who gave a claim every kind of test, and if it still passed, he sat down and smelled the paper it was written on. And if he didn't like that, he'd take his chance. Expense account item two, $138, plane fare to Los Angeles. Item three, $3, a telegram to Bert Kenyon advising him of my arrival which turned out to be at 1 o'clock in the morning, 10 minutes ahead of a fog that blanked out the whole area at the airport. Johnny! Johnny Dollar! What? Oh, hey, Bert. Uh, How are you? Johnny, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, Come on, I got a car. Well, have you got a cigarette? I ran out two hours ago. Ah, sure, man. There you go. Well, good to see you. Good to see you, boy. The last time I saw Bert Kenyon was July, a year ago, in Dayton, Ohio. He was there working on an arson claim for the National Underwriters. Before that, I'd run into him in Denver, Portland, and Chicago. And we'd worked together for two weeks in New Orleans on the San Antonio case. He sent me a Christmas card every year. I sent him one. We were as close and as far apart as two friends can be. When I saw him this time, he looked tired and thinner. And he lit one cigarette after the other. You like San Ladeo, Johnny? Yeah, how's the hotel? Uh, old Spanish job. Big rooms, fireplaces, smells kind of damp all the time. You get used to it. Are you uh, tired? Yeah. Well, uh, tell me about the claim, Bert. Nothing to tell. Routine so far. Oh, well, Fuchs was pretty worried about it. He doesn't like the coroner's report. Ah, you know, Fuchs, worry, worry. That's what he gets paid for. Oh, well, that's what we get paid for, too. Okay, okay. On the face of it, I'd question the claim right away. Just on the three months period alone, I'd question it. You still think it was an accident? I think we should pay up and shut up. I'd like to admit this to sell guy, Johnny. Stocks and bonds and pretty blondes. He sure had them all. Where till you meet Mrs. DeSalle? Where till you see the layout? Boy. 
And Fuchs worrying about a hundred thousand dollar claim. Do you know how much DeSalle's widow is worth? Eight million dollars. A hundred thousand dollars means about that much to her. Not that much. Peanuts. You want to hear something funny? Real funny? Go on. DeSalle bought that policy one day at the racetrack at Del Mar. Yeah. Because an insurance broker gave him a tip on a horse. Yeah. <laughs> I can just see Fuchs worrying about his hundred thousand and finding out about that part. How did you find out about it? Mrs. DeSalle, she told me the story. What about her? Now, what about her? She's a beneficiary. Well, I told you, a hundred thousand doesn't mean a thing to her. Why would she kill him for a hundred thousand dollars? Why not? Fuchs sent you out here to take over because he thinks I lost stuff, didn't he, Johnny? He sent me out to see if I could give you a hand. He wants us to cover the whole thing again. Wouldn't kid an old pal, would you? I'd never try, Bert. <laughs> I bet you wouldn't. I just bet you wouldn't. In another ten minutes, we were in San Ladillo, a sprawling little town built around a natural harbor. The houses looked expensive, the boats even more expensive. Kenyon pointed out one house on a hill, a three-story affair with an acre or so of lawns around it. He explained it was the DeSalle home. I checked into the San Ladillo Hotel and got a good night's sleep. Next morning, Bert Kenyon and I went over to the statements of everyone who had been on the yacht the night DeSalle went overboard. Then we went out and interviewed everybody again, including Mrs. DeSalle. It's getting awfully dull. You understand we have to do this. All right. Dave and I were having drinks with a few friends. He said he felt like getting a little air. He went up on deck. A few minutes later, someone was looking for him. Mr. Burke. It might have been. Well, that's what's on your statement. All right. Mr. Burke. We couldn't find Dave, and then I remembered he was on deck. We went up there and saw his hat floating on the water. We looked around. We didn't see him. I sent one of the crew to call for help. They fished him out an hour or so later. You were never on deck until then? No, I wasn't. Who were they? You said they fished him out. The police. Someone. I don't know. There were a lot of men. They tried to give him artificial respiration. Well, what did you do? I watched. What else was there to do? Hard thing to watch, Mrs. DeSalle. Your husband just drowned. Yes. Yes, it was. Is that all? Yeah. That's all. Come in. Hi. Well, what's all this? Thought you'd be in bed. Just going over the reports again. Well, what do you think? Oh, I don't know. I'm trying to make up my mind, Bert. About Mrs. DeSalle, the way she looks, the way she acts. I told you she was something. Yeah, sure. Fifty men that sell their souls to be tied up with her one way or another. She had help, Bert. What? She had to have help to kill him. A dozen people swear she was below drinking martinis with him, so someone was up on deck waiting for DeSalle. What have you got to go on? DeSalle swam the English Channel 20 years ago. He should have been able to swim 20 feet to a gangplank. Drunk or sober, he should have been able to do that. I knew about that swimming business. Expert swimmers drown all the time. We both know that. What else? Well, why didn't somebody hear him yell? Maybe he didn't. Everybody lets out a yell in a situation like that, falling or in the water. There were a dozen people aboard. One of them should have heard him yell. Yeah, I guess you're right. All right, suppose he didn't yell. But suppose this coroner made a mistake about the bruises on the side of his head. Suppose they happened before he went over the side. Well, it'd be hard to prove now, Johnny. Oh, look, she's got a boyfriend somewhere, Bert. She had to have one. The servants can be gone over. Somebody at the house has seen him. He's called her, sent her messages. He's our boy. We can bring him out in the open. We'll get help from Los Angeles. We'll call the legal department and get them busy. Get permission to exhume the body and have an autopsy. We'll Johnny. bring... What? Let this one go, huh? What? Drop it. It's just lousy enough to get by, Fuchs. We got a good case, Bert. I know. I've known it all along, Johnny. A sellout? 
Mrs. DeSalle offered me the whole hundred thousand. The whole hundred thousand, Johnny, to let it get by. <sighs> Who helped you do it? I don't know. I wasn't interested anymore when she came up with the offer. Look, what does DeSalle mean to you and me? Nothing. He had a whole life the best it could give him. We can't bring him back. I'll split the hundred thousand with you, Johnny. We'd have a little chance for some things, too. Johnny? Bird. No deal? No deal. Now you're a good dick, Johnny. Stand up. Oh, put that thing away. I've been looking a long time for a mark like this. Now you've lost it up and I have to beat it. Turn around. Bert. So long, Johnny. I went down to my knees trying to hold onto the desk. I saw him stand there a minute, like he might want to help me. And then he was gone. I did everything I could to make my feet, but my legs wouldn't work. And then it was all over. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. What does it mean? The word itself is of Greek origin. Demos meaning the people and kratos meaning authority. Thus, in a democracy, the people have the authority to rule themselves. But where does the authority come from? The authority comes from the people themselves. They put it in their constitution, and the constitution can't be changed by anyone except the people. That puts the supreme power of the government of a democratic country right in the hands of the people. And the people elect their representatives to run the government. In that manner, democracy gives everyone equal representation in the government. Democracy provides mankind with its greatest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the DeSalle Matter. <laughs> Light on the desk was the first thing I saw. It was still on. The window was still open. The room was the way it had been before. I kept thinking about every man having a price and how Bert Kenyon had settled for $100,000. It seemed like a fair price. It also seemed too bad there was no way for him to collect it. There were two of them. A heavy set man about 50 years old and a tall, lean-faced man with dark eyes. They looked me over. Your name Dollar? Yeah. Police, we want to talk to you. My name's Blair. This is Sergeant LaFrida. You sick or something? I bumped my head. How? Never mind. Well, what do you want? We'll ask the questions. What are you doing in San Ladeo? I'm standing around in a hotel room talking to a couple of cops. Just answer up. Don't be funny, fella. I don't feel even a little bit funny. You uh, got a license to carry this gun? Hey, what is this? Have you? Yes. Your meat-handed friend ought to put it down or it might go off. Been fired, Tom? Ah. Uh, Meathead, huh? That's what I said. I'll remember that. Okay, Oak. Tell us about it. Tell us what you're doing here. And don't waste a lot of time doing it. I'm an insurance investigator. Tell this goon to back away and undouble his fist or I'll break a chair over his head. Are you going to try to be tough, baby? I'm going to try to find out what this is all about. You want me to pop him open to see if he's as tough as he sounds? Behave yourself, Tom. Let's see something that says you're an insurance dick. Top of the dresser. Bring it over, Tom. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now tell us what you're doing in town. The DeSalle case. Now you tell me what you're... You know Bert Kenyon? I know him. I've been working with him. He's been around town four or five days. We haven't seen you. I only got here this morning. You could prove all that, could you? Oh, sure. With a plane ticket, with a hotel clerk downstairs, with a bellhop who brought up my luggage, with a dozen people or more I've talked to today. And tonight? What about tonight? Right here. You could prove that, too? Try the clerk downstairs. There's Kenyon. Where is Kenyon? I don't know. You ought to know. Why don't you sit down, Tom? Okay, okay. Now, when did you see Kenyon last? A couple of hours ago. Now, tell us what you talked about, and don't forget anything. We talked about the DeSalle case. Kenyon have something new on it? No. 
Don't hold out on me, boy. This is police business. Tom here's pretty edgy for a cop, but I'll turn him loose on you if I have to because I haven't got a whole lot of time to waste being sweet. Tom worries me to death. One more minute. Just one more minute is all I'm going to take off this guy. Oh, shut up. I'll ask you again, Dollar. What's new on the DeSalle case? What did Kenyon tell you? The way we look at it, you came out here because something new popped up that might take two guys to handle it. Look at it any way you want to. Blair, are you going to take this stuff? Never mind. Okay. Get your hat and coat, Dollar. We're going to see a fella. Not unless I know why. And I mean that. Dollar, your buddy's been killed. What? Canyon. Somebody shot him up an hour ago. I put on my clothes and we went downstairs and climbed into a battered-looking police car. Tom Lafrida drove. I sat with Blair in the back seat. No one said anything. A half a mile out of San Ladillo, we turned onto the main highway and drove to a spot about two miles away, all-night filling station. There were a couple of highway patrol cars there, an ambulance, and men in dark suits who looked the way policemen always look. Wait here. Keep an eye on him, Tom. Sure. Be just a minute. <laughs> He's a soft old gink. I suppose you're hard. I know how to handle pinballs like you. Before we're through, you and me, we'll have it out. Okay, Dollar, get out. Yeah, sure. Tom, put the spotlight on him. Okay. Good. Now, Posey. Posey, take a good look at this man. You ever seen him before? No. Look good. Take your time, boy. No, a man I saw was shorter by this much. He wasn't as husky. Okay. You go on back to your place there and get some sleep, boy. That all? There'll be more of a morning. Go along now. Sure. Night. What was all that? Tom, get out. You sit sure. around here with Dick and Wally. Okay. You're the boss. You get in the front, daughter. You're lucky. Posey didn't recognize you. I suppose I am. Why? An hour ago, Posey's pumping gas. He hears three or four shots off in the dark. Then a car starts up and gets out of there real fast. Then Posey sees your pal Kenyon stagger out across the highway, full of lead. Kenyon drops dead right in front of the station. That's him, the mopping up now. We had half an idea you might have been the man beaten in the car. That's a dumb idea. Well, he was shot close up, like it was somebody we was just standing talking to, an old friend. You're an old friend of his. Claire, you got it all wrong. Huh? We haven't been friends for three hours. His full name was George Blair. He'd been on the Los Angeles force 12 years. Then they retired him in half pay when a holdup man shot off part of his right foot. He'd taken the San Ladillo job because it was the only police force he could find that would take a man who limp more than a little. Expense account item four, 20 cents coffee for Lieutenant Blair and myself. I don't know. Maybe he went at you the wrong way in that hotel room. That's my fault. But a man's been murdered, and I get excited about things like that. I don't blame you. No hard feelings? No. As long as I don't have to do business with your boy, Tom. Yeah, I got Tom Lafrida and three other boys. None of them worth the press in their pants. I need help, darling. What? This town's popping open tonight. Your buddy got it, and it's tied in with this DeSalle thing somewhere. You sure he didn't have anything new for you? No. Mm. You wouldn't want to tell me about that bump in your head, would you? Not right now, no. My boys are so green, they tromped all over the boat the night the sail drowned. They loused up anything that might have helped me to find out how he went over the side. They banged his head against the dock a few times, bringing him in. I couldn't tell if the bruises were there before or after he was in the water. You don't think the sail was accidental? I was murdered. She had somebody do it. Well, why didn't any of that come out in the coroner's report? My coroner runs a drugstore when he isn't being a coroner. If you feed him enough scotch, he'll tell you whether somebody's dead or not. He don't know from nothing. You know, the thing that kind of got me was this Kenyon. He went along with that coroner's report. I know that. You both know that. All right, I'll lay it on the line. I need help, Dollar. If I'm going to get anything done, find out who killed Kenyon, and get at this to sell thing, I need help. All right, I'll help you. I was hoping you'd say that. More coffee? No. 
Dollar. What? You can start by telling me about that bruise in your head. <sighs> Kenyon. He sold out, did he? Yeah. To Mrs. DeSalle. He covered up for her and the reports he sent in. Hmm. A man back in Hartford got suspicious and sent me out to make a recheck. Yeah, I guess something like that. No dummies, those claims, men. Look, uh, who'd he say was in on it? He didn't say. I don't think he really knew. At least not any more than you and me. Mm. No wonder you didn't want to talk up that kind of news. Kind of hurts, doesn't it? Like having a bad cop around. You should know. I know. Well... How do you feel? Mister, I feel lousy. A friend of mine's been shot. What's more, he died a bum. Well, I'm talking about dropping in on people while the smoke's still hanging around. Mrs. DeSalle? Yeah. Let's go. It was about a quarter to seven in the morning when we left the diner. By 7.30, we were winding up the driveway to the DeSalle mansion overlooking the ocean. Claire mumbled things about the fog lifting and what a nice day it would be. I smoked cigarettes and looked and watched the contented smile he kept on his face. Well, what do you know? Mm. Tommy LaFrieda's car. Oh, what does that mean? Well, let's find out. Tommy's off duty at 6 o'clock, as far as I know. Ah, I told you it was going to be a nice day. Yeah, you did it then. Nice place. The only thing nicer is Buckingham Palace. Hmm. Mr. DeSalle picks up all these little knickknacks when we probate that will. The boat down there, everything. Nice. Yes? Mrs. DeSalle, please. At this hour of the morning, she's still asleep. Yeah, uh, we kind of guess she might be in bed. You tell her the police are here and want to talk to her. Police? Now you got it. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just a moment. That's you, Blair. Hello, Tom. I'm waiting to see her, too. Thought she might have a little something to say that'd help in that Kenyon killing and be willing. You remember Mr. Dollar? Mister? That's what I said, Tom. What is this? He's giving me a hand. You trust him. Better than I do you. What kind of a crack is that? No crack. Just that you're always talking and you ought to be listening. Besides that, you've been drinking again. Uh, Go on, get your hat and get out of here. No I just me, gave man. you an order. Beat it. No. He'd like to kill somebody, that bird. I'm not so sure he didn't. You got a gun in that coat? No. Take mine. What? I don't like him being here. It just came to me. He was the first one down at the dock the night the Sal got it. The first one. Her boyfriend? Could be. I can't awaken Mrs. DeSalle. You'll have to come later. Oh, we'll handle that part. Which room is hers? But you can't come in here. Which like room? Just, uh, uh, top of the stairs, the first door. Well, you run along and buy yourself a cup of coffee. Come on, Dollar. You can't go up there at this hour of the morning and break in on her. Mrs. DeSalle. No. Hey, get the light switch. Yeah. Come near me, please. Don't come near me, please. Please. Oh, please, I won't tell. I won't tell Mrs. anyone. Mrs. DeSalle, I just... Beaten up. Good Lord. Please. Oh, please don't. Look, Mrs. DeSalle, we aren't going to hurt you. Tell us who did this to you. Tell us why. <laughs> Tom LaFrieda? Was it Tom? Tom helped you get rid of your husband, is that right? We know that's right. Now, what about Kenyon? Tom killed him. LaFrieda killed him. Why? He wanted money to get away. Tom said it'd be easier. Easier to kill him off than let him go. Tom did this. Yeah. Why? He said people would be around to see me. Not to, to talk about anything. Not to talk about anything. This is George Blair. Get an ambulance over to the cell place fast. He said he loved me. He never loved anything, anything in his life. <laughs> you big fat pig. Turn around and get it. I'll warn you, Tom. Dollar's got my gun. He's next. You look at mine. <laughs> you all right? Okay. His went in the ceiling. You? Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, he's gone. What made him, Dollar? What made him? All these knickknacks and her. <laughs> Expense account item 525 bucks. One phone call to Hartford. I told Hillary Fuchs the whole story, and he promised to send out the necessary legal aid. Item 6, $10. Flowers for Bert Kenyon. Item 7, $2. One drink. To one good cop with a bad foot. The drink cost a buck. The glass cost a buck. The drink for the good. The smashed glass for the bad. Oh, yeah, it was hammy, but it made me feel... Expense account total, $416. Remarks, none. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one of the sweetest old characters I ever met. And with him, one of the cleverest killers. Join us, won't you? Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is written by John Dawson and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, John Stevenson, Will Wright, James McCallion, and Ben Wright. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Paul Brennan, Inter-Allied Insurance Company, Johnny. Oh, hi, Paul. How's the world doing by you? Oh, I got troubles. Oh, like what? Like Albert W. Winkler. Winkler? Who's he? Maybe you mean who was he? Well, which is it? Well, that's the trouble, Johnny. We don't know. Huh? Well, he's disappeared, and with him a hunk of emerald worth exactly 100,000 clams. Wow. Well... Sure. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Inter-Allied Insurance Company, Dawson Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Blooming Blossom matter. 
Expense account item one, a dollar even. Taxi from my apartment to the offices of Interallied, where Paul Brennan wasted no time in getting to the point. Albert Winkler was a partner in a small jewelry firm down in New York. Real exclusive type place. Floyd and Winkler? Yeah, that's the outfit. Well, a few days ago, they got hold of an emerald. It's called the Green Eye of Calcutta. And Johnny, the darn thing's big enough to choke a horse. Okay, Paul, okay. I don't think you need go any further. No, wait. They plan to put it on an exhibition at the big international jewelry show in Chicago next month, and Winkler took it home to work on it. Oof. Insured for 100000 you said. Yeah, and Winkler's insured for ten. Okay, so who killed him and stole the rock? Listen, will you? Go ahead. Well, Sunday morning, his partner Blewett tried to phone him at his apartment. No answer. So Blewett sauntered down to the office thinking he might be there. But no sign of him? Right. Nor of the green eye of Calcutta. Only a note Winkler had left the night before saying he was taking the stone home to work on it. Well, that makes it look as though maybe Winkler... Listen, be... about that time, the phone rang there in the office. It was the police department, also looking for Winkler. Oh. Yeah, they'd been called by Winkler's landlord after a chambermaid had found his apartment completely ransacked and the old boy missing. Uh-oh. Who's working on it? For the NYPD, I mean. Uh, Sergeant Randy Singer, 18th Precinct Homicide. Old friend of yours, I believe. Yeah, good man. Has he come up with anything? Nothing. Well, Johnny? Sure, Paul. Now? Now. Item two, another dollar for a taxi back to my apartment where I slicked the stubble off my face, showered, dressed, and was about to head for New York when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? That's right. Well, who's that? Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Dollar. Huh? I must talk with you, sir. It's important, very important. Well, who are you? Me? Oh, well, this is Wilbert Kenworthy Blossom. Yes, and I must see you right away. Well, what's this all about, Mr. Uh, Blossom, did you say? Oh, why, that's right. How did you know that? Oh, for... Is this some kind of a gag? It certainly is not. And to think that now I'll be working with you on a... Oh, it's wonderful, just wonderful. What are you talking about? Why, you, don't you see? I follow every single one of your cases, sir. Either in the newspapers or on the radio. Oh, I'm your biggest fan. Is, uh, is that all you call to say, Mr. Blossom? It is not. I'm calling about the mysterious disappearance of Mr. Albert Winkler. Winkler? You know something about him, his whereabouts? I certainly do. Where are you, Mr. Blossom? Uh, here at my house in New York. And I'll be waiting for you, sir. Goodbye. No, wait. Give me your address. Oh, oh yes, of course. How could you know where to come if I hadn't given you that? Yeah. <laughs> silly of me. Well, goodbye. The address, man. The address. Oh, oh of course. Yeah. It's 825 East 73rd Street. Item three, $9.20 transportation and incidentals to New York City and 825 East 73rd Street. It turned out to be one of New York's famous old brownstone houses, well-preserved and reeking of an era long past. When the city's wealthy and elite had built row on row of these monuments to a now-forgotten financial aristocracy. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in. I'm Wilbert Kenworthy Blossom. And I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to be working with you on this. I don't know how to describe it, but I'll try. The inside of Blossom's home was unbelievable. Ornate pre-Victorian furnishings, heavy velvet draperies, huge lamps and chandeliers, gilt frame mirrors, even an ancient horsehair sofa. It was also filled with dusty piles of newspapers and magazines, hundreds of old books. Travel books, Mr. Dollar, and mysteries. Oh, I just love mysteries. One corner of the high ceiling living room was piled with old trunks and handbags, an old carpet bag even. Boxes of tools and utensils were stacked about. An ancient Victrola, beat-up sewing machine. You just never know when you might want to sew something, do you? Old guns and pistols, some of them museum pieces. A stringless tennis racket. A pair of rusty handcuffs locked to the base of a floor lamp without a shade. A broken bicycle pump. That's just in case I ever find a bicycle to go with it, you understand. Uh, yes. Against one wall stood an old metal cabinet loaded with rusty surgical instruments and a worn-out catcher's mitt. Yet... Directly opposite was a corner shelf full of priceless porcelain figurines and rare pieces of china. Some of the old clocks and jewelry on the mantelpiece were collector's items. Fine original oil paintings lay among piles of old shoes. All in all, it looked as though the contents of half a dozen pawn shops had been dumped into it. At auction sales, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, sir. I just cannot resist an auction sale or a bargain. But what are you going to do with all this stuff? Oh, just keep it. I like it. 
And I like a lot of things. Yeah, so I see. Including 12 gross of Spencer's superlative steel tip shoelaces patented 1841. But they were a bargain, Mr. Dollar. Just like all this fine artwork is, too. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Some of my friends pamper me a bit, though. You know, send me things they pick up at sale. Yeah, now look, Mr. Blossom, you told me you know something about Albert W. Winkler. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Well? And think of that magnificent emerald. Gone. Disappear? Yeah, but now you said... And that poor Interallied Insurance Company. Oh, my. That's how I knew you would be called on this case. But a hundred thousand dollars... And ten thousand dollars on Mr. Winkler. Well, at least they're off the hook on him until he's proved dead. Aha. And that's where I come in. With proof. Proof? What proof? Have you seen Winkler? Mr. Dollar... I have. Well, where is he? You understand, of course, that I know Mr. Winkler very well because I've seen him at his office so many times. Yeah, okay, go on. Oh, go on. yes, indeed. Such beautiful, beautiful jewelry he had there. And, of course, he was always trying to buy some of the things I but had. But you say you've seen him. Where? Well, Saturday I'd planned with a couple of old friends to attend a railroad auction. Uh, that was the Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad. Winkler was there at the auction sale? Oh, well, yes. Did you speak to him? Oh, no. Well, why not? You said you knew him. Oh, I didn't go to the auction. I wasn't feeling very well that day. I had a little... <clears throat> a little cough. <clears throat> it was kind of like that. Then how do you know he was there? My friends went. And at least they talked about going. Mr. Blossom. And I'm sure they did, too, because they sent me something from... And what do you suppose it was? I don't know. I don't care. Now, look here. You got it me It was to... the very thing that has solved this whole case for you. What? And think of it. This dull, drab, dreary life of mine has suddenly become... Why, it's almost like a mystery story, isn't it? Adventure and... Look, Mr. Blossom, would you... Think of it. I'm being a detective. I'm working with my idol, the famous Johnny Dollar. Oh, George. Mr. Blossom, what did they send you? What's that? Oh, oh, yes, of course. Uh, Here. Here it is, sir. It's right here between the erector set and the golf clubs. This old trunk? That's right. Oh, great Scott, you think you do. But at first, of course, I I thought of calling the police. But knowing all about you... Mr. Blossom, let me see that. Excuse me. There are a lot of crumpled newspapers on top. Yeah, I see. As old as the trunk. Good Lord. It, um, It isn't pretty, is it? Sergeant Randy Singer, homicide. Randy, Johnny Dollar, get somebody over to 825 East 73rd Street right away, will you? Body of Albert Winkler. Randy got there in a matter of minutes. Got the same story from Blossom that I had, then called for the lab crew to come and take over. Now, now, who delivered this trunk, Mr. Blossom? But it was just, uh, just a delivery man. Can you describe him? Would you know him if you saw him? Yeah, well, he was big and strong. He was very strong. Distinguishing features. Scars or a limp or a beard or well, something? Well, I told you, Johnny, he was big and strong. How old? Well, I would say he was somewhere between 25 and, um... Yeah? 50. Uh, yes, I'm sure. Well, that's a lot of help. Yeah, you better have those thick spectacles changed. But he was big. Yes, we know, and strong. What about his truck? Oh, I didn't see that. He left it outside. No. Now, look. These friends of yours who did attend the auction, who were they? Oh, oh yes. Now the investigation proceeds. Now the excitement... Who were they, Mr. Blossom? Uh, oh. Well, there's uh, Randolph Harrison and Prison. Randy Singer took down the names of Blossom's three auction-minded friends. The lab crew arrived. Randy took off to dig up Blossom's friends, and I took a cab. That's item 480 cents to the apartment of Elwood Blewett, Winkler's partner in the jewelry business. Blewett lived alone in a modest but tastefully furnished five or six rooms on East 52nd Street. Of course, Mr. Dollar. I'll be glad to help you all I can. Albert's death has been a terrible blow. Yes. Well, tell me this, please. Yes? 
Did Mr. Winkler make a habit of taking valuable pieces of jewelry to his residence? Yes, Albert often took pieces home with him to work on them, clean, polish, and so on. Wasn't that a rather dangerous practice? Frankly, I always thought so, but he felt there was far more chance of being robbed if he were alone at the office than at his flat, where he wouldn't be expected to have anything of great value. Well, who has seen the green eye of Calcutta besides you and Mr. Winkler? I'm not sure, of course. Almost anyone would have been able to recognize it. Because of the publicity in pictures when you brought it over here. Yes. Come to think of it, Blossom indicated he'd been much impressed with it. Wilbur Blossom? Yeah. You know him? He's been in the office many times. He and Albert were always bickering over pieces that either of us... Bickering? Well, it was really something of a joke. Albert always wanted some of Blossom's heirloom pieces, and Blossom wanted some of the finer things we had. Did he ever buy? Never. He always wanted us to put them up at auction or at a bargain price. Hardly our way of doing things, needless to say. When did you last see Blossom? Why, last Friday. I was busy with an important client, and from the back room where Albert worked, I remember hearing Blossom insist that Albert show him the emerald. What did he? I don't know. The silly argument got so noisy that I closed the door on them. Hmm. Oh, now wait... Certainly you aren't thinking that perhaps Wilbert Blossom... I'm not quite certain what I'm thinking, Mr. Blewett. <laughs> Item five, ten cents, phone call to Randy Singer. No, not a thing, Johnny. One of the three names on Blossom's list is in Europe. The other two did go to the railroad auction, but purchased nothing. Randy, do a couple of things for me, will you? Like what? Phone whoever is stationed at Winkler's place that I want to look it over. Sure, everything is just as it was, including the poker that was used to kill him. Also, I want a copy of the picture of the trunk your lab boys took and the list of Blossom's friends. I'll have them waiting for you. And post a man at Blossom's place. Keep an eye on him. Huh? Yes, right away. Johnny, have you learned something that... No, no, just, uh, well, just for his protection, say. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, but... I... <laughs> Blossom. Yeah, Blossom. Maybe I hadn't given enough thought to the strange little character. Or to why the trunk with Winkler's body had been at his place. But if he were involved, why call me in? Cover up? Possibility. But Wilbert Blossom kill a man? Yeah, maybe he could. Maybe he did. I'd better see him as soon as I get through with the inspection of Winkler's apartment. Mr. Dollar? Oh, hi, officer. Did Sergeant Singer call and tell you that... He's on the phone here in the Winkler apartment now. Wants to talk to you. Says it's very urgent, sir. Okay, thanks. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, how did you know? Huh? The man I sent to cover Blossom's house for you got there too late. What? Whoever got in and attacked the poor old coot got away. Attacked? Blossom? Yeah, really did a job on him. Johnny? (sighs) Okay, Randy. Thanks. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. As everyone knows, democracy means many things. Self-rule of the people, a higher standard of living, freedom of speech, press and religion, rights and privileges, liberty. But the most vital promise of democracy is mankind's right to dignity. For it is through the dignity of man that democracy has given mankind its greatest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Blooming Blossom Matter. Expense account item six, two dollars and a quarter for a fast taxi ride to 18th Precinct Police Headquarters. All right. As soon as I got your call, Johnny, I sent a uniformed man over to Blossom's house. From the way you talked, I thought maybe you suspected him. Yeah, Randy, I'm afraid I did. Boy, how wrong can you be? Anyhow, when he got there, he found the front door open and Blossom lying in the dark hallway. Where's Blossom now? In the hospital, but he's okay, just bruised up a bit. They're letting him out. Fingerprints? Anything to go on? The lab's checking on the prints right now. Uh Uh-huh. Let me know. Yeah. Anything else? Nope. So, now let's find out who tried to put Blossom out of the way and we'll have the guy who killed Winkler. And stole the hundred thousand worth of emerald, then shipped Winkler's body to Blossom. Oh, uh, and by the way, here's the picture of the trunk you asked for and the three names Blossom gave me. Harrison, Norton, and Scatterday. What are you going to do with them? Randy, 
Hmm? Suppose the man who attacked Blossom is the one who did all the rest. You got a better suppose? Well, look, Randy, whoever wielded that poker on Winkler couldn't have been very strong. A really hefty wallop would have bent it out of shape. And the lab agrees with you. But, of course, it didn't take much of a blow to finish off old Winkler. He didn't weigh much over 100 pounds, you know. Yeah. Any strong arm could have finished him off easily and without messing up the whole apartment. And don't forget, whoever did him in also put him in the trunk and delivered it to Blossom's house. But why? Yeah. Yeah, and where's the emerald? That's what you should be worried about. A hundred grand worth of worry for your insurance company. Now, what are you going to do with that picture of the trunk and the list of Blossom's friends? Oh, yeah, sure. Hmm? I'll see you later. Item seven, five dollars and a half for a taxi to the warehouse of the Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad over in Jersey. There I finally managed to track down a man who knew something about their occasional auction sales of unclaimed baggage and stuff. Insurance investigator, eh? That's right, Mr. McKinney. One of those boys with a fancy expense count, eh? Well, that's a matter of opinion. Look, you had an auction sale here last Saturday, didn't you? That's right. Handled it myself. Want to know something about uh, something we sold off? Exactly. Then I'm your man. Always remember all about every single item I sell and who bought it and, and all about them. That's fine. Because I want to know if any of the names on this list bought from you on Saturday. Yeah. Randolph Harrison. Man by the name of Harrison buy anything? Mm, no. How about Percival Wentworth Scatterday? Nope. Ellsworth Norton. Nope. You sure, Mr. McKinney? I'm sure. How, uh, how about Blossom? That a man's name? Yes, Wilbert Blossom. Well? No, sir. Nope, never heard of him. And like I told you, I never forget the stuff I sell or the fellas I sell it to. Wait. This picture of a trunk. Huh? Have you ever seen this trunk? Well, yes. Did you sell this trunk on Saturday? Yes, I did. To whom? Come on, man, it's important. Well, uh, now, I was real early in the sale. Yeah, before most of the people got here. Uh, bought this trunk and had it sent to his apartment in New York. And his name? Well, it was a funny kind of name. Uh, Blinky or Winky or... Uh, oh, no. Winkler. Winkler. That was it. Albert Winkler. I had made two dollars, two drinks for myself at the nearest bar. But they didn't help to kill my feeling of utter frustration. Item 9, 550, taxi back to 18th Precinct headquarters in New York for want of a better place to go. Oh, it's about time you got here, Johnny. Oh? Uh, we matched up the prints we found after Blossom was attacked. You know who made them? Yeah, here's his card. Carlo Bernasconi. Any reckon? A couple of a dozen arrests, only one conviction. Anything to do with jewelry? Better. Accessory to a hijack operation a couple of years ago. He drove the truck. Hey. Sure. Got a mugshot of him? We got him. Downstairs. Come on, I'll take you down. Randy, what's he look like? Like you'd expect the truck driver to look, big husky brute. Has he admitted anything? Well, the threat of a murder charge made him talk, all right, but none of it makes any sense. Of course it doesn't. But he's our boy, all right. He killed Winkler, beat up Blossom. I thought your lab decided whoever killed Winkler was a small fella. Mm, yeah, I... So the theory about the same man killing Winkler and beating up Blossom doesn't work. But, Johnny, holy... Come on down, let's talk to this Bernice Cone. After I make a phone call. Huh? Who to? Yeah? Get me a man named McKinney. Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad Warehouse over in Jersey. Make it fast, please. Yes, sir. Hey, you been over there, Johnny? Just before I got here. Did you find out anything? No, but I'm going to now. Like what? Randy, for the first time, this whole thing is beginning to make sense. Here's your party. Mr. McKinney? That's me. This is Johnny Dollar, remember? Sure do. And Good. say... Now... I've been reading in the paper since you left here about that body found the trunk over there in New York. Yeah, well, look. In that same, is that the same trunk you was over here asking about? Yes. Now, you told me that trunk was bought by a man who gave his name as Winkler. That's right, Doctor. Do you remember what he looked like? Sure do. Why, I can give it to you as accurate as if it was in the police file. Well? Height, uh, mm, five foot nine, maybe nine and a half. Go on. Weight, between 155 and 58. You see, when I was young, I worked with a carny show guessing weight and height, and if I didn't guess it right... Yeah, okay, okay. Now, how about the uh, color of the eyes? <laughs> well, I noticed them because of the way he squinted through them thick, old-fashioned steel glasses. Thanks, Mac. I'm sending you a ten spot in the next mail. Well, now. Well, Johnny? Come on, Randy. Let's go down and see this Bernasconi. You find something out new? Yeah. And I don't like it. I don't like it. Now, look, Bernasconi, you're in plenty of trouble for the assault on Blossom. 
maybe even more. But I'm the man who can save you from a murder rap, if you'll answer a couple of questions. Ah, uh, sure, I told the cops... All right, all right. Did you pick up and deliver a trunk yesterday morning? Sure, I told him, for a guy named Winkler. You got the trunk from Winkler? Sure, at his apartment on East... What did he look like? How tall? Uh, maybe five, eight, or ten. What? Johnny... Slight that... build, or heavy, or what? I'd say about medium. Maybe 150 pounds. Johnny... Now, look, mister... Now, wait a minute, you look. Did you deliver that trunk to a man named Blossom? Sure, at 825 East 73rd Street. What did he look like? Him I never seen. I knew it. He hollered from a window that the door was open and I should put the trunk in the living room. <laughs> what a junk house. But you must have seen him later when you came back and assaulted him. It was night then. When he came to the door, I just slugged him and let him lay there. Then I went inside where the lights was on to look for... Well, look for the big rock I'd read about in the paper. But then I heard a prowl car coming, so I beat it. Frank wasn't there anyway. Okay, Bernasconi. See you later, Randy. Now, just a minute. Hey, and what about me? You said it... Item 10, 90 cents, taxi to Wilbert Blossom's old brownstone house on East 73rd. Come in, come in, Johnny. Thanks, Mr. Blossom. All recovered from your beating? Oh, of course I am. Here, sit down, sit down. You, uh... You said you wanted to help me on this case. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Why, this chance to work with a man I consider the finest insurance investigator in the world. Yeah. That's why I called you when I got the trunk with Mr. Winkler's body in it. Mr. Blossom, why don't you tell the truth? All my drab, dull life, I wanted to be a detective, an investigator. And this was my chance. My chance... Tell the truth, did you say? (sighs) Mr. Blossom... Listen to some facts for a minute and see what conclusions you draw from them. Oh, deductions. <laughs> like a detective. To begin with, this house of yours is so full of, well, junk. I told you, Johnny, I like things. I like things. But it also has a lot of fine paintings, sculpture, china, jewelry. Oh, I like all sorts of things. Especially if they're fine and rare. And bargains. <laughs> like the green eye of Calcutta? Oh. The most beautiful emerald in the world. And I would conclude that you'd do just about anything to have that stone. Yes, sir, Johnny. I'd reach the same conclusion. Okay. Now, when Albert Winkler and the emerald disappeared, it was in the papers that Inter-Allied had written policies on them. Conclusion? Yes, sir. I would deduce that you would be called in. Wouldn't it be smart, then, if the killer was afraid I'd eventually get around to him anyway... Wouldn't it be smart for him to call me in and offer to help me? As a cover-up for what he'd done? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, indeed. Or at least he'd think it would. Oh, yes, I I guess he thought it would. Another thing, Mr. Boss. Oh? What is it, Johnny? The body was packed in the trunk with old newspapers. Like these you keep piled around. Oh, I, yes, yes. And I would deduce... So that obvious that both Randy Singer and I overlooked them completely. Oh, well, there's so many things piled around it. <laughs> you couldn't be expected to... Johnny. Yeah? What really made you decide that... Uh... Well, I'd like to know. All right. Albert Winkler was a frail little old man, about 4'11", not much over 100 pounds. Yes, he was. But the man who bought the trunk and had it sent to Winkler's apartment, who gave his name as Winkler, that man was about 5'9", 155 pounds. And he wore thick, old-fashioned, steel-rimmed glasses. But, Johnny, I can't see without them. Then there's the truck driver. The man who ordered the trunk delivered to this house gave his name as Winkler, too. But Winkler was dead by then. Dead from a blow inflicted not by some big bruiser, but by somebody of... Say your bill. Oh, that awful truck driver who thought the emerald would be in the trunk and came here to steal it and who beat me up. I suppose you want the emerald. Yeah. Here, Johnny, I, I kept it in this old coffee pot uh, that I picked up at an auction sale. Real bargain, too, it was. Isn't it a beautiful stone? Oh, if only Mr. Winkley would have sold it to me. At a bargain, that is. Then none of this would have happened. 
Well, I guess we better go now, haven't we? Huh. It's such a silly thing. Me trying to act like a detective. I guess I didn't even make a very good killer. Did I? Why? Just this overpowering passion to have things? Maybe. Or maybe it was just a reaction. A last desperate attempt to some way, any way, break from a lifetime of lonely, dull, drab idleness. I don't know. But for some crazy reason, I feel sorry for the funny little old character who turned killer. Expense account total, including incidentals and fare, back to Hartford, $61.55. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case so simple, so easy, so obvious, that it proves almost impossible to solve. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Howard McNear, Herb Ellis, Herb Vigran, Junius Matthews, Herb Butterfield, Frank Gersel, and Johnny Jacobs. Musical supervision is by Jerry Goldsmith. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, I've been trying to reach you for two days. Who's that? George Reed. Oh, well, I took off a couple of days, George. What's on your mind? A riddle. Riddle? Yeah, and a blonde photographer's model. That's better. How are you with riddles, Johnny? Not as good as I am with... But go ahead, try me. All right. A year ago, this model married Webster Crean. Crean Hat Company? Was Crean Hat Company. He sold it when he retired. Go on. Well, last week, Crean reported his wife had disappeared. And according to him, when she left home, she didn't bother taking any of her clothes or car or jewelry. And she forgot to tell her friends she was leaving? Right. Not even him. You think Crean told the truth? Johnny, that's the riddle. Bob Bailey, in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account... America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. 
To Floyd's of England, American Branch Office, 443 North 15th Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Mad Hatter matter. Expense account item one, 85 cents, cab fare from my apartment at George Reed's office. He was seated behind his desk, his lily white nose buried in a copy of Playmate magazine. He didn't look up until I was halfway across the room. Hmm? Oh, Johnny, come in, come in. Hi, George. What you reading? I, uh, I was just taking a look at Bridget Randall. Or Mrs. Preen, I suppose I should call her. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Mmm. Very nice. She uh, look familiar to you? Oh, George, you're flattering me. No, really. She should. Oh, why? Well, up until she married Preen, she was a very popular model. Figures. Is that a pun? No. <laughs> Anyhow, her picture was in everything from the police gazette to the ladies' home journal. And after she married him? She retired. Hey, this is a new magazine, George, this month's issue. Well, the picture must have been taken before she was married. Hmm. Well, what do you know about Preen? Not too much. He's over twice her age and, from all reports, has a lot of money. I bet on it. Their marriage caused quite a stir. You know, real winter and spring stuff. The newspapers played it up big. Where were they married? New York. She'd done some ad work for Preen's hat company. He liked her look. And she liked his bankroll. Cynical, aren't you? Yeah. Anyway, since then, they've been living at his place near Los Angeles. Here's the address. All right, thanks. I called Mr. Preen long distance day before yesterday. He knows you're coming out. What about the police, George? You know who's handling their end of it? According to Preen, it's a man named Steiner, detective lieutenant. I got the feeling Preen doesn't much care for Steiner. George, how much life insurance does he carry on his wife? None. None? Nope. Or if he does, it's not with us. Then would you mind explaining why you sent for me? Not at all. We're not interested in her life. Obviously. That's a pretty callous attitude. Let me girl. finish. We're not interested in her life, but we are in her face. In her what? The fine print reads from a point two inches below her chin to the hairline. Come on, break it down, George. Of course. Last year, a couple of months before she married Preen, she took out a special coverage policy in case something happened to her face that would finish her modeling career. You know, like a permanent scar, bad burn, anything like that. Uh-huh. She received quite a bit of publicity at the time. And it didn't exactly hurt us, either. When does this uh, policy lapse? Well, that's why we're so concerned, Johnny. When she married Preen, she announced that she had given up modeling for good. So we quite naturally thought she wouldn't renew the policy. But she did. Yes. And just ten days before she disappeared. How much did you people bet that she wouldn't ruin her face? The amount she earned year before last. $25,000. Expense account item 285 cents cab fare. Back to my apartment. On the way, I had the cabbie stop at a newsstand where I spent half a dollar of my hard-earned cash for a copy of Playmate magazine. Yeah, there was no doubt about it. Mrs. Webster Preen was the kind of woman any red-blooded American boy over 30 would be eager to locate. Item three, $190, plane fare, Hartford to Los Angeles, then a cab to the Statler Hotel. I checked in, made arrangements to rent a car, then put in a call to police headquarters. Lieutenant Steiner was out, so I left word for him to call me, had lunch, and then drove out to the San Fernando Valley. The Preen home was one of those Spanish stucco and adobe jobs. Two stories, probably 30, 40 years old. It sat in the middle of some two acres of orange trees with a plaster wall around all the property, separating her from the subdivision on one side and a main thoroughfare on the other. I walked up to the front door and rang the bell. In a moment, it was opened by a beautiful blonde. If she hadn't been wearing a nurse's uniform, I might have mistaken her for Bridget Preen. Yes? Afternoon. Is Mr. Preen in? Do you have an appointment, Mr. Dollar. Johnny Dollar. No, I don't have an appointment, but I'm sure he'll see me. Really? Yes, really. I'm investigating his wife's disappearance. You're from the police? No, insurance investigator. I see. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but Mr. Preen can't possibly see you. You're uh, sure of that, Miss... Uh... Richard, and I am sure. Mr. Preen has suffered a severe shock. The doctor left strict orders that he's not to be disturbed unnecessarily. And you feel qualified to say what is necessary and what isn't? I've been with him for nearly five years. Well, answer me this, Miss Richards. Do you think Mr. Preen's health would improve if somebody happened to find his wife? What? I... I, I mean, they haven't found her, have they? You haven't answered my question. You want my honest opinion, Mr. Dollar? Helen, who is it? Who's out there with you? Excuse me. No one important. It's Johnny Dollar, Mr. Breen. Now, just a minute. Mr. Dollar, will you come in? Come in. Have him come to the orchid room, Helen. Yes, sir. Well, I hope you enjoy steam baths, Mr. Dollar. Steam bath? What do you mean? 
Follow me. You'll find out. A pretty girl, in spite of her abrupt manner. And there was a lot going on behind those clear blue eyes. She led me into the house through a couple of large rooms, then up a winding staircase and down the hall to a door at the end of it. Miss Breen's waiting for you in there, Johnny. Thanks. Ouch! Hey, that doorknob's <laughs> hot as... Oh, very funny. I warned you. Here, like this. Come here, Mr. Dollar. Sorry. I'll see you later, Johnny. Uh, close the door. Close it. I, I don't want it to cool off in here. Well, you look surprised. Well, I, I didn't expect to meet you in a hothouse, Mr. Breen. Well, I'm sorry if you're uncomfortable, but orchids must have plenty of heat and moisture. Now, me, I love it. I, I, I didn't used to, but since I've... Well, since I am at the age where a man is nothing but stick and dried parchment, I, if you can take off your jacket if you like, Mr. Pollard. Mm, thanks. Do you know anything about orchids? Well, only that they're expensive. Aren't all beautiful things? <laughs> Sit down, sir. Any place that's clean. <laughs> we can talk while I do this. You know what I'm doing. I haven't the least idea. What the bees would normally do, that is, if these plants were in their native environment. Ah, uh, pollination? Yes, sir. Would you mind handing me those tweezers? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Hey. How many plants do you have here? More than 200, Mr. Dollar. 36 different varieties. Ah, beautiful. Oh, yes. Lovely, delicate creatures. Mr. Dollar, do you think you'd be able to find her? Well, I'm going to try. I'd appreciate it. I have so very few things left these days. I... Did you notice the orange trees when you drove in? Well, yes. When I bought this house, the land on both sides was nothing but orange groves. Beautiful orange trees. Green, growing things as far as the eye could see. And now it's a housing project. Yes, well, Mr. Preen, I understand you aren't entirely satisfied with the efforts the police are making to find your wife. And you understand correctly. They have done nothing but ask me the same asinine questions over and over again. Have you talked to them? No, sir. I felt that I should see you first. Get all the information you have. I will cooperate with you all the way, Mr. Dollar. All right. When exactly did she disappear? Just, just ten days ago. She'd come down from our place up at Lake Arrowhead, where she'd spent Saturday and Sunday. Uh -huh. We had planned on going up together that weekend, but I developed a cold. Oh. The evening she returned, I retired earlier than usual, and then when I awoke about 11.30 that night, she wasn't in her room. I called to her, searched the ground, then waited up. But she never came home. I see. Was anyone else in the building that evening? No. We were alone. Rather, I was. Any sign of a injury to her face, or blood, anything like that? Nothing. Do you remember if she made any remark earlier? Anything that had given you some indication as to whether she planned to go out? She had no plans. She was tired from the drive home, had already put cream on her face and her hair up in curlers. But... Yes? Well, she did say something about wanting to go back to Arrowhead the next day. And you're positive she didn't that night? Mr. Dollar, my wife is a very beautiful woman. And an extremely vain woman. She would never leave this house with her hair in such a state. Oh. And even if it were brushed, she wouldn't leave on an overnight trip without taking along a complete wardrobe. All right. What do you think has happened to her? I don't know what to think. If I did, I wouldn't have gone to the police. A few minutes later, I left the lonely old man with his orchids and started toward the stairs. I was about halfway down when I suddenly felt as though I'd forgotten something. Only I was sure I hadn't. Still, something was wrong about this setup. I was trying to figure out what it was when Miss Richards called me. Johnny? Yeah. I'm in here. You better put your jacket on. It'll catch cold. Yeah, well, you better let me worry about that, huh, nurse? Helen. 
Johnny. I'm sorry I was so rude. But I thought you were just another detective who was going to upset Mr. Preen. Well, now, what makes you think I didn't? Because he didn't shout at you. Does he usually shout at detectives? <laughs> he ripped into Lieutenant Steiner yesterday morning. Oh? You know why? Well, the police have a crazy idea that Mrs. Preen's body could be buried somewhere on the grounds or upstairs in the hothouse bed. Well, how do you know that? Well, they've been after him trying to get his permission to dig. If they were really serious about it, they wouldn't need his permission. They'd get a warrant. Johnny... You don't believe Mr. Preen killed his wife, do you? At this moment, I have no reason to. Well, everyone knows what a kind and gentle person he is. What about Mrs. Preen, Helen? Well? I hate her. Why? You, uh, care for him? I don't like that. All right, sorry. He's a fine man, a gentleman. There aren't many left. No, I guess not. He called Mrs. Preen extremely vain... Would you go along with that description? It was made for her. Suppose something had happened to her that night. Suppose, well, something that scarred or burned her face. What do you think she'd do? If she lost her beauty, she'd kill herself. Even if she threw away $25,000 by doing it? I know about that policy, but even if it was doubled, she'd still do it. Why? Because she wouldn't have the nerve to face her friends? <laughs> friends. Bridget Pree never had any friends. But that isn't what happened to her. What did? I don't know, but I'm sure she's dead. Why? I... Why, Helen? Johnny, I... Johnny, please. Tell me. Now, come on. I know you have a good reason for saying that. Now, let's have it. All right. Come over here. I put them away in this drawer. See? Well, what are they? Caps. What? Plastic dental caps. Actresses, models wear them over their teeth to give a perfect appearance. Bridget wouldn't leave a bedroom without them. Where did you get them? I found them on the floor of the garage, two days after she disappeared. Act two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. What does it mean to the farmer? How can democracy benefit the farmer better than any other form of government? These are easy questions to answer because the facts are there. Only in a democracy can the farmer get the most aid from his government, own his own land, produce, and equipment, and still earn a standard of living that is comparable to workers in the manufacturing industries. That's because the people in a democracy tell their elected representatives they want it that way. Government subsidy, free enterprise, open markets... And the will to work and better himself enables the farmer in a democracy, such as the United States of America, to produce one of the world's finest diets. Scientific agricultural advancement and democratic government are the reasons why this can happen. This is a part of democracy. But whether it functions in agriculture or some other form of endeavor, democracy gives mankind its finest legacy of freedom. Now act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And the Mad Hatter Matter. Helen, the Supreme's nurse, gave me the set of dental caps that Bridget Preen had used to beautify her teeth. And after telling her not to mention them to anyone, I drove back to my hotel in Los Angeles. Along the way, I racked my brain about whatever it was, something that had bothered me at Preen's home. Then as I passed the newsstand in the hotel lobby, it hit me hard. I had been in almost every downstairs room of Preen's house, and not once had I seen a single picture of the beautiful and vain Bridget. In my room, I was about to call Preen and ask him why when somebody began pounding on my door. Well, Dollar, we seem to have had a hard time making connections, didn't we? I'm Steiner. Oh, how are you, Lieutenant? Fine, just fine. And I think I've got our little case all sewed up. That's so? Yep. Yeah, you mind if I rest? No, no, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, see, we've been checking back on Miss Breen's activities for the past few weeks. Uh huh. Been making quite a few weekend trips, ain't she? I wouldn't know. We figure she found herself a new man, a young man, and took off for parts unknown. What about her clothes? Why didn't she take them? She didn't want to take what old Preen had given her. She's too proud. A little too proud to be true. She had enough things paid for out of her own money to last a good many years. Oh, now, Dollar, you guys let your imagination run away with you. Now, you look at this realistic. 
Here's a girl in her 20s married to a man who's content to sit home and wait for the golden chariot. And maybe she's content to sit there with him at first. But it ain't normal she should for long. Yeah. You locate anyone who's seen her out with another man? Nope. Tried to. That's the thing that's still stuck in my craw. Well, I don't think you will. Why not? Because she was smart. A smart woman. If she had had a boyfriend, and I'm not disagreeing with you on that score, she was very discreet about it. Mr. Dollar. I'm not sure you were aware of it, but each time you mentioned Mrs. Breen, you referred to her in the past tense. Why? (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. Don't tell me I fell for the oldest trick in the business. Come on, Dollar. Stop playing games and answer me. Oh, you should talk about playing games, Steiner. Sorry, but I wanted to throw you off guard. Oh, you did, pal. You did. What did you learn bird-dogging around today, Dollar? Nothing, Steiner. Nothing. Look, you either let me have all the information you've received today, or tonight you'll be on your way back to Hartford. Now, which is it? Okay. Okay. Preen's nurse, Miss Richards, found these on the floor of the garage two days after Mrs. Preen disappeared. You know what they are, I suppose. They don't have to be Mrs. Preen's. Uh, Take a look at this chart, Dollar. We got it from her dentist last week. Now look at the caps. Okay. What are you going to do? What do you think? Arrest Webster Preen for the murder of his wife. I told Steiner he could never get an indictment. The teeth caps definitely belonged to Bridget, but they were found in her own garage. She could have dropped them any time during that evening she came home from Arrowhead. And I reminded him of Preen's position in the community, his money, how well he was liked, everything. Hoping I could still stall him long enough for me to try something that had been in the back of my mind since I left Hartford. I opened a copy of Playmate magazine to Bridget's picture. Then I placed a long-distance phone call to New York City. Ready with your call to Mr. Howard, Mr. Dollar. Okay, thank you, operator. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello, Mr. Howard. This is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Yes, Dollar? A client of ours has her picture in the current issue of your Playmate magazine. Oh, yes. Yes, lovely, lovely girl, hmm? Uh, Mr. Howard, her name is Bridget Preen. Bridget Preen? Or Randall. Bridget Randall. Oh, yes, yes. I know her very well. well where is she? We, uh, aren't sure yet. Mr. Howard, uh... I've got to know when that picture was made and the address of the photographer who shot it. Have you got that? Yes, yes. You just hold on. Now, I remember now I was surprised to see Bridget after all that talk about retiring. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, here it is. The photographer's a new one as far as we're concerned. What's his name? Tracy. Russell Tracy. Address? Box 17. Got it? Box 17. Lake Arrowhead, California. What? Lake Arrowhead. You ought to know where that is. Yeah. Yeah, I do. It took me a little less than two hours to drive up to Lake Arrowhead. When I reached the village, I stopped in at the post office. Yes, sir? What can I do for you? Well, I'm looking for an old friend of mine. He's got a place up here somewhere. Uh, What's his name? Tracy. Russell Tracy. Oh, yeah, sure. A nice little cabin on the lake, about a half a mile down toward the left. You just follow the road. Okay, thanks. Uh, the cabin just before you get to Russell's has a big mailbox out in front with the name Preen on it. Got it? Preen? Yeah, I sure have. I was there in five minutes. It was small. Two rooms at the most. A dog came from the direction of Preen's cabin to bark at me. Then went back into the woods again. Yeah. Russell Tracy? Yeah. Who are you? Name's Dollar, insurance investigator. May I come in? Uh, yeah. Yeah, come on in. Thanks. Oh, Mr. Dollar, what's this all about? Bridget Preen. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not... That's a very good picture of her in Playmate. You tell her you sold it? Yes, I did. When? The day you decided to submit it? Or after it was sold and too late to start publication? Or not until some other photographer started calling her home to see if she'd come out of retirement? Now, look, Mr. Dollar, I haven't done anything wrong. I didn't say you had. I mean it, Dollar. All I did was take some pictures of her. I, I didn't have any reason to kill her. Who said she was dead? All 
right, Donna. Sit down. I'll give you the whole story, at least all I know of it. Here, go ahead. Bridget liked modeling. She liked it better than anything else, I guess. And when she found out I was a photographer, well, well she was over here most of the time. What about the day she disappeared? I'm getting to it. I'd needed some money a few weeks before that. I needed it bad. I I had a run-in with the law in Texas a couple of years back. I haven't been able to hold on to a good job since. Go on. Well, I had this one shot of her, and I knew it was right, so I sent it in without her knowing about it. When did she find out? Well, like you said, photographers called her house. Her husband answered one of them. You ever meet her husband? Yeah. Yeah, a couple of times when he was up here. He knew you were a photographer? He's been trying hard to get back at me for taking that shot of his wife. How do you mean? There's a dry well out in the back, about 20 yards from the fence line. After he killed Bridget... He killed... Yeah. Yeah, because the next morning I... I was out with my dog and we found her face down in the well. I guess he figured the sheriff would find her before I didn't figure I did it. How do I know you didn't? If I had, I wouldn't have dropped her in my own well, would I? Besides, why? All right, she's still there. No, and... No, I, I took her out that same morning. And it's a good thing I did, too. The sheriff and some detectives from L.A. were up here nosing around the next day. Why would Prane want to kill her, Tracy? All right, now, now don't ask why, but Bridget was in love with me. The night she went back to L.A., she was going to tell him. I guess that on top of the picture was just too much for him to take. Dolly, you believe me, don't you? Why didn't you report this to the sheriff? I've got a record, Dollar, and Preen's got more money than he knows what to do with. Besides, there's no proof of what I've, I've just said. It'd be his word against mine, and well, you know who'd come out on top. Where's the body now? I'll take it. You want? Yeah. Bring your camera. My camera? And plenty of film. Don't ask me why I trusted him. I couldn't answer. Except like he said, he didn't have any reason for killing Bridget. He led me deep into the woods, into a clearing. And there, well, he'd done his best to make her comfortable. We removed the rocks and Bridget was... She was very dead. Expense account item four, five dollars and twenty cents. Assorted phone calls, Arrowhead Springs to Los Angeles. I've been hoping you'd call. Is Mr. Preen there? Yes, right now he's up with his orchid. Have you seen Steiner? Oh, yes, he was here this afternoon. He took Mr. Preen away with him. But in about an hour, Mr. Preen came Now look, Helen, you stay there, but keep out of his way, do you understand? Oh, Johnny, really, you're talking like he's a criminal. Helen, do just as I say. I'll be there as soon as I can. After seeing that Russell Tracy was safe in the custody of Steiner, I took the freeway out to the San Fernando Valley. It was a little after 9.30 when I pulled into the Preen driveway. The porch lights were on and Helen opened the door. Johnny, you look awful. You had dinner? No, no, not yet. Well, let me fix you something. No, please, Helen. What's in the envelope? Uh, Nothing important. Where's Mr. Preen? Where do you suppose? Upstairs with his orchid. Would you mind if I went right up? Of course not, Johnny. You go ahead. When your dinner's ready, I'll call you. Yeah, okay, thanks. Careful of the doorknob. Yeah, I remember I didn't expect to see you back so soon. Hello, Mr. Crane. Ah, didn't dress for us again, I think. You'd uh, better take off your jacket, Mr. Dollar. Uh, afraid I'm not going to stay long enough to bother. Oh, well, now that's too bad. Beauty such as this isn't often seen, Mr. Dollar. I, uh, I disagree with you, sir. What? I think I have something here that's every bit as beautiful as any flower in this hothouse. Well, now, you have aroused my sporting instincts, son, and also my curiosity. What have you... Uh... Here. Oh, no. Oh, no. She was beautiful, no. wasn't she, Mr. Preen? Here, she's very beautiful. But here... Oh, no. Look at this picture. Uh. Taken just a couple of hours ago. Yeah, what about this one? What about it, Mr. Preen? What do you think of your handiwork? Proud of what you've done, Mr. Preen? No. No, please. No more, please. Why did you do it? 
I had to. I had to. She was going to leave me. Like everybody else had done. Everything does. She was going and I couldn't let her. I just couldn't let her go. Well, aren't you been right? After he'd killed Bridget, Preen had not been able to face the many photographs of her about the house. Or any pictures of Bridget, as we learned. One photograph had caused a death. The others we took later put Bridget's husband away for the few remaining years of his life. Expense account total, including car, rental, hotel, incidentals, and transportation back to Hartford, $870.40. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a fishing trip that could be very pleasant. Except that one of the fishermen is deaf. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi there, Johnny. This is Buster. Buster? Buster Favor, Lake Mojave Resort over on the Colorado River. Oh, well, Buster, how are things? Oh, you never really did get in the fishing we promised you over here. No, but so help me, I'm going to one of these days. Is that what you call me about? No. Johnny, you remember old Mike Kirby? Kirby, Kirby. Oh, sure. The sweet old fellow I met down at your boat dock. A uh, guide or something? That's the one. Oh, sure, I remember him. How is he? Well, that's what I'm calling about. He, uh, he isn't. What? And Johnny, I think it was murder. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Kirby Will matter. As soon as I hung up on Buster, I lost no time in making the necessary plane reservation to Las Vegas and picking up a handful of American Express travelers' checks. That's item one on the expense account, a total of $320. Then I packed a bag, was about to take off, and the phone rang again. 
Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny, I'm glad I caught you in. It's Danny Newcomb at Tri-State Life and Casualty. Oh, hi, Danny. Johnny, I need you badly, and I need Whoops. you fast. Now, there's only a $5,000 policy involved. Danny, the circumstances are I'm sorry, didn't... Dan, but I can't handle it. I'm about to catch a plane out no, of no, here. No, no, Johnny, now listen. There may be a killing involved in this case, so we don't dare waste any time. And what's no, no, more... you listen. There may be a killing involved in what I'm going out What's to... more, the death of our client occurred at one of your old stamping grounds. Sorry, Dan. At the Lake Mojave Resort. Danny, I told you I... What? Yeah, that's right. You... Mike Kirby? Yeah. Okay, Danny, I'm on my way. It was 7.30 a.m. when the plane dropped me off in Las Vegas, Nevada, smack in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Even at that hour of the morning, the otherwise clear, clean air was filled with the cacophony of this city of chance. The stuttering clicks of the ball on the roulette wheels, the rattle and gallop of the ivories on the dice table, the endless drone of the croupiers, the flat clank of the chuckaluck cages, the snap of cards by the blackjack dealers, the never-ending click of poker chips and silver dollars. And over it all, the interminable chunk and whir of the slot machines, day and night from one end of the town to the other. Fabulous. I grabbed breakfast, that's item two, then rented a car and headed south and east on Route 93 toward Kingman, Arizona. Then, just five miles short of that town, I swung right on 68 down toward Davis Dam, down to Lake Mojave Resort. Mile after mile of nothing but sun-baked rock and sand, sagebrush and Joshua trees, tumbleweed and cactus. And right in the middle of it, the clear blue waters of Lake Mojave. Buster Favor, whose general factotum of the resort, was waiting for me. After a hearty greeting, he led me into the office and we sat down and got to work. Yeah, it was murder, all right, Johnny. Are you sure? Yeah. And by the way, I don't know how much you knew about Mike Kirby. Well, only that he seemed to be one of the fixtures around here. Was obviously well-liked. Well, he'd been a businessman back east. Owned a string of restaurants, made a fortune. Uh Uh-huh. And about ten years ago, he retired. Did a lot of traveling all over the world, I guess. Oh, lucky man. Did he have any relatives, Buster? Oh, only some nephews and nieces. I see. Anyhow, a little over three years ago, he settled down here to spend the rest of his life just fishing, taking it easy. Can't think of a better place or way to retire. How old was he, Buster? Sixty-one. Didn't look it, though. No. Well, if I remember right, he was pretty fit. Mm, He was. Well, I had the impression when I was here before that he was just a hired fishing guy, something like that. Oh, he used that as an excuse to meet folks. Half the time, he clean forgot to charge for his guide services. Accidentally on purpose, no doubt. Well, now you said... Now, don't rush me, Johnny. I got to give you the background. Okay, shoot. He kept saying over and over and over again how glad he was to be out from under a lot of responsibilities. And one day, about six, seven months ago, he suddenly transferred title to his boat, his motor, his fishing tackle, and his old beat-up Ford to us. Oh. I know. I asked him at the time if he wanted to... Get him off his personal inventory, why not give him to his relatives? Well, what'd he say to that? Said he didn't like him. Felt they were just waiting around for him to die so they could get their hands on his money. Oh. Said he just wanted to make sure that if anything happened to him, the stuff would end up with us, on account of we'd use it and appreciate it. Also, Johnny, he plunked down $10,000 in cash and insisted that we take that, too. Ten thousand? What for? His rent on his cabin for as long as he lived. Oh. Buster, did he leave a will of any kind? Well, now, I'm getting to that. Anyhow, last Friday afternoon, he went out fishing alone like he often did. And just before dark, one of the rental boats came in with two young kids. Yeah. They'd seen old Mike's boat up on the beach in that big cove just above the power line crossing. They found Mike laying on the sand beside it as still as death. Well, they came tearing in to report it, scared half out of their wits. Well, I sure hope you Oh, wouldn't. sure, sure. I grabbed Ham Pratt and a big flashlight. You remember Ham. Oh, yeah, the manager of the resort. Yeah, yeah. Well? Well, we... We found him there. And he... He was gone. The poor old fella. Go on, Buster. Well, Ham took one look at him and... Rattlesnake, he said. Rattlesnake did it. Mm-hmm. You could tell by the way Mike looked laying there. Fang marks? Yeah, on his right leg, just above the ankle. And a big bruise on his head, like he'd hit a rock when he fell. But on the phone, you said you thought it was murder. And a minute ago, you said you're sure of it. Well, we put him in our boat, hitched his on behind, and brought him back here. 
We phoned Tad Harding of the Kingman Police Department. Oh, I remember him. Good man. Yeah, well, Chief Harding took one look and he agreed with Ham. Poison from a rattler. Well, they took him into Kingman and I telegraphed the relatives. But, Buster, now look, you... Uh, then I got to thinking. There was something wrong. What do you mean? Well, there are very few rattlers in this part of the country because of the heat. They can't take it. If anybody would know better than to fool with one, it'd be old Mike. And they always sound a warning before they strike anyhow, don't sure, they? Sure, sure. So early next morning, I went back to the cove. And? Number one, there was no sign of any rock that Mike might have hit his head on when he fell. Go on, Buster, go on. There was no trail from any kind of a snake anywhere around. Well, the sand could have drifted over. No, sir. The footprints Ham and I and the kids had made were clear as crystal, but no tracks of a snake. All right, go on. Well, then I noticed it. Where another boat had been beached. Strange one, not from our landing. It was right next to where Mike's had been, right alongside. Any footprints from it? Well, if there were, we and the kids had mashed them all out. And I remember the way Mike had been laying there, as though he could have been rolled out of his boat or thrown out right on the sand. Then it looks as though somebody met him out on the lake, banged him over the head, made the fang marks, which isn't hard, then lashed the two boats together, dumped him off at the cove and left. It sure does, Johnny. I want to see that place. Yeah, and all the excitement, I might have overlooked a lot of things. Oh, that I doubt. Now, Buster, if there's no sign of rattlesnake poison in all Mike's body... Well, right after I called you, I phoned Chief Harding. Connor's making his autopsy today. He'll call me. Well, now, look. These nephews and nieces of Mike's, how much do you know about them? Oh, I never met them. But according to their answering telegrams, they're going to descend on us like a swarm of locusts. There are a lot of them? Well, no. I was thinking of the way that they... Well... One, there's a woman name of Martha Woodbury who... Excuse me. Mr. Faber? Yeah, I'm Buster Faber. I am Miss Martha Woodbury. Oh, well, Miss Woodbury, we were just at... Uh, uh, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Miss... How do you do? Mr. Faber, I'm a niece of Michael, Jonathan, and Kirby, and probably the major beneficiary of his estate. I wired you that I would be here, and I am. You got here kind of fast, too, didn't you? I also wired Uncle Michael's attorney in Kingman that I saw no reason why he should delay the reading of Uncle Michael's will. Lawyer Guilford phoned me about that, and I guess you weren't the only one. You should be here late this afternoon. I also wish to make funeral arrangements befitting one of his financial status. Uh, won't you sit down? Now, please tell me the circumstances of his death. And, of course, I wish to see the old, the poor darling's body. Miss Woodbury... Oh, uh, yes? What do you do for a living? Why, if it's of any concern to you, I teach at Armand College. Toxicology. Toxicology, huh? Yes. Well, isn't it? Very interesting. Is it? Why? Who are you, Mr. Dollar? Well, I'm a special investigator for your uncle's insurance company. What? Yes, you see, we have good reason to believe your uncle was murdered. Murdered? Murdered? Who said that? Oh. Hello, Martha. Uh, you said murdered. Are you talking about Uncle Michael? Well, that's right. Who are you? I am Chester Kirby, and as far as I know, the heir to my uncle's fortune. Oh. Who are you, sir? Uh, Chester, Mr. Dollar, is an insurance investigator. Oh, an investigator, huh? Dollar, I'm Hank Kirby, family black sheep, also Uncle Mike's nephew. What's his talk about murder? Are, uh, are you three his only relatives? That's right, Dollar. Except for Lita. Lita? Low Lita Laverne. Though we sometimes try to forget that. Oh, come off of that. Why, Miss Woodbury? My sister is a cheap nightclub dancer. We prefer to forget it. And the silly stage name she uses. Now, take it easy, teacher. Of course, Martha. This is hardly the time or place to... What do you do for a living, Mr. Kirby? Chester? Oh, uh, well, play the stock market a bit, that sort of thing. He's a playboy, Mr. Dollar, and a gambler, and I suspect not a very honest one. Martha, my dear girl, I resent that. You've never done a lick of honest work in your life. And if you think Uncle Michael didn't know it, would let his money ever get into those soft pickpocket fingers of yours. You don't you're... think you're the well, one Well, let me it. tell you something, Oh, shut up, both of you. Fair money grabbing. If you had to work for a living... You... Like what, Hank? What do you do? Yes. Tell him, Henry. Oh, I told you I was a black sheep of the family, but I work. You know, odd job. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar. He's a roustabout. Circuses, carnivals, that disgusting sort of thing. Where are you working now, Hank? Well, there's a sort of a scientific exhibit. Sideshow is more like it. All right, all right. Along the highway over near Victorville. A lot of rare animals, reptiles, and things on display. And Henry, dear boy, when he's off the bottle, is appropriately enough in charge of the snake pit. Oh. Uh, 
Well, we do scientific work, too. You, you know, like, uh, well, like, uh... Like, uh, what, Henry? Like milking the venom from the snakes to sell the laboratories? Yeah. Well, that is, we... Excuse me. Hello? What? You sure? Well, what... Mr. Dollar, now, I think it's about time you tell us hey, what you meant when... Yeah, Buster. I want you to hear this. It's Chief Harding. Go ahead, Chief. Well, as I said, Buster, there was evidence of rattlesnake venom in the body, all right, but it didn't enter at the fang marks on the leg. What, what do you mean, Chief? Well, the coroner says those marks were fakes. The venom was injected with a needle up near the armpit where it wouldn't be noticed. Chief, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, hi there, Mr. Dollar. Haven't seen you since you were out here Listen, working on... Listen, the... was the venom injected into his body before or after old Mike received the blow on the head? Was the coroner able to check that... I don't think he's tried, Mr. Dollar. Well, have him do it, would you please, if he can? Well, sure. Also, do me a favor and check with lawyer Guilford. I'd like to know when he's coming out here with a will. Oh, I saw him just a few minutes ago, and he asked me to tell Buster. Sometime this afternoon, if he can get away. Good, thanks. I'll talk to you later. Well, sure, Mr. As I started to say, Mr. Dollar, Look, Miss I... Woodbury, there is nothing that you or any of us can do until we get the complete report from the coroner. Well, you can at least tell us what you meant. And when what you about meant... dear Uncle Michael's will, Mr. Dollar? That will have to wait for the attorney. He expects to be here sometime later today. Now, wait a minute. You said murdered. Incidentally, I suppose the will shouldn't be read until uh, Lolita, or whatever her name is, gets here. According to her telegram, she ought to get here today. Well, she better. What I want you to do is arrange for quarters here. And, uh, all of you stay here. If you won't do it of your own free will, I'll have Chief Harding of the Kingman Police Department take whatever... No. No. Such a humiliation is entirely unnecessary. There's nothing to keep me from sticking around. I want to hear that world, too. Of course. Don't we all? Okay, then. Sit tight. For my money, any one of them could have done it. A toxicologist... A man whose business was handling poisonous reptiles and a cheap tin horn gambler and the nightclub dancer who hadn't appeared yet. Yeah, any one of them to latch onto the old man's fortune. I avoided telling the three present about the circumstances of their uncle's death and the hope one of them would slip would give himself away by saying something to show that he or she already knew. As soon as they were ensconced in their rooms, Buster and I hopped into his outboard and headed up the lake. Remember the last time we rode up here looking for evidence, Johnny? Yeah, I sure do. That was the Midas Touch mine. Yeah. And the pretty little lady owned a high-power rifle with a scope sight. And just about here, she started taking pot shots at us from the shore. Well, that's one thing we won't have to worry about this trip. Now, right around this point is where I found Mike's boat on the beach. And like I told you, I may have overlooked some clue that you'll spot in a second. Buster. Yeah? Tell me. Did old Mike earn enough as a fishing guide to make a living? Well, just about enough to buy food and a few odds and ends and... Well, like I told you, most of the time he deliberately forgot to charge. Not needing the money and all. Hey, Johnny. There in the cove. What? A boat. Right where Mike's was. Whose is it? Do you know? Isn't out of our landing by... Here, that puff of smoke from behind the bush way up on the sand dune. Swing us around. That's somebody with a gun. And look, we're taking in water, those holes in the bottom. Grab that can, start bailing. There, that guy can shoot. Pull us around, Buster. We're like a pair of sitting ducks out here. Right. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. It takes an awareness of life and a respect for mankind to make democracy work. But when this happens, democracy works in mysterious ways to better the lives of everyone. Why? Because democracy is concerned with everyone. One could say that democracy is people. For the people rule themselves in a democracy. No tyrant stands a chance. No dictator can get a foothold. The systems of laws and justice in a democratic government is made and operated by the people, for the people. And people like to be free. That's why democracy gives mankind its finest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Kirby Will Matter. Well, 
Whoever had been shooting at us from the shore there on Lake Mojave had a good eye. But a 30-mile-an-hour outboard at over 200 yards and swerving like mad can be a pretty tough target. With a hull full of holes, we had no choice but to go back to the landing. There, I made a quick check of the three I suspected of having killed old Mike Kirby. First, his nephew, Chester. Right here in my room, Mr. Dollar, reading. Then a brief walk in the hills. Why? And when is that lawyer coming to read Uncle Michael's will? Then the niece, Martha Woodbury. Gathering a few desert plants, as you must know. Hardly racing about on the lake armed with a gun, as you seem to suspect. Why don't you question Henry? If anyone should know how to handle a gun, he should. So I questioned Hank Kirby. Fraser, that's what. I saw no reason to just sit around waiting for that lawyer to arrive. I was fishing in that first big cove on the right. On the Arizona side. That's right. And I saw you and Buster tearing back here. That's when I come back to see what was up. Now, what is up? Mr. Kirby? Yeah, yeah Buster? On the pay phone, in the phone booth next to the cafe. Yeah? Kingman operator just called. Yeah? She still hadn't been able to reach your party on whatever that call was you made. Oh, yeah, thanks. What call, Hank? Uh, well, I, I've been trying to locate Lita to find out why she hasn't got down here. Maybe she doesn't care about the will. Where is she, Hank? It was to a dive up in Las Vegas that I sent the telegram, Johnny. Yeah, 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 that's where she's been working. Is that where you called earlier, Hank? Earlier? Yeah, didn't I see you in that phone booth when Buster and I pulled out? Oh, yeah, sure, trying to get Lita then, too. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me, Johnny. Lawyer Guilford just phoned me from Kingman. He'll be over here in about an hour. Then the will gets read, huh? Perhaps we ought to wait for Lita. What do you think, Hank? She'll... She'll be... Well, did you talk to her? Is she on her way? Yeah, she's on her way. All right. If Buster's willing, we'll use the office when Guilford gets here. Sure. So, Hank, you tell the others to be ready and waiting. Yeah, sure thing. Come on, Buster. All right, Johnny. What's on your mind? Well, maybe it's just a hunch, nothing more. But I want to get on that phone in the office. I called Armand College first. Yes, Miss Martha Woodbury had left there only last night. So she couldn't have been here when Mike Kirby was killed. A call to Chester's Hangout, a private gambling club in Reno, indicated the same thing. Call number three was to the so-called museum, where Hank Kirby worked with the snakes. A place within easy driving distance of Lake Mojave. But the records showed he hadn't left the place in two weeks until this present trip to be here. Lolita? Well, the manager of the club in Las Vegas said she hadn't missed a show. Daytimes? Well, who knew? But she was there every night. Then I suddenly remembered something about the geography of Lake Mojave. Yeah, Johnny. Cottonwood Landing is only about 25 miles north on the west, the Nevada side of the lake. Could that boat we saw in the cove? Sure. That's where it came from. I knew there was something familiar about it. Hey, what are you going to do, Johnny? Hangman. Operator, get me Cottonwood Landing, please. Yes, sir. It's one of their rattleboats, Johnny. Yes, sir, I'm sure of it. Any number? Any identification on it? All that I didn't see. Anyhow, they rent so many to fishermen every day. Uh-huh. Hey, here comes Lawyer Guilford driving up. Good. Cottonwood. Hello, this is Johnny Dollar, special investigator. Yes, sir. What I you... want to know if you rented a boat today to a girl named Lolita Laverne. Laverne? I'll meet him, Johnny, and I'll bring him all in here. Okay. Uh, no, sir. Uh, nobody by that name rented today. Well, uh, what about Friday? Friday afternoon. Friday. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, the only women we rented to on Friday was old lady Newberry, down from Canada for a couple of days. No, this is a young girl. Well, the other was a Miss Hancock. Hancock? Lucy Hancock. Okay. Thanks very much. I've never seen... Johnny, this is Lawyer Gilford. Lawyer, Mr. Johnny Dollar. It's a pleasure, Mr. Dollar. How are you, sir? Now, if if you'll all please sit down. All right. Uh, I'm a little pressed for time, so I'll waste none in getting to the reading of Michael Kirby's will. Well, you, you don't think we ought to wait for Lita to get here? It, it won't be necessary. Uh, no. I possess a full accounting of the net value of Mr. Kirby's estate. Excellent. Oh. It, it may surprise you, by the way. Fine, fine. This will confirms that valuation. It is dated, by the way, just five months ago. I made it out right after. Oh, look, let's get to the well. Huh? Let's read yes, it. Yes, yes, please, come on. Please. please. His real property consisted only of his clothes, then the outboard motorboat, 
and an old car which he transferred to the Lake Mojave Resort together with a sum of money to provide for his living here. How much? Yeah. Only $10,000. Oh, well, good. Uh, some years ago, he turned all other of his real property, including some rather important real estate and business holdings, into cash. Well, where is all the cash deposited now? Yes. Surely you aren't considering adding bank robbery to your rather questionable career, Henry. Martha, that is quite uncalled for. Now, why don't we proceed with the will? Yeah. Uh, there is one asset specifically set aside that perhaps I should mention since it concerns Mr. Dollar. He is the beneficiary? Oh, no, 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 no. I refer to the insurance policy for $5,000. Well, don't worry about a piddling amount like that. Let's have the will, oh, man. Oh, <clears throat> the insurance on. policy is to cover burial expenses and nothing else. All of it is to be used. Okay, okay. Let's have the rest of the world. Yes. Can't you leave all that? <clears throat> Very well. <clears throat> I, Michael Jonathan Kirby, do make, ordain... And declare this instrument to be my last will and testament. Oh, why don't you skip that stuff? Please. Being of sound mind and body, determined to enjoy the fruits of an industrious life to the fullest. The bequests, man. Life to the fullest. And rather than burden others with the responsibility that money demands. What? For these and other reasons... I have carefully spent every dollar I ever owned. <laughs> what? No, he was out of mind. That is the will of Michael Jonathan Kirby in its entirety. Good day. Good day. <laughs> what fools we've made of ourselves. What fools. And it's no less than we deserve. I only wish that Lucy had been here. Wait a minute. Lucy? Yes, Lucy. Her real name, a proper name, not Lolita Laverne. It's Lucy Hancock Woodbury. But as I told you before... Now listen, all of you. You're to stay right here. Stay in your room. Oh? What's the point? Now we know the contents of that stupid will. Yeah. But I want right you... Chief Harding. Tell him to stand by in case these people get itchy feet. Right. <laughs> What little I've done so far in this case was based on nothing but hunches. So when 10, then 11 p.m. came and Lolita, Lucy Hancock Woodbury, hadn't arrived, I acted on another hunch. Sure, Johnny. My room is right next door to the office, so if this leader arrives and signs in, I'll let you know right away. No, Buster, no. Huh? Just sign her into a room after you've done a little tampering with the register. What do you mean? Chester is in number six, isn't he? That's right. All right. Change that on the register to number eight. That's this one, your room. That's right. And be sure that Lita sees the register. I don't understand. You don't have to, Buster. Let's just hope she gets here. Buster left. And with my door ajar, I turned off the light and lay on the bed and waited. It must have been after midnight when I heard the car pull in. Where Buster admits someone to a room a couple of doors down the line and then go back to his home. Then, silence. Then, the quiet click of feminine footsteps approaching my door. Quickly, in the darkness, I lit a cigarette, held the glowing end away from my face. Well, darling. Yeah. About time. It's about time you got some sense, Chet. No, no, don't turn on the light. The others are asleep. Their rooms are dark. Uh-huh. Listen, dear cousin, have you lost your mind? Mm. Shooting at that boat from over the ridge between the two coves. What were they? Police? Detectives? Hmm. You, you should have known you couldn't have hit them that far away, Chet. You should have waited till they got on shore looking for me. Well. Did they fall for the rattlesnake bite we made on the old man? Uh-huh. Well, they'll never find the needle I used. It's at the bottom of the lake. And look, if the cops question you, I hope you had sense enough to remind them what Martha and Hank do for a living. No and chance. What, and what about the will? <laughs> Would you be surprised? What? Say that again, Chet. Say anything. You sound like somebody else. Yeah, like Johnny Dollar. Let's have some light. Dollar? That's right, special investigator. Oh, no. Let me out of here! No, where do you think you're going? No, let me go of me! Come on, now. Yeah, all four of them had wanted to see old Mike dead. 
But Hank, the only honest working man of the lot, didn't have the brains. Martha wouldn't have used a means that tied in with her toxicology work and probably didn't have the nerve. So Chet, who lived by his wits, and Lita, who was a real cheap no-account... Well, the courts will take good care of them. And I still have to chuckle over poor old Mike's will. Being of sound mind, I have spent all my money. <laughs> Which reminds me, expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford, three thirty-one twenty-five. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... Well, next week, the most complicated case in years comes up with the simplest, most obvious solution. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Barney Phillips, Shirley Mitchell, Stacey Harris, Carlton Young, Forrest Lewis, Frank Nelson, and John Daner. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Lud Barlow, Johnny. I'm on a spot. What's the matter? The Templeton house in Boston was knocked over sometime during the night. We have a $100,000 loss on our hands. Can you go over there right away? Well, I'll see what the plane situation is, Lud. Never I... mind the plane situation. Just pack up and get out to the airport. I'll meet you at Hangar 12. What? I'm chartering a plane for you. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Mid-Eastern Indemnity Corporation Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Templeton matter. Expense account item one, five dollars even, cab fare for my apartment to hangar 12 at the airport. A twin engine bonanza had been rolled out and a fueling truck was pulled up alongside. A man in a sheepskin seemed to be supervising things. The man who seemed to be supervising him was Lud Barlow. When he saw me, he waved his briefcase. Hey, Johnny. Hi. Hi, right, you all set? Well, I'm here. That's what you mean, lad. That all your luggage? Yeah, this is it. This is Tommy Clark, Johnny, your pilot. How are you? Hi, Tom. I'll uh, stow this gear for you. Oh, thanks. The faster we move on this, the better off we are. You know that. I know. Uh, this is the blanket policy. This is the itemized list. This is the itemized list broken down. You'll have to check the itemized against the sales. 
Your authorization procedure. And a description of stock records, including shipments received by Templeton House up to and including the first day of last week. Okay? Well, now maybe you'll tell me what this is all about. And when you get there, what? What it's all about. Let's start with Templeton House, huh? Biggest jewelry firm in Boston. You said they were robbed last night. Burglarized. Broken into somewhere between 5 and 7 o'clock in the morning. All set, Mr. Dollar. What'd they get away with? Well, that's for you to find out, Johnny. We carry a blanket policy on all their stock. Anything in the store in the way of merchandise is covered. On the phone, you said something about $100,000. It may be $200,000, Johnny. I take it you talked to somebody in Boston. Yeah. yeah. Did you talk to the police? Yes, for a minute. I told them I was sending a man. They're expecting you. Give your hand, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks, Tom. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Who's in charge, lad? Lieutenant Roebuck. Roebuck? Yeah. Get your seatbelt, Mr. Della. Oh, sure. You'll want to see those contents records. You'll be sure and tell them they're up to date. Who's the man with the company? What? The man at the company. Temple Sir. Stand clear, Mr. Bottle. Remember, Johnny, a client can face a thing like this a lot better if the man from the insurance company standing by. And... I'll try to remember that. Good luck and keep the informed. By the time we arrived at the Boston airport, I'd read over the policy and had a fair idea of the coverage involved. Expense account item two, ten dollars, more cab fare. I dropped my bags off at the Independence Hotel and had the driver take me over to Templeton House. Two police cars were parked in front of the building and two uniformed police officers were parked in the doorway. Yeah, I'm sorry, mister, the store's not open today. Well, I'm from the insurance company. Oh, Lieutenant Robux in the back. Go ahead. At the back of the store, a white-coated intern and an ambulance attendant were working over a blanket wrap figure laid out on the stretcher. One of them was operating a plasma tube. The other was checking the pulse. A group of men, some in uniform, were watching closely. The tall, thin ones seemed to be in charge of things. Roebuck? Uh, yeah. Johnny Dollar, Mid Eastern oh, okay. Indemnity. That didn't take you long. This uh, Sergeant Younger, Sergeant Toohey, this is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. Hi, man. What's this? Oh, this... The man was a special patrolman working the area. He must have walked right into the middle of it and got himself shot. They've been giving him transfusions ever since they found him. Uh-huh. Said anything yet? I oh, hasn't been conscious. Doc, how about it? Yeah, we can't do any more here, Lieutenant. We'll have to risk a trip to the hospital and try to operate. Okay, boys, load up. Right. Doc, this is Mr. Dollar, insurance company. How are you, Doctor? Uh, okay. Doc, we're going to want to talk to him the minute he comes around. I'm not going to promise you anything, Lieutenant. Well, see you. All right. Yeah, Mr. Dolly, you didn't waste much time. I brought a contents list that might help you, but uh, good. The best help we're going to get is from that patrolman. Come on, I'll show you around. This is where they got in. Jimmy, huh? Yeah, most likely. There's marks there on the door jam. But as we can tell right now, they only took important stuff. Easy to move. Easy to break down and unload, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, you can see where they snipped the alarms, grounded the wires. Mm -hmm. Showcases aren't touched. No, they went straight for the safe, darling. Well, we really got something on our hands, huh? You don't just break into a store and open one of these things very easy. Someone did. The neighborhood was canvassed for possible witnesses. I spent the rest of the morning with Dorian Templeton, the owner of the company. By noon, we had taken an inventory of the missing stock and drawn up a tentative list. As far as I know, that about does it, Mr. Dollar. So what's the next step? I'll check this against the merchandise received reports, Mr. Templeton. It'll take a while. As soon as I have that finished, you can check it over again and file a formal claim. And then? The company will reimburse you in cash. Well, what are the chances for recovery in a case like this? Well, I could quote the actuaries, Mr. Templeton, but I won't. Why not? Whoever broke in here last night knew what they were about. They opened your vault the way you'd open your front door. They took what they wanted and got out very quickly. No alarm, no witnesses. The chances are they planned the rest of it just as well. They probably scattered. The police aren't sure how many men were involved. They know it was at least two men, possibly three. How did they arrive at that? One man working on the safe, another man looking out. Possibly two. The point is, the more men who are involved, the harder it'll be for them to take the jewelry, break it down, sell it, and stay out of sight. They're going to get away with it? I didn't say that. Well, nothing seems to have gone wrong with their plans so far. 
One thing went wrong. That special patrolman surprised him. True, he didn't have time to draw his gun or sound the alarm, but they had to shoot him. And if something hadn't gone wrong, they'd have been satisfied to knock him on the head. Uh, yes. Well, what happens now? Well, that's up to the police. I can tell you their investigation will take some time. Burglary is the toughest kind of thing to work on. Why? No witnesses. Uh, I never thought of that. Well, are you all cleaned up? Well, we got a tentative list. As soon as I check it, I'll give it to you. Okay. Mr. Templeton, I'd like to have you come with me now. Now? Yes, we'll want your statement, sir, and there's quite a bit of work to do with the employees. Uh, all right. Dollar, as soon as you get the list up, give me a ring, will you? Yeah, okay. Uh, any news about the policeman? Yeah. It's a murder case now. Expense account item three, twenty-five dollars Stenographic fees. The public stenographer at the hotel helped me make a comprehensive list of the stolen items, which was verified by Templeton. The amount of loss was set at $100,000. By late afternoon, clerks, stenographers, accountants, designers, salespeople, stonecutters, all in Templeton's employ had made statements to Lieutenant Roebuck. The statements were in the process of being checked. A general roundup of known safe crackers and burglary suspects had begun. Expense account item four, $3.75 dinner. Lieutenant Roebuck and myself. Well, it's going to be a long night. Yeah. Any luck on the employees? Well, it's hard to say yet. One of them has a record. Hmm? Yeah, a fellow named Tabor. One of the janitors there. He's a two-time loser. I had him tucked away in a cell until we clear some of this other stuff away. Has he said anything? Oh, he denies all knowledge. As far as time incident goes, he was home sleeping when all this happened, but that doesn't rule him out of... Somehow getting that safe combination and passing it on to a friend. Yeah. Man with the records apt to have that kind of friends would be interested in just that kind of thing. Hey, uh, how much do you want me around? You're a free agent, darling. If you have any ideas, I'll listen. It's a tough baby, any way you look at it. Let me talk to Tabor. There might be a shortcut. Why not? John Tabor? That's right. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. I'd like to talk to you a minute. Okay, talk. You might be in a lot of trouble, Tabor. That'd be too bad. They tell me you're a two-time loser. If you don't believe what they tell you, you just go look it up for yourself. It's right down there in the books. How did you get that job at Templeton's? I asked for it. They know about your record? No. You keep it from them? I didn't broadcast it, would you? No. Okay, what other dumb questions have you got? Do you have any ideas about this? I've got a lot of ideas. Do you know anything about it? No. Need anything? What? Cigarettes, anything? I'm all set. Okay. My company faces a big loss in this case. We'd like to avoid that loss. There's a standard offer I'm authorized to make in some instances. I'm going to make it to you. If you have any knowledge of this crime and can furnish any information that will lead to the arrest of the persons involved and recovery of the merchandise, my company will guarantee you the best possible legal assistance in the event that information should incriminate you. That's pretty generous. Well, I have to say it to you. You can use your own judgment. Hey, guys. It's a pretty good offer when you think about it, Tabor. You have a record. The police can't pass you up without a lot of scrutiny. You know that. That record makes me a real hot one. I swiped a couple of cars, and now they think I might have opened that vault. No, they don't think that. But they have to find out if you might have contact with somebody who did open it. I don't know anything about it. In that case, you'll be released. Oh, sure. Sure, I'll be released when every cop in town had a go at me twice. I'll be released when the guys who did the job walk into the station and say we didn't mean it, we want to give it back. They've always got to have somebody to throw to the newspapers. Maybe. You know it and I know it. Nothing better than to throw some old ex-con in a can and hold him for questioning. You go for it? No. Uh, any more ideas? Turn him loose, Lieutenant. See whom he talks to and whom he meets. John Tabor was released without bail and a 24-hour watch was put on his residence. By 10 o'clock the next morning, the police had located three witnesses to the shots that had killed the special patrolman. However, none of them had seen the burglars or the car that was used. 
The district attorney's office issued an order impounding the financial records of Templeton House. A complete audit revealed that its affairs were in excellent shape. It also revealed that Templeton himself was the only man in the jewelry firm who had the combination to the vaults. His statements emphatically denied giving the combination to anyone. As far as the police were able to determine, he was telling the truth. The search for all known safe crackers extended into New York and Philadelphia and Chicago. On the morning of the third day, a claims adjuster arrived from Hartford with a check for $100,000, full payment on the claim. Two hours later, we had the first break on the case. Hey! Caller, hey! What? Oh! Hello, Lieutenant. Come on, get in. What's up? Well, the Harbor Division found a body down by the docks early this morning. All weighted down with 38 slugs. They were fired from the same gun that killed that special patrolman. They match, huh? Like the dimples on your knee. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. It is a rare event when a young man decides to leave civilization behind and hide himself away in the steaming jungle just so he can help his fellow humans in a remote corner of the world. The late Dr. Tom Dooley did just that when he left the United States to help the sick and starving jungle people in the little kingdom of Laos in Southeast Asia. Dr. Dooley's story is well known to nearly everyone. And all over the world, people talk of his little jungle hospital on stilts. That's where he treated the dread diseases of the jungle and trained native medical technicians so that they might help their own people. Dr. Dooley wrote and lectured to many people so that the work of his medical assistance program, Medico, might go on. It was not easy for someone so young and so talented to give up the bright lights of the city and plant himself down in an unknown jungle just for the purpose of helping unfortunate people he didn't even know. But through Medico, Dr. Tom Dooley wanted to help people. He wanted to help people to help themselves. Today, the work of Medico is going forward in a number of countries besides Laos. Young men are being sent to the United States to be schooled in medicine with the idea of returning to their own countries to help their own people. Hundreds of thousands of dollars' worth of medical supplies have been donated by American businessmen and pharmaceutical companies. Today, Dr. Tom Dooley's work is being continued for him. It is helping to create better understanding. It is... An injection of the spirit of freedom. The right of all men everywhere. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Templeton Matter. I spent the rest of the day with Lieutenant Roebuck at the morgue. The body that had been found in the harbor was a man about 35 to 40 years old. Slim Bill, dark hair. The labels had been cut out of his clothes and the laundry marks torn off. His fingerprints didn't check with anything in the local files. Roebuck put them on the wire to Washington and requested an urgent identification. Johnny Dollar. Blood Barlow, Johnny. What's this in the paper? Well, the special patrolman and the unidentified man were killed by the same gun. As soon as we get an identification, we can go to work. Well, how about that ex-con that turned up working at Templeton's? Tabor? Well, they're still watching him. He might have been the case, man. So far, it's just an idea. I'd like a recovery on this one, Johnny. So would I. What do you think is possible? Well, two days ago, I would have said no. Today, things look better. For one thing, none of the merchandise has shown up on the market. For another thing, there'll be, there has to be, some kind of connection with this unidentified man. I just read your report on Templeton himself. He's out of the question as a suspect? So far, yeah. He's the only one who has the combination to the safe. There's no apparent motive for him to rob himself. But he's the only Don't one who Don't start has... yelling at me, Lud. I know what you're thinking. Find a motive. Well, give us time, boy. Give us time on everything. Lud? Oh, I guess I hate to pay off big claims. <laughs> you may get it back. Keep your pants on. Expense account item five, fifty dollars deposit for rented car. That afternoon, I drove from Boston to Creeksdale, the home of the Grantland Safe Company. 
where I met a man who looked as formidable as the product he manufactured. I am Grantland, sir. I found him standing inside a shiny new vault, ready for shipment. Beautiful thing, eh? On its way to South America tonight. Well, I... I never thought of a safe exactly that way, Mr. Grant. Ah, beauty, strength. Think for a moment, sir, the treasures it will someday hold. But I bore you, sir, with my enthusiasm. <clears throat> now then, you say you are here on a matter of vaults. One vault, Mr. Grantlin. No. The one your company sold and installed at the Templeton House in Boston 17 years ago. Yes. Have you read about the burglary? No, sir, I have not. Mm. Templeton House. Yes. The vault was opened. Blasted? Opened. Someone had a combination. I am bewildered, sir. Indeed I am. You want a thorough accounting for my organization, of course. Well, that's up to the police, Mr. Grantlin. Right now, for my own information... I wonder if you could tell me who might have the combination to that vault. Well, in answer to your question, I would first have to inspect our records. Well, I brought the serial numbers. Oh, well, let me see. Um, mm -hmm. That's as good as... Uh, the K series, Mr. Keating set the final combination. Mr. Keating? Yes, my chief engineer for years. And who else? Uh, myself, sir. I'd have a record of the combination in my own file. And who are those available to? Myself, sir. I keep them in my own vault. I see. Anyone else? No one here. The people in proper authority at Templeton. I'd like to meet Mr. Keating if I could. Impossible, Mr. Dollar. Why? Mr. Keating has been dead these six years. <laughs> I drove back to Boston, phoned Roebuck, and told him about my interview with Grantland. He said he'd already started looking into Grantland's background and expected to have a report within 36 hours. I was a little surprised when Dorian Templin called half an hour later and asked me to have lunch with him. Would you like a drink? No, not now, guys, no. I didn't know whether to call you or the police, Mr. Dollar. I finally decided on you. Uh-huh. What's the matter? Well, it's one of those strange things, uh... I'm not a particularly observant man, and I don't know why I observe this. Go on. However, last night, Mrs. Templeton and I went to a dinner dance at the country club. We thought with all this business, a little relaxation should do me some good. Yeah, sure. There was a young girl at the table next to ours, a very pretty girl whom I've never seen before. I happened to notice her handbag, jeweled affair, quite expensive. One of our items... Yeah. It didn't occur to me until we were leaving that it had been sampled stock, not for sale. What do you mean? It was stolen, Mr. Dollar. Why not the police, Mr. Templeton? I was going to call them first thing this morning and report it. And then I got a package in the mail. It was the handbag, intact. Crazy? You said it. Did you happen to get the name of the girl? I asked the Meta D. He said her name was Helen Tabor. That's not so crazy. Expense account item six, ten cents, one phone call. To Lieutenant Roebuck to see if John Tabor was still being watched. Roebuck said that two men were on duty watching his house at all times. I saw them when I drove up an hour later. They were parked across the street. Miss Tabor? Yes, who are you? Johnny Dollar, is your father in? Uh, he's sleeping right now. May I help you? I don't know. Didn't I see you at the country club last night? Why, yes, were you there? Couldn't keep my eyes off of you. Or your handbag. Oh. I'll talk to him, honey. Dad, is anything wrong? Nothing I can handle. Go ahead, fix up a pot of coffee. All right, Dad. Nice girl, Tabor. Yeah. Templeton was at the country club last night. He saw her. You can talk to me or you can talk to the police. I don't have to talk to anybody. The way it looks is that you cased the job. You might even have killed a special patrolman. He was shot close range. Could have been somebody new and trusted. You've got your share of things. That handbag was part of it. A little part of it. The 
the way it looks, huh? That's about it. Of course, I don't understand why you sent the handbag back, but then you've probably got a good story for that. Oh, I've got a good story. Nobody will believe it, but I've got a good one. It starts off by me saying I didn't help in that heist. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't case the place for anybody. I didn't even know it was coming off. Let's get to the handbag. I took that two days ago. I borrowed it. I've been borrowing stuff right along whenever my kid needed anything. I always come back in good shape. I told her they... They let me do it. She don't know anything. Borrow them. That's kind of a strange philosophy. I don't even know how to spell the word. I do know my kid's got a life ahead of her. I got to give her every chance to look good, act good, use her brains, meet the right people. Not just because the right people have money, but because they know more right people. It takes a, it takes a little extra to let her do things like that. You let her use the handbag because she had a date to go to a dance. Uh, you guys are all the same. I didn't expect you to believe it. Oh, relax. Maybe I do believe you. What? It sounds nutty enough to be the truth. It is the truth. All right. You taking me in? I'm going to tell Roebuck about this. He'll probably want to talk to you. He can check it better than I can. Now, I haven't any authority to take you in. I wouldn't take you in anyhow. I'm interested in guys who walk into vaults. See you around. Hey, wait a minute. What? I never thought I'd see the day when I try to help a cop or anybody like a cop. Maybe this is the day. I, um... I saw the paper last night. Oh? The picture of that guy they found floating in the harbor. They tagged him yet? He's a John Doe until we hear from Washington. His name's Kylie. Billy Kylie. How do you know? I used to know him a long time ago. Billy Kylie? Yeah, from Philadelphia. Thanks. A check with the Philadelphia police and a comparison of fingerprints identified the man as William H. Kiley. His Boston address was on Parker Street. I drove out there with Lieutenant Roebuck. It was an ordinary, undistinguished apartment house. No one answered at apartment 12A, so we let ourselves in. The room had nothing to offer in the way of evidence. Well, did you find anything? No. Nope. Well, I'll have some men come out here and give it a good going over. Well, uh, maybe the manager or the tenants list, something that'll help us. Come on, let's go. Yeah. Be careful, though. Yeah. Yeah. Tim? Yeah, this is Tim. Any trouble there? A little. Say that again. A little. I don't know who you are, but I know you're not Tim. Well, it sounds like we're getting something. Here, let me have the phone. I'll see if I can trace it. Don't bother. I know where we can find him. What? I'd recognize his voice anywhere. It was dark by the time we got to the Grantland Safe Company factory in Creeksdale. There was a single work light spreading a sickly yellow glow over the main floor loading platform. We were expected. It went off somewhere in the darkness of the building. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. All right, let's try for that stair really. Right. See the flashes? There. All right. We'll have to try. Mr. Dollar. He thinks you're alone. Answer him. Yeah? What are you doing here? Looking for $100,000 worth of jewelry and the answer to a couple of murders. (laughs) Funny? (laughs) You're very foolhardy. But you're courageous. A man of your perception could do well with a part of that money. No, thanks. I'll take it all. You will take nothing, sir. Keep him talking. I'll try to get under the stairs. Are you alone? For a little while. But I've got people coming, though. Oh, people, eh? <laughs> Mr. Dollar? Still alive and kicking, Mr. Grantland. You can't shoot around corners. No, <laughs> But then I don't have to shoot around the corner. Very, very, very good. Very good. 
good shooting, sir. Granlund, I want a statement. No, no. No statement. No statement. He was dead before the ambulance arrived. And there was no statement. There was never a statement. As nearly as it could be pieced together, Grantland himself opened the vaults at Templeton House. William Kiley and possibly a man named Tim helped him. Kiley, of course, was killed for his efforts. Tim never appeared, was never identified. My hotel bill ran up to $168. That's item 7. Item 8, $35, car rental. I got $50 deposit back. Item 9, $32 and a half, airfare and incidentals, back to Hartford. Expense account total, $413.28. Remarks? Put that against $100,000 the insurance company didn't have to pay off. Johnny Dollar. This is Barlow. I just talked to Roebuck in Boston. There's not one scrap of that jewelry anywhere in that whole safe factory. Not one piece. I know. What? Just about now, there's a safe at the port of New York being shipped to South America. It's a Grantland safe. And if you hurry over there, you can... <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Where have you been for the past 20 minutes? In the shower. For 20 minutes? Okay, so I'm a shiny dollar. So you... Oh. Who's that? Max. Max Green at Assured Equity. Oh, hi, Max. What's on your mind? Four score and seven years ago... Our father's brought forth, but that doesn't answer my question. Johnny, you ever hear of the Meeks? Uh... New England family, stood away in the Mayflower, speak only to their money? That's the Meeks. What about them? No, not about them. It's about Mariah Meek and Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. She's lost her copy of it. Well, it shouldn't be hard to find her another one. That's where you're wrong, Johnny. Huh? It would be very hard. Might cost us $100,000. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Assured Equity and Trust Company, 325 Scott Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Meek Memorial matter. Expense account item one, $1.90, cab from my apartment to Max Green's office. He was standing in a haze of cigar smoke, ashes on his vest, and a worried look on his face. Oh, good morning, good morning, Johnny. Oh, you want a cigar? Oh, no, no, thanks. Let's sit up, sir. Excuse me. Listen, Johnny... 
What do you know about that speech that Lincoln made at Gettysburg? Well, I had to memorize it in school, like every other kid. All right. You know how many words are in it? Um, maybe a couple of hundred. Why? Wait a minute. It's in this book. Here. It's page 143. The speech is printed here exactly as Mr. Lincoln released it to the newspapers after the Gettysburg Address. You find it? Yeah, but now what do you... Okay. Total number of words, 268. Oh. But the first two drafts of that speech, including the one he read that day, contained only 266 words. So he padded his part. That's right. Two more words. Mm -hmm. How come? Oh, according to the historians, Lincoln ad-libbed the two additional words at the time he read it. Later on, when he made three new copies of the speech, he included those two words. You with me so far? Keep going, Max. Yes. All right. Right down at the end of it, just before Of the People, By the People, where he said that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, hmm? the words under God do not appear in the first two drafts you wrote. Yeah. Well, this is all very interesting, Max, yeah, but I still don't see what it is or what it has to do with me. Well, Mariah Meek's copy has disappeared. Oh. And Johnny, that copy happens to contain just 266 words. You mean she owns one of the first two original drafts? Handwritten by Mr. Lincoln himself while he was on the train riding to Gettysburg. Wowee. Yeah. Which is, of course, why we insured it for the full amount it cost her, which is $100,000 even. Of course, you made sure it was authentic before you issued the Oh, policy. naturally. Well, who'd she buy it from? An antique dealer down in Richmond, Virginia, a fellow named uh, Jason Penrod. Uh-huh. Well, where's she been keeping it? Under glass. In the Meek Memorial. What's that? Oh, she collects Americana, so she had a museum built to keep it in, and she calls it the Meek Memorial. Follows? Mm -hmm. Follows. Also follows the most expensive item in the collection, the Gettysburg Address, would be the one to disappear. Oh, you're just an old pessimist, Max. You think somebody lifted it? What do you think? It walked out by itself. Okay, okay. So what are you going to do about it? Well, we're going to run newspaper ads. We're going to offer a $10,000 reward for information leading to its return. If anyone answers it, you let me know where you'll be, and I'll refer them to you. Good. When was it taken? The night before last. Is there any kind of market for something that rare? Uh, hard to say, Johnny. A hot camera would be easier to peddle. Sure. But a good many wealthy people, like Mrs. Meek, they make a hobby of collecting things, you know, antiques, objects of art, etchings. But whoever took this, or buys it from the thief, couldn't just let everybody see it. Well, it wouldn't matter to some people. They take it and put it in a vault and keep it there. Then what's the point in having it around? Pride of possession. You've got something no other collector could own. Mm. And, of course, it might not have really disappeared at all. You're thinking of fraud? A hundred grand is a lot of cash. <laughs> Expense account item two, one dollar and ninety cents. Cab fare back to my apartment. I wasn't particularly intrigued by this assignment... Rare documents, like anything else antique, have always seemed to be just one step from decay. And that sometimes goes for the people who collect such things. Item three, $16.10, transportation, including a round-trip ticket, Hartford to New Bedford, and cab fare to the Waiters Hotel. There was a convention in town, so I was lucky to get a room. After checking in, I called the Meek residence. Mrs. Meek was expecting me and said she'd have her car pick me up. I had just put down the phone when someone knocked on the door. There. Depends on what you're looking for. Well, I'm looking for Mr. Mr. Jade. Jay, did you say? Nobody by that name here. Oh, yeah. I, I see. I, I, I guess I got the wrong room. Yeah, well, uh, why don't you ask down at the desk? Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Funny. Where is it? I cracked the door open again. Watched him walk to the stairs. Then I took the elevator down the eight flights to the lobby. Half an hour later, I was in the back seat of the Meek limousine, heading toward the home out on Buzzard's Bay. It was a big, sprawling frame building facing on the beach. About 50 yards behind it, closer to the road, was the Meek Memorial Museum. I was starting up the front steps when the door opened. Mr. Dollar? Ah, that's right. I'm Paul Meek. I understand you have an appointment with my grandmother. Right again. Now come in, please. He's waiting for you upstairs in the sitting room. Okay, thanks. Uh, before you go up, I wonder if I could have a few words with you. Why not? Stay in here, then. You've never met my grandmother, have you? No, no, I haven't had that pleasure. Some people consider it a dubious one, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Uh, Mr. Dollar, this is my wife, Janice. This is me. Hi. How about a drink? Uh, thanks, not just now. 
How about you, old stick in the mud? You want another one? After a bit, Janice. And if I were you, I wouldn't have any more. But you're not me, are you? You will have to excuse my wife, Mr. Dollar. She... Well, we've both been under a severe strain since moving here. Grandmother is blind, you know. No, I didn't know. Her sight began failing about four years ago. I'm surprised the insurance agent didn't tell you. Well, Mr. Green was so concerned over the theft of the Lincoln manuscript, I, I imagine it slipped his mind. Mm-hmm. And just how do you intend to locate that manuscript? I'm not so sure that I can. It'd be a pity if you couldn't. It'd be just awful. It's grandmother's prized possession. She hasn't been herself since it was stolen. And being quite elderly, well... We're all very much concerned. Oh, my, yes. We're afraid she might die and leave us all that lovely money. Janice. It's the truth. You see, Pa and I don't have any money of our own, Mr. Dowler. We'll never have any until she does die. Instead of giving it to us now while we're young, you know what she does with it? Spends it buying junk for that soy old museum. Now, look. That's yeah. gratitude, isn't it? I bathe her feet or rub her feet and do all her dirty work. Janice, and... you've said quite enough. Mr. Dollar isn't interested in our personal problems. Oh, stick in the mud. All right. I'll be in the den if you want me. And that's the funniest thing I've said all day. If you want me. I'm sorry. She doesn't mean half of what she says. Uh, oh, that's Grandmother's signal. Then hadn't we better go up? Yes. Yes, we'd better. We went up the broad staircase, through a hall, and into a bright, sunny room. Wrapped in an old kimono and shawl, Martha Meek sat in an invalid chair, facing the ocean. Paul introduced us, then sat down quietly near the door. Paul? Paul, I know you're there. Now answer me. Yes, Grandmother. You go on downstairs. I want to talk with Mr. Dollar in private. Whatever you say. And close that door. Don't mind my back, Mr. Dollar. I couldn't see you if I looked into your face. Now then, when are you going to arrest that crook and bring my Lincoln speech back to me? Well, I, I'm going to need a lot of help and information, Mrs. Meek. Mm-hmm. What kind of information? Mostly about the museum. Like what? Well, do you know who was in there the night the manuscript disappeared? Certainly. That dirty robber was... <laughs> Anyone else? Well, old Pete's always there. Supposed to be guarding the place, but he didn't do a very good job the other night. Got himself slugged. Does he live on the grounds? Yes. I brought him over from Naples ten years ago. He was my guide in Italy. Showed me around so nice, I decided to bring him back. Tell me, is the memorial open to the public? It was going to be. I intended it to be once. But when my eyes... No, Mr. Dollar, I keep it locked most of the time. Uh-huh. And who discovered the manuscript was missing? Pete did, I guess. At least when he recovered, he ran yelling bloody murder up here to the house. Everybody went down to see what had happened. Everybody but me, they left me all to myself. Were there any strangers here in the house that night, Mrs. Meek? Anyone beside the servants and your grandson and his wife? One person, but he's no stranger. Who's that? Jason Penrod from Richmond. He's an art dealer. We were discussing some business. May I, uh, ask what kind of business? Uh, It has nothing to do with you or the people you work for. Sorry. Where can I find Mr. Penrod? Uh, He's staying here now. If he isn't in his room, then he's most likely out in the memorial. Now, that's enough questions. You, give me a cigarette. Ma'am? What's the matter? You're deaf? Give me a cigarette before Paul or that snoopy wife of his comes prowling around. (laughs) All right, sure. Light me. Yeah. Ah. Well, you want any more information? Pete's the one to talk to. All right, thanks. But what about your son and daughter-in-law? Were they inside the house at the time of the robbery? You don't suspect them, do you? Right now, I suspect everybody, Mrs. Meek. Even me? Yes, ma'am. Even you. Well, bless you, boy. <laughs> I found Pete Vesuvio trimming the shrubbery just outside the memorial building. He seemed quite willing to talk to me. Uh, How you say what happened to me, mister? I'm uh, hit out? (laughs) Knocked out, Pete. Ah, si, senor. And because of this, I do not see anything. Nothing at all, huh? 
Please, mister, do not use the insult. I am American citizen, first papers. And because of the kindness of my patrona, I will soon be second papers. I know by heart the Constitution, United States, the Gettysburg address, pledge allegiance to my flag. Yeah. You know how I know that these things which help me be citizen? Because of my lady, she's letting me work in a place where great papers are for me to read. Because of her, I would not hide anything, mister. Okay, Pete, okay. I'm convinced. But I'm sorry I cannot help you, mister. Well, it's not your fault. Hey, you like to hear me say Gettysburg address. Well, Do it very good. Learn it right from President's own writing. Some other time, Pete. Right now, I have to find Mr. Penrod. Oh, he's inside, mister. Counting the treasures. All of the beautiful things a lady can no longer see. You'll find him in uh, Section L, senor. <laughs> I found the small, neat-appearing art dealer just where Pete had said he'd be, peering into a glass case crowded with Derringer pistols. He had a notebook under his arm and seemed to be making some sort of inventory. Oh, oh dear, you, you gave me quite a fright, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I uh, wish I could concentrate like that. Oh, well, there's nothing more interesting to me than these fine old pistol things. <laughs> what history they must have, Mr. Uh, Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, the insurance investigator. Paul told me you were wondering about the place. I, I suppose you'd like to ask me some questions, hmm? If you don't mind. Oh, no, goodness, no. I understand you were with Mrs. Meek the night of the robbery. Uh, that is correct, sir. We heard the shouting. We ran out here just as fast as we could. I was the one who discovered the manuscript was missing. You have any idea how the thief got in here? No, sir, no, no. Unless someone forgot to lock the front door, or unless he had a key. <laughs> Well, has Mrs. Meek given out many of the keys? Well, in my opinion, too many. <laughs> Even I have one. What about Paul Meek and his wife? No, I don't think so. Well, they, they really aren't interested in the museum at all, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Uh, Mr. Penrod, I understand you're quite an authority on antique art and things like that. Well, I... Uh... Isn't taking inventory a little beneath your position? Well, I suppose it is, Mr. Dolliver. Uh, last week, when I received dear Mariah's wire asking me to do it, I, I simply couldn't refuse it. She's been such a good customer of mine. Will he? Yes. You have any idea who might have wanted the Lincoln manuscript? Well, I know several persons who'd love to have it. Give most anything, but I don't know anyone with uh, the nerve to break in here and take it by force. You remember where Paul Meek and his wife were when you heard Pete shouting? They were right in here when I arrived. I see. Well, thanks for... Oh, just one more thing. Oh, yes? If you'd stolen the manuscript... Mr. Dollar... A hypothetical question, Mr. Penrod. But if you had, and you wanted to sell it at a good price with the least danger of being caught, how would you go about it? Well, I, I, I take it abroad, of course. I'd put it on the open market over there. Huh. You aren't planning on going abroad soon, are you, Mr. Penrod? Oh, gracious, no. <laughs> you know anyone who is? Anyone who, uh... Well, didn't Paul and Janice tell you? Well, they're flying to Paris Wednesday night. I left the memorial and walked back to the house. The Meeks were in the study, engaged in their favorite pastime. When I told them what the art dealer had said, Paul set down his glass long enough to confirm the fact that they did have reservations and insisted that he had a logical explanation for not having told me of those plans earlier. Very logical explanation, Mr. Dollar. Let me handle this, Janice, please. Sure. Drink, Johnny? No, first I want to hear that explanation, if you don't mind, Paul. Of course I don't mind. Janice and me, were fed up. Why didn't you tell me about the plane reservations? Well, why should I have? I'm not even sure I'm going to use them. Oh? Grandmother's upset enough over losing that manuscript. Something else might... Well, anyhow, if the manuscript doesn't turn up within 48 hours, we're canceling our trip. Oh, no, please. Sorry, Janice, but that's the way it's got to be. She did it. What do you mean? It's an act, don't you see? Jason Penrod told her we were going to leave, so she had him hide the manuscript. And now this thing about her being so upset and having such a weak heart. It's an act to keep her precious darling boy tied to her apron string. I don't believe that. Well, just wait. You will. Anything else, Dollar? What does a trip to Paris cost, Paul? Well, it's not inexpensive. Your wife was complaining about being so broke. Haven't you ever heard of flying now and paying later? We have friends in Paris, Dollar. It won't cost as much to live once we get there. And we'll worry about paying for our ticket when we get back. Any other questions, Mr. Snooper? Yeah. Later. 
It was after seven when I finally got back to my hotel room. I ordered a drink and tried to make some kind of sense out of the information I'd gathered during the day. But it all added up to zero. I called Hartford and asked Max Green to look into the meek finances. Then I dressed for dinner. I was about to go downstairs when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I was told to call you. Yeah? It's about the ad. The ad? In tonight's paper about something missing from a certain memorial. Go on. Well, I called Hartford. Collect. They said to call you. Yeah, that's right. Who is this? Now, my name's not important, Dollar, but that ten grand reward is. You think you can earn it? You meet me tonight, you'll see. Where? In the alley behind the Bourne Whaling Museum. Be there at 9.30 and be alone. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Expense account item four, 85 cents cab fare from my hotel to the Bourne Whaling Museum. I don't like wandering around dark alleys at night, alone in a strange town. It isn't the best way to stay alive. But at 9.29, I passed the old whaling museum and started down the alley. It was dark, no moon, and it was very quiet. I was about 20 yards in from the street when I saw him, curled up in a ball like he had a stomach ache. Only he didn't. Because somebody had made him very dead. I struck a match and turned him over. I'd only seen him once before, but I didn't have any trouble remembering where it had been. Right after I'd checked in, he'd knocked on my hotel room door. By mistake. At least that's what he'd said. After giving a statement to the local police who identified him, I went back to my hotel. Evening, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, say, uh, look, I know it's probably against all your rules, but uh, who had my room just before I checked in? Oh, I couldn't disclose that information, sir. Sorry. Oh, well, so am I. It'd mean a lot for me to know. Maybe even five bucks worth. Well, I... I... Well, sir, if it's that important... <clears throat> Thank you. Now, yeah, let's see here. Uh, um... Yeah, yes, here it is. Uh, can you read his signature, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, thanks. Just fine. <laughs> The name I'd seen scrawled on the hotel register wasn't important now. At least not without something more to back it up. There was no law against checking out of a hotel. But there was a law against murder, if it could be proven. And that would be hard to do without finding a motive. So I went back to the Meek House to look for it. I paid off the taxi, that's item five, and started up the front steps. Oh, hi, Johnny. I thought it might be you. That's so? Mm-hmm. I hope you aren't mad at me for the things I said today. No, no, not at all. I've been a very bad girl. But everything's going to be all right now. It is. Mm-hmm. Or haven't you heard? Heard what? About dear old grandmother. She had a real bad stroke. Isn't expected to live. You, uh, aren't a bit sorry, are you? Would you be, if you were me? Dollar, you mind coming up here? No, not a bit, Paul. I'm trying to reach you at your hotel. Thank goodness you've come here. Did Janice tell you? Yeah. How is she? Bad. Doctor's given up. Says it's only a matter of hours. Uh, she told me to send for you, Mr. Dollar. Oh? I don't know why. But I've never been able to figure out a lot of things she did. All right, where is she? In there. Oh, Pete's with her, but go on in. Thanks. Would they increase devotion to that cause for which they here gave her the last... Who is it? Oh, it's uh, Mr. Dollar, my lady. Hello, Mrs. Meek. Oh, thank you for coming, Mr. Dollar. I uh, go now. No, wait. Mr. Dollar, you have a moment, haven't you? Of course. I promised Pete the last time I visited the museum. I promised I'd let him recite some of the things he's learned while working there. I haven't been able to keep that promise till now. Go on, Pete. Please. Yes, my lady. They here gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. That was wonderful. 
Thank you, my lady. Now I, I go. Well, Mr. Dollar, I have a confession to make to you. Yes? I lied to you. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't a very big lie, Mrs. Meach. Oh, but it was. I told you the business Mr. Penrod and I were discussing the night of the burglary. Yes. I told you it had nothing to do with you or the people you work for, remember? Yes, ma'am. Well, that was a lie. I'm broke, Mr. Dollar. All I have left in the world is this house and the things in the memorial. I see. That's why I sent for Jason Penrod. He purchased most of my treasures for me. He's evaluating them now. So Paul and Janice will know what they're worth when they go to sell them, which they'll do immediately. Mrs. Meek, don't you think you should try to rest now? Will you give me a cigarette? No, ma'am. Sorry. And you must rest. There isn't much else to do, is there? Good night, Mr. Dollar. Outside in the hall, Paul and Janice Meek were talking quietly to Jason Penrod. Off in the corner, standing with his back to the others, was Pete Vesuvio. Mr. Dora, is she... She is resting quietly. Oh, dear God. Why did you lie to me, Pete? What? I never lied to nobody. Who say I did? I say you did. You're crazy, mister. What lie I tell you? You said you learned the Gettysburg Address right from Mr. Lincoln's own writing in the museum. That's a no lie. What's the matter? You don't believe that, mister. I believe you, Pete. But I just had to be sure. Come on, let's join the others, shall we? Well, good evening, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Penrod. Tell you any of the family secrets, Johnny? Not too many. You learn anything in there you didn't know before? Yeah. I know which one of you stole the Lincoln manuscript. One of us? Why, you're crazy, Dollar. We were all in the house at the time it happened. That's right. But one of you hired a little man named Leo Jones to do your dirty work. Jones called me earlier this evening. He was going to tell me which one of you it was. Evidently, he didn't like the deal he was getting. What was he doing, Penrod, trying to blackmail you? What are you talking about? I don't know any Leo Jones. Then why did he come around to my hotel room this morning? The same room you just checked out of. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. I imagine several persons have been to that room today. Sure, but they're still alive. Now, let's get to the phony Lincoln manuscript. Phony manuscript? It wasn't phony, Mr. Dollar. Wasn't it? Well, you correct me if I'm wrong, Penrod. After Mrs. Meek purchased one of the first two drafts of Mr. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, she started losing her sight. When she closed the museum to the public, you saw a chance to make yourself another $100,000 sale. So you switched copies of the manuscript, replacing that draft with one containing the words, Under God, which isn't worth anything close to hundred grand. What do you mean, Dollar? All right, let me quote. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and so on. What? The phrase, under God, was not in the manuscript he sold your grandmother. But it was in the copy old Pete has been studying in the museum. Right, Mr. Penrod? All of you, stay right where you are. You get what Jones got. Mr. Dollar. He won't go far, Pete. But I am the guard. The lady will want me to stop him. Pete, come back here. Keep away from me. Pete! Oh, my God! Come on. Oh. You, uh, you tell the lady. I am a better guard now. Much better. See, si, senor. Yes, Pete. I did good. You did fine. Pete Vesuvio will live to apply for his second paper. <laughs> and in time, probably open a spaghetti joint in New Bedford. Penrod will be tried for murder. As yet, he hasn't disclosed the name of the person who purchased the stolen manuscript. But on time, I am sure he will. As for the Meeks, well, Mariah passed on later that night. But as she said, there was nothing left for her but to rest. Expense account total, including hotel and numerous incidentals, $98.30. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dave Lawler, Johnny, over at Surety Mutual and Trust Company. Oh, hi, Dave. Long time. Yeah, I know. Listen, do you own a pair of dark sunglasses and some real loud sports shirts? Mine are so loud I have to keep them in a soundproof drawer. Great. But where you'll be at this time tomorrow, nobody will give them a second look. Oh, like where? Well, according to the travel folders, it's, quote, the land where the summer spends the winter, unquote. In other words... Palm Springs, California. Dave, you're on. Good. But don't forget, this can be pretty expensive for your company. Oh, more than you know, Johnny. 75,000 hard cash. Ah, we. Oui. Unless you're able to prove the bracelet Dan Galloway gave to his child bride wasn't really stolen. For a trip to Palm Springs at this time of year, I think I could prove anything. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Franklin Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the suntan oil matter. (laughs) Expense account item one, $197.40. Airline fare and incidentals, Hartford to Palm Springs, California. I registered at La Casa de Paz on South Palm Canyon Drive, changed into casual clothes, and sauntered over to police headquarters. Detective Sergeant Lacey was about to leave for lunch, so I went along with him. Yeah, Dollar, you'd be surprised at how much stuff is lost in this town during the course of just one season. The report we got says it was stolen, Sergeant. Oh, sure, sure. But I doubt it. A $75,000 bracelet, just five days old? That'd be a little careless of the lady, wouldn't it? Well, if you were married to one of the biggest wildcatters in the oil business, maybe you could afford to be careless. What about Dan Galloway? Didn't you say he was drilling somewhere around here? About 80 miles south in the middle of the desert down by Salton Sea. Salton Sea. Oh, that's really a big inland lake that lies way down below sea level, isn't it? Want to bring me a check, Daddy? 245 feet below sea level, Dollar. There's oil there? Dan Galloway figures it this way. One of the most successful new fields that's been worked in years is deep under the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Louisiana. There are a lot of salt domes down there, and underneath them are big pools of oil. Millions of barrels. So, why not under the Salton Sea, which is all salt deposits? Who knows? Maybe he has something. Anybody else drilling down there? Uh, just Galloway. Who else needs it? I mean, any more than he does. Well, does he? All yours, Daddy. How would I know if Galloway needs it? But there has been talk around, you know. But if he's hard up, how could he afford that fancy bracelet last week? Yeah, or the uh, snazzy Italian sports car the week before that. I don't know either, darling. What about his wife? Oh, 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 that Roberta. What a doll. And in 3D, if you know what I mean, how an old coot like him could ever latch onto a pretty little chick like her. 
I take it Roberta's somewhat younger than her husband. Oh, not more than 35, 40 years. Oh, I see. How long have they been married? Mm, two, maybe three years. Uh, down in Dallas, I think it was. She's a Texas girl. Well, is it working out? I mean, are they happy? There's talk about that, too. What kind of talk? Oh, it's really just small-town gossip for the most part. Uh, ever hear of Sonny Wyman? Wyman? No. Well, Sonny's around Roberta's age. One of those kids who came up from nothing, but all the time knew exactly where he was going. You know, made a point of meeting the right people, shaking the right hands. Real nice kid, too. Uh, what's he do? Well, when the season's over here, he works Pasadena, Beverly Hills, and L.A. Always has something that'll intrigue his wealthy friends. This season, it's Italian sports cars. Uh, Cosmo Romas, I think they are. And he's the one who sold the Galloway's theirs, huh? Uh, he sold Roberta hers. Any angle there in connection with the bracelet? Huh? There is. You let me know. Well, if there isn't, what have you been working up to? Well, actually, nothing. You see, I still believe it was lost. <laughs> Expense account item two, $35 for rental of a drive-your-own car. I found the Galloway place about two miles out north and east of town. As I parked in the broad U-shaped driveway, I noticed a low, shiny, suntan color sports car standing in the shade of a date palm back by the garage. I started over to take a look at it. but the front door of the house opened, a Filipino boy appeared, took my name, and showed me into the living room. Through the solid wall of picture windows, I could see that the whole place was built around a kidney-shaped swimming pool. Huh, mighty inviting. And so was Roberta, Mrs. Galloway, when she stepped into the room a minute or two later. Hi there, Mr. Dollar. My, it's nice of you to come all the way out here. Yeah, Sergeant Lacey was right. Roberta was a living doll. Twenty-two or three, trim, petite, and with a figure that... Well, let's not go into that. She said it would be more comfortable out on the lanai beside the pool. I just wish there was something I could tell you about that bracelet that'd help you find it, Mr. Dollar, but... Well just must have been stolen. Well, it makes no difference insofar as your claim is concerned, Mrs. Galloway. The company will still have to pay up, you know, unless, of course, it's found. Oh, I know that. How do you go about your investigation? I mean, uh, do you offer a reward or something? Uh, usually, yes. Uh, of course, it depends on... How much have they offered for my bracelet? Well, frankly, I haven't checked on that yet. But now, Mrs. How Galloway... How much would you guess, Johnny? Well, claim this size, probably somewhere between 10 and 30 percent. To... What's the matter, Johnny? Your ear's out a mile. Uh, nothing. I, I just thought I heard... Now, that's funny. I didn't hear a thing. But I had. Quick footsteps somewhere in the house. Then a door opened and closed. Then a few seconds later, the unmistakable growl of a high-powered engine thundering out through twin straight pipes. Dad, probably some hot rod fan in the neighborhood just drove by. Aren't they She all... prattled on for another hour or so and again asked about possibilities of a reward for her bracelet. But so far as helpful information was concerned, she came up with nothing. So I excused myself and drove back to town. I wanted to talk to the driver of that sports car. I also wanted to check with Wilhoyt Van Hook, the jeweler who had sold the bracelet. I found his shop on Palm Canyon Drive, a small place but very ultra-ultra. As I was about to enter the door... Mr. Dollar, got a minute? Oh, yeah, sure. Two or three minutes. And I, uh, I like your car. Mr. Wyman, isn't it? That's right. How'd you know? How'd you know mine? Yeah, real cloak and dagger stuff, huh? You, uh, you knew I was out at Berta's house, didn't you? Well, it seemed pretty obvious when I heard you hot-footed for the door and then heard this pint-sized monster of yours barrel off. Hey, you wouldn't like to buy a Cosmo Roma, would you? It's a real dilly. Oh, I'd like nothing better, but I'm out here on a job. Yeah, I know. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Well, you know anything that'll help me? Not much, I'm afraid. But I'll be glad to tell you anything I can. You going in to see Willie? Willie? Yeah, you know, Will Hoyt Van Hook, the jeweler. I was, yeah. Why? Do you know him? Know him? I sold him one of these. One exactly like mine. And we're both going to be in the rally they're holding next Sunday. You ever see a good sports car race? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. Well, we'll soon fix that. And look, uh, after you've talked to Willie, if you want to go down to where Dan Galloway is drilling his new well, I'll be glad to give you a lift. Good idea. But I don't want to take you out of your way. Oh, not at all. I was going that way anyhow. Besides, uh, I thought it might give us a chance to talk a little. Sure, why not? Why not? With a name like Wilhoyt Van Hook, I expected... 
Well, I don't know what I expected. As it turned out, he was a smartly dressed chap of about 40, tall and slim, blonde hair and quick blue eyes, an alert mind. I told him why I was in Palm Springs, showed him my credentials, and he immediately offered full cooperation. No, here we are, Mr. Dollar. Here's a copy of the appraisal. A duplicate of the statement I sent Dan Galloway. And here, yes, here's a sketch of the bracelet. Ah, very good. Diamonds here, emeralds, and the mounting is yellow gold. Hand worked, all of it. Mm Mm-hmm. One thing I can't help wondering about, Mr. Van Hook. Yes? Isn't a $75,000 bracelet a bit unusual for a shop in a resort town? As a matter of fact, it is. As you can see, I specialize in rare and exclusive sort of things. But very little over, say, ten or $12,000. Then the Galloway bracelet was an exception. Yes. After Dan told me what he had in mind to give to his wife, I had some sent over from Pasadena and Los Angeles by wholesalers with whom I do business. You know, had him shipped down on consignment. He liked one, and that was that. I see. Mr. Dollar, I wouldn't want this to go any farther, of course. But after all, jewelers and insurance companies are... Well, our businesses are pretty well tied together, at least on occasion. Yes, unfortunately. But what are you getting at? I'll tell you. Two days after the bracelet was delivered, one morning, just as I was opening up, Dan came in here. So? He was ill at ease. Looked worried. He said he had to have some cash quickly. He asked if I could possibly refund his money. Oh? Did you? No, because I couldn't. Things have been rather slow for me this season. Quite frankly, I'd used all I'd made on the bracelet to pay up some old bills. I told him as much and that I was sorry, but I just couldn't help him. Did Galloway say why he had to have that much cash right away? Yes. Well? I don't know much about oil drilling, but as I understand it, his test well is down some 400 feet further than he'd planned on going. And the day before he came in here, something on his rig had broken loose and left him with a highly expensive repair job before he could proceed any further. Apparently, it was all very serious and very expensive. Hmm. Strange, his wife didn't seem to be bothered. I just talked to her. Berta? (laughs) Believe me, Mr. Dollar, she wouldn't be. In fact, I doubt if she even knows. Oh? Figure it out for yourself. A man of nearly 60 who has to give bracelets and fancy cars to his wife to keep up her interest. Well, you'd hardly expect him to tell her that kind of news, now would you? No, I suppose not. Especially if he's worried about the competition. And if you ask me, he has competition. If only he could see it. That suntan and chrome Cosmoroma was all Sonny Wyman claimed it was. It purred like a kitten performed beautifully. But I was more interested at the moment in what Sonny wanted to talk about. Johnny, I'm going to be perfectly blunt with you. I'll go along with that. Out at the house a while ago, I felt pretty foolish when you arrived and Berta insisted I hide until she could get you out on the lanai. Did she have any particular reason? Well, you see, we know that... Well, there's some talk going around about Berta and me. Any truth in it, Sonny? A little, I guess. You saw her. Oh, yeah? I mean, there's nothing serious between us. It's just that, well, with Dan away so much of the time, we, uh... Well, we have fun together. Yeah, sure. Now, what about the bracelet? You mean who might have stolen it? That's the general idea. I don't know. I have no idea. That uh, sound funny to you? Should it? Well, after all, Dan and Berta keeping their house open to everybody. People in to swim, play badminton, cocktails, barbecues. I guess half the population of Palm Springs has been there at one time or another. And even if it weren't an invited guest, why, it'd be simple for someone to just sneak in and walk off with it. Providing, of course, they knew where it was kept. Well, yeah, someone who was close enough to... Well, yeah, I... Uh... I heard uh, Berta ask you about a reward for it. You think a big enough reward would turn it up? I would think so. I understand that stolen jewelry brings about uh, 20 cents on the dollar. Sometimes it brings 20 cents. Sometimes 20 years. Uh, well, yeah. Well, I uh, j- just wonder. How's the car business doing, Sonny? Oh, great, great. It's really one of the reasons I'm driving out this way. Oh, a prospect? An oil-rich Indian or a well-to-do prairie dog? (laughs) Hardly. No, I told you we were having a sports car rally on Sunday. Well, being the promoter, so to speak, I'm going down to check the course. If you're still around, you ought to come. Oh, maybe I will. Having some good events, too. 
Willie Van Hook and I are running a match race. He's quite a bug, you know. And ever since I sold him the twin of this job, he's been working it over. Special carburetor, racing cams, everything. Yeah, no wonder I can't afford this kind of stuff. Oh, man. You'd be amazed at the amount of, amount of money to change his hands. Hey, wait a minute, Sonny. Rigs. Isn't that an oil rig over there? Uh, yeah, Dan Galloway's. The rig itself's about uh, 50 feet out in the lake. The shack or office or whatever you want to call it's over the other way. You see? About a quarter of a mile beyond those Joshua trees. I'll drive you over. He did. There was an old car parked near the shack, so we figured Dan Galloway must be inside. Sonny Wyman dropped me in front of it, then took off in a cloud of dust and exhaust gas. I picked my way between the cactus plants, opened the door without knocking, and barged right in. Mr., uh... Oh. Oh, hello. Well, no use asking. If Mr. Galloway is here, I can see he isn't. No, he isn't. Is it all right if I wait? I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm Mrs. Galloway, Mr. Dollar. Huh? Hell, that is, I'm the first Mrs. Galloway. The former. The one who scrimped and saved while Dan was booming around every oil field all over the country trying to make his score. I'm the forgotten Mrs. Galloway. Oh, I, uh, well, I'm sorry. Are you expecting him back soon? <laughs> who knows? I've been waiting here three hours. But I'll wait three days if I have to. Promises, that's all. Promises. What do you mean, Mrs. Galloway? After working to help him the way I did for all those years, and then to be tossed over for somebody else who never did a lick of work in her life. Oh, sure. Give me anything I want if I let him free. So what have I got? Promises. Well, I, I'm sorry. But getting all upset isn't going to help. Well, wouldn't you be upset if you had more than $18,000 in back alimony coming to you? And with them living like royalty? Oh, I see. Well, he's not going to keep on getting away with it. That's why I'm here. Well, now that gun in your handbag isn't the well, answer, I'm afraid. How'd you know? I've seen that kind of bulge in a handbag before. You really have ideas about using it on him? Well? Well, I... Oh, I don't know. I... There are times when I feel as though killing would be too good for him. Then there are other times when... Oh, I, I don't know. Well, here, better let me no. have it. No, leave me alone. Well, I'm not going to sit here and try to make sense with somebody as upset as you are who has a gun. Well, how would you feel? What would you do if you were me? How should I know? But killing him isn't the answer. Isn't it? Or sitting here shouting at me. Who are you anyway? What are you doing here? I came out here to see your husband, your ex-husband, on business. What kind of business? A friend drove me out here and figured Dan would drive me back. But since he isn't around, there's no point of my staying here. Or you either. Well, maybe you aren't going to You have a say... car, so you and I are driving back to Palm Springs. I'm not leaving here till I see Dan. Until I get some money from him. Or see him dead. Maybe he's at the well. All right. Maybe he is over there. Now, come on. Why I took this on, I didn't know. But I couldn't leave that slightly frantic woman sitting there, waiting, with murder in her heart. For all I knew, she'd murdered Dan already. Better inspect the gun later. The road down toward the oil rig was just a pair of ruts in the desert sand. Then just as we cut in between some yucca plants and a wind-blown Joshua tree, I slammed on the brakes. <laughs> There, in the middle of the trail, lay a man's body, crushed and twisted. Dan Galloway had been carefully, repeatedly, run over by a car. <laughs> Expense account item three, one dollar, nineteen cents for a quick phone call to Sergeant Lacey in Palm Springs and smelling salts and a bromide for Florida, the ex-Mrs. Galloway. Then I dropped her off at the Galloway house. She and Roberta ended up consoling each other while I huddled with Lacey in his office at headquarters. Some of the boys are still out there, Dollar, checking tire prints, taking pictures, and so on. No clue as to who ran Galloway down? Not yet. Looked to me as though Galloway stepped out of his own car to see whoever had pulled up in the other and was run down for his trouble. The car that did it ran around in a circle over and over him. Any suspects, Sergeant? You found his ex-wife, Flora, waiting for him in the field office, you said. That's right. And she was pretty nervous, on edge, you say. So? Also, she was carrying a gun. Oh, oh now, wait a minute. Uh, any reason why she couldn't have run him down earlier, then gone back and just waited for somebody like you to come along? Somebody with whom she could then discover the body? Only one hitch. You told me yourself, Dollar, that she was pretty insistent about your going over there to look for Gannon. Yeah, yeah, I know. But, Sergeant, you're off on the wrong foot. Why? Because of the tracks left by the killer's car. They didn't match the tires on Flora's car. You checked? I checked. And if I were you, I'd have your boys find out whose car did make those tracks. I'm way ahead of you. Well, if you know, then what do you... Hey, wait a second. Yeah? Levine, Sergeant. I got news for you. Hey, listen to this, Dollar. About those tire tracks at the scene of the killing. Well, right on cue. They're the, the same make and size as the tires on Sonny Wyman's Cosmo Roma. You sure? Well, I 
told you, it's a scene. I thought it was a sports car by the small size of the circle the tracks made. Yeah? And knowing the feeling between Wyman and Galloway, I went right over to his place. Nice, clean tracks all over. And they match. You holding Wyman? Oh, well, I don't know where he is, Sergeant. He wasn't at his place, and there was no answer to the phone at his showroom. Well, then get after him. Put out a flash on him. With that car, he shouldn't be too hard to find. Let me know when he's picked up. Yes, sir. What do you think, Sergeant? You know something, Dollar? I have a notion that when we find Sonny Wyman, we'll also find out what happened to that bracelet. Yeah, could be. One thing was certain. Dan Galloway could no longer be suspect in the case. But Roberta... Why not? Maybe she did know that Dan had run out of money. Maybe that's why she was so interested in the amount of reward for the bracelet. And what about Sonny Wyman? Well, it looked bad. A smart young opportunist out for the fast buck. And, of course, close to Galloway's wife. Anything he could do to hurt Galloway would help him. And now these tire tracks, the one solid clue to Galloway's killer. Sergeant Lacey and I drove out to the Galloway house. No, Johnny. I haven't seen Sonny since he left here this afternoon. That's when you were here. He didn't call up? Why should he call up? Why shouldn't he call, Roberta, if he'd heard that Dan was killed? Now you listen here, Mr. Dollar. If you're trying to trick me into saying something about Sonny having anything to do with Dan's death, you're wasting your time. And what's more... Pardon me. Hello? Oh, yes. Just a minute. For you, Sergeant Lacey. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yes? Yes, when? Yeah, I see. Okay, Levine, thanks. Has he found Sonny Wyman? He sure has. And if you want to see him, you'll have to go to the coroner's office. What? Oh, no. Yeah, that souped-up car of his, a couple of miles out of town, ran off a curve and over a hundred-foot bank. Within minutes, Lacey and I were at the scene of the accident, looking things over with the help of flashlights. Yeah, he must have been really burning up the road to spin and roll this far off the highway. But surely he must have been familiar with that curve. Oh, sure. He knew these roads around here as well as anybody in the county. Tires still in one piece, too. And these sport cars usually corner pretty well. Well, this one didn't. Hey, Lacey, look here. Yeah? This left rear fender. Looks to me like this car was sideswiped. Hey, you're right. Rolling over would never make a long crease like that. Uh Uh-huh. No, wait. If another car sideswiped him, there'd be paint on this fender. Paint from the other car. Sergeant, you're absolutely right. And since there's none here... Sergeant, you're absolutely wrong. How far to the nearest filling station? What? I want to make a couple of calls to some wholesale jewelers in Pasadena and Los Angeles. Right now, in the middle of the night? Right now. Wholesale jewelers? Expense account item four, eleven dollars and ninety cents. Phone calls to Pasadena and L.A. The third call yielded Mr. Alfred Mencken of Mencken Imports Incorporated, who was pretty cheerful about having been gotten out of bed. It's quite all right, Mr. Dollar. Now that I'm up, I'm wide awake almost. Well, I hate to throw something like this at you in the middle of the night, Mr. Mencken, but tell me, please. Did you ship a diamond and emerald bracelet to Will Hoyt Van Hook in Palm Springs within the past few weeks? Why, yes, Mr. Dollar. Oh? As a matter of fact, I sent him three. That was two weeks ago, and he returned them all. Returned them? When? Two of them, the day after he got them. But the third one he kept for a while. I got it back just last Thursday. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you. You bet it does. Thanks very much. Lacey and I piled into one squad car, four patrolmen in another. It was several miles out to the little ranch where Van Hook lived, and Lacey and I chewed it over as we drove along. It don't hold out on me, Johnny. What if it made you think a Willie Van Hook is the one who drove Sonny Wyman off the road? Well, apparently there was no paint on that fender from the car that sideswiped him. Actually, there was. Holy... Of course. Van Hook's car is exactly the same color as Sonny's. Another thing. The car that ran down Galloway, like the one Sonny drove, even down to the tires, but not necessarily the same car. Plus the fact I couldn't help wondering about Van Hook all along. Yeah, but why? In a job like mine, you have to wonder about everybody connected with a case. Anything particular about Van Hook? Well, he told me that he'd use the money he got from Galloway to pay off some overdue bills. And yet, a few weeks ago, he was able to buy an $8,000 sports car. It ties up, Dollar. It all ties up. But how did Sonny Wyman figure in it? Oh, Sonny was a fellow who lived by his wits. He may have reached the same conclusion about Van Hook that I did. May have had an idea for latching onto the reward money. 
mentioned the matter of reward to me a couple of times. Or he may have had ideas for blackmailing Van Hook. Another thing. Van Hook saw me drive away from his shop in Sonny's car. That meant he had to act fast, get rid of Galloway, who'd given him back the bracelet, and, of course, take Sonny out of the picture, too. Yeah, it all seems to head up very nicely. And when we face Van Hook, but well, well, there's his place now. Yeah, here's his driveway. Well, either he's skipped out or he's asleep. No lights on in the place. Well, if you ask me, he's far... No, no, wait. Yeah? The third window on the right. The blind was pulled away for a second or two. Well, then let's get out of this car. We're sitting ducks in here. Well, how about it, Sergeant? What do we do? You boys split up. Cover the back and sides of the house. He's in there? Yeah. Okay, boys. Come on. All right, right out. Hey, Johnny, maybe you better keep out of this. Are you kidding? I'm... Hey, listen. The car door, I'm sure of it. Yeah, I know. Holy... What's he up to? Gonna lock himself in and take the monoxide route? Come on. Are the back doors in that garage? Not that I know of. Here, wait a minute. Van Hook! This is the police! We've got men all around this place. Turn off that engine and come out of there with your hands over your head. Don't be a fool, Van Hook. You haven't got a chance. Come out of that garage with your Hey, did you see that? He drove right through the door of his garage. Come on, Lacey, the car. Get after him, you guys. Get moving. Yeah, come on, boys. All right, boys. Swiping habit. See what he did to that other patrol car? Yeah, they're okay. They're off and tailing us. Come on, step on it, Lacey. This is one time we ought to have a Cosmo Roma. Well, maybe he can outrun us, but with two cars on his tail, he may get careless, take chances. If so, well... Yeah, hang on. Oh! Lacey, you could qualify for some of those road races yourself. That guy's out of his head. Main highway like this, full of trucks and trailers. Oh, don't worry about those guys. Those interstate truckers will give you a clear road after them. They're the best drivers in the country. Come on, hit your siren. You're right. Hey, you see, I told you those guys would give you the road. Holy... Look! The trailer in front of him! And the oncoming truck! Van Hook's trying to squeeze through! Pull up! Pull up, I will... Well, he squeezed through all right. Squeezed right through the pearly gates. Expense account item five thirty eight dollars seventy five cents room two meals and valet service at the Casa de Paz. Item six one hundred ninety one dollars and sixty cents airfare and incidentals Palm Springs California back to Hartford. Expense account total four hundred seventy four dollars eighty four cents. Remarks. Well, justice is done in pretty strange ways sometimes. Kind of makes you think. Maybe it pays to tread the straight and narrow, doesn't it? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, international intrigue. A beautiful girl and a very clever chemist. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is written by Paul Franklin and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Barbara Eiler, Paula Winslow, Forrest Lewis, Frank Nelson, Sam Edwards, Austin Green, and Shep Mencken. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. This is Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual Life and Casualty Company. Oh, hello, Harry. What's with you? John, I have a case I'd like you to handle for us. It's, uh, well, it's somewhat unusual. Have you ever handed me one that wasn't completely screwy? I said unusual. And I said screwy. So now that we understand each other, what's it all about? Well, absolutely nothing yet. Uh, but I'm very apprehensive about one of our clients. Oh, Harry, you're the biggest worry worn I ever knew. Uh, what was that? I said, who is this client? Oh, uh, Dr. Walter Merrill. Merrill? The scientist? That's right. Nobel Prize winner? The man who worked out the molecular orbital contraction, something or other? Yes, yes, that's the one. As I say, John, I'm worried. Well, who wouldn't be about him? I'll be right down to see you. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Life and Casualty Insurance Company in Philadelphia, where else? Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the clever chemist matter. Expense of transportation and incidentals, Hartford to New York to Philadelphia. I didn't even stop to check my bag, but headed directly for the Philly Mutual building on Walnut Street. Harry Branson is a good insurance man, but a great worrier. Nonetheless, he'd given me some pretty important too. And after all, what do we live for? Hey, I keep the change. Thanks, Doc. John? John, what took you so long? Oh, now, what's the matter, Harry? Forget to pay the rent on your office or just forgot the key? No, John, as a matter of fact, I had the key right... <clears throat> this is hardly the place for levity. Well, surely you haven't been waiting here on the sidewalk ever since you called me. No, I haven't, but by checking plane schedules, I was able to determine when you'd arrive almost to the minute and not wanting to waste time taking you upstairs to the office. Pretty urgent matter, huh? Well, you should be here shortly. What? Well, now, usually I arrange these things myself, Harry. Yes, and how we pay... Out of you. Oh, Harry, you touch me to the quick. Oh, now, please don't misunderstand me. I I don't mean that there's ever anything really dishonest about you your don't? expense account. Well, it's you only... ought to. Believe me, I'll pad it to the hill if I think I can get away with it. Anyway, the most important reason for engaging the car was so that you can leave immediate... Malaga? Yes, New Jersey. It's a... oh, is that where Dr. Merrill is? Yes. As is his custom, he chooses to work in some isolated spot where he can't possibly be disturbed. Uh, he and his colleague, that is. Colleague? I always heard that he worked alone, freelance. And you heard right. However, he now has a professor, Theodore Nash, with him. Nash? One of our... to Dr. Merrill. Never heard of him. John? They're working together on what I'm sure is some top secret project. Oh. Oh, say, so Wait. Didn't Merrill have something to do with the early rocket experiments? Precisely. Which is why I suspect their present work may have something to do with the space satellite or intercontinental missiles or something of the sort. Yeah, possible. But what has all this got to do with you? Their insurance. Dr. Merrill has had a policy with us for some years. $25,000. Oh, and probably he took out a policy for $10,000. Beneficiary? Nash made Dr. Merrill his beneficiary. Oh, well, that sort of thing is often done between men working together. Harry, you know that. Yes, yeah, so that if anything happens to one, the other will be financially able to carry on what they've started. Sure, right. Which is no doubt why Dr. Merrill changed the beneficiary of his policy to Theodore Nash. So, what's the worry? No sooner was the change made than I received a letter of protest from Dr. Merrill's daughter. Who's she? Uh, Mrs. Howard Harding. She and her husband live in West Philadelphia. He he's a welder for an aviation company, I think. Well, what did she base her protest on, Harry? She claims her father must have been coerced into changing the policy. Oh, now, wait a minute. That sounds like the hungry relative who complains about being cut out of the will. It might. If Mrs. Harding weren't a perfectly well-balanced, intelligent, and I'm sure quite unselfish person, a completely... Uh, un... is she good-looking? Well, yes. And, uh, real sweet to you? Yes, yeah, she is. A... Well, now, John, I don't know what you're trying to imply. Uh, uh, I do it every time. John. Particularly when there's a bit of money involved. Good-looking insurance broker like you. And you're a bachelor, too, aren't you, Harry? <laughs> John, you're pulling my leg. Oh, Harry. But then I guess we're all suckers for someone like that. That has nothing to do with it. I've had these hunches before, John, and they've always been right. Even you will have to admit that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll confess that in the cases I've handled for you so far... Why don't you call up Dr. Merrill? <laughs> 
I think the quaint old fellow would die rather than have a phone near enough to disturb him in his work. Oh, oh, there's your rental car waiting at the curb. So off you go, John, and see what you can find out. Okay, Harry. It all sounds like a lot of nothing you're worried about, but as long as you're willing to pay for it. And I always did like South Jersey this time of year. I drove across the Delaware River Bridge into Jersey and headed for Route 45 to Westville, Woodbury, and finally Pittman, where I picked up Route 47. What Harriet said was true. These hunches of his had a remarkable way of panning out. And yet, oh, who was I to complain? After a pleasant hour's drive through cranberry bog and farm country, through miles of orchards and the intoxicating odor of the peach blossoms, I pulled into the quiet little town of Malaga. Population, oh, I'd say around 500. First stop, the post office. Uh, Dr. Merrill? Yeah, sure. You go back the way you came, about a mile, till you say, you see the name Wampus Bung. Wampus what? Wampus means cat. Bung? Bungalow. Wampus Bung. I, uh, yeah. Yeah, the doctor and the professor got the fourth cottage beyond it. White one with a fence around it. Yeah, good, thanks. And if you don't mind, you can uh, take their mail out to them. They haven't been in to pick it up for five days now. Oh, Nothing wrong, is there? Well, who'd know the way those two keep to themselves? Well, you'd think whatever they're working on was the atomic bomb. Yeah, well... Just to be sure, you let them know that you're at the gate now before you try to go through the fence. Oh, what's that supposed to mean? The professor sees you prowling around. He's liable to take a shot at you. As I drove back and toward the edge of Little Malaga Lake, the idea of getting shot at by anyone living in this peaceful, quiet place seemed ridiculous. The lake itself, by the way, looked pretty inviting. I made a mental note to come back here on my own sometime after the fishing season opened. As the postmaster had indicated, the fourth cottage beyond Wampus Bung was heavily fenced in. So I gave notice of my arrival. I had barely left the car when the door of the little cottage opened. Yes? Who, who is it? Dr. Merrill? Oh, oh yes. My name is Dollar, sir. Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Harry Branson? Yes, sir, that's right. Harry Branson sent me down here to see you. Oh, uh, come in. Come in. Uh, I'm most most glad to see you. Uh, please, come into the house. All right, thank yes. you. Is uh, Professor Nash here? In the, uh, in the laboratory. But please, As come As he spoke, the, the sliding house. door on the garage at the side of the house opened. A rather swarthy man stepped out, quickly closed the door, and threw a heavy bolt on it. Then looked over toward us suspiciously. Yes, because it's better that you and I talk in, in private, alone. Doctor, who is that? Yeah. Oh. oh, yes, Professor. If we have a visitor, why do you not bring him here where we can both speak to him? Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course. This is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Professor Theodore Nash. Mr. Dollar? I do, Professor. I'm from your insurance company. Just uh, making a little routine checkup. Oh, fine, fine. I'm very glad to see you. As a matter of fact, I wish to talk with you. <laughs> How do you do? Now, come into the laboratory. Professor, do you, do you think it wise? Oh, of course, Doctor. Since he is not a man of science, I'm sure there is no harm in his seeing it. And... You have an experiment going, remember? But I wish to Mr. speak Dollar, to him Mr. Dollar, within these four walls, the genius of Dr. Merrill and my own poor efforts are creating things that will startle the world. Outside, the small building looked like an ordinary two-car garage, someone in need of paint and repair. But inside, it was immaculate and loaded with scientific equipment of all shapes and sorts and sizes. There were racks of test tubes, bottles of chemicals, beakers, a centrifuge... Machines and apparatus I'd never seen before, that I imagine much of the world never dreamed of. And all of it as neat as a pin, not so much as a stirring rod out of place. Ah, look, Doctor. The polymerization step is almost complete. Eh? Now, you must continue the molecular balance check immediately. Oh. Oh, yes, yes. And you must both leave me. This must not be seen by... By any yeah, We understand, hope. Doctor. We understand. I hope you will pardon me, Mr. Mr. Dollar. Yes, of course, Doctor. Oh, come, Mr. Dollar. Yes, I, I will lock the door. Yes. He, uh, he does require privacy, doesn't he? Yes. Oh, hey, you're not going to bolt that door, are you? Oh, 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 of course not. <laughs> Force of habit, I guess. 
Oh, it is he who keeps things locked so tightly when he's working. Unnecessarily so. But then uh, genius is permitted his idiosyncrasies, huh? Harry Branson seems to think you two may be working on something to do with guided missiles. Uh, very perceptive man. But that is something we must not speak about. Now, <clears throat> why have you come here, Mr. Dollar? Well, like I said, just a routine checkup. We, uh... We usually do this when a sizable policy has changed. Oh, there is something unusual about two men working together on important things, ensuring in each other's favor? Well, no. Uh, but when his daughter perhaps objects... You know Dr. Merrill's daughter? Oh, I know about her and about her unfortunate marriage to that, uh, that day laborer. Nothing wrong with day labor, Professor? Yeah, but one who waits for a great man like the doctor to die so that he can get his hands on the insurance money. You think that's why his daughter objected to the chain? Of course. But his money will be used to further his work by me. And, of course, for the good of humanity. I uh, see. Well, how soon do you think the doctor will be through with this experiment? An hour, perhaps two. And then... He will call me in to assist him with the next, the crucial step. Uh, but now, about well, look, insurance. why don't I run in town, arrange for a place to stay, grab a bite to eat, and then come back here? Huh? If you like. I'm sorry we have no room in the cottage. No, don't give it a second out. thought. I'll see you later. Something of Harry Branson's hunch had passed on to me. A strange feeling about the whole setup. There was something wrong about both Merrill and Nash, particularly the latter. Something I couldn't quite put my finger on. Was Dr. Merrill afraid of Nash? I don't know. Item two, a dollar even for a quick bite in a little cafe along the highway after I'd made arrangements for a room for the night in a private home. It was not much over an hour later when I drove back to the little cottage by the lake. And then I heard it. Someone pounding on the door of the laboratory from the inside. Someone calling for help. Professor! But the lock's on the inside. Turn the lock. What? Bolt here on the... Oh, what are you... Oh. Oh, thank you, man. Good Lord, Professor. What happened to you? You look like you've been run over by... Dr. Merrill. Too late. Too late. Professor, what happened here? He beat me. Threw acid at me. The doctor? No, the, the man. Who... <laughs> then he killed the doctor with a gun. He killed him. Who, oh, Professor? Who? I, I, I don't know. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. To the many who have lived under tyranny, democracy comes as a guiding light, shining on a brighter future. That is because democracy stands for the establishment of government conceived from deep thought and free choice, rather than being based on accident and force. It is also normal that the free choice of a democratic government happens because people who choose their own government are directed by true interests in the welfare of mankind. Democracy has been proven to be mankind's greatest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Clever Chemist Matter. Expense account item three, ten dollars for the services of one Dr. Frederick Foote, the only resident medico in the little town of Malaga, New Jersey. After pronouncing Dr. Walter Merrill dead, he took the badly beaten Professor Nash to his office clinic. While waiting for Nash to get in good enough shape to talk, I ran up item four, ten cents, phone call to the sheriff, who promised to come over as soon as he could enlist the aid of the nearby state police. Finally, Dr. Foote gave the word. But I suggest you talk with him as little as possible, Mr. Dollar. In pretty bad shape, huh, Dr. Foote? The intruder not only beat him severely, but threw a bottle of acid in his face. Oh? Professor Nash will never have the use of his left eye again because of that nitric acid. Has Nash said anything that might help us identify the assailant and killer? No. Now, please don't talk with him too long. Uh, Professor? Yes? 
Yes. Hello, Professor. Oh, Mr. Dollar. I will never see again with my left eye. He has told me. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. But the great Dr. Merrill, he is dead. What a loss. Professor. Mm -hmm. Professor, tell me, did you see the man who attacked you? Yes. Can you describe him at all? Yes, no. Young, not more than 30. Five feet, six or eight. Very heavy. Yes. Stocky. And black curly hair. Yeah. Hands like a working man, a laborer. Come. Have you ever seen this man before? No, I... <coughs> oh, here. <coughs> Some water. Thank you, thank you. Do you know why he came in and attacked you and Dr. Murray? No. Was he after something there in the laboratory? No, only to kill Dr. Merrill. I tried. I tried to defend him. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I think that's enough. Yes, yes, okay, Dr. Foote. I think I've heard enough. I managed to get back to the cottage by the lake before the police arrived and came up with one very damning piece of evidence. In one of the bedrooms, I found a picture of a wedding couple. It was inscribed... Love to the dearest father in the world. And next to the bride stood a man who answered perfectly the description Professor Nash had just given me. The husband of Dr. Merrill's daughter, Howard Harding. And then I, I thought of what Nash had said about Harding. His antagonism, his conviction that Harding was the one who resented the change in the insurance policy. But there was something else, too. That had happened when I talked with Nash in the doctor's office that... Hmm... By the time I got back to the laboratory, the sheriff and state police arrived. The sheriff, I'm afraid, must up any prints that might have been left on the bottle of acid. However, in the weeds outside, a state trooper found the pistol, a 38 caliber Luger that had killed Dr. Merrill. Fingerprints had apparently been wiped off, but the gun was carefully... Fingerprints. Before taking off in a mad dash back to Philadelphia, I stopped at Dr. Foote's and picked up one water tumbler. Item 5, 370 for a tank full of gas. Item 6, 50 cents. Parking in Philadelphia as close as possible to Harry Branson's office. John, what have you found out about Dr. Merrill? Harry, he's dead. Well, oh, dear. Now listen, write down the address of Mr. and Mrs. Howard Harding for me. His daughter, does she know? No, she doesn't know yet, and I hope I can avoid telling her before I write it down, will you, man? Well, yes, of course, Take but this. I... Don't unwrap it, but see that it gets to Ray Kemper at the Federal Bureau fast. I'll check with him about it later, thanks. But, now, John... Harry, this is one time this expense account of mine is going to save you a lot of money. I think. I don't know how many red lights I skipped on the drive out to West Philadelphia, but I felt like a hound dog in a hot scent. The home of Mr. and Mrs. Howard Harding turned out to be in a nice, quiet residential area. I was met at the door by the girl in the wedding picture. A tall, very nice-looking blonde in her late 20s. Oh, yes? Mrs. Harding... I'm Terry Hardy. Well, I'm Johnny Dollar from your father's insurance company. Oh, good. Come in. Perhaps you can help me make him do something about that policy of his. Well, uh, that isn't exactly... Someone has poisoned Daddy's mind, Mr. Dollar. Oh? What do you mean? It isn't that I need the money if Daddy dies, which heaven forbid. No. It doesn't exactly look as though you do. No, of course we don't. Howard's been doing so wonderfully at Colonial Aviation. Yes, apparently. And I'd had a notion he was just a... Labor or something. Oh, dear, no. That's what Daddy called him because... Well, because he wasn't too fond of Howard. And that is the way Howard started before we were married. But now he's one of the officers of the company. Uh, where is he, Mrs. Harding? Well, as a matter of fact, I thought you were Howard when you drove up just now. He's been fishing. Fishing? On some little lake over in Jersey. He goes every Saturday all by himself. Malaga Lake? No, Malaga's where Daddy was. Mm-hmm. He and that... That what, Mrs. Harding? Well, I... I don't know. It's Howard, I guess. What do you mean? Howard has never liked or trusted him, even though they've never actually met. When Daddy changed his insurance to name that professor, there is something wrong about that man, Mr. Dollar. What, Mrs. Harding? I don't know. Daddy always worked alone until he came along. Daddy's such an alert, bright-eyed little busybody in spite of his Wait age that... Your father... Like a cute little wound-up spring, hopping about like a... Mrs. Harding. Yes? Mrs. Harding, when I saw your father... You've seen Daddy. Well, then you know what I he mean. He was tired. 
Almost in a daze, he spoke with difficulty. Oh, no, you're mistaken. He chatters away like a jaybird. He... What is it, Mr. Dollar? Oh, he must have been doped. He looked as though... Hi, honey. Well, I'm just as lousy a fisherman as usual. Not a single... Oh, excuse me. Mr. Harding, just tell me one thing. Well, that depends. Who are you? Mr. Dollar's from the insurance company, darling. Not Johnny Dollar. Yeah, that's right. Well, I've certainly heard of you. Uh, tell me... No, you tell me, Harding. Where have you been? Why, fishing. Where? Over in Jersey. Where in Jersey? Little private lake. Where? Over near Mount Holly. One place I know of where nobody else ever goes, where I can get rid of the cobwebs, it's my job. Hey, wait a minute, Dollar. What is this? Harding, you've been identified as the man who murdered Dr. Walter Merrill. What? Murdered? I'm Did sorry, I... Mrs. Harding. I'm sorry, but it's true. Oh, no. What are you talking no. about, Dollar? You didn't know about it? Of course not. How could I? Where did it happen? How? At his place in Malaga. Oh. Professor Nash. I'll kill that man. You'll take it easy. You seem to forget that so far you're the only suspect in the case. You're out of your mind. If it was anybody, it was that Nash. Never have trusted that man. And the insurance policy. If anybody killed Dr. Merrill, it was that professor. Now listen to me. Nash was with Dr. Merrill when he was killed there in his laboratory. Of course he was. But Nash was attacked also, beaten, acid thrown at him. He lost the sight of one eye because of it. And I tell you... You sure? Yes, of course I'm sure. It was I who found them, Nash beating against the inside of the door of that laboratory, crying for help. A door that was bolted on the outside. But, Dollar, I... You're sure of that? I'm sure. Well, I still think... Oh, Terry, I'm sorry, honey. Here, let me... Oh, Howard, it's so terrible. Better answer that phone, Howard. Yeah. Hello? Yes? Oh, yes. It's uh, for you, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Terry, uh, come on. You've got to pull yourself together. Johnny Dollar. Right. John, this is Harry Branson. I just received a call from Mr. Kemper at the Federal Bureau. Yes. He says he must see you immediately. Call him back, Harry. Tell him I'll be there in 15 minutes. Harding, just to keep things straight, I wouldn't leave this house if I were you. Well, now, wait a minute, just Dollar. Just sit tight. I think you're in the clear. More red lights got passed up on my way into the Philadelphia offices of the Bureau. So Ray Kemper felt that whatever he'd found was important. If so, it would back up one of my suspicions. But in view of the circumstances, that bolted door in the laboratory, for instance, how could it? Important is putting it mildly, Johnny. The prints you found on the water glass, Ray. Three sets. One, yours. Yeah, well, naturally. Two, uh, Dr. Frederick Foote, who is currently practicing medicine. I know, I know, in the town of Malaga, New Jersey. That's where the glass came from. Oh, but the third set of prints. Yes. I had to go into the international file for them. And Johnny... Nash? Theodore Nash? Nash. Nashevsky. What? Theodore Nashevsky. Chemist from one of our not-so-friendly countries. Huh? Expert on explosives. One time, he was thought to have attempted to enter this country. That was in 1940. Ray, have you got any pictures on him? Plenty. From the time he was a kid. Uh, here. Tell me how you picked up these prints. The beard in this picture. That looks like him, all right. Yeah, this too, with a shaved head. Almost as though he tried to keep changing his appearance. Johnny, Wait a sec, wait a sec. This picture of him as a youngster, this eye patch on his left eye. Our dossier is pretty complete. He was quite an athlete until he injured that eye. But it doesn't show in these other pictures, and he hasn't a glass eye. No, his eye always looked perfectly natural. Now, Johnny, if you have information... Ray, this has done it for me, thanks. Hey, now, just a minute. I'll see you. Hey, Johnny! This is Kemper. Give me a man to tail Johnny Dollar. All the way back to Malaga, New Jersey, I hoped my rental car would hold together. It did, in spite of the fact I pushed it all the way. International intrigue is a bit out of my line, but this time, so help me, I was beginning to feel like an FBI man. I stopped at state police headquarters along the way, and according to them, Nash was off the hook. Not only because of the acid thrown in his face, but even more important, because of my own testimony that I'd found them locked in that laboratory. I stopped again at the lab. Nothing. Then back to Dr. Foot's office. Very well, Mr. Dollar. When they arrive, I'll insist that they wait for you. All right, thanks, Doctor. Well, Professor, you're sitting up. Oh, have they found anything, Mr. Dollar? Have they found the man who attacked us and killed poor Dr. Merrill? Professor, I think I have. Oh? But tell me something. Yes, of course. Your, uh, your government doesn't pay you very well, does it? Merrill and I were not working for the government, Mr. Dollar. Although, of course, the results of our work... I'm talking about your government, your own real boss. 
I do not understand. No doubt it's very much interested in anything this country develops in the line of guided missiles, that sort of thing. Mr. Dahl. Now, let me go on. Merrill was doing important work. Stuff that would be of great value to any country in the world. Of course. Your country would have paid you well for the results of his work. But, brother, they'll never get it. I do not know what you are talking Money, about. Money, the loot from Merrill's insurance, sure. Sure, it was enough to get you out of here after you'd gained the knowledge you need of Merrill's work. See here, Dollar. After you'd killed him, before he could give to his country, the United States, what he'd invented. You are a he fool. Come... I was beaten, The poor too. old man put up a pretty stiff fight, didn't he? Do you think I would have done this to myself? You My gave eyes... yourself away earlier when you reached out for a glass of water I handed you right here in this room. A man who'd lost his sight in one eye would have lost his aim until he got used to it. Funny, though, it didn't come to me until you later. You are mad. You haven't seen out of that left eye since you were a kid. I tell you, you are mad. And a little acid burn to make it look like somebody had thrown it at you would be well worth the alibi it gave you. Feodor. Feodor. That's right, Feodor Nashevsky. Uh, listen to me. You, you were the one who found us locked in the door bolted from the outside. You found us. Yeah. Also the cord, the string you used to pull the bolt to. That you looped over the bolt and pulled after you got inside. You couldn't have. I dropped it in the vat of acid. Yeah. Thanks. I was bluffing. But I made a lucky guess. What? <laughs> oh, what a brain. Nashevsky, I'm sure glad you're not working on our side. <laughs> The capsule he fished out of his pocket never got to his mouth. And I'm afraid he won't see very well out of his other eye for a while. My knuckles still hurt. And it was lucky for him that the police arrived. I'm afraid I don't like guys like him. Expense account total, including all the incidentals I could think of, and transportation back to Hartford, eighty-four thirty-five. Remarks? Well, don't beef on this one, Harry. The criminal, in spite of being the name beneficiary, doesn't get paid. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a real close look at a little-known but very dramatic side of Hollywood. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Duff. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Howard McNear, Forrest Lewis, Jack Crucian, Russell Thorson, Frank Gersel, and Bob Bruce. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Now for Johnny Dollar. George Reed here. Well, good morning, George. Bad morning, Johnny. Ah, what's the matter? You remember Josiah Gillis? 
Eccentric old man loves animals? Sure. Well, for the second time, he's talked us into issuing a special coverage policy on an item he wanted insured. And for the second time, it's disappeared, huh? Right. I hope it's not another singing mouse. I'm afraid it's something worse. An articulate canine. Articulate what? Dog, Johnny. An articulate dog? You mean a talking dog? Yep. Oh, no. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. I didn't know about mice. I do know about dogs. And I've never heard one yet that could say anything but rough. Well, maybe you haven't, but Michael Murphy has. Michael Murphy? Iron Mike Murphy, vice president of Milford Steel. Oh, what's he got to do with it? Well, he's the former owner of the articulating canine. Gillis bought the dog from him? According to this application, he did. Hmm. When did it happen? Well, about three weeks ago. First I heard of it was when Gillis called from New York asking for the coverage. How much insurance does he have on the credit? Hmm, the maximum we'd allow, 7500 75 Oh, no, no, George, that's hardly worth my time. I can't make any commission from a small policy like that. Why don't you pay him off and forget it? I'd like to, Johnny, but it isn't that simple. No? No, since you found his mouse, Gillis thinks you're some kind of a miracle worker. Oh, pied pipey, I mean. Or pie-eyed something, or really. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the boys upstairs have agreed to let you write your own ticket again, providing... Yeah? Providing you locate the dog. Or in the event you don't, you pass by Gillis. Keep him happy so that he doesn't cancel his other policies. And if I can't do either? Then you wind up with your regular commission and expense account, which our auditors will check and double-check. Hmm. A real sucker bet. But okay, George, you've got yourself a deal. Expense account item two, 85 cents, cab fare back to my apartment. Item three, 26 dollars, transportation, Hartford to New York City, including cab fare to the Statler Hotel. By the time I checked in, changed my shirt, it was 8.30. I picked up the phone and called the number George Reed had given me. Hello? May I speak to Mr. Gillis, please? Johnny, Johnny Pollard. Dad told me you were coming. Well, hi. Hi, is that all I guess? This is Marion. Yeah, yeah, I know. I had a hunch your father was staying at your place. Sure have. 514 East 51st Street. Apartment 4C. Oh, yeah. Now you get right over here before everyone leaves. Everyone? Who else there? Well, just friends. It's a celebration. What kind? I'll tell you when you get here. Now hurry. Right. <laughs> Expense account item 4, $1.70 taxi from the Statler to the East 51st Street address. The entrance to the building faced toward Deepman Place, and one side of it looked out over the East River. I could hear the noise from apartment 4C before I stepped off the elevator. Marion had a good many friends, which figured because of her blonde hair, gray eyes, and a few other... Well, yeah. I pressed the buzzer and waited. I was about to press it again when a door opened further off down the hall. Hi! Hmm? Oh, Marion! Here, Johnny. I hope you don't mind sneaking in through the kitchen. But Dad made it very clear that he wants to see you now and alone. Alone? Was that mob in there? <laughs> He's waiting for you in the den. It's this way. How have you been? Oh, fine. Fine, just fine. <laughs> Sounds like quite a party. <laughs> it is. I sent out the invitations before the pup disappeared. I offered to call it off, but Dad wouldn't let me. Any special kind of celebration? I think so. It's to announce my engagement. You're... Well, what do you know? Who's the lucky man? His name's Bill Fisher. He's an executive with the Powers Advertising Agency. Mm, real big-time operator, huh? He just talked one of his clients into putting on a new TV show. Well, uh, you know you have all my good wishes. Oh, Bill, we were just talking about oh, you. I wondered where you disappeared to. Bill, this is Johnny Dollar. Hi, congratulations. You're getting a fine girl. Yes, I think so. Thunderation, what's called? Yes. Oh, well, it's Dollar, so you finally decided to get here. Hello, Mr. Gillis. Come in, come in, come in. Yes, sir. Uh... We'll see you later, Johnny. Yes, yeah, sure. Well, you ready to go to work? Yes, sir, whenever you are. <laughs> whenever I am, you're the one's getting paid to be a detective. Well, I can't do my job without your cooperation, Mr. Gillis. Uh, well, what do you want me to do? Answer a couple of questions. Just answer them. Didn't that sweet pea of an agent tell you all you need to know? Well, he couldn't. 
He didn't know anything except that a dog you have insured. A dog? A dog, you say? Is that what you call her? Why, you miserable, cold-hearted... A dog. Well, isn't that what you've lost, Mr. Gillespie? No! And don't you ever let me hear you calling that if she's a little lady. If you must refer to the type of being she is, well, she's a... She's a canine. Okay. Uh, do you mind telling me under what circumstances the uh, canine disappeared? I wouldn't mind at all. And please call her Ming Toy. Beg your pardon? Ming Toy, that's her name. Ming Toy Murphy. What's the matter, you dog? Are you deep? Uh, no, uh, isn't that kind of an unusual name for a dog? A canine? Oh, you think so? She was how stupid that she's a Chinese. Chinese? A chi- yes, a Pekingese. A, chi- a Pekingese. And being as the first owner's name was Murphy, the whole thing, Moon Toy Murphy, just fits here to a T. Uh, yeah. Now, exactly when did you notice Ming Toy was missing? Oh, uh, as soon as we got back from breakfast, you see, I'd left Ming Toy in here, locked up safe and sound. But when we got back, the door was standing open. The front door? No, 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 not to the, this door. Right? And Ming Toy was gone? Of course she was gone. That's what all this fuss is about. But the front apartment door was closed. It was, and somebody's come in here and stolen her. They had sense enough to close the front door when they left. You're, uh, for sure somebody did steal her. I don't know what to think. All I know is mean tired missing. Canine animals like her don't grow on trees. Oh, well, you mean because of her, uh, <clears throat> special talent? Well, now you're getting it, my boy, yes, sir. Because she can talk. Oh, now, Mr. Gillis, can you honestly say you heard her speak? Speak, a man, all dogs can speak. But meantime, talk. Just like a human being, I suppose. Yeah, I see you don't believe me. <laughs> well, you just mark yourself over here with this tape recorder. Oh, Mr. Gillis, if she can talk like you say, it's still going to take me a while to kind of get used to this. You idea. and the whole country, providing we get it back. The whole country? TV, boy. What? Television. A new show called The Big Shock. The first one's on tomorrow night. What's the matter? Don't you read the papers? Anyway, they started advertising about two weeks ago. Looking for a dog that could say, Happy Hollow Dog Food is yum, yum, yummy. Happy Hollow Dog Food? That's the company sponsoring the show. Go on. They're going to open their show... With the animals saying that slogan, you see. And today I was going to take Ming Toy down there and let her say it and collect the $50,000. What $50,000? The $50,000 they're offering to give for a dog that can say, Happy Hollow oh, Dog. Dog. Oh, no, I, know. I know, I know, I know. Yes, well, anyway, when I first heard about this, I remembered Mike Murphy had said something to me over a year ago about having a, a canine in his kennel that could talk some. So I went over there three weeks ago, and I bought her. Was the ad in the paper at that time? No, of course it wasn't. Well, how did you know it was going to be? Marion told me. How did she know? Uh, that dress dummy she's fixing to marry. The advertising agency he works at, they're, they're the ones that talk the happy, hollow people into putting on that show. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. Well, you see, you know, it's about time. I also see that you don't exactly approve of Fisher for a son-in-law. Oh, I wouldn't say that. I don't approve. I don't disapprove of him. If she wants to marry a stuffed shirt, that's her business. You know, let me play this tape recording for you. You're going to hear the sweetest little voice this side of town. Ah, now then, me little bitch. <laughs> You see, no we made this at Mike Murphy. All right, girl. Now talk to me. Pretty now. Talk pretty. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hey, you see? Hello. He said hello. What's a dog? A canine. Be quiet. Be quiet. Very good, lad. Now tell me, how are you feeling these fine days? Hey, what happened? She saw a cat. What do you think? Oh. <laughs> you still doubt she can talk, Nello? Uh, I think I'd like to see it with my own eyes. Have you put an ad in the lost and found columns of the papers? Of course. <laughs> what about the people in this building? Then I had Morris. He's the super. Put a note. Super? The janitor. They call them supers in the city. So what's the matter? You don't you know anything here? Either? I had to put a notice in each apartment telling them to be on the lookout for her. But so far, nobody said a word. And naturally, they wouldn't because she's not allowed here. 
She's been stolen. Oh, now, look, why would anyone want to steal her? They couldn't put stolen property well, on TV. maybe and... it could have been somebody doing it for spite. Like who? Yes, like Iron Mike Murphy. You know, too. He's been saying nasty things to me, claiming I cheated him out of mean toy. Well, did you? Of course I did. Mr. Gillis, is there any other possible way she could have gotten out of this room? Well, now, there's several... Oh, no. Huh? No, no, it hurts me just to think about it. Oh, dear. That, uh, that window. Window? Yes, yes. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Was that open yesterday morning? Yes, it was open. I forgot to close it. Oh, dear. Well, what's down below there? Nothing, nothing. Nothing but the East River. I continued questioning him, making sure he'd given me all the facts. And after promising to take him along when I visited Iron Mike Murphy, I said goodnight and left. Expense account item five, one dollar and seventy cents for a cab back to my hotel. The next morning I called Murphy and wangled an invitation to his Long Island home. At exactly nine o'clock, I was in front of the Gillis apartment. Hey, mister, mister. Mm, yeah? You look for Mr. Gillis? No, Mr. Gillis. You seen him? Ah, sure, sure. When they go out to put their breakfast. Oh, yeah, I see. Do you uh, pick up the trash and garbage from the apartments every morning? That's uh, my job, senor. Well, what time do you usually hit this floor? Oh, the same time as now, about 10, 9 o'clock. Uh-huh. Do the Gillises go out for breakfast every morning at this time? Almost every morning. What about the uh, day before yesterday? The before, oh, when the little one disappeared, yeah. see, it was at the same hour. Uh-huh. Tell me, Morris, uh, do you remember seeing anyone on this floor that morning? You know, one who did not have a business to hear? But there was someone? Ah, see, si, see. Si. Near the Gillis apartment? Where you stand, waiting at the meeting. Well, who was it, you know? Oh, no, I don't know his name. Am I... Yeah, yeah. He's such a nice gentleman, and he carried what I know was another present for Mr. Gillis. I told him they were out for their breakfast, and he went away. You still haven't told me who it was, Morris. My heavens, senor. Who else would bring Mr. Gillis such a pretty box, such a beautiful gift? Who else but the gentleman she's soon to marry? <laughs> of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Ming Toy Murphy Matter. People in love usually keep on hours, so I wasn't surprised that Morris the janitor had seen Marion Gillis's fiancé outside the apartment the morning the dog, pardon me, canine, had disappeared. I think Morris for his help went back downstairs to my cab where I saw the Gillises walking toward me from First Avenue. Morning, Dollar. Morning. Sorry we're late. Got to gabbing over that second cup of coffee. Better not let your doctor hear you say that. No, no, Mary. Be sure. Yes, you ready, Dollar? Ready, ready, Mr. Gillis. And then let's go. I've got a few things I can't wait to say to Mr. Iron Mike Murphy. Now remember, Dad, no excitement. I'll remember. Marion. Yes? Are you going to be busy around noon? No, I don't think so far. Uh, just thought we might have lunch together. 21? Anywhere you like. Say, 12.30? Perfect. See you then. According to Mr. Gillis, I'm Mike Murphy. He didn't know that Ming Toy was missing. So it was going to be interesting to see his reactions when we told him. The Murphy home was squared across a couple of acres near Great Neck. The main house was a large two-story brick affair with a pack room, swimming pool, and the kennels behind it. Or Aaron Mike pursued his hobby of raising Pekingese dogs. He found Murphy at the camera. Well, Gillis, you lion, Stephen Dibble. You hold your tongue, Mike. What are you doing out here anyway? I came along to help Mr. Dollar. He doesn't know you like I do, so he wouldn't be able to tell when you're a lion like I can. Ah, I suppose you think that's funny. Dollar, you know what this man did to me? He stole a wonderful little dog right out from under me nose. And you stole her back. Well, what do you mean by you that? You know man? what I mean. The day after you called me on the phone, you saw that ad in the paper. Well, the next day, somebody stole mean toy. And I'm sure it was you. 
You shanty Irishman. Why are you a dirty-minded evil old man? I have half a mind to take a horse whip to you for saying such a thing. Oh, you deny it, yes. Of course I deny it. And you say it again, I'll deny it with me fist. Oh, is that so? Well, I whipped you when you are in the steel mills, and I can whip you now. Look out, fella. Oh, Mr. Gillis, remember what your daughter said. Defend yourself, Murphy. Mr. Gillis. Bring yourself at me, Gillis. Taxi. Taxi. Mr. Gillis, please, Mr. Murphy. Here I come. Oh. <laughs> Ah, just a triumph. Oh, oh, oh. Horsey, Horsey. 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 Marion arrived. We were shown to a table, and I told her as quickly as I could what had happened at the Murphy home. Johnny, you know Father isn't supposed to get excited. I know. He knows. And I tried to stop him, but he wasn't so upset over losing Ming Chua or anything else. Well, especially something as strenuous as a fight. Well, it might prove to be too much. Oh, he's all right, believe me. Well, I'm calling in a few minutes to be sure. Marion, this morning while I was waiting for you to come back from breakfast, I, uh, I had a talk with Morris, the super at your apartment. So? Yeah, he... Hello, uh, Marion, darling. Oh, darling. well, I told you to join us, Johnny. I hope you don't mind. Uh, no, no, of course not. Sit down. No, thanks. Johnny's been out all morning with Dad. Oh? Hunting for the dog, huh? That's right. Any luck? I'm not sure. Excuse us, Bill. But what did Morris have to say, Johnny? Oh, it wasn't important. Don't try lying to me, Johnny Dollar. I know you too well. Now, you tell us. What more have to say? Bill, the morning the dog disappeared, you were at Marion's apartment, weren't you? Of course he wasn't. Bill, day before yesterday? No. Are you sure? Positive. I was in my office all morning. What time did you get there? you remember? Yes, we've been very busy lately getting the big shock ready for the air. It was about 8.45. Your secretary will swear to that? Naturally. Johnny, what's this all? Excuse me. Where are you going? We'll make a couple of phone calls. Be right back. I called Bill's office, spoke to his secretary, and of course he had lied. Instead of going back to the table, I took a cab to my hotel, made a couple of more phone calls, and waited. About 40 minutes later, Bill Fisher called and asked me to meet him in a bar near Rockefeller Center. You like a drink, Johnny? No, thanks. Not right now. No? I figured you'd be thirsty. You've been such a busy little boy. Well, what do you mean? You know what I mean. Calling my secretary, then calling the happy hollow people to find out whose idea it was to advertise offering 50 grand for a talking dog. Oh, I wouldn't be ashamed of having that idea if I were you. It's a good one. Except for one thing. It was meant strictly for the publicity value. Nobody ever heard of a dog that could really talk, so I guaranteed them their 50,000 would be safe. Go on. See, it was tough enough getting the Happy Hollow people to put a show on TV in the first place. They really don't have that kind of money. And if they'd had to pay out the 50 grand on top of everything else, well, that would be it. We'd lose their account, I'd lose my job. Uh Uh-huh. So what did you do with Ming Toy? Well, naturally, since she could talk, I had to get rid of her. You understand that, don't you? How did you get into the Gillis apartment? That was easy. I'd been there the night before. When I left, I slipped the latch so the door wouldn't lock. When they went out to breakfast the next morning, I went in. I was going to put her in that box and carry her out, but she put up such a fuss, I... Well, I just tossed her out the window. Into the river? Yes, Dollar, into the East River. But what can I do about it? After all, Ming Toy was only a dog. It wasn't like she was a person. Well, what can I do about it? I'm not sure. But whatever it is, I hope it's plenty. I left him there and walked down 6th Avenue. When I reached the corner of 51st, I called Marion and asked her to meet me in a little park near her apartment building. Somehow, I told her, as simply and directly as I could. Well, it's kind of funny, isn't it, John? I don't know. It isn't. Sure. If I hadn't met Bill, none of this would ever have happened. Dad would still be feeling chipper. I might have been engaged to somebody else. Maybe even a nice guy like you. And... Why do things like this have to happen? I don't know, Marion. I just don't know. We were about a block away from her apartment when we heard the end. 
We watched it turn into 51st Street and stop. Then we were running. It's God, I know it. No, no, you don't know any such thing. Oh. All right, folks, all right. Now, keep back. Give the men room for work. Johnny, they're they not going in the building. No, no, they're doing something out there in the middle of the street. All is this. Officer! Officer, what's happened? It sounds like a little girl's caught down there under the street. Under the street? Yeah, lady, in the drain pipe that goes down to the river. Are you sure it's a little girl and not a dog? You kidding? Dogs can't talk like that. Like what? Like, well, it sounds like she's trying to say something about a dog food being yum, yum, yummy. Get your phone, Marion. Yes, oh, yes. Excuse me. Hey, come back here. I joined the power and water men who had lifted up a manhole cover and put down a ladder. Didn't take us long under the street, just a couple of minutes. Then we climbed back out again. Johnny! Tell her! Tell her! Where is she? Where's my baby? She's still down there, Mr. Gillis. Uh, you left her? Dolly, she's not. No, 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 sir, she's fine. Then why didn't you bring her back? Well, uh, maybe you'd better look for yourself, Mr. Gillis. All right, I'll do just that. Dad, you can't. You just try stopping me, will Come on, Dollar. Come on. Come on. Honey, honey. Careful now, Mr. Yes. Watch yourself. Don't you worry about me. You just look out for yourself. Yes, sir, I am. Happy holiday, Dollar. Do you hear? She's saying happy holiday, dog food. Yes, sir. My George. My George, boy. Let me down here. Where is she? Where's my little sweetheart? This way, Mr. Gillis. Okay, that's... Hello, hello, you little rascal, you. Oh, 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 yummy, 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 yummy. Listen, Mr. Gillis, she's under this water pipe. Yes, under this water pipe. This one, I guess. Yes, sir. You'll have to stoop down to see her. What's that mean, sound out? She, she. Well, I'll begin to it. Puppy. Puppy, darling. Yes, sir. Fix them. Yes, well, that little rascal. Puppy. So that's why she disappeared, huh? To have her family. Papa! 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 She called me Papa. Papa! <laughs> well, you naughty little girl. <laughs> by golly. Papa. Well, sir, by golly. So who would have thought? I guess Ming Toy did, sir. Yes, yes, he must have. Yes, indeed. Oh. Oh, Papa. Look, Johnny. I'm a grandfather. I never did tell Gillis exactly how Ming Toy had been helped out of the apartment. All he knew was that Marion, for reasons of her own, had called off her engagement to Bill. Ming Toy spent a week in bed recovering from her ordeal, and naturally, since Gillis refused to let her appear on TV that night, the $50,000 went unclaimed. And, alas, the long-suffering public has yet to hear the dulcet tones of a talking dog named Ming Toy Murphy. Expense account total, including hotel, incidentals, and transportation back to Hartford, $225.70. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a vessel that was lost at sea suddenly turns up. Thanks to the true love of my gay young life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles Smith. It is produced and directed by Jack Comstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, G. Stanley Jones, Herb Ellis, Joseph Kern, Jay Novello, Bill James, and Howard McNear. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Who's that? Bert McGraw. Oh, hi, Bert. What's the 
on your mind? Haley's Comet. What? Harry Haley, pitcher for the Spartans. They call his fastball Haley's Comet. Oh, yeah, sure. Great guy. Reminded me of a cross between schoolboy Rowe and Bob Feller. Sure too bad about him and the Spartans. Breaks my heart. Oh, boy. Well, Haley's disappeared, and right in the middle of spring training. Well, maybe he got tired of playing ball. You're kidding a man that pitches like he does is making 60000 bucks a year doing it. Your company hold a policy on him? For 50000 double indemnity. But that's incidental. The Spartans don't stand a chance this year without Haley. You're wrong, Bert. Huh? What about? That policy. A hundred grand's never incidental. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Providential Assurance Company, 393 Dewey Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the melancholy memory matter. Expense account item one, a dollar and twenty cents taxi from my apartment to Bert McGraw's office. Bert's a large man with a voice to match. Before becoming an insurance agent, he played ball with the Bush Leagues and eventually spent a year with the Spartans. He'd never forgotten. Come in, Johnny. Sit down, sit down. Thanks. Sure didn't take you long to get here. No reason why it should. That's now, why I called you, boy. Always on the ball. Yes, sir. I said to myself, if anyone can get in there and pitch, it's Johnny Dollar. A man with a real batting average. And just what the job needs. Yeah, uh, sure. So what's the catch? Find Haley, that's what. Find Haley, dead or alive. Only I sure hope it's alive. Daddy wouldn't be much good to the Spartans. Or your company, who'd have to pay out at least 50 grand. Huh? Or have you forgotten about that? Oh, good gravy. No, I'm a company man first, last, and always. In fact, I'm the bird who sold Haley that policy. What was that? About six months ago, the day me and the boys at the Lions gave him a testimonial dinner. Who's the beneficiary? Well, the original beneficiary was Haley's sister. Her name's Mildred Womack, lives in Omaha. Oh, did Haley change the beneficiary? Yeah. Who figures to collect now? His wife. Now, her name wife? is... Papers didn't say anything about him being married. I know. Well, it happened recently? Since he's been in Tucson for spring training with the rest of the team. Oh, well, maybe he's on his honeymoon. Not Haley. Why not? Because, like I said, the team's been in spring training. Last week, they started playing exhibition games. Haley wouldn't miss those for anything in the world. And according to Slats Lewis, he's the Spartan manager, Haley was going to stand up against the Red Legs last Wednesday. But nobody's seen him since Tuesday night. Almost a week. Yeah, sure is. But it's still no sign he isn't taking a little vacation. Oh, Johnny, come on. This man's an athlete. A precision machine built to pitch baseballs. Did you know he started playing when he was eight years old? Loves the game. Huh? Yes, sir. And he doesn't think of anything, ever, except playing it. I wouldn't say that. Hmm? He got married, didn't he? Oh. Oh, well, you know what I mean. Okay, Bert. Well, what do you got to go on? Well, uh, maybe I got it right here. What's that? A telegram. Came in late yesterday. Here, read it. Uh, feel sure my brother, Harry Haley, has been murdered. Please conduct thorough investigation before settling any claim on his estate... Signed Mildred Womack. Hmm. Where did you say she was? Well, she lives in Omaha, but that wire came from Tucson. You have her address out there? Yeah. I'd better have a talk with her. That's the way I'd play it. And Johnny, yeah. me and the Spartans, and of course the company are counting on you. You get a hit, okay? Coach, I'll do my best. <laughs> Expense account item two, ten cents for an afternoon paper. It contained a follow-up story on Haley's disappearance with a quote from his sister Mildred. But again, there was no mention of Haley's wife. Item three, one hundred and forty-eight dollars air travel to Tucson and cab fare to the Western Hotel. I called the Casa Grande Motel where Mildred Womack was staying, then rented the car and drove out to it. It was on the highway to Nogales, and she was waiting for me. A tall, thin woman, obviously Haley's older sister. I followed her in and sat down on the stiff chair between the bed and the dresser. 
You ever see Harry play, Mr. Dollar? No, ma'am. I'm afraid that's something I've missed. Oh. Well, this is his picture in case you want to know what he looks like. Oh, I've seen pictures of him in the papers and newsreels, Mrs. Mormack. Handsome man, ain't he? And famous. Too famous. All that publicity about his new contract, that's what started the trouble. How do you mean? If he'd never reached the big leagues, he'd be alive today. Do you really believe he's dead? Of course I do. Did you read my telegram? Oh, yes, ma'am. But do you have any proof of his death? That's all I need. Would you mind telling me what it is? The record of my brother's doings before I came to Arizona. Oh? I didn't get out here until the day before he disappeared. I came because Harry wasn't writing to me like he was supposed to, so I hired me a detective to find out what he was doing with his time. You hired a detective to follow your brother? They no law against it. No. Especially when I suspected something was wrong. Yeah, I've had to watch out for Harry since our pa died 12 years ago. How old is your brother? 25. That's physically. But he's still a baby. <sighs> Mrs. Womack, about this proof you have. I'll get to it. See, before Harry signed up with the Spartans, he never had nothing. And after last year... Well, now they're paying him a heap of money. Naturally, a man like him, simple and all, why, he was just like a ripe melon waiting for some little chippy to come along and pick him off the vine, which is just what happened. Then you know he's married. Of course I know, but I wouldn't have known if it hadn't been for that detective, Mr. Oglethorpe. You know why he kept his marriage a secret? Sure. Same reason I've tried to keep it one. What's that? Well, now, would you have gone around broadcasting it if you'd woke up some morning and found yourself hitched to a person called Juanita Torres? I don't know. I never met the lady. She ain't no lady, Mr. Dollar. Torres, Mexican. So? Well, you know. Afraid I know. Oh, no. Well, this Juanita, she was the night club dance, as she called it. That's what Oglethorpe told you? That's right. The way I figure it, Harry must have been good and drunk to let her talk him into marrying her. Have you met her? <laughs> It's not. And don't try them to, neither. Well, well, don't you think that's being a little unfair, Mrs. Womack? I don't need to. I got all the information I needed from Mr. Oglethorpe's report. Little gold digger. But she's a horrible, cheap, painted dancing girl. You're sure of that? I am. As soon as she could, she had Harry change his life insurance, making her the beneficiary. And that was like putting a gun in her hand. And you think she had something to do with his disappearance? It's murder. It ain't no death. That's a very serious charge, Mrs. Womack. But she didn't tell you. Mr. Harry didn't run off. Leave me. He had no reason to. There was no reason for him to leave without telling anybody. You're sure of that? You find the reason. I'll change my mind. When I finally got away from Mildred Womack, I headed cross town to the Oglethorpe Detective Agency. Mr. Oglethorpe wasn't in, so I left word for him to call me, then stopped by Tucson's police headquarters. Lieutenant Snyder was in his office eating his lunch out of a paper bag. All right, come in, come in, pull up the chair. Thanks, Lieutenant. You like hard boiled eggs? Sometimes. Me too, sometimes, but not every day like my wife thinks I do. You want it? No, thanks. Me either. Sergeant tells me you hear about that Haley case. Yeah, that's right. That's not much, but you're welcome to anything we have on it. Well, what do you think's happened to him, Lieutenant? I don't know. When I'm around that sister he is, I'm convinced he's been murdered. And I start thinking about it logically. Yeah. Well, if he was murdered, where's his car for him? That missing, too? It sure is. Bright new red convertible. Well, if you've got the license, it shouldn't be too hard to find. And like Haley shouldn't be, either. Face as well known as his, you'd think somebody'd spot him. Tell her we got an all-points bulletin out on both sides of the border, but so far, nothing. Just how far is the border from here, Lieutenant? About an hour's drive. Could be down there someplace. Yeah, but like his sister said, why would he leave his team, his friends, his sister, all of them, without even a goodbye? <sighs> no, it's got me. What's his wife say? Oh, didn't you know? Now what? She's gone, too. Disappeared the same day Haley did. <laughs> Spartans were playing an exhibition game that afternoon, so after telling Lieutenant Snyder where I was staying and asking him to call me if anything broke, I drove out to the ballpark. You know, there's a saying in baseball, if anybody knows a pitcher, it's the man who catches for him. And the Spartan catcher was Crawfish Crawford. After the game, I sent word in to him. A few minutes later, we're standing in the Steamfield locker room. Uh, 
figured one of you insurance men would be careful enough. You knew about his policy, huh, Crawford? Crawfish will do. Yeah, every man on the team knew about it. We've been after him to get something like that, start saving his money. Uh, hand me that towel, would you? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Now, what was it you wanted for me to tell you? Anything you can about Haley's disappearance. Well, there ain't nothing much to tell. Well, uh, did you see him at all the day he disappeared? Sure. He was my roommate. This was our second year together. Real nice boy. Picked up his clothes, showered every day, didn't snore. Are any of his clothes missing? No, nothing. He even left his raisin brush behind him. Hmm. What about his wife? Why? Oh, now don't tell me you didn't know he was married. Well? Wasn't much he didn't tell me. When he'd tell me something he didn't want talked about, I always told him I wouldn't open my mouth to nobody. Don't think I'm doing it now. But it's no secret. The afternoon papers are playing his marriage up big. Well, then I reckon it's all right. What sort of a girl was or is she? I only saw her one time. Reckon she seemed nice enough, but you can never tell about a woman. Boy, I remember one time down in Beaumont, Texas, there was this gal, and she looked so sweet, but... What she done to me, ooh Yeah, well, let's get back to Haley. How was he doing this year? Well, he was off, way off. But being in love like he was, well, that can hurt any man's control. Are you sure being in love was the only thing bothering him? I don't know what else could have been. But if I think of something, I'll let you know. <sighs> okay, Crawfish. I couldn't make up my mind about Crawfish. I didn't know if he'd held out on me or if he just didn't have any information that would help me find Haley. I drove back to my hotel, put the car in the parking lot, and then started across the lobby when somebody called to me. Hey, Dollar! Johnny Dollar! Hi, yeah? Oh, Lieutenant Snyder. Took a chance on your being here. I received a call from the Nogales police this afternoon. They find Haley? No. It looks like his sister's been right all along. How so? Mexican Highway Patrol found his car abandoned about 30 miles below Nogales. Well, that doesn't mean he's been killed. No, but there's something else that does. What? There's dried blood on the front seat. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Vermont's state flag, in its early form, imitated our national flag, uniquely bearing 17 stripes and 17 stars, with only the inscribed word Vermont to distinguish it. The good people of Vermont assumed, as did our national government, that stripes as well as stars would be added as each new state entered the Union. Vermont entered the Union after Tennessee and Ohio, and with Kentucky to join shortly, the Vermonters naturally put 17 stripes on their flag. In 1818, the United States Congress put a stop to this, and since then the stripes have always been at 13, and only stars are added for each new state. Vermont's present flag captures the famous beauty of the Green Mountain State in its coat of arms, and inscribed is the phrase, Vermont, Freedom and Unity. Vermont's state flag, the flag of the 14th state to enter the Union, was adopted on April 26, 1923. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the melancholy memory matter. <laughs> After Lieutenant Snyder told me about the Mexican police finding Haley's car abandoned below the border, I asked if he was going down there. He said it was out of his jurisdiction, and besides, he felt the Mexican police could do as well as he could. Snyder left, and I crossed to the desk to pick up my key and messages. There was one from the Oglethorpe Detective Agency. Upstairs, I called their number. Oglethorpe speaking. Oh, Mr. Oglethorpe, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, Dollar. I'm sorry I missed you this morning. Well, it wasn't important. I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. About Haley? About Mrs. Haley. Oh, what kind of question? Well, what kind of person is she? How do you mean? Do you think she married Haley for his money? I don't think nothing. I don't get paid for thinking. Just for reporting what I see. 
Well, what have you heard about her? You've been in the place where she worked, haven't you? Why, sure, but like with everybody, some folks liked her, some didn't. Look at your dollar. If you want me to do your job for you, fine, but you got to come up with some cash. I might, if you can answer this one. Try me. Where's she from? What's her hometown? Huh. Easy place called Magdalena. About 50 miles below the Mex border. Things were beginning to add up. But the total didn't look too good for Haley. Or for his wife, either. And as much as I hated believing it, it did look as if Haley's sister, Mildred Womack, was right when she said the Mexican girl her brother had married was responsible for his disappearance. I called out for a drink and was getting ready to take a shower when somebody pounded on the door. Miss, uh... Yeah, come in. It's unlocked. Just put it on... Oh, crawfish. Yeah. Well, come in, sit down. No, no, I can't stay long. I'm going out to eat with the rest of the gang. Well? Well, I've been thinking, and I figure you might be able to make something out of this. Out of what? I'm breaking my promise to Harry by telling you. Come on. Well... He's been going to a doctor here. Oh? I ain't gonna tell you no more than that. Oh, come on now. At least give me the doctor's name. It's Wolf with a knee. Wait a minute. Wolf with a knee. What are you doing? Looking it up in the phone book. Well, you can't call the nights after office hours. I'm just curious to see if there is such a doctor. What's the matter? Don't you trust me? Yeah. Yeah, I trust you, Crawfish. Is it here? Let's see. Yeah, Dr. George M. Wolf. Specializing. Yeah. Yeah, I see it. Thanks, Crawfish. You've given me the one thing I had to know. By the time I had the car checked over and filled with gas, it was about 8.30. The sign over the office of Casa Grande Motel served to light the whole court. Mrs. Womack's bungalow was dark, but I knocked on the door anyway. Yes? Who is it? Johnny Dollar. Mrs. Womack. I'm sorry if I woke you up this evening. Yes, it is. I've been sitting and thinking about Harry. But then Snyder told me they found his car. There's blood on the seat. Like I knew all along. Mrs. Womack, I wouldn't give up hope if I were you. I gave up hope when I heard he'd married that girl. And if I ever get my hands on her, I... Do you remember telling me this morning that if I could find a reason for Harry wanting to get away from everyone, to disappear, you'd change your mind about his wife? I remember. Well, I have that reason. What is it? I'll tell you late tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow afternoon? Yes, ma'am. Provided you'll be ready to leave here with me at 8 in the morning. Leave for where? A little town south of the border. It's called Magdalene. It's 65 miles from Tucson to Nogales. We made it in an hour. But from there on, the road became progressively worse. It was early afternoon when we reached the outskirts of Magdalene. Oh, really, Mr. Dollar, I wish you'd tell me what we're doing down here. I'll tell you when I'm sure, Mrs. Womack. You mean, this may be a wild goose chase? It may be, but I don't think so. Oh, really? Oh, you think they'd have sense enough to keep their chickens at home? You don't care much for the Mexican people, do you, Mrs. Womack? No, I don't. Why not? You know... I sure do, because they're so poor and dirty. By our standards, I guess some of them are poor. But as for being dirty, have you ever seen American ditch diggers or farmers after a hard day's work? Well, what about their children? They're always filthy, like those over there. Huh? Where? In that field. Do you see them? Yeah. Yeah, I sure do. Mr. Dollar, what are you doing? Be right back. But, Mr. Dollar? Hey, Sonny. Sonny. What's that? Nothing. Come over here a minute. What? Yeah. Come. Yeah, that's right. Hey, you uh, understand English? Uh, American? Good. Uh, who ever taught you how to play baseball? You do not know too, too good for Yeah, I see. You have five bases out there. 
Yes, and for the first time she came, she explained it to us. I am sure there's five days. No? No. Oh, it does not matter to you. We are grateful for what she gave to us for the, um, highest yes. Oh, oh, my. The bat. She is the bat. And the guanty. Uh, the glove. Well, who is this lady? What's her name? What is her name? What? The little one who's daughter. Do you know where she lives? Oh, see. The woman is her father. You want me to show the way? Yes, ma'am. That'd be fine. Victoria's family home was a large, rambling ranch house made of red brick and tile. I parked the car near the front door and we got out. I still hadn't told Mildred Womack why we were there. I only told her whose house it was. A servant escorted us into the living room, then left us alone. Really? Really, Mr. Dollar? Yeah? What is it now? Don't you understand how I feel? You think I can face these tarnished people after that business? Think of a daughter has done away with my brother. Your brother hasn't been done away with, Mrs. Oh, you aren't really sure of that. I'm not sure of anything. Whose blood did they find on the front seat of his car? Why not ask him? Him? Your brother. He's standing there in the doorway right behind you. Harry. Hello, Mildred. Oh, Harry. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so very glad. Are you? Oh, why, of course, I thought. Oh, the things I thought. I'll bet. Now, you hurry and get your things together, dear. We'll let Mr. Dollar drive us back to civilization. I'm not going back, Mildred. Oh. I hoped you'd never find me. But Harry, why? Oh, I've been so worried about you. I wanted to get away from you for good, Mildred. What? I'll never forget the things you said to me about Juanita. Oh, Harry, after oh, all... They made me sick, you hear? You know what she did, mister? She invited me over to dinner. Not me and my wife, just me. Last Tuesday night. Yeah. And when I got there, and I should have known what she had in the back of her mind, she tried everything she could to get me to leave Juanita, including calling me names and telling me what a dirty, sneaking detective had found out about Juanita. It was all true. Even if it was true, who cares what she did before we were married or what I did? Hey, you shouldn't talk to me like this after all the things I've done for you. Oh, I now, don't you. give me that routine, Mildred. I'm sick of it. Ever since I was a kid. But I did everything for you, even after you grew up. Sure. And even tagging along every year to spring training to see that I behave like a nice little boy. Harry, Harry. Please. Well, ain't it the truth? I had to protect you, Harry. Uh, Don't you understand? You're all I have. You can get a husband. And have him leave me like Joe did. Joe left you because you were so busy making a fuss over me and never had time to even cook his meals. Oh, Harry. Oh, Harry, please. You. Your name's Dollar? That's right. Insurance investigator. We thought perhaps you met up with an accident, huh? Yeah. What about that blood in your car? Hit a chicken on the way down here. We were a little tight by then. Thought the blood would make it look like we'd been killed. Nobody come looking for us. Why didn't you take your clothes? Two reasons. When we left Tucson that night, we... Hadn't planned on disappearing. What's the other one? Mildred bought most of them for me. Oh, Harry. Don't hurt me, please. I, I couldn't stand it if I... If I thought you were... Get out of here, no, Dollar. No, no, I won't leave. Go on no. back to Omaha, Mildred. Back to your roses and your cat. I never want to see you again. I guess we've done it. Mr. Dollar, have I been wrong all this time? Selfish. Pedro, Senor, Senor. What? Yes. Senor, Senora, I am Juanita Torres, really. You are... I know how you must feel about me, senora, but please, I, I cannot help it if I love your brother. You really love him, even as you do. More. And you must not feel too bad, too angry for what he has said. He is not well. 
Vincent. Well, wow. I do not know all of it. But he has had very bad news from the doctor in Tucson. Oh, no. He's oh. very upset. I'm sure he will forgive you when he's better. When there is better news. I... <sighs> Thank you. Thank you for telling me. Juanita? Juanita? Come in, querido. And he was... She's a lovely girl, isn't she? Yeah. Hey, hey, do you see her, senor? She's just left. Yeah, yeah, we saw her, thanks. Well, five faces. Can you tell her what that was wrong? No. No, that's something you'll have to do. Oh, oh I will. Adios. Dollar. Yeah. In Tucson last night. You said you knew the reason for Harry wanting to disappear. But you couldn't have known what he said just now. I learned he's been going to a doctor in Tucson. A specialist. Diseases of the eye. What? I called the doctor before we left Tucson this morning. He told me your brother is losing his sight. What? He's going blind. Some people, you just can't figure. Motored Womack stayed on in Magdalena. Yeah, she rented a small adobe house and did what she could to help her less fortunate neighbors. Harry Haley never played ball again. But he retained enough of his sight to show the Junior Magdalena Spartans the difference between four bases and five. Expense account total, including car rental, hotel bill, incidentals, and transportation back to Hartford, $579.12. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, three of the most unforgettable characters I've ever met. And believe it or not, a case that solves itself. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Lillian Byeff, Richard Beale, Barney Phillips, Frank Nelson, Harry Bartell, Dick Crenna, and Lawrence Dobkin. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. You smell smoke, Johnny? What'd you say? Who is that? This is Henry Willoughby at Four State Mutual Insurance Company. Oh, hi, Hank. And I asked if you smell smoke. Should I? What kind? The kind $5,000 makes when it goes up in flames. Where? Over in Cranford, the peerless junkyard. Junkyard? That's right. But if there's only a $5,000 loss, how can you afford me? Because what I smell is arson. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. 
following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Peerless Fire matter. Expense account item one, a dollar even, cab to Hank Willoughby's office in the Security National Building, where he lost no time in getting to the point. Policy was taken out by one Oscar H. Lehman about four years ago. He's the owner of the junkyard. Address of the yard is corner of Howard and Kingsway Boulevard. And why do you suspect arson, Hank? Our fire didn't start until about four o'clock this morning. When I got here to the office a few minutes after nine, the claim was already on my desk. Almost as though he'd had it filled out and waiting even before the fire occurred, huh? Precisely. How much do you know about this man, Lehman? Well, nothing really outside of the data on the policy. His home address is uh, 232 East 4th Street. Also in Cranford. Yeah. Okay, Hank. I'll see what I can see. <laughs> Item 2, 40 cents phone call to make sure the suspect, or at this point, I guess I'd better call him the client, to make sure he'd be around for questions. Here speaks Oscar Lehman. Mr. Lehman, this is Johnny Dollar representing your insurance company. So why do you waste time at the telephone? Well, then maybe you're coming here with my check for $5,000 right away, huh? Well, you see, there are a couple of things that... So uh... all right, I'll be waiting for you when you come with the money. Goodbye. Huh? Item 3, 120 for a train ticket to Cranford. Item four, two dollars for an old rattle trap taxi when I got there. Cranford is a new town, or rather a new one built on what was left of the old. When the big clock company folded up at the end of World War II, Cranford kind of fell to pieces. But situated as it was, just a few miles above the busy city of New Haven, a bunch of smart New York operators had stepped in and were busy making a nice modern residential community out of it. New stores, new homes, and all the fixtures. You see that uh, block up there ahead? Huh? They had a big fire there this day, a big junkyard. Yeah, I see. Man, it was really hot. Thought it was going to take the three houses there on Howard Street along with it. You know, flying embers and the heat and all. But the wind swung around. They didn't even get touched. Yeah. Well, uh, pull up, will you? I want to look it over. Okay, let's see. You're the boss. Hey, you want me to get the meter running? No, I'll leave you here. Okay. That's uh, 85 cents, uh, but it would have been a buck and a half to where you first wanted to go. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh... Hey, thanks. Boy, how I hate to see that junkyard gone. Oh? Why? Oh, well, that's where I've been buying my parts to keep this old crate tied together. Hey, you know something? It looks... <laughs> now that Peerless is gone, I'll probably either have to get a new cab or either try and fix this one up right, you know, and that costs dough. Yeah, well, happy fixing. Yeah, like I say, though, out of something bad, always comes something good. Sure. And, and I not only mean my taxi, mister, but them houses there, too. Well, what about them? Oh, they're on Howard Street. They, they've been beefing their heads off ever since the yard got its license. So now, no more junkyard. Now the whole place could be residential like it ought to. Like I always say, out of something bad, um, always something come... good, yeah. Yeah. No, I got to get going. Hey, you know something? Maybe that fire gives me a good idea. Like, uh, maybe I should burn up this old wreck of mine and the insurance company would have to give me a new one. Hey, how about that? Maybe you'd better be careful who you say that to. Hmm? Oh, sure. Especially not to an insurance investigator. Yeah, like well, me. don't you worry, bud. I'm too smart. You? You? That's right. Oh, happy day. In spite of the valiant efforts of Fire Chief Dale Marley and his crew, the peerless junkyard was just that, junk. And he agreed with the camp driver. The other property owners were probably glad to see the ice go up in flames. Well, you wouldn't like it either, Dollar, having a place like that in your front yard. And just take a look at those folks standing around. you see what I mean. Yeah. I must admit, they don't look very unhappy about it. So the fire started in the shed that stood right here, huh? That's right, yeah. The big shed that Peerless used to store a lot of old furniture and stuff like that. Hey, Peters, huh? hit that corner over there with some more foam. Okay, sir. Yeah, a fellow runs a grocery store on the caddy corner, and he sleeps upstairs over it. He said it woke him up, went off with a boom, like a, like a small explosion. Have you considered the possibility of arson, Chief? Yeah, yeah, I have. That's why I called New Haven and asked them to send up a couple of men from their special squad. But you found no trace. Nothing I could put my finger on. You got any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe I have. 
I learned a long time ago that a lumber yard or a furniture factory were about the worst places in the world to look for signs of arson. The wood goes up so hot and so fast. And the remains of this shed wouldn't be much better. So I walked over to the little grocery store and spent item five, 21 cents, for a loaf of white bread. And I rejoined Chief Marley at the ruins of the shed. Hey, hey, what's the matter, Dollar? Did you get to eat breakfast? Oh, something like that. Hey, you want a chunk? Huh. Not without strawberry jam and a cup of coffee. Hey, Herb, take it easy over there. Stop it around like that, you wipe out all the clues. Now, like I told you, Dollar, the fire started somewhere right around here. Uh-huh. And the quick shift in the wind moved it over that way. Uh-huh, Chief. Yeah. Here, chew a piece of this fresh bread. What? That's right, chew it. Get the taste of it in your mouth. What for? Just do it, would you please? Here. Well, you got an idea, Sam? You bet I have. Here. You... You mean chewing on a hunk of bread is going... Is going to what? Now swallow it. What is this, a gag or... Something? No, not by a long shot. Now watch. Well, don't throw it away. <laughs> now you got my appetite up, I'll have some more. Here now, chew on this piece. What? After you dropped it in the ashes? That's right, chew on it. Oh, now Go wait. Go ahead, do it, I'm serious. Holy... Kerosene. That's right. Well, I'll be doggone. Yeah? Fresh bread will pick up even the slightest trace. Even after the fire? Even after a fire. That means kerosene was brought in and poured over the floor of this furniture shed to set it off. And, Dollar, I'm going to get in the police and have them lock up old Oscar Lehman so No, no, wait. What for? Until I can talk to Lehman. Well, now, look. You look. This isn't any absolute proof of arson. Well, it's good enough for me. It's good enough for a suspicion charge. I'll tell the police what I found out. What, uh, who found out? Well, uh, What I found out. Now, don't forget that. But if it puts us on the trail of an arsonist, if you like, you can take the credit for it. Only if you'll cooperate. Yeah, but Dollar... Otherwise, you'll lose any cooperation from me. Okay? Uh, okay. Item 680 cents cab to the address on East 4th Street where Oscar Lehman lived. Like the Howard Street address, this was a has-been section. Lehman's home reminded me of some of those on the other side of the town next to the junkyard. When the old character let me in, I wasted no time in getting to the point. You ask why I should be staying here in my home instead of at the yard? <laughs> and I'm asking you why not? What good can I do over there? My lovely junkyard is gone. There's nothing I can do. So I'm waiting here to collect the money your company owes me. So are you going to pay me or not? Well, now that depends. As I started to say... I Lehman, tell you, I didn't even know about the fire till I went down there to open up the gate and start the day. What time did you go down there, Mr. Lehman? Seven o'clock, like always. Well, you sure didn't waste any time getting your claim into the office in Hartford, did you? Of course not. So soon as I see what's happened, I sign up the claim and take it to Hartford. And the office is closed, so I leave it under the door. Yeah, well... What uh... else could I do? Sit around and wait to think about it while the money is coming to me? It's my money, so I should have it. You know how much merchandise I have in that yard? Twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000. Retail? Yeah. Then why'd you burn it up? You think I'm crazy I should do such a thing? Don't you understand now I'm out of business for God? Oh, what do you mean? My, my license for the yard on condition, you know. A conditional license? Yeah, that's right. If I'm not in business every day, I lose the license. I lose the lease on the land. Then they, they make houses, little stores. It's a big development company. So you're crazy to come and talk to me, tell me I should set fire. Maybe I've suddenly changed my mind, Mr. Lehman. Maybe I've already met the arsonist. Huh? And I was just too blind to see him. of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Missouri's state flag is a horizontal tricolor of red, white, and blue. In the center is a circular device bearing the state coat of arms. An eagle, symbolizing the superior authority of the nation... A grizzly bear representing Missouri, chosen for his size, strength, and valor. And a crescent moon, 
symbolic of the shield carried by the second son, Missouri being the second state carved out of the Louisiana Territory. A belt encircles the coat of arms with a motto inscribed, United we stand, divided we fall. Atop the flag is a cluster of stars representing the Union, with a larger star for Missouri as she surmounts her difficulties and assumes her rank among the states. The state motto is also inscribed on the flag, Salus Populi Suprema Lex Esto. The welfare of the people shall be the supreme law. Surrounding the device is a group of 24 stars. Missouri's state flag, the flag of the 24th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 22, 1913. And now, Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Peerless Fire Matter. the cab driver had said while taking me to the scene of the junkyard fire had suddenly come back to me. He'd been talking about the nearby property owners, homeowners. They've been beefing their head off ever since the yard got its license. So now, no more junkyard. Now the whole place can be residential like it ought to. Yeah, like I always say, out of something bad, always comes something good. Item 785 cents, another taxi back to the scene of the fire. The men from the department were still busy cleaning up. Their chief, Dale Miley, had been busy with some detective work. Had some answers that seemed to make good sense. Now, look here, Donnie. You see this hardware? See this groove in the foundation wall? Yeah. Big sliding door, huh? That's right. And here, the lock was still in a hasp. Yeah, I see. It's hardly likely somebody tried to pull a big sliding door closed and lock it after starting a fire with kerosene. It's too dangerous. Unless he used a wick of some kind. Yeah, yeah, but look here. On the side that faced Howard Street. Street? I just call this an alley. Yeah, pretty narrow from the old days. Now, look here. Well, it's window glass. Right. Yeah, there was a window here. You see, here's, here's the two parts of the catch from it. The catch was open. Yeah, but the question is, was it open from the inside or outside? And I think I've got the answer. Look across the street. So? Those homes and the little lawns and gardens in front of them. So what? Well, you see the rocks they all use to border their flower beds? Uh, go on, Chief. Yeah, now, look here. Just inside the shed where the window was... I found this rock under the ashes. And, Dollar, it looks to me like somebody threw that rock through the glass, opened the catch, climbed in, spread the kerosene, climbed out, tossed in a light of some kind, and left in a hurry. Yeah, but who? That's just it. You got a better idea than old man Lehman? You talk to him. Yeah, I think I have. Like who? I'll let you know when I find out the name. Well, now, wait a minute, Dollar. I hope that last crack would keep Chief Marley from sending the police after Oscar Lehman. Maybe he was guilty of firing his own junkyard. But with only 5,000 insurance, it didn't make sense. And I had a couple of better ideas. At least about people who might have had reason to do it. Three, as a matter of fact. Four, there were three residences on Howard Street facing what remained of the junkyard. Thanks to the sudden shift of wind, they'd received little damage. I walked down the short length of Howard Street to the first old house. The name Howard McNeil was on the little metal mailbox. Yes, well, what is it? Mr. McNeil, I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator, looking into this junkyard fire. Huh. This is a fine time to come around selling insurance after the fire's out. You should know better, young uh, fellow. No, you misunderstood me. I'm Why, do you know what would have happened if that wind hadn't changed? It would have set this whole block on fire. That's what it would have done. It would have burned us all out. We'd have been helpless. Yes, Mr. Especially McNeil. Especially that poor widow lady, Miss Cummings, down there in the third house, right across from the shed where the whole thing started. Mr. McNeil. Yes? I'm not here to sell insurance. I'm investigating the fire, understand? Well, don't. What's that? You can stop right now. Just leave things as they be. Don't you know that fire was a blessing? I'm not quite sure I... I said blessing. That fire was the finest thing that's happened around here in years. Oh, you like its having happened, huh? You just bet I do. The only way we could ever get rid of that awful pile of junk right in our front yards. Now, maybe they'll give us back our nice little park that used to sit there. Or build a lot of track houses. Yeah, now... all right. What do they do? Anything is better than that wretched junkyard. I've hated it. Everybody's hated it. I hated it. Enough to set it on fire? Yes, sir. We have so... Oh, no. <laughs> Me? Well? <laughs> Mr. Dollar... <laughs> 
A, a quiet, peace-loving person like me? Oh, no, why, I wouldn't even think of such a thing. <laughs> Especially since that fire might have got out of control and burned me up. Well, you carry insurance, of course. I do not. I don't believe in it. No, so don't you try to tell me it. I told you I'm an investigator. Well, why don't you ask that Nazi if he had insurance? Nazi? Yes, that Oscar Lehman that owned that dirty junkyard. Why do you call him that? Well, he's a German, isn't he? Well, that doesn't make him a Nazi. Well, it does to me. Anybody who'd wrangle a license to put up a filthy place like that on our beautiful street, especially if he's a German, well, to me, he's a Nazi of the worst kind, the worst kind, the very worst kind. Think she's a ladies' man, too. All right, now, have you any idea who, besides you, would have liked to see that place burned up? I certainly have. Oh. Why don't you ask the police? They were here at dawn asking us all questions. You said asking us all. Of course, I... Mentioned the widow Cummings that lived in the third house, and, and then there's Miss Gertrude Mary Anastasia Conroy, the nice spinster lady who lives next door in the day. Oh, very charming lady, Miss Conroy. Yeah, well, now what oh, you mind? Oh, and what spirit she has. Now, that's the way I like them, Mr. Dollar. Ladies with spirit. And do you know something? One of these days, I'm going to ask her for a date in, in spite of the competition. <laughs> you never have? Oh, no, sir, no, no. I'm, I'm not the bold type like some people I know. And I've, I've been working up to it. And how long have you been a neighbor? It's Sixteen years. And you mark my word, one of these days, I'm going to march right up on her front porch. And, Miss Conroy, I'm going to say... Yeah, well, thank you very much, Mr. Yes, uh, yes, but I was going to tell you, but... Uh, oh, dear, I must have said something wrong. Whew. Wanting. Miss Conroy? That's right. And don't you see this sign beside the door? No peddlers, no solicitation. So be gone with you. I'm busy cleaning the smoke. Got to be house for that. Half a fire this morning. Well, that's what I'm calling about, ma'am. That fire. I'm an insurance investigator. Investigator, huh? Well, now, just a... If you're an investigator, young man, let me see your badge. Badge? That's right. If you're an investigator, you're a detective. And if you're one of them, you're with the police. No, 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 no. And if you are, you can go right back and tell your chief I've had me feel right up to here with answering full questions about that fire. As if I myself did it, huh? Well, did you? For years now, I've connived and connipted how to get that terrible, dirty, filthy junkyard out of this neighborhood. And now, poor soul, he's lost it. Oh, I could cry my eyes out. You what? Oh, such a lovely old man he is when I finally met him, that dear Mr. Lehman. Oh? Oh, the horrible things that Hitler done to him before he escaped them Nazis that took over his fine old country. And when he got here, he put all his savings in that lovely second-hand lot. Lovely. So he could earn an honest living. I'm afraid I don't oh, understand. such a fine man. Such a gentleman. The way he'd click his heels and bow when he come and call in on Sunday afternoon. Oh, such a uh, gentleman. Wait a minute, Miss Conroy. I don't get it. A couple of minutes ago, you sounded as though you hated that junkyard. Second-hand lot. Oh. And so I did. Until I got to know that nice Mr. Lehman. And I'll tell you this. In spite and despite the fact they won't ever let him set up in the same kind of business again. If it takes every cent I own, I'll see that he gets started in something else. Well, I'll be... Investigator, huh? Insurance investigator. And then I suppose I can tell you confidential that I've set me cap for dear Oscar. You mean you hope to marry him? Aye, and that I will before I'm through. But I got the impression that your neighbor, Mr. McNeil... Oh, that crazy old stick in mud, that old coat, ha! Huh? But if you're from the insurance company, how can I help you, lad, with your uh, investigation thing? Well, you can't tell me this. Was your friend Mr. Lehman in need of uh, money, particularly? Uh, well, no. Uh, his business has been good. He drives a nice car and keeps a nice home. But like I said, if he needs more than he's got to get started again, I'll be the first to help him. Besides, it will sort of help to bring us closer together if I'm worrying about him a bit. No, won't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I guess it will. I just want to oh, make sure. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah? It's so blind I was thinking of me darling Oscar. So that's what you were up to with your nasty questions. What? Implication that he might have burned up his place by his own self to get the insurance money. Is that what your evil, filthy mind was thinking of? I didn't say that. But that's what you meant, now, ain't it? 
No, no, after all, somebody set that fire. And if he was in need of money... And just because I told the poor soul to get his claim in real quick this morning... You told him. Of course I did. Give him something to do besides standing around in the ruins, crying his poor old eyes out, keeping his sorrows to himself. Mm. But I'll soon put a stop to that. I'll cook him up a real nice mess of corned beef and cabbage, a German style, that is, and take it over for his supper to comfort and keep him company. And what will you be doing for the poor soul? Uh, well, that depends. Oh, it depends, does it? Well, you and that insurance company better pay up what you owe him instead of making snide talk about maybe he himself set that fire and his... Oh, get out. Go on, get out. Why should I be wasting my time talking to the likes of you when I've got cooking to do for me? <laughs> oh, brother. This was turning out to be the most offbeat insurance matter I ever handled. Well, there was only one suspect left. The woman living in the third house opposite the shed where the fire had started. The Witter Cummings, McNeil had called her. I went up on the porch, rang the doorbell. And again. After the third time, I was about to decide no one was home when the door slowly opened. And just inside the door, in a wheelchair, sat a little old lady, pale, gray-haired. Her face reflected years of pain. I've been waiting for you to come, Mr. Dollar. So you know who I am? I overheard you at my window when you talked to Mr. McNeil and Miss Conroy. Listening to the neighborhood is the only thing I have left these days, tied down as I am to this wheelchair. Yes, I see. I'm sorry. Come in and sit down, please. Thanks. There's uh, no one to take care of you here? Only Rudolph. Who does as little as he dares. And you must take him away, Mr. Dollar. Rudolph? My stepson. Who keeps me here. Waits for me to die. What? Not even a rest home. Where I'd have care and friends but here to die. He'd help me die too if he dared because of the money. What money, Mrs. Cummings? That my husband left me. A lot, Mr. Dollar. And this... Rudolph wants to get his hands on it? That's all he wants. That's why he wants me dead. But he hasn't dared kill me. Because everybody knows that we're alone here together. And if I should die from his neglect, they'd know he did it. But he's smart. That's why he thought of the fire. He what? He thought that it would burn down this house, too, and trap me here. Mrs. Cummings, do you know what you're saying? The divine providence. The changing wind kept the fire away. He set that fire to burn this house and you? He's clever. He made it known that he'd be away all night, that he wouldn't be back here until he finished his work at the plant in New Haven. But he came back, Mr. Dollar, this morning before dawn. I heard him here in this house... And from this window, I could see him in the moonlight. Mrs. Cummings. No, I must tell you. Quickly, because he'll be coming back from work. His work. To keep up appearances, to keep them from suspecting. His gambling. The terrible people he goes out with at night. Gangsters, that's all. And I must tell you. Because if I don't, listen to me. I'm listening. I saw him. Take a can, the kerosene we keep in the cellar for when the electricity goes out. He took it across the street and broke the window of the shed and went in. Then he came out, he threw a piece of burning waste back in, then ran. Mrs. Cummings, are you sure? I lied to the police. I couldn't make myself tell them. After all these years of knowing what he's been and saying nothing... But I thought I'd wait for him. Maybe when he saw his evil plan had failed, that I was still here. Maybe I could make him give himself up. But in my heart, I knew he wouldn't. Because he's bad. All bad. Mrs. Cummings, I'm glad you told me. God forgive me. 
But I knew, I knew that if I didn't, he'd find some other way to... You must take him away, Mr. Dollar. Before he does murder. Expense account item eight, ten dollars, board and room. I've stayed an extra day in Cranford to clear things up. For while I waited for Rudolph to return, I found the kerosene can he'd used down in the cellar. Chief Marley found the top from it in the ashes. The police have since found only his prints on it. Rudolph is in the city jail. And I'm sure Mrs. Cummings will testify against him. After all, her life is at stake. Hoskin Lehman, his claim will be paid in full. Well, I hope he and Miss Conroy live happily ever after. Expense account total, including incidentals on the way back to Hartford, $14.46. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... Exploration in the high Sierra country of California. And at the end of the trail lies death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Peggy Weber, John Stevenson, Herb Vigran, Hans Conrad, Forrest Lewis, and Parley Bear. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Reed speaking. Oh, good morning, George. Is it? Well, sure. The birds are singing, the bees are buzzing. And there are whales in the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, there are. What? You know anything about whales, Johnny? Can't say that I do. Well, neither do I. Neither does our agent down in Gulfport, Mississippi. Can you go down there? Well, yeah, sure. But what's this all about? I told you. A whale. Oh, come on. You people didn't insure a... Now, George. Oh, Johnny, of course we didn't. But we did write a floater policy covering 80 pounds of amber gris. Amber who? Gris. Comes from a whale. Uh Very valuable, used in the making of perfume. Oh, yeah. We issued the policy a week ago. Yesterday, the stuff disappeared. How much did you cover it for? 20,000. And our agent down there is W.C. Owen. Got it? Owen, huh? Yes. You really shouldn't have any trouble locating the stuff. No? Why not? Because, and I quote Mr. Owen... Ambergris smells worse than a hound dog which has caught a skunk. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American Branch Office, 443 North 15th Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Michael Meany Mirage matter. Expense account item one, $168. Transportation from Hartford to the Markham Hotel in Gulfport, Mississippi. I called W.C. Owen, the agent who had sold the policy covering the ambergris. Half an hour later, I opened the door of my room to a middle-aged man wearing a brown seersucker suit. Mr. Dollar, is that right? Sure is. Come on in, Mr. Owen. 
Come on. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Well, Dollar, I'm not going to fool around about this. I'm in a mess, and you're my only chance of getting out of it. Well, I'll do whatever I can, Mr. Owen. You just find that ambergris. And, man, please find it within the next 48 hours. Oh, why the rush? Two reasons. When the ambergris was stolen off the freight platform at the train depot the day before yesterday, it was packed for shipping. Had enough dry ice around it to last 72 hours, but no more. Uh-huh. Now, what's the second reason? That Mike Meany. Who's he? Owner of the ambergris and a real good client of mine. I promised him you'd locate the stuff for sure. Well, I appreciate your confidence, Mr. Owen. Name's W.C. Mr. around here sounds too highfalutin for an insurance salesman. Okay, W.C. But what's this fellow mean he's so worried about? The ambergris is covered for 20000 He told me he'd learned it was worth a lot more than that since the floater was issued. Something up near 60000 Pretty rare stuff. Which is. Matter of fact, this is the first time I've ever heard of anybody finding ambergris in the Gulf. Who fished it out of the water? Meany? No, a young fellow worked for him named Billy Fisher. Did Meany buy it from Fisher? Didn't have to. Belonged to Mr. Meany right off. Oh, why's that? Well, because Fisher works for him. Mr. Meany lets out his fishing boats to fellas, which ain't got no boat of their own, or even a chance of getting one. He rents them out, you mean? No, he don't rent them. He lets them out on share. Mr. Meany puts up the boat, gas, nets, everything. And whoever runs the boat, well, he... Whatever he catches, he belongs to Mr. Meany. Oh, uh, and because Fisher happened to be in Meany's boat when he found the abogris, it automatically became Meany's property, huh? Now you got it, boy. Uh-huh. Did Fisher know what it was or the value of it when he turned it over to Meany? Well, you have to ask him about that. Yeah, I plan to. But first, I'd like to have a talk with this Mike Meany. I'm way ahead of you, Dollar. I called Meany right after you called me. He's waiting for us. How far does he live from here? Oh, about three or four miles down the beach road toward Biloxi. Place called Mississippi City. Mississippi City? Uh-huh. But don't let the name fool you. Ain't nothing there except a couple of stores, fishing boat landing, and the train depot. Uh, sounds like a real quiet place. It is. It's also where this whole thing started and where I hope it finishes. And the sooner, the better. A few minutes later, we were driving east along the coast. Ahead of us, we could see Mississippi City's one and only landmark, a long wooden pier extending far out into the gulf. Anchored near the end of it were several small fishing boats. We passed the Meany General Store and the Meany Fish Market, then turned into a narrow driveway. I'm not sure what kind of a house I'd expected Mike Meany to live in, but this certainly wasn't it. It was too small and it needed a coat of paint. We got out and Owen led the way to the side porch. Mr. Meany, you at home? Doesn't look like he is. No, no, he's here. Listen. What in the name of... Sure, heavy, ain't he? Yes, sir. Ain't another man his size in the whole United States. Good night, I believe. W.C. boy, you sure took your sweet time getting here. Yeah. Well, I made it just as fast as we could, Mr. Meany. Uh, this is the fellow I was telling you about, Mr. Johnny Dollar. Uh, both of you come inside. That's it. Come on in. You men sit down on the sofa. I'll just lower, uh, lower myself into this, uh, this here, uh, chair. There. Yeah, now then, you're a detective, huh, Dollar? Well. Well, then, me ain't giving me an answer. You're a detective or you ain't a detective. Now, which is it? I'm an insurance investigator. Right now, I'm being paid to find 80 pounds of ambergris that you lost. Lost? Lost. You didn't mean nothing by saying that. You Mr. hush Meany. up, you you road agent. Hey, Mr. Meany. Dollar, that stuff was stolen, you hear? Thieved. Right in the broad light of day. You're sure? Well, I'm sure 80 pounds of ambergris didn't get up and walk off by itself. Yes, sir. Me too. It's out. Exactly where was it when it was stolen? Well, sitting in a box I had built for it, a special bo- box. Box? Smell proof. Cost $25. Oh, shut up. I was sending it to New Orleans to a fella I'd heard might be able to sell it for me. And the box was on the platform uh, right outside the American Express office of the depot. Here in Mississippi City? Boy, you ever take a bad fall out of your cri- crib? No, you ignorant in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Where do you think that depot was? Well, it could have been in Gulfport. No, it could not never do business there. Okay, okay, so I'm wrong. No, but that's the first time you ever admitted it. 
Had the box been checked in at American Express? You mean had the freight been paid in New Orleans? Yes, that's what I mean. Tax grounds and ignorant, no good. Had it been paid, Mr. Meany? No, it had Why not? Because the rat I trusted with the Amber Grison sent down to the station to see it got on the train. Yeah? He'd promise. He'd give his word. He wouldn't take his eyes off that stuff for one second. No. That dirty. That no account. That, that, Are you okay, Mr. Meany? No. But you sit down. You make me nervous, don't you see? <laughs> yes, sir. Jeez. Every time I think of that, T.J., that stupid nephew of mine, well, you know what he done, Dollar. He spotted something more interesting to look after than $20,000 worth of ambergris. Ambergris. Okay, who was she? She? Oh, W.C. told you. No, I didn't. No, sir. Mr. Dollar, he, he's just clever. Yeah, well, anyway, according to T.J., this young female pulled up in an open car across from the road from where he was at. And it, it wasn't until he got up close that he could see that she was wearing a, a strapless... Bathing suit. You see, Mr. Dollar, T.J. He thought... He knows what T.J. thought you, Miss Boo. You keep your mouth shut, W.C. Well, whatever you say, Mr. Boo. Well, while T.J. was investigating the uh, situation, uh, someone made off with the ambergris. Is that right? Right. Well, what about the other people at the station? There weren't no other people there. How about the baggage clerk and the passenger agent? Where were they? They? Sam Burroughs is the only man that works down the depot... And he was busy selling some woman a Pullman ticket to Memphis. How long did T.J. talk to the girl? Just a couple of minutes, according to him, that is. Uh, if you want to ask him yourself, he works at the all-night cafe in Gulfport. All right, thanks. Well, we sure haven't much to go on. You got nothing to go on. So you might as well give me my 20000 and head back up north. We belong. Blong. Not yet, Mr. Meaning. You got 45 hours. At the end of that time, I want my insurance money. Money. You don't see that I have it, Mr. W.C. Owen. You're going to be sorry. You know what I mean? Mean? Yes, sir. I know. Owen didn't say another word until we pulled out of Fat Mike Meany's driveway and a turn left going on down the beach toward Biloxi. I suppose you think I should have stood up to him a little more, huh? No, I I figured you had your reasons for not wanting to get into an argument with him. You see those boats off the end of the pier? The small fishing boats, uh-huh. Well, they belong to Meany. He's also got money invested in half the business place along the beach. You know what that means, Dollar. Yeah, well, where I come from, he'd pull a lot of weight. That's it. And anybody he gets riled at, well, one word from him and a good many of my clients would be screaming for me to cancel their policies. Like that, huh? Just like that. Hey, where are we going? Billy Fisher's. This way, this here is the boarding house he lives in. Come on. Uh oh. Okay, boy. Okay. Easy now. Easy, easy. That's it. Good boy. Good boy. Did you know it's all get back in this house? Well, good afternoon, Miss Harvey. Well, my goodness, Miss Owen, this is an unexpected pleasure for sure. Why, thank you, ma'am. Uh, this here is Mr. Johnny Dollar, Miss Harvey. Afternoon. Pleased to know you, Mr. Dollar. Wouldn't you like to come in and sit down? No, thanks. We really don't have much time. Oh? Mr. Dollar is an insurance investigator. Right now, he wants to have a talk with Billy Fisher, providing his home. Why, sure he is. you find him round the side there. Oh, but... Yes, sir? Well, he's with Jane Higgins, Miss Owen. Jane Higgins. Oh, you know her pa rented that old Miller place again. The girl that got Billy into that trouble. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. What, uh, what kind of trouble, Mrs. Harvey? Well, it happened when the Higginses were down here two years ago. Billy and Jane have always been sweet on each other. But being as Billy is Billy and doesn't have a fang of his own, not even a job except fishing one of Mr. Meany's boat. Well... James Pa just put his foot down. <laughs> but didn't mean a thing to Billy. No, sir. At least not until old man Higgins got a sheriff out. <laughs> that still didn't stop James. <laughs> and finally, the Higginses just packed up. They didn't come back until just three weeks ago Saturday. How old is the Higgins girl now? Oh, he's 19. And she hasn't changed one bit in those two years. No, sir. She's just over here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be some fur fly when her paw finds oh, out. <laughs> there they are now. Billy? <laughs> James! Yeah. Come over here a minute, Billy. Someone wants to see you. Sure. Billy? 
Howdy, she has Mr. Dollar. Hi. Howdy. Uh, Miss Higgins, Mr. Dollar, and Mr. Owen. Uh, Hello, Miss Higgins. How are you? Billy, I wonder if I could speak to you alone for a moment, huh? Yes, sir. What did you want to talk to me about? Mr. Meany and the ambergris you found. Oh, that. Where did you find it, Billy? Out near Cat Island, floating in the East Channel. Uh Uh-huh. Did you know what it was as soon as you saw it? No, sir, not exactly, but I read a story once about a fellow that found some ambergris, and he sure made a lot of money off it. So you weren't going to take any chances, and you hauled it aboard, is that right? Uh, Yes, sir, something like that. Billy, you realized... That anything you caught or salvaged with that boat uh, belonging to Mr. Meany, uh, it wasn't yours. You realized that, didn't you? Well, not right then. I didn't know, sir. He gave me some kind of a contract to sign when I started working for him, but I never read it. Well, what happened when you put in at the pier that night? Well, that Cliff Stillinger, Mr. Meany's checker, he spied the ambergris right off, and he made me turn it over to him. Was that the last time you saw it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, that was it. Okay, Billy. That's all I had on my mind. Well, that's all? I mean, no questions about whether I swiped it from the train station or not? Would you tell me if you had? You crazy something? Heck no. After saying goodbye to Jane Higgins and taking a rain check on a dinner invitation for Mrs. Harvey, Owen and I drove back to town. I was tired and I was discouraged, and I needed a good night's sleep, so I had him drop me off at the hotel. At the desk, I found a message to call long-distance operator 19. A few minutes later, the call was completed. George Reed speaking. Hi, George. Thought it was you. Johnny, where in blazes have you been? I've been trying to get hold of you all afternoon. Oh, something important? No, I was just curious about the weather down there. Oh, well, it's great, great. Warm, but not too warm. Johnny. Okay, George, what's happened? One of the boys upstairs got wind of that ambergris claim. So? So he just happens to have a friend who's an ichthyologist. Well, bully for him. Johnny, this ichthyologist says that ambergris comes only from the sperm whale. And there has never been a sperm whale alive that would be caught dead swimming in the Gulf of Mexico. What? You follow me, Johnny? I think so. If there's never been a sperm whale in the Gulf, then that stuff you people insured couldn't have been... But, George, if it wasn't ambergris, what was it? I don't know. But unless you find it, we're stuck for 20,000 bucks. Holy smokes. Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag for each of the 50 states. New Mexico's flag is an ancient Zia sun symbol, a red circle on a field of yellow, radiating from four points, which we might indicate as north, east, south, and west, are four parallel lines. Four was a sacred number of Zia, the number most often used by the giver of all good gifts. The earth had four main directions, each with its own gifts. The year had four seasons, each with a different offering for mankind. The day had four phases, sunrise, noontime, evening, and night. Life had its four divisions, childhood, youth, manhood, and old age. Everything in life and nature was bound together in a circle, the circle of life and love, without beginning and without end. And in this great brotherhood of all things, man had four obligations. He must develop a strong body, a clear mind, and a pure spirit. Fourth, and most sacred, he must fear it to the welfare of his people. From this simple symbol, the Zia Sun, we read the legend of a wonderful philosophy. The flag's colors of flaming red and golden orange represent the banners of Ferdinand and Isabella, which were carried by Columbus across the Atlantic. New Mexico's state flag, the flag of the 47th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 19, 1925. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Michael Meany Mirage Matter. Talking to George Reed and learning that there was considerable doubt in his mind concerning the origin of the ambergris Mike Meany had insured with Reed's company, I called WCO and the agent who had issued the policy to come down to the hotel. 
He was as shocked and surprised as I'd been. Johnny, I, I just can't believe it. Yeah, well, it's true. At least according to a man who studied the habits of sperm whales for years. Oh. And those kind of whales never come into the Gulf? No, not according to him. What if ambergris isn't ambergris, what is it? W.C., your guess is as good as mine. But whatever it is, it isn't worth $20,000. No, guess not. Johnny? Yeah? You don't think Mr. Meany's trying to pull a fast one, do you? Trying to defraud the company? Yeah. Oh, no, I, I doubt it. He has all the money he'll need for a while. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, tell me, W.C., did Meany have the ambergris analyzed before he asked you to insure it? Matter of fact, he did. Even showed me a letter which said that the stuff was ambergris. You remember who made the analysis for him? A chemist over in Biloxi. Don't recall his name offhand, but he signed that letter he gave Mr. Meany. Ah, uh-huh. okay. First thing in the morning, we'll take another trip out to Meany's place. Good. In the meantime, don't mention any of this to anyone, will no, you? No, 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 I won't. Jerry? Yeah? I should have checked on that chemist, shouldn't I? And, uh, and, and I shouldn't have been so anxious to take Mr. Meany's word. Well, we all make mistakes. Not big ones. Not big ones like this. Johnny, we just got to find that stuff. Because if we don't, we'll never know if it was ambergris or not. Will we? No, W.C., we won't. I felt sorry for Owen. I knew as well as he did that the company might recall his franchise unless we could prove it was ambergris that had been insured. And at the moment, I was quite sure we couldn't do that. The next morning, the coffee shop was crowded, so I started up toward the center of town, looking for another place to have breakfast. I was about four or five blocks from the hotel when I heard someone calling me. Mr. Dollar! Johnny! Hmm? Oh! Oh, yeah. Good morning, Jane. Good morning yourself. Well, well, what are you doing in town so bright and early? I'm going on a shopping spree. Oh? A girl can't get married in just any old thing, you know? I guess she can't. Oh, oh, well, who's the lucky guy? Well, who do you think? Billy Fisher? I certainly wouldn't marry anyone else. Well, uh, Jane, it's none of my business, but uh, I heard... You heard that my father is dead set against Billy, didn't you? Yeah, something like that. Well, he is. But there isn't much he can do about it. I'm over 18. Besides, he's going to change his mind about Billy. I hope so. Mm. He's going to be real sorry he ever treats Billy the way he has. Uh, Jane, look, I haven't had breakfast yet. How about joining me for a cup of coffee? Oh, I'd love to. Where'll we go? Oh, how about over there? The all-night cafe. All right. Oh, no, I mean, I... Do you know what time it is, Mr. Dollar? Mm, just ten after nine. Why? Well, I just remembered something important. I'll see you later here. Hmm. Funny. What is it? I crossed the street and entered the all-night cafe. Behind the counter, wearing a white T-shirt, apron, and a Valentino-type hairdo, was a man about 23 years old. Morning. What'll it be? Ham and eggs and coffee. I want them eggs. Over easy. Okay? It's okay with me. I ain't eating them. Two and a half nice with pigs. You want your coffee now? Yeah, please. Um, do you happen to know a man named Mike Meany? I should. He's my uncle. Oh, well, then you must be T.J. That's right. Yeah, uh, how come you know me? I was talking to your uncle yesterday. My name's Dollar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he told me if you come around, I should tell you anything you want to know. Well, what happened at the depot that afternoon, T.J.? Didn't he already tell you that? I'd like to hear your side of it. Well, ain't much to tell. I was sitting there waiting to put that box in the 303, and this here gal drove up. Uh-huh. What happened then? Man, she gave me just about the biggest come on I ever did get. So you left the freight platform and crossed the road to talk to her. Well, shoot, Mr. Dollar. I didn't see nothing wrong in doing that. There wasn't nobody around. Oh, there must have been. Yeah. Yeah, I reckon so, but I sure didn't see you. T.J., did that girl tell you her name? Yeah. What is it? Betty Lou Miller. Betty Lou Miller. Yeah. Now, look, mister, I'm busy. No, no, wait. Have you seen her since then? Well, sure. When was that? Well, just now, out in the street. She's a girl you was talking to. I finished my ham and eggs and walked back to the hotel. Owen was waiting for me, but before we drove to Mike Meany's house, we made a stop at the railroad depot. The agent remembered everything that had happened that afternoon, the afternoon the ambergris had been stolen, including the name of the woman who had purchased the Pullman ticket to Memphis at the time of the theft. After thanking Sam for his help, we went on to the Meany place. Come on in. Sit yourself down. Thank you, Mr. Meany. Dollar. 
Dollar, you find my amber grist here? No, sir. Yeah. But I think I know who has it. Who do you mean? You mean you know who stole it from the depot? I think so, Mr. Meany. I'm not sure. Well, boy, boy, you just let me have their name. Yes, sir, I'll get the sheriff out here and see their foot under the jail. Now, you come on. Tell me, who did it? No, sir, I'm sorry. I'll tell you when I'm sure and not before. What? Well, when's that going to be? Depends. Depends on what? Whether you'll help me or not. <laughs> Why, well, you ignorant, stupid Yankee. You know good and well, boy. I'll help you. Yes, sir. No, no, what? What do you want me to do? Give Owen here the letter you received from the chemist that analyzed the emigrants. Is that all? That's all for now. Uh, but, boy, boy, you dollar. Where do you think you're going? To see a lady, Mr. Meany. Oh, and I'll call you as soon as I'm sure. Right. Good luck, Johnny. In Owen's car, I drove down the beach to Mrs. Harvey's boarding house. Billy Fisher was out with the boat, so I had plenty of time to tell her what I knew. It's all my fault, Mr. Dollar. I planned the whole thing and put Billy up to it. And bought the Pullman ticket? Yes. I still have it. Been meaning to turn it in for the money, but just haven't had a chance to get down to the depot. Tell me, Mrs. Harvey, how did you know that T.J. would leave the ambergris when he did? Oh, everybody around here knows T.J.'s weakness for girls. One that to me hasn't been locked up long ago. Yeah. Well, it was a beautiful job. You timed it just like a professional. <laughs> I thank you for the compliment. Where was Billy? In the woods on the other side of the railroad track. Uh. He waited till Jane got T.J. all mixed up. Then he scooted across, got the ambergris, and ran back into the tree. And Jane picked him up after leaving the depot? Yes, sir. You care for a cup of coffee, Mr. Dollar? No, no, thanks for serving. You look so downhearted. <sighs> well, I, I guess that's part of my job, too. What did Billy do with the ambergris? I sent it on to Atlanta. A man there going to sell it for him. Oh, I see. My, you sure look like you lost your best friend. Yeah, well, I, um, I ran into Jane this morning. She was going shopping for her trousseau. Yes, I know. Mrs. Harvey, if it turns out that that isn't Ambergris... Oh, they'll still get married no matter what, Mr. Dollar. If not now, then don't so Dollar! Dollar! You Yankee schemer! What? Where are you at? What on earth? Well, that sounds like Mr. Owen. And my friend, Mr. Meany. Dollar! Just what you trying to put. I tried to keep him from coming over here, Mr. Dollar, but I just couldn't handle him at all. All right, Dollar. It's a long way from being all right. Just what do you want here, Mr. Fat Mike Meany? What do I want, why, woman? I want to arrest you and that dirty, that backbiting, Billy Fisher and his girl for stealing my amber. Amber. Amber grease, that's what I want. Hush. I want to see you in jail. Jail? Don't be ridiculous. Ridiculous? Why, well, woman? That's uh... what I said. Now, if you don't get off my property... Yeah, but you, woman, you stole it. How do you know I stole anything? I know because this here worm of an insurance agent wouldn't have a customer left on the beach unless he told me. Well, he told you wrong. Billy took that amber no. But it belonged to him all the time. Why, well, well, woman, that's a lie. Ain't you... that right, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, it sure is. At least it is if it was ambergris. It's ambergris right enough. On. Well, I <clears throat> I called that chemist, but he quit his job a couple of days ago. Couldn't find no record he made of it. Don't need no record. It's ambergris, and it's mine. It's Billy. Mine. You think it's yours, you're seeing a mirage. Tell him, Mr. Dollar. Dollar, if this is some kind of a low-down yank, he trick. It's no trick, Mr. Meany. Mrs. Harvey showed me the contract you have with Bill. Well, what's that got to do with him stealing the ambergris? Just this. Yes. The contract states that all fish and fish products and byproducts caught or sane while using your boat belong to you. That's right. Exactly right, sir. So, the ambergris doesn't. What? No, sir. Ambergris comes from a whale. And the whale is not a fish. It's a mammal. Dollar, now, Dollar, you boy, no, no, wait a minute. Well, doggone. Doggone. They say that young love can work miracles, and I guess it must be true, because later that day, a huge sperm whale was sighted about three miles offshore near the Cat Island Channel. Proving, as I've always said, you can't figure whales any more than you can people. Expense account total, including hotel, bill, and transportation back to Hartford... 
$420.10. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the wayward truck matter. And I'll leave you to figure that one out for yourself. But join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, G. Stanley Jones, Junius Matthews, Gil Stratton, Dick Crenna, and John Daner. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ted Orloff here. Orloff? Los Angeles? That's right. Try Western Indemnity Company. Well, hi, Ted. Look, are you free to come out here in a hurry? What's up? A wayward truck. A wayward? That's right, truck. Lost, straight, or stolen? Well, that's what I hope you can find out. It's a big one. Insured for nearly 20000 That is a big one. And aboard it, when it disappeared, was the driver. Insured? For 10000 And a cargo of copper tubing worth 9500 Also insured. Holy. Ted, I'll grab the next plane. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-Western Indemnity Company, Los Angeles office. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wayward truck matter. Expense account item one, $194.65, airfare and incidentals, Hartford, Los Angeles, California. When my plane set down at the International Airport shortly after 9 a.m., Ted Orloff was waiting for me. He led me on out to the parking lot. Here we are, Johnny. This car right here. All right. Go on. Hop in. Okay. You reserve a hotel room for me in town, Ted? Huh? Why? Well, after all, I've been sitting up on a plane all night and wouldn't mind a chance to shower and slick the whiskers off my pussy. Change clothes. Don't want to take the time. That's why I'm glad you could make it out here right away. See, this thing only happened Wednesday night. Well, just what did happen and who suffered the loss? And how about stopping somewhere so I can grab some breakfast, huh? Sure. Find a place along the way. Like I told you, Johnny, a truck loaded with $9,500 worth of copper tubing has disappeared. What kind of tubing? The kind they use a lot of in building airplanes, that sort of thing. Go on. It was shipped from Marlowe Copper Products over in East Los Angeles. That's where we're heading. Marlowe's a big jobber, distributor. Okay, so what happened? Well, late Wednesday night, a driver by the name of Jackie McAllen was scheduled to haul this order of tubing over to the Belden Aircraft Corporation over in Victorville. That's about 100 miles east of here, out in the desert. Yeah, I know. So? Well, the truckers usually drive that route at night, not only because of lighter traffic, but to avoid the heat during the daytime. Brother, you can say that again. Yeah. Well, anyhow, right after midnight Wednesday, 12.05 to be exact, Jackie signed out of the Marlowe warehouse with his load of copper tubing. Yesterday morning, Friday, Belden Aircraft was screaming for it, wanting to know why it hadn't been delivered as promised. Just disappeared? Just disappeared. Hijacked, obviously. And the driver? Any word of him? Nothing. Well, what kind of a market is there for stuff like that out here? Plenty of market for it. 
Not only because it's expensive, but it's hard to get, too. Especially for some of the new little companies that have sprung up around Palmdale and Lancaster out that way. Yeah, didn't Lockheed just build a plant out there? Lockheed, Belden, a lot of the big ones. And they subcontract work to the little boys. That's why nearly $10,000 worth of copper tubing would be worth its weight in gold to those little plants. Well, then it's a wonder there isn't more of this kind of hijacking, if that's what it is. What do you know about the driver of that truck? Jackie McAllen is as honest as a day is long. Yeah, who says? His employer, and he should know. Jackie's been driving for Marlowe Copper Products for years. They trust that boy with a load of pure gold. Yeah. Yeah. What's that mean? Yeah. Man might have some trouble selling off a load of pure gold. Huh? But if what you say is true about the demand for copper tubing in this area... Oh, now, wait a minute. Well, every man's supposed to have his price, you know, Chip. Look, Johnny, I see what you're driving at, all right. But not Jackie McCaffrey. You sure? 10000 is a lot of money. Wouldn't be worth 10000 sold undercover. Jackie would certainly know where to sell it, though, wouldn't he? Johnny... And why hasn't he showed up? I'll tell you why. Because he's probably been killed. <laughs> Item two, a dollar seventy-five breakfast for me and a cup of coffee for Ted Orloff on the way into Marlowe Copper Products in East Los Angeles. I was amazed at the way this industrial area has grown in the past few years. The Marlowe operation turned out to consist of a small office and a couple of warehouses. Marlowe himself was a tall, lean man of about fifty, very much on the ball. Yes, sir, Mister Dollar. It's as simple as that. Now, Willie here is the night watchman. How do, sir? Hi, Willie. According to Willie's clock and the shipping order in the manifest, Jackie McCallion signed his load out at exactly 12.05. And that's the last we've seen of either of them. He took off a loan with a load worth $10,000? 9500 yes. Well, isn't that taking quite a chance? Well, he's done it many times. Mr. Marlowe, how much does this Jackie earn a week? Well, that would depend. Anywhere from 100 and... Oh, now, wait a minute. If you're thinking what I think you are, you're wrong, Dollar. Dead wrong. Just as I said, Johnny. Sure, why? I'd trust Jackie with my own life. And believe me, whoever's done him in, well, he's going to have to deal with me. I'll see him hang. Well, what makes you so sure he's been done in? Well, it's the only thing that could have happened to make him give up a shipment of goods. A hijacker would have to kill him. And whoever did this to Jackie... Tell me, do you think there's any possibility of his having been approached beforehand by hijackers... Perhaps threatened into turning the shipment over to them? No, not a chance. He would have told me of anything like that immediately. If he had time, maybe. Who's working on the case now, Mr. Marlowe? The L.A. Police Department and the Sheriff's Department of every county in Southern California. Are all your trucks like those two I see out the window there? Jackie's was. We got four of those big singles. Did have. Now it's three. And three big tractor trailer rigs. Mm-hmm. A truck like one of those is a pretty big hunk of stuff to just disappear. Willie. Uh, yes, sir. Were you on duty Wednesday? Yes, sir, I was. Did you notice anything unusual about Jackie that night? Why, no, sir, not that I noticed. He came to pick up his truck alone, huh? I didn't see nobody else with him. Well, uh, did he look worried, anything like that? Well, not that I could see, no, sir. And he didn't say anything that might have indicated things weren't as they should be? Not that I heard, no, sir. Just exactly what did he do? What the driver always does, come in, signed in, signed up the manifest, putting down the time, and then drove off with his truck, like oh, Nothing unusual at all? Not that I saw, no, sir. Mr. Marlowe, where did Jackie live? Somewhere over on West 3rd Street. He lived alone. Naturally, the police looked for him there first thing. May I have that address, please? I'll have my secretary get it for you. You, uh, you all through with me, boss? Yes, Willie. If you're going to work tonight, you better get some sleep going. Yes, sir. Thank you. Right. And believe me, nothing's going to happen to anything this time. If I were you, Mr. Marlowe, I think I'd have more than that for a night watchman in a place like this. Just what were you thinking of, Mr. Dollar? Jackie's address, I mean. <sighs> Look, if the police and sheriff's offices haven't been able to turn up anything, well, in spite of what you said, there's always the possibility of collusion in a case like this. Between, between Jackie and whoever stole that truck? Oh, no, sir. There's always the possibility, voluntary or otherwise, if Jackie was in with the hijackers, even against his will... I, I wouldn't believe but it. But it's a possibility, whether you want to believe it or not. For one thing, how would the hijackers know when and how the shipment was to be made? From any one of a number of sources. The man who supervised the loading here, for instance. Oh, Red Kingsley, or almost anybody in the place, or just as easily anyone over at Belden Aviation in Victorville. Belden would know exact time of departure from this warehouse? Oh, well, no. Close indeed. timing in a hijack operation is usually pretty important. But they knew the stuff was due at their plant early Friday morning. They've been hollering for it ever since. I'll lay my money on the tip-off coming from this end. Now, 
Has the route between here and Victorville been thoroughly gone over? By the police. And they found no sign of either the truck or this fellow Jack? That's right. The truck, of course, could be disguised. New coat of paint, that sort of thing, often done. But no body, alive or otherwise? No. So how do you plan to proceed? Well, if Jackie was forced to participate... And I'm sure he wasn't. Then I don't know. Let me have that address, huh? Frankly, I didn't have the least idea what I was looking for. But I couldn't just stand around, so I borrowed a company car with a name and a number plastered all over the side and drove to the West 3rd Street address, hoping I'd have no trouble persuading the manager to let me in. Manager? Not in that old ramshackle frame house. The front door was wide open. And the mailbox had the number four opposite Jackie's name. That meant upstairs. As I reached the second floor, I could see that the door of number four was slightly ajar. And I could hear somebody moving about inside, opening closets and drawers. Quietly, I slipped close to the door. Inside, his back toward me, was a big, broad-shouldered brute, hastily emptying one of the bureau drawers. He was dressed in dirty work pants and wore a heavy, tattered blue sweater. Hey, what... Maybe you better let me ask the questions, huh? Oh, yeah? Now, look, buddy. What are you doing here? What are you putting into those handbags? None of your business. Now, you get out of here. Not until I find out what you're up to. I said get out. Didn't you hear me? Oh, take it easy, please. Oh, yeah? You want to play that way, huh? That's right. Brother, that was a big mistake. Oh, you asked for it. You... Oh, no, you don't. Oh. All right. Now, start talking. What were you doing here in Jackie's room? Well, what was I doing here? Hey, look. Who do you think you are? The law or something barging in here like this? That's right. Who are you? I said who are you? I'm Vic McCallion. What? That's right. Jackie McCallion. Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. New Jersey's flag was created at the direction of George Washington. In 1779, General Washington directed that the New Jersey Continental Regiments wear coats of dark blue with buff colored facing. This was done as a tribute to the former ruler of these colonies, the Dutch whose national colors were buff and blue. Later, he instructed that the field on the flag of New Jersey should be the same buff color, and the state coat of arms in blue be placed upon it. The state's motto, reflecting the aspirations of all who came to these shores, is also inscribed on the flag. Liberty and prosperity. This flag was displayed proudly before the combined American and French armies at the surrender of Cornwallis's army at Yorktown. New Jersey state flag, the flag of the third state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 26, 1896. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the wayward truck matter. Missing. A $20,000 truck from the Marlowe Copper Products Company of East Los Angeles. Also missing. It's cargo of copper tubing insured for $9,500. Also missing, also insured, the driver, one Jackie McCallion. And when I found a big, ugly-looking character going through Jackie's furnished room, I jumped him. And who does it turn out to be? That's right, Jackie McCallion. Boy, I'll say this, buddy. You, you sure handy with your dukes for a skinny guy. Hey, who are you, anyway? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. And look, I'm I'm sorry I must help you. Uh, insurance what? Well, I came here to find out what happened to you and that truckload of copper tubing that never got to build an aviation over in Victorville. What are you talking about? Of course it didn't. Of course not. Well, why? <laughs> because the shipment was called off, that's why. What? Well, sure. It was supposed to go out Wednesday night, right after midnight. And it did. At least it left the warehouse. Oh, that's where you're wrong. Because me and Betsy, we was going to take it. Betsy? Yeah, Betsy. You know, my truck... Only the order got canceled out. Who says so? The office. Who at the office? Well, how shall I know? All I know is I was here in my room getting ready to go over and pick up Betsy and the tubing. And the phone rung and a girl from the office says the shipment is canceled out. What girl? Do you know? I don't know. 
Some girl says she was in the office or so. You know, one of the girls, like, like they always giving out the orders, you know. And uh, she told me the boss says on account of there ain't no more trips for me this week, I can start my vacation right away instead of next week. But you don't know which girl in the office told you that. I told you. I don't know. I told her, tell Mr. Marlowe thanks, that's all. Why? D didn't she tell him? Where have you been since Wednesday night? Well, I'm down in San Diego, staying at my sister's and doing some yellowtail fishing while I was there. <laughs> you know, out around San Clemente Island. Boy, they pulling in the big ones. Yeah, I'm sure wait, they are. Well, there I'm was about... one guy on our party boat that... Hey, wait a minute. Well, what do you mean the shipment went out? Just that. On schedule. A little after midnight. What that girl told me... And it hasn't been heard of since. You... You mean it went out in my truck? In Betsy? Who took it? According to everything we know... You? Oh, no, sir. By midnight Wednesday, I was halfway to San Diego in my car. Look, you ask my sister down there. I got there before 1 a.m. Call her up and ask her. Go ahead, call her. You're sure of that? Oh, well, sure, I'm sure. And if some dirty guy took my Betsy out, I'll kill him. Don't nobody ride Betsy but me. Well, what were you doing when I came in here? Packing those bags in such a hurry. What for? <laughs> my vacation. What's the matter? Don't you hear good? Hey, well, look, mister... If somebody took my truck out... Okay, and... Jackie, okay, calm down and come along with me. Where? We're going back to uh, Marlowe Copper Products to talk with a couple of people. Maybe to a showdown. Jackie? <laughs> with a name like that, I'd pictured a slim, wiry little fellow, not this big gorilla. And from what he'd said and what he told me on the way back to the Marlowe warehouse, I was convinced he was telling the truth about his whereabouts the night of the robbery. But then... Who could possibly have been a close enough double for Jackie to fool the watchman? Or had the watchman been trying to fool me and the police? And why? Or could Marlowe himself have somehow contrived to... But again, why? And if Marlowe was up to something, well, he'd have been smart enough to put or at least keep Jackie out of the way. Well, Mr. Dollar, did you find... Jackie! Hi, <laughs> Hi, boss. Hey, hey, what's going on around Jackie, here? thank heaven, boy, you're all right. Oh, sure I'm all right. You thought you'd been killed or something. Oh, me? Killed? <laughs> Where'd you find him, Dollar? Where's the truck? Hey, boss, that's what I've been trying to find out. Only all this guy here does is ask me questions. Well, the important thing is you're all right. I didn't tell you this before, Dollar, but Jackie's as much a part of this business as I am. Ah, oh, come on, Ah, uh, you started out with me in the beginning when I didn't have a penny to my name. Worked seven days a week, night and day, helping me build up this business. And you've kept him just a truck driver? What do you mean, just kept me a truck driver? That's the way I like it. Oh. Yeah, even the big retirement he made for me. I don't want that. I just want to keep on driving the truck, just like I am. And maybe go fishing now and then. That's what I like, and I'm happy. Thank God you're still all right. Hey, but what about Bessie? Yes, Dollar, what about the truck? Any ideas, any leads? Mr. Marlowe, I want to talk to that night watchman of yours again. Oh, will he? That's right. Let's just hope he hasn't skipped town. Skipped town? Would you Dollar, see if you can locate him and get him down here? Well, of course. Do you think he was involved in the hijack operation? Well, let's get him in here, if we can, and we'll see. Something had just come back to me. Something pretty damning insofar as Willie was concerned. It was the way he had answered my questions when I talked to him before. Was there anything unusual about Jackie when he came to pick up the truck? Well, not that he noticed, he said. Had Jackie picked up the truck alone? Well, he hadn't seen anybody with him. What had Jackie said? He hadn't heard anything. Not one really positive answer in the lot. Or to the other questions I'd asked him. Much to my surprise, Marlowe's phone call brought assurances from Willie that he'd come over to the plant right away. And I... I told him I'd get somebody else to fill in for him tonight because of the sleep he's having to miss. Yeah, well, tell me this. Yeah. Do your watchmen carry a time clock? That's right. There are punch key boxes located in a dozen or so spots all over the warehouse and one in this office. Ah, uh -huh. they register on a paper dial on the time clock, Yeah, right? that's right. That way there's a record of what time he reaches every station on his nightly round. Would you get me that record for Wednesday night, please? Well, of course. And while you're at it, I'd like a copy of the shipping order and the manifest for that truckload of copper tubing. I'll have my secretary get them for you. By the time his secretary dug the punch clock record out of the files, old Willie arrived, looking somewhat the worse from lack of sleep, but apparently willing to cooperate in any way he could. I took him out to the watchman's booth, which was just inside the warehouse gate. Yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. This here's my own private office every night. And this is where you were when Jackie McCannion came to pick up his truck Wednesday night, huh? Well, now, where else would I be? 
Well, now, that answer is just as definite as the ones you gave me before, Willie, and it won't do. Why? I asked you if Jackie said anything that night that might have made you suspicious. And I told you. Not that I heard. No, sir. Well, did you talk with him at all? Well, no. No reason to. There were just the two of you here in the middle of the night. Yes, sir. And you didn't even say hi to each other? Well, no. No reason. Driver comes around to pick up a shipment. He... Well, all he has to do is sign up the manifest the time he leaves. And... You knew what time he was to be here, didn't you? Sure. I mean, yes, sir. It was right on the shipping order. But you didn't see him. You didn't see him pick up the shipping order or sign the manifest or drive out of here with his truck. Knowing he was coming, you left the gate open for him. Or knowing somebody was coming. That's against the rules, mister, leaving the gate. You weren't here when that truck went out. I didn't say that. No, no, so far you haven't said anything. You've just given a lot of evasive answers to all my questions. All right, all right. Now, if you were here, you were partner to the hijacking operation. No, sir. You'd have had to be. Because Jackie McCallion didn't pick up his truck that night, as you'd have us believe. If you were here at the gate, that is. And that's something we'll find out right now. Here. Jay, that's out of my time clock. That's right. And it's dated the night of May 22nd and 23rd. Well, that's the night? Yes. Now, where's Station 1? Well, that, uh, that's right there on the gate there. And, and, and that's the key I use to punch my time clock. Every single night, right on schedule. And I don't know what you're getting at, Joe. All right, all right. Just listen to me and answer my questions. Station number one was punched at 11.41. If that's what it says, that's what it was. Now, where's number two? Well? Uh, look, I don't where like Where is wait. number two? It's a big double doors back in the warehouse on the right. But now you look at 1147. Here. You must walk pretty slowly. Well, of course I do. I look around. I make sure that everything's all right. Okay. Now, where's number five? Come on, number five. On the back gate, way around the other side of the warehouse. Yeah. A good quarter of a mile from here. And according to this time clock record, that's where you were at exactly 1204 that night. And, brother, I'd like to see you do a quarter of a mile around these buildings in less than a minute to get back here at exactly 12.05 when you claim Jackie signed out that truck. Well? You're right, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Which way am I right? I... I wasn't here. I... I left the gate open for him. Like I often done when I wouldn't be right there for a night shipment. Like you often did? Don't you see? Nothing like this ever happened before. And when I seen his name on the manifest, I know that You he... weren't here when the truck went out, so you don't know a thing. I mean, I thought Jackie took it because I left the catch on the main gate so it looked like it was locked. You ever done that before? Well, not for Jackie. He was always too close to the boss. Well, he and the yeah, boss... Yeah, yeah, I know all about that. But I have for the other boy. Yeah. Yeah, you've left this whole place wide open for anybody who wanted to come in and take anything he could lay his hands on. And this time it was a $20,000 truck with a $10,000 cargo. Willie, you're in trouble. Plenty. I questioned him further and got nothing more than a few tears and a plea for mercy, and then I turned him over to Marlowe. Willie was his problem now. But my own was still far from solved. I wasn't any closer to the missing truck and its cargo than I'd been when I arrived. Expense account item three, 220, lunch for Jackie McCallion and myself at a lunchroom around the corner. We were on our second cup of coffee. Good boy, you know, that was a good donut. <sighs> oh, sir, Mr. Dollar. And the more I think about it, the more I say that outside of them pretty girls in that boss's office, the only ones to be sure what time that shipment was to go out was Willie and, and Red Kingsley. Kingsley? That's his car I use. Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. He's in charge of all the shipping. Well, how much do you know about him? Well, I, I don't know. After all, you know, he, he's kind of over me. I thought your only real boss was Mr. Marlowe. Well, he is. You just bet he is. And and he's the best friend I ever had, too. But if I don't keep my place around the plant, you know, keep subordinating to the guys that are forming and stuff, what do you think would happen to the morale around the plant? Well, tell me about Red anyway. Dollar, well, he... Dollar, Mr. Oh, Dollar. Mr. Marlowe. I just got a call from the sheriff's substation in Victorville. Yes? They picked up some of that shipment of copper tubing. You see, we put a stamp on every piece. Then whoever hijacked it is already getting rid of it. Yes, but so far nobody's admitting where they got it. 
It's at Air Metals Company and Stress Products Incorporated, both near Victorville. You want to check on it? Use Kingsley's car again. Right. Hey, hey, you want me to show you the route? Okay, Mr. Warren. Sure, Jackie, go to it. And believe me, we went. I don't know whether the police along the route have been alerted to let us by or not, but we earned more than one speeding ticket before we hit the cutoff around Victorville. The cutoff that would take us on past Edwards Air Force Base where the plants we were looking for were located. All along the way, Jackie had carefully scrutinized every truck we passed, going in either direction. Uh, uh, no, no. Same make and model, but she ain't Betsy. Oh, Jackie, don't you realize that truck of yours is no doubt thoroughly disguised by now? Uh, you think a father couldn't tell his own little baby no matter how disguised it was? Maybe, but a truck. Yeah, now, now look at that one up ahead. See the, the one we're pulling up on? Oh, it's the same make and model, only this one is painted green. Yeah. Want me to slow up as we pass it? No, nah, she ain't, Betsy. Even from here, I could tell. Fred! Hey! What did he say? Well, I didn't quite... Hey, wait a minute. That's Betsy. You sure? That paint job looks pretty oh, that's old. That's Betsy. I know by her sound. You stop and block her off. Hey, Red. That's what he shouted. And this is Red Kingsley's car with a company name all over it. Yeah, that's why he thought we was red when we passed him. Sure, and look, look, he's catching up on us. Well, he sure knows we ain't red by now. Hey, look out. He's going to pile into us. He's going to ram us. Holy, hang on. Keep slapping you on the push this way. But come on. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. No, All right? I'm, I'm okay. Hey, your, your pal's up the road with that other truck. That's huh? the sheriff's car. Up up there where a couple of thousand miles of copper pipe spread all over the countryside. Oh, yeah. I edged him off the highway and he flipped over. Well, why did you do that? Why? Well, to hear those cops talk, you'd think I was a hero or something. The guys in the green truck rammed you off the road, didn't they? That's right. Well, when the cops seen that happen, they tried to force the truck off. Mister, that takes something like Clarabelle here. Clarabelle? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I call this tractor-trailer rig of mine. It's not the first time I've given the police a hand. Yeah? They've given a lot of people a hand, those boys who drive the big interstate trucks and trailers. They're a pretty fine bunch to have on the road. Well, I guess it's pretty obvious that Red Kingsley and Marlowe's shipping department was back at a hijacking operation. The two who were aboard the stolen truck turned state's evidence and sang plenty, and the courts will take care of them. Expense account total, including air transportation and incidentals back to Hartford, 50105. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, if you think a sudden case of complete amnesia is any fun, you're wrong. Because it happened to me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Boris Lewis, John Daner, Junius Matthews, Stacey Harris, and Jack Crucian. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking.
It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Crutcher, Mr. Dollar. Lester Crutcher at Continental Insurance Company. Oh, how are you, Mr. Crutcher? Uh, tell me, are you familiar with the Priest Expedition Collection? Priest Expedition? Some of the relics, artifacts, of considerable archaeological import that were excavated from the ruins of the city of Ur in the valley of the Euphrates. What? Findings from the temple erected to the god Baal, which proved of such historical value to students of the ancient Babylonian civilization. You know. Yeah, I certainly don't know. But what about it? We carry some special insurance on that collection. And what's happened to it? Nothing yet. But I think you'd better come over and see me. Right away. Okay, Mr. Crutcher. Why not? Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the loss of memory matter. Ancient Babylonia, Crutcher had said. So on the way down to his office, I stopped off at the library for a good look at the encyclopedia. And I learned that what was once Babylonia is now a part of the country of Iraq, one of the hot spots in the Middle East. Go ahead. Go ahead. There might be some action, even international intrigue. On a map, I found the location of the long-forgotten city of Ur. The confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates River near the Persian Gulf was where it was. Romantic names, all of them. And not too far away, the exotic city of Baghdad. Yes, at long last, a trip to the Middle East. Middle East? Uh, well, that's what the map said, Mr. Crutcher. Near west is more like it, Dollar. Huh? Uh, you must have misunderstood me. The relics from the temple of the god Baal I mentioned are presently in the little town of Lakeview. Lakeview? Yes, right here in Connecticut. <laughs> I guess I did misunderstand. They're owned by a Mr. Alvin Peabody Cartwright, who, uh, I might venture to say, is a crackpot of the First Order, but who happens to have placed a great deal of insurance with us on his life, property, art collection, and so forth. I see. You uh, mentioned a priest's expedition collection. Of rare scrolls and tablets, principally, taken from excavations along the bank of the Euphrates River. Some of them over 4,000 years old, all of them of great historical and archaeological value. Here. This is a relatively unimportant piece that Mr. Cartwright gave to me some years ago. Well, uh, what is it? What does it look like? Well, like a tiny sort of sofa pillow. Only it's made out of dried mud or some... Hey, wait a minute. There are a lot of tiny marks on it. Hieroglyphics, Dollar. Those are a perfect example of the cuneiform writing that was used by the ancients. Oh, what's it say? Has anybody deciphered it? It's a receipt for 24 fat sheep, 12 oxen, and 12 goats that were taken to the temple for sacrifice to the great god Baal. Well, how about that? Does the whole collection consist of stuff like this? Yes, and of priceless scrolls made of papyrus and leather. You've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Oh, yeah, sure. They throw so much light on biblical times. Yeah, they've had a lot of publicity in time and life and so on. Yes. Those in the priest collection cover much of the history of the Canaanites and Phoenicians. And you've insured the collection? It's this way. Mr. Cartwright has decided to sell it to the museum here in Hartford. Has promised them that his stepson, Alfred Hocking, who lives with him, would deliver it to them today. But now he's suddenly worried to death that something will happen to it en route. So? So, to keep him happy, we've issued a $20,000 transit policy. Well, then what's he worried about? Now he demands a guard for it, too. Well, doesn't he trust his stepson, this Alfred? Who knows? Who knows what old Cartwright thinks, whom he trusts? Well, now look... And I... after all, $250 plus whatever expense account you can dream up for a couple of hours' drive in the country. What if his own... Oh? Well, sure, why not? Expense account item two, fifty dollars deposit on a rental car in which I probably headed north and west on Highway 44. The fifty-odd mile drive to Lakeview was easy and pleasant. Finding Cartwright's home was also easy. 
It sat prominently atop a hill on the outskirts of the little town with perhaps two acres of ground around it. All of it looking worth a lot of money, yet rather seedy and run down. Alvin Peabody Carter and himself greeted me at the door. I take it you're Mr. Dollar. That's right. Mr. Uh, Cartwright? Let me see your credentials. Oh, well, yeah, sure. All right, here you are. Uh, yes, all right, you can come in. This way, in my study. Right here. And there, Mr. Dollar, is the box containing the Babylonian relics. That one carton is all that's to be delivered to the museum in Hartford? That's all. Young man, the contents of that sealed carton are worth $21,000, and it's sealed, you understand, so that neither you nor that worthless stepson of mine can get your hands on any part of it. Alfred, this is Mr. Dollar. Alfred Hockey. Hmm? Hi, Dollar. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't see you sitting back there. Yeah. Hey, I... uh, uh, now let me finish this phone call that you interrupted. You still there, Mr. Waring? All right, now. Huh? Yes, he finally got here. Dollar's his name. That's right. Shall Dollar. I uh, sit down? Yeah, sure. Well, just you be sure he identifies himself. Yes, and that he's accompanied by my stupid stepson, whose name's Alfred Hawking. Now, if only one of them appears, or if the seals on the carton are broken, you're not to accept it. Make him bring it back to me in a... No. 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 Call the police. Yes, that's what I said. Call the police. Otherwise, give the money to Mr. Dollar. Not to that half-wit stepson of mine. I don't trust him. Now, they'll leave here shortly, and I... I know it's late, but wearing, just make sure that you're there waiting for them with the money. Goodbye. Mr. Cartwright. Yes, well, what? what? If you're so concerned about it, I can't help wondering why you haven't asked the police to guard this shipment for you. Because I don't trust them. I don't trust them any more than I trust this numbskull Alfred. Thanks. I don't trust anybody. Oh, does that include me? Of course it does. Why do you suppose I'm having both of you take it over there? I'll tell you why, to keep an eye on each other. Now, get yourselves out of here and on the way to Hartford. Just be sure you bring that cash right back here to me tonight. You mean check, don't you? I mean cash. I don't believe in checks. I don't believe in banks. I don't trust them. I've kept all I have in my big safe here in the house for the past 47 years, and I intend to continue keeping it there, where I can watch over it myself. Now, go on, you and this dumb Albert. Get out of here. Dumb, Alfred? I'm not so sure. On the other hand, as we drove back toward Hartford with Alfred at the wheel, he said he knew a backcountry shortcut. I decided he just wasn't as clever as he'd like to be. Hey, hey, take it easy, Al. I'll give it to you straight, Dollar. I'd hoped the old buzzard would let me make this delivery alone. Because believe me, if he had, <laughs> he'd never see one red cent of that 21 grand we're going to pick up. I take it you and your stepfather don't get along too well. <laughs> it's putting it mild. But I'm telling you, boy, that once I figure a way to relieve him of his dough, he'll never see me again. 21,000 bucks. Boy, that would get me so far away from here, I tell you... You, uh, been living with him long? Uh, all my life. The crazy old Scrooge has never let me have any money of my own. And me, I got a right to blow myself, have a little fun as much as anybody. Well, maybe he thinks you ought to work for him. Hey, hey, now, you better slow down, Al. Work, did you say? When he's got more than he'll ever be able to use stashed away in that old safe in the cellar? Why should I have to work? Hey, I said take it easy, Al. Uh, why don't those trucks stay off those back country roads? Oh, now, Al. Why should I work when all I need to do is to get my hands on some of that pile he's got in the safe and I can live like a king? <laughs> he'll never spend it. And he'll never leave it to me when he kicks off. That's why I haven't knocked them off myself, but believe me, Al, been... look, just stop this crate and let me take the wheel. Yeah, why? Oh, with all your ranting and raving, you're all over the road. Sure, okay, okay. Sure, you can drive. Well, stop. Sure, I'll stop. Look out, we'll skip. Let us skip. Look out! <laughs> there was a long long period of deep, dull blackness, without sound, without feeling. And then slowly, hazily, the light came back, but it wasn't clear. Everything seemed very confusing, very, very vague. I was conscious of a terrible throbbing in my head, and then it slowly passed, leaving only a dull ache 
The strange and helpless feeling of not knowing who or what or where I was until the shadow of a man rose from the ground beside me. Slowly took definite form as it wavered for a moment, then stood over me. How about you, boy? Back to the world again? Well? Yeah, you... You really hit that windshield frame. Here, let me help you sit up. I'll lean you up against what's left of the car. Yeah, no. Car? Sure. Yeah, this is the wreck we cracked up in. There you are. Nothing busted. You were just knocked out. Cracked up? Sure. On our way to Hartford. Hartford? Hey. What's the matter with you? I... I don't know. I, I can't seem to re- remember anything. What do you mean? I... Not anything. I, I can't remember. My mind is all blank. Well, you, 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 you know who you are, don't you? No. What? No, and I... My head, it's just... It's... it's look, 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 look. Are you, are you, are you kidding, I'm Fred? Car? Sure, sure. Hartford. To deliver some stuff and collect a big wad of... Uh, you, you're sure you don't remember? I don't remember. Not even who you are? I don't remember. I'm trying to. But it's well, I'll and it's... be... Okay, oh, okay, Lana. Now, listen, listen, listen. Everything's going to be okay. Real okay. You want to know who you are, huh? Yeah. Who I am. Sure, sure you do. And I'll tell you. Your name is Hawking. Alfred Hawking. Alfred? That's right, yeah. You're Alfred Hawking. We were driving along here in the car. See, uh, I was. You were keeping me company. You get it? Yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah, sure, you do. Sure. You see, I have to deliver some stuff in Hartford. It's in this box here in the car. Now you see it? Box. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just came along for the ride. The, the ride to Hartford. See. Oh. Yeah, and after I deliver this stuff and pick up the, uh, I make a little pickup, that is, why, then you and me will part and go our merry way, you see? I, 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 I don't know, I guess. So. Sure you do, sure, sure, sure you do. Yeah, sure I do. You feel better now, huh? Yeah, yeah, much. I, if only my head would clear, if only I could remember something, anything. Look, look, you're going to be okay. Al? Al. I'm Al. That's right. Yeah. But you... I... I can't remember. Huh? Who are you? Me? My name is... Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Yeah. Yeah, remember that. Johnny... Dollar. That's right. Yeah... Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. We sometimes wonder, what is the life of a human being really worth? Not too much? Or maybe a great deal? Does it depend on whose life it is? Whatever the answer, one thing is certain. Fred Hargesheimer, since World War II, has felt that his life is worth quite a lot. Quite a lot of gratitude. During the war in the Pacific, about June of 1943... Lieutenant Hargesheimer had his P-38 fighter plane shot out of the sky. Badly wounded, he bailed out over a tiny island, New Britain. It looked pretty small from where he hit the silk, but he found it much bigger when he hit the ground. It was bigger, and in complete control of the enemy. But Hargesheimer was lucky. After a month of lonely hiding, he was found by a group of friendly natives from the village of Nantambu. They cared for him and successfully hid him from enemy patrols for the next four months at the risk of their own lives. Then Hargesheimer was able to make it back to civilization. For the next 17 years, Fred Hargesheimer thought about those wonderful people of Nantambu. 12,000 miles away in the United States of America, Hargesheimer put a great plan into effect. He made speeches, took up collections, sold jewelry belonging to his family and worked out a way to bring a bit of civilization and happiness to the little village of Nantambu. 
Needless to say, the villagers gave him a spectacular welcome upon his return. Fred Hargesheimer showed his gratitude to the people who had saved his life. But life is worth little without freedom. The right of all men. Everywhere. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Loss of Memory Matters. Amnesia. Sudden, complete amnesia. And all the feeling of utter helplessness that goes with it. The man who was with me told me of the crack-up of our car on the way to a place he called Hartford. Hartford? Not nothing to me. Nor did I recognize anything of the countryside, of the road where we sat waiting, hoping someone would pick us up. Names, places, I remembered nothing. Not even who I was, or who the man with me was. That's right. Dollar. I'm Johnny Dollar. I, uh, I see. And your name is Hawking. Alfred Hawking. Hawking. Yeah. Yeah, you're feeling better, aren't you? Yeah, I, I think so. Well, look in the pocket of your coat. Pocket. Oh, isn't there a bill folder? Yeah, yeah, open it up. Yeah, here's... Yeah, there's a name in it. Sure, see? Alfred P. Hawking. That's right, that's you. And I'm Johnny Dollar. Just remember that and everything will be all right. Ah, why don't some truck come along and pick us up or a car? What, uh, what are we doing out here, Johnny? You, you see this box? Well, I've got orders to deliver it to the museum in Hartford. Museum, huh? What's in it? No, oh, just some old relics. Then I'll collect the money for it and that'll be that. You can be on your merry way, okay? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Sure. But how come I'm going with you, Johnny? Why, uh, you live in Hartford, see? Oh, I see. You didn't even know that. You still don't remember anything. Only what's happened since I woke up here. Look now. Yeah? Why, why, why don't you take me home first, if we can get a ride, that is, and maybe if I rest, I'll feel better. My no, head, no. Maybe my mind will clear up. No, but, no, first the museum. But, Johnny... All right, listen. The crazy old coot I'm delivering this stuff for, uh, well, he phoned ahead that there'd be two of us, see, so you've got to come along to the museum. Museum? Yeah, yeah, the museum, the one in Hartford, like I told you. Oh, yes, uh, But uh, once I get the money for it, I'll take care of you. Yeah, I'll take care of you. Well, you, you've done pretty good as it is, I guess. Sure I have, doll. Al, I mean. I've pulled you out of the wreck and all. Hey, look, here comes a big moving van, and if I know those boys, who will pick us up. Come on, get up on your feet, and we'll flag him down. The helpful driver of the big cross-country truck picked us up and was all for getting me to a hospital before anything else. But my companion, who called himself Johnny Dollar, assured him he'd do it as soon as our mission was accomplished. So the driver agreed to take us directly to the museum Johnny had mentioned. Johnny Dollar. The name had a strangely familiar sound, but I I couldn't remember. Finally, in the city, they told me it was Hartford. We pulled up in front of a large, rather imposing granite building. You sure somebody will still be there waiting to meet you, mister? It's getting pretty late. Don't worry, driver. There'll be somebody, all right. Okay, but you sure you don't want me to wait and take your friend Al to a hospital? Like I told you, the minute we're through here, I'll take care of him. Come on, Al. Sure. Thanks, driver. Uh, yeah, thanks. It's okay, boys. If I couldn't give somebody in trouble a hand, I'd have no business driving this rig. Money. Here's your package. Oh, thanks again. Now, come on, Al. Okay, Johnny. I'll do all the talking, and uh, you just remember who you are. Sure. Let me help you carry that. You you just push the bell button there beside... Well, it's about time. Uh, which of you is Mr. Dollar? Uh, that's me. Hi, Mr. Waring. Uh, here's my credentials. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, then you, uh... Al Hawking. Oh, yes. Uh, just as Mr. Cartwright said on the phone. But... Uh, what happened to you? I had a little car accident on the way. Oh, yes. 
Are you, uh, are you feeling all right, Mr. Hawking? Well, uh, my... Oh, sure, sure. I'm going to take care of him as soon as we leave here. So, if you don't mind, uh, you've got something for me, haven't you? Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, uh -huh. Seals are still intact. Sure are, in spite of the accident. Oh, very well. If you'll step inside, I'll give you the money. Good, good. Come on. Now... I must confess my bewildered mind was somewhat puzzled what happened next. Mr. Waring opened a small wall safe and handed my companion a package. From it, he extracted and counted almost greedily $21,000. He signed a receipt, accepted a receipt for the packet of bills. Then we left the museum and hailed a taxi. Hey, buddy, you know a drive-your-own-car place that's still open? Sure do. Then take us there and, uh... Uh, there's an extra fin for you if you step on it. All right, you are. Johnny, can't the cabbie take me home first? I said I'd take care of you, didn't I? All right, now, don't ask any questions. We haven't got time. Maybe I had lost all memory. Maybe my mind was befuddled, confused. The pain in my head nearly driving me out of whatever sanity I'd retained. Nonetheless, I had a strange feeling that things weren't what they should be. S still, my friend, this Johnny Dollar, who'd saved me from the wrecked car. If only I could remember things from before we cracked up. There was something strange, too, in the way he slowly, painstakingly, signed the application for the drive-your-own car, looking carefully all the while at the license he pulled out of his pocket. Then a few minutes later, we were on the road again, and we were heading, according to the highway signs, out of town and toward a place called Danbury on Route 6. Uh, these rental cars could stand a little souping up. Look, Johnny, I thought you were going to take me home. I am. But you said I live in Hartford. Listen, if I know that stepfather of, my, of yours, the sooner we get out of the state... What? What were you going to say? Nothing, nothing. Now, uh, no, uh, listen... Uh, I gotta get you to a hospital, see? And the best one I know is over the line in New York. You wanna get your memory back, don't you? Yeah, sure. But now look, Al. Huh? What'd you say? <laughs> That's funny. I called you, Al. What's funny about it? Sure you aren't beginning to remember things, huh? How about it? I wish to heaven I could. But... Now, look, Johnny, there's something funny about all this. I may be a bit muddled after that crack-up we were in, but it you seems... You are muddled. That's the reason you're getting crazy ideas, but don't. See? Just quit thinking and relax, so you might do something you'd be sorry for. Yeah. Real sorry. This determination of his to get across the state line. Things were wrong, and I knew it. But I didn't know why. A man's judgment is based on his experience, or his reasoning powers, based on things he's done or that have happened to him, or at the very least on things he's known about in the past. And all of my knowledge of the past was gone from me. Anything I might do or say at this point would probably be wrong. So how could I argue with this, this Johnny Dollar? What's more, he had a gun. I felt it in his pocket when he bumped against me. Perhaps if I had a gun, I could stop him. Demand an explanation. I felt that I should. Why? I didn't know why, but somehow. Johnny? Yeah? Why are you so anxious to get into another state? I told you to get you to a hospital. Now, shut up. Now, listen to me. Don't ask questions. Just leave everything to me. Well, why is driving all this distance, 50 or 60 miles now, better than if you'd taken me to a hospital or doctor back in Hartford? I told you to stop asking questions. Johnny, why do you carry a gun? Why shouldn't I? Don't worry about it. Are you supposed to? Sure, sure. I got a permit, so forget it. Let me see it. Hey, what is this? Later. Now. Later, I say. Then I don't believe you. All right, all right, then here. Look in this card case. I looked in Johnny Donner's card case. His driver's license, business cards that said he was a freelance insurance investigator... And again, something vaguely familiar stirred in my cloudy mind. You find it yet? And then, an identification card with thumbprint and snapshot. And the picture was not of the man beside me. Instinctively, I leaned over to look into the rearview mirror, to look at myself. 
But he pulled the gun from his pocket, and before I could do it, he struck me hard across the head. All right now, Al. We're going to stop. You hear me, Al? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hit me with that gun. That's right. That was a mistake. Because that second blow on the head. Why have we stopped? You'll see. You see, you gave me an idea about this gun. Now, get out. Sure. Why not? Pretty wobbly, huh? All right, now. Look down over the side of the road there. What about it? See that deep ravine down there? Why? Al... That's why. Because you called me Al. And this time you meant it. Yeah. I guess I did. Thanks to that poke on the head. So, you got some of your memory back, huh? But not your strength. No. So before you do... No, put that away. Expense account total so far, $95 even, including doctor bills. Repair bill on rental car is still to come, and strangely enough, old Cartwright is perfectly willing to pay it and any other expenses that may be involved. <laughs> He's a changed man with his chiseling stepson out from underfoot. Also, I'll be required to appear in court against Alfred Hockey, and there'll be expenses involved there, too. Uh, the extra 500 Cartwright insisted I take doesn't go in this account since it came out of his own pocket. <laughs> Not bad for just a couple of wallops on the head, huh? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, it's another case of mistaken identity, but believe me, a completely different affair. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Les Tremaine, Parley Bear, Joseph Kearns, Barney Phillips, Tom Henley, and Shepard Mencken. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... 
Johnny Dollar. Matter up, Johnny. Ah, who's that? McGraw! Oh, as if I didn't know. What's on your mind, Bert? Dollar Mason. Ever hear of her? Her uncle Sylvester Mason. Mm, Mason stealing iron? Yeah, that's the man. Dollar's his favorite niece. About six weeks ago, she disappeared. So? So, yesterday, a body washed up on Newport Beach not too far from her parents' home. Charles? According to her father. And you hold a policy on her? For 25000 double indemnity. Ouch. So, why don't you pay it off? Well, we would have today, except for one thing. Well, what's that? Right after Mason identified the body, a man named Dixon showed up and swore it was the body of his daughter. What? <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Providential Assurance Company, 393 Dewey Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Mason-Dixon mismatch matter. Expense account item one, $1.20, taxi from my apartment at the Providential Building. The walls of Bert McGraw's office are covered with pictures of sporting events. And as I entered, Bert was preparing to hang another one. Oh, Johnny. Well, come in, come in. Uh, you, uh, you ever see this? Uh, who was it? Who? Was well, me, that's who. The day I pitched for the Valdosta Lions. Struck out ten of the cherry pointers that afternoon. Yes, sir. Uh, you win the game for him? Huh? I said, did you win the game for him? Oh. Uh, no. Cheating umpire. <laughs> ah, hey. Well, Johnny boy, you ready to join our little team? I don't know. The body of a girl being found on a beach, Mason identifying it as his daughter, then somebody else showing up. Uh, Henry Dixon. Yeah, and saying the same thing. Can't the authorities identify her? Haven't been able to yet. Neither one of those girls had their fingerprints on record? Nope. Well, what about dental work? Uh, nothing to go on there either. Oh, brother. It's not going to be an easy one, Johnny. How long had the body been in the ocean before it was washed up? Well, they figure about six weeks. You know what that means. Yeah. Hello? Oh, yes, sir. I see. Uh-huh. Well, if it isn't the Mason girl... Yes, sir. Yes, sir, that's right. Well, thanks for calling, Captain. That was Captain Miller of the Newport Police. They find out who she is? No. So if it is the Mason girl, we're going to have to pay out 50000 on the double indemnity clause. You aren't surprised, are you? No, I didn't think she died from a natural cause. But I didn't think it'd be from a gunshot wound, either. What kind of a gunshot wound? A thirty-eight, right through here. Mm. How old did you say the Mason girl was, Bert? Oh, around 20. Dixon girl, too. Both of them pretty, full of life. At least they were. When did the Mason girl disappear? Oh, about six weeks ago. And the Dixon girl? Well, she's been missing about three months. Well, one of them's still alive. I'll try to find her. Bert gave me all the information he had on both the Mason and the Dixon families. I took a cab back to my apartment. That's expense account item two. Item three, $18.10 transportation, Hartford to Newport, Rhode Island. After checking in at the Ogden Hotel, I called Dollar Mason's father, rented a car, and drove out to the Mason home on the beach. I was about to ring the bell when the front door opened. Hi. Well, hi. You must be Johnny Dollar. That's right. Come on in. I'm Joan Mason. Dollar's little sister. Uh Uh-huh. This way, Mr. Dollar. Mother's waiting for you in the den. Your mother? I thought my appointment was with you. Oh, my father's indisposed. Besides, mother's the brains of this family. Of course, if you really want to know about Darla, you ask me. Maybe I will. You better. Mr. Dollar's here, Mother. Thank you, my dear. Come in, please, Mr. Dollar. See you later, Johnny. A dreadful mistake my husband made has upset him so. I thought it best to see you myself. Just what mistake are you referring to, Mrs. Mason? 
Well, we've released a statement, the newspapers. I thought you had heard. No, ma'am, I haven't. You've made a trip over here for nothing, then. Oh? Yes, you see, my husband erred when he identified that body as being our daughter's. It couldn't possibly have been. Well, uh, I know you're glad of that, Mrs. Mason. But what made Mr. Mason change his mind? I haven't changed it, Dollar. George, I, I thought you were going to stay in your room. Never mind. Dollar, any questions you want to ask, I'll try to answer them. Why, why, George Mason, you've been drinking. Only enough to take the bad taste out of my mouth. And you know what put it there. Uh, oh, uh, don't I... look so mixed up, Jenny. I tried going along with you, but I got too weak a stomach. So here I am. I don't know what you're talking about. No. Listen, Dollar. Soon as they found out that girl had been murdered, my wife here decided it couldn't have been Dollar. It isn't Dollar, and you know it. Only thing I know is that you've got a set idea good, proper people don't die nowhere else but in bed. Because this girl died like she did, because she was shot, you tried convincing me she ain't our daughter. Well, I won't hold still for it. That girl's Dollar, no matter what that if crazy you'll Coot Dixon me, says. Mr. Or what Mr. you Dollar? say. Surely. You hear? You hear me, Jenny? Oh. Doggone woman. I get some mad at her. Oh, you, you want a drink, Dollar? No, no thanks. A little early for me. Well, I guess I've had enough, too. Well, Dollar, no matter what way our girl died, she was a good girl. Never gave me a bit of trouble. Never lied. Never ran around like some her age do. Oh, she was a real good girl. Mr. Mason, the police haven't been able to make a positive identification. I know that. Well, would you mind telling me why you're so certain that girl is your daughter? Oh, of course not. First thing, Darla had no reason to run off. She had everything I could give her. Charge accounts all over the place. Everything money could buy. So, she had no reason to leave here like she did. Where was she last seen? At the Newport Yacht Club, at the bar. Younger daughter, Joan, saw Darla talking with a stranger. When she walked out of the club, it was the last anybody ever saw of her. Well, Mr. Mason, do you have a picture of your daughter that I could borrow for a few days? Yeah, I might be able to find you one. What do you want with it? I'm going to try to find her. You what? Darla, you... Or find the Dixon girl. Oh. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Well, you... Might locate Ruth Dixon somewhere. Do you know the Dixons, Mr. Mason? No, I never heard of them before this happened. What about Ruth Dixon? Could Darla have known her? Oh, of course not. Are you sure? I mean, isn't it possible that in a small community like no, this one... No, no, it's not possible. Darla, we're the Masons. Now, maybe that don't mean much to you or to me, but it means an awful lot to my wife. And for the time poor Darla was born, my wife drilled it into work. You understand? No, I'm not sure that I do. Well, Darla never mixed with people she thought were beneath her any more than my wife ever has. I see. You don't believe it. You just ask around. I plan to, Mr. Mason. Mason found a small snapshot of his daughter. I took it and drove back to town. Expense account item four, ten cents, one phone call to Henry Dixon. Twenty minutes later, I walked through the knee-high weeds that surrounded the Dixon home. Standing on the front porch waiting for me was a tall, thin man. Afternoon. Mr. Dollar? Yes, that's right. Well, I'm glad to know you. Sit down. It's such a nice day, I thought we could talk out here on the porch. Fine with me. Oh, uh, Dollar. Yeah? Uh, look, th this whole thing hasn't been easy on my wife. Now, I've spent all day convincing her that I was mistaken that the girl found on the beach isn't our daughter. You really believe that? Oh, I do, and so does my wife. And for the first time in days, she's almost her old self again. Henry? Oh, on the porch, Lucille. Mr. Dollar's here. Oh, my. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Oh, Lucille, this is Mr. Dollar. Oh, pleased to meet you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Dixon. Well, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Just anywhere. Oh, Henry built these chairs himself. I wanted to put them in the house, but Ruth, well, she just wouldn't have it. There. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Dollar. <clears throat> I'm not at all sure why you want to see us. Ruth wasn't insured. 
We never could afford to take out a policy on her. Well, we did once for her college fund. You remember, Henry? Mm, yes, but when I was forced to slow down, we had to cash it in. All except about $1,000, that is. Back in St. Louis, my husband was a school teacher, Mr. Dollar. A fine one. But the doctors made him give it up because of his heart. Oh, I see. Um, how long have you folks lived in Newport? Five years and four months. Mrs. Dixon, I imagine you remember just about everything that happened the day Ruth disappeared, don't you? Oh, my, yes. Well, did your daughter seem to be upset or emotionally disturbed in any way? No more than usual. Well, Ruth was spoiled, Mr. Dollar. Before Henry had to leave his job, we had the money to buy her nice things. Then, when we didn't have it, well, Ruth just never could get used to seeing her friends in their pretty new dresses. That's one of the reasons we moved to Newport, to get away from that crowd. Yes, we hoped she would find some friends on her own... Uh, financial level. Yes, some friends like that. But she... she wouldn't change. Did she know the Mason girl? Or ever talk about her? No... I can't recall that she did. Now, wait a minute, Henry. She did once. Oh, when was that? Oh, about the middle of March. They were having a dance where Ruth worked. When she got home that night, she told me the Mason girl had been there and how nice her hair had looked. Mm, the Mason girl wasn't nearly as pretty. Oh, no. Have you ever seen a picture of Ruth, Mr. Dollar? Uh, well, only the one in the newspapers. Oh, that doesn't look a thing like Ruth. Excuse me. Oh, surely. Mr. Dixon, was Ruth happy with her job? Well, considering how little they pay girls for doing hostess work, she was. Now, here. Here's a real nice picture of her, Mr. Dollar. You just look at this. Mm. Isn't that something? She sure... Mrs. Dixon, where was this taken? Why, where she worked. At the Newport Yacht Club. I borrowed the picture after promising to be careful with it. Then I went back to my hotel. At the desk, I stopped for my key and messages and found one from Captain Miller of the Newport Police. He wanted to see me in his office as soon as possible. It took me about five minutes to get there. Dollar? Yeah, that's right. In the air. I'm Miller, homicide detail. I'm glad you could... Oh, Mr. Oh, Dollar. Huh? Mr. Dollar, what wonderful good news. Now, Jenny, leave the man alone. Well, I, I didn't expect to find you people here, Mrs. Mason. No, no, I'm sure you didn't. And Mr. Mason didn't expect to be here either. Oh, you just wouldn't hold the thought, would you, George? You just wouldn't have faith. Oh, Jenny. You had our girl dead and buried in her grave. Oh, for heaven's sake, never see anything so disgusting, Dollar. But she's not. No, sir. Oh, I'm so thankful, so very Mrs. Very... Mason, you mean you found her? They haven't found her yet, Dollar. As a matter We've of fact... We found proof that she's alive. What kind of proof? A slip. A what? A little sail. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm so excited. Calm down, Jenny, for heaven's sake. I'll what did you down find? When I'm ready to I didn't Mason find it, Mrs. Mason. Well, oh, what, what is it? What is it? A bill from Kennedy's. Things. That's a department store really over in Providence. Oh, why don't you, you shut up, woman? Oh. Captain, oh. what's a bill got to do with Dollar Mason being alive? Just this. All the Masons have a charge account at Kennedy's. So? Yes, yes. So today a bill came to the Mason house addressed to Miss Darla Mason. You hear? You yeah. Hear? Mrs. Mason opened it. Yes. Darla charged a fur wrap in Kennedy's. Oh. When? Just last week. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. We often hear about people shooting the bull or throwing the bull. We often do it ourselves on occasion. But here's a story about a bull that threw the man instead of the other way around. When Air Force veterinarian Captain Tony Kamalocker was stationed in the Azores, 
he was asked by a Portuguese veterinarian to diagnose the wound of a young and promising bull that had been gored by another bull. It came from a long line of famous Corrida bulls and was considered very valuable. But Captain Kamalocker's diagnosis was not favorable. An operation was needed, and there were no facilities for such a thing, just the young captain's bag of surgical instruments, a few strong field hands to hold the animal down, and Mrs. Kamalocker, who acted as nurse. The operating table was a rocky field under a penetrating drizzle of rain. But Captain Tony Kamalocker couldn't be stopped with mere inconveniences. After giving the bull a dose of tranquilizers and a shot of local anesthetic, he proceeded with surgery. Just as the operation was completed, the bull came to life. With a mighty lurch, it leaped to its feet, throwing the field hands aside like sticks, and, for thanks, immediately charged at the surgeon. But Kamalocker escaped over a nearby stone wall. The bull recovered, and its grateful owner renamed it Kamalocker for its debut in the ring, where, Portuguese style, it is against the law to kill the bull. That's how a simple act of kindness brought about new understanding, a step on the road to freedom, the right of all men, everywhere. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Mason-Dixon mismatch matter. After telling me that the Mason girl had used one of her charge accounts just five days before the body was discovered on the beach, Captain Miller produced the original sales slip. Written across the bottom of it was the name Darla Mason. I wish to heaven I could be positive it's really her signature. You mean you think it's a forgery, Captain? Well, I don't think anything yet. Mr. Darla, you believe it's Darla's signature, don't you? Well, I, I haven't anything to compare the signature with, Mrs. Mason. Mrs. Mason, do you happen to have any of your daughter's legal documents at home? Her driver's license or anything else that might contain her signature? No, I'm afraid I don't. You can order a copy from the Department of Motor Vehicles, Captain. Yeah, I will. What do you want it for, Captain? Well, it's just a matter of form, Mr. Mason. We have to be sure. But Darla's mother and me, we are sure. And we're the only ones that count. Well, that's not quite true, Mr. Mason. What? Have you forgotten about the Dixons? Oh. Oh, yeah, I guess I did for a minute. Well, you go ahead. Mrs. Mason and me will be at home. Yes, sir. You'll let us know as soon as you can, Captain. Yes, ma'am, I will. Thank you. Well, Darla, now what? How far is Providence, Captain? About uh, 40 miles. Why? Well, I don't know about that store over there, but where I came from, before a person could charge on an expensive item like a fur wrap, he'd have to produce some identification. Unless. Yeah? Unless the salesperson recognized him. Or her. What do you think? Hmm. It's 310 now. If we hurry, we might have time to do a little shopping. <laughs> made it in an hour and a half. The first salon at Kennedy's is on the second floor, back, away from the escalator. I remember her quite well, Mr. Darla. And you're sure it was Darla Mason? Oh, yes, I know, because I was so surprised to see her. Oh, how's that? <laughs> well, I read the papers, Mr. Darla. I knew she'd uh, been away. Had you ever waited on her before, Miss Trumbull? No, I had not. Do you remember how she was dressed? Mm, well, she had on a hat. Gray felt fitted real close to her head, so you couldn't see any of her hair. And, oh, yes, a navy blue dress, raw silk, I believe, and real decollete. What? Low cut, Captain. Oh. Did you recognize her when she first walked in, or not until she told you her name? Well, I... Oh, you men are so picky. I don't remember everything. I'm sorry. Miss Trimble, I have two snapshots here. In a moment, I want you to tell me which of these two girls is Darla Mason. Well, that won't be hard to do. But first, may I borrow a pair of scissors and a small piece of paper, please? Mm, certainly. Here you are. Thanks. What the devil are you up to, Johnny? Cutting paper hats. What do you think? What? Come over here to the counter. Miss Trimble, if you'll just wait there a second, please. Yes, whatever you say. This had better be good. I think it will be. Now watch. All right. Now I put the snapshots on the counter. 
And on the head of each girl... Johnny! One of my little paper hats. Oh, really? This is ridiculous. Is it? Take a look. But I... Well, I'll be... When did you spot this? Today, at the Dixon house. Miss Trimble. Yes, sir? Would you come over now, please? Yes, sir, All right. Look at the snapshots and tell me which of these ladies bought that fur from you last week. Why, you've covered up their hair. You said she wore a hat, didn't you? Yes, but... but... Which one of them was it, Miss Trimble? Well, I, I'm not sure. Uh-huh. They look so much alike with their hair covered like that. And just not sure. The Mason girl had worn her hair short in the Italian style. Ruth Dixon, who didn't have the money to spend on beauty parlors, had let hers grow long and full. But both girls had similar features, and apparently I was the only one who had noticed this. Or was I? Captain Miller and I went to the credit department where we compared the signature on the sales slip with Darla Mason's original credit application. After that, well, there was little doubt in our minds as to what had happened. It was almost seven when I got back to my hotel, took a shower, and stretched out to do a little thinking. Yeah, hello. Hi. Hi, yourself. Who is it? Oh, come on, Johnny. Who are you expecting? Well... Don't tell me you've forgotten about our date. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, Where shall I meet you, Miss... uh... I'll meet you. Be right up, Johnny boy. I wasn't quite dressed when she began pounding on the door. I tucked my shirt in and opened the door. Hi. Joni. Well, who else? Well, don't look so amazed. Invite me in. Oh, sorry. Come in. That's more like it. You don't mind if I leave the door open, do you? Worried, Johnny? Oh, no, no. It's just that I like lots of air. (laughs) You're cute. So are you for a 17-year-old. 18, but I'm... I'm quite sure you are. Now, uh, Joni, before we go out tonight, would you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? I thought you probably would. Oh, why? Well, I'm sure everyone in Newport knows about Darla charging that for a wrap. Oh, I see. What do you want to ask me, Johnny? It's about the day Darla disappeared. Yes. Well, you said she was in the bar with a stranger, right? That's right. But you and I, we both know that every stranger who enters the yacht club has to sign a guest book. Correct? Well, he's given a temporary card. With the name of the member who invited him to the club also registered in the book. You're very clever, Mr. Darla. Why did you lie to the police and your parents, Joni? Darla's my sister. I thought maybe someday she'd do the same for me. Will you tell me who the stranger was? Or shall I go over to the yacht club and start checking their guest book? I'll tell you. You... Yeah? Would you mind closing that door? Tell me first. His name's Peter Hansen. Who is he? My mother can answer that. Or my father. Who is he, Joni? A tutor. My mother hired him for Darla and me. He moved into our house about three months ago. Of course, he didn't stay long. Where was he from? I don't really know. But I know how you can find out. Yeah? Mother hires all her help from the Castelloni Employment Agency in Providence. If anyone has his home address, they will. I started calling the Castelloni Agency at 8.30 the next morning. Hanson's last known address was in Providence, and half an hour later I was headed toward the highway. It wasn't until I reached the turnpike that I noticed I was being followed by a battered blue sedan. Hanson had moved, but he'd left a forwarding address. And three hours and two addresses later, I turned down a lonely oyster shell road and stopped. Ahead of me, I could see a small beach cottage. And still behind me, the battered blue sedan. You make it real easy for a man to follow you, Mr. Dollar. If I had known it was you, sir, I wouldn't have. I hope you don't mind my tagging along like this. (sighs) Mr. Dixon. No, wait. I know what you're going to say. But let me say this first, Mr. Dollar. I- I've waited around, wondering if it was our girl you would find or or the other one for so long. Well, I just couldn't anymore. I had to do something. You understand that, don't you? Yes, sir, I think I do. Good. Well, then, you go on about your business and I won't bother you. You go on up to that house and I'll wait right here. Go on now. Yes, sir. I wasn't sure who or what I would find in that beach house. But I was sure no amount of talk could persuade Mr. Dixon to leave until I did. I knocked on the door for a good minute before it finally opened. Yeah? Mr. Hanson? Yeah, what is it? My name is Dollar. 
I'm an insurance. Insurance man? <laughs> oh, I thought... Honey, it's just an insurance salesman. Look, Dollar, even if I had the money, I wouldn't buy any insurance from you. You come around too early. You didn't let me finish. Huh? I'm not a salesman. I'm an investigator. Oh. Hey! hey. Oh, give it up, Hans. Nah, no! Honey! Honey! Honey, and... You can't stop me, Hanson. Uh, you want to bet? Yeah. Give me all right. Why did you have to find us? Why? Why did you disappear? You know how much trouble you've caused? I can read. I know. It didn't bother you? Your family not knowing whether you were dead or alive? Not a bit. I'd be happier if they thought I was dead. Oh, darling, you don't mean that. I proved it, didn't I? I'm not sure. Why did you disappear? Because I was bored. Tired and sick of living like my family makes me live. And how's that? Come out here. You see those birds? The seagulls, yeah. Beautiful, aren't they? You know why? All right, why? Because they're free. Because they can live any way they want with no responsibilities, no reputation to worry about. Oh, boy, how I envy them. Mr. Dollar. We're around back, sir. All right, now you tell me something. Sure. How'd you know that wasn't me they found on the beach? Because of that fur wrap you charged at Kennedy's. But how did... I told them to send the bill here. They didn't. It went to your house. Oh, no. Somebody sure goofed. Yeah, Dollar. You sure did. Mr. Dollar, are you all right? I thought... Oh. Mr. Dixon, I... Mr. Dixon? Yes, Dollar. He followed me here, hoping I'd lead him to his daughter. Oh. Gee, Mr. Dixon, I'm... I'm sorry if there's anything I can do. My daughter was fine. Decent. But you... Oh, Mr. Dixon... After what you did to your parents and to us, making us wonder for so long, not knowing whether it was you or, or our daughter who was dead. Believe me, I wish it were you. Like Bert McGraw told me a long time ago, somebody has to handle the rough ones. And for me, this was it. Henry Dixon was in no condition to drive his car, so he rode back with us. And on the way... Well, Darla Mason will never forget the things he said to her. Neither will I. As for Ruth Dixon, who murdered her and why, well, that's up to the Newport police. Expense account total, including hotel bill, car rental, and transportation back to Hartford, $319 exactly. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, I suddenly found out there was more to this case I just finished. More. The really tough part. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Mary Jane Croft, Jeanette Nolan, Gene Tatum, Frank Nelson, Will Wright, Austin Green, and Marvin Miller. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. The bases are loaded and there's nobody out. What? And you're pitching, Johnny boy. Bert McGraw. Yep, right as rhubarb. What's in your mind, Bert? You, and a job you didn't finish. A job I didn't... What are you talking about? The Mason Dick. Well, sure. Ruth Dixon's body was found on Newport Beach. But you didn't find out who killed her, Johnny. I figured that was a job for the police. They want to talk to you about that. And so...
float away. Oh? Yeah, Ruth Dixon was insured with our company. For how much? A thousand dollars. One thousand? You don't expect me to go back to Newport for the commission I'll make off that, do you? Nope. But if you'll go, we'll foot the bill. Oh, how come? Tell you when you get here. Interested? Yeah. Now. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Providential Assurance Company, 393 Dewey Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Dixon murder matter. Expense account item one, a dollar and twenty cents taxi from my apartment to the Providential building. Along the way, I did some thinking. A week ago, a girl's body had been found on Newport Beach. The Masons and the Dixons had each identified it as the body of their missing daughter. I managed to locate the Mason girl. That meant that Ruth Dixon was the girl on the beach. Who had killed Ruth? Well, I didn't figure that was my job. But evidently the branch of Providential did. Why? Well, I hope Bert McGraw would tell me. Johnny, come in, come in. Ah, morning, Bert. Uh, about this Dixon matter, I suppose you're wondering why we're so anxious for you to go back to Newport. Well, I am kind of curious, Bert. Well, I told you, Ruth Dixon was insured with our company. But for only a thousand dollars, you'd save money by paying it off and forgetting it. Maybe. But it isn't that easy. Oh, why not? Because of the Newport police, for one thing. Well, what have they got to do with their insurance? Well, not a thing. But they have got plenty to do with our company and its representatives. And last week, you were one of them. So? So, the Newport police, uh, Captain Lewis of Homicide, to be exact, called here this morning. Who's Lewis? Miller was the man I worked with. Uh, Lewis took over because Miller didn't follow up on you. And he's very unhappy with you, Johnny. I can't imagine why. No? Well, Captain Lewis says you left Newport without giving his office all the information you had on the Mason girl. The Mason girl? What's she got to do with the Dixon investigation? Well, how should I know? Carla Mason didn't even know Ruth Dixon. Lewis says different. But that's beside the point. We can't afford to have any police department in this country feeling the way the Newport boys do about our investigators. Oh, come on now, Bert. It isn't at all that serious. Johnny, we have to have police cooperation. And we can't force them to cooperate, so we try to build up a sufficient amount of goodwill. But, Bert, no, I... No, t- it's too late to apologize. Who's apologize? Captain Lewis chewed out my boss, my boss did it to me, and I have orders to do it to you. Okay, so get it over with. Well, I... I'm almost through. Mm. Except that no matter what it costs us, it's going to be worth it to have goodwill restored. You understand? Sure. And whatever you do in Newport, please keep Captain Lewis informed. Hey, if you stumble onto something that might lead to the Dixon girl's killer, tell Lewis about it. Okay, Bert, whatever you say. Oh, uh, uh, no hard feelings, Johnny. No, 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 everything's just fine. Oh, good boy. Glad to see you understand. For an expense account like the one you're going to get, I can understand the theory of relativity. <laughs> I took a cab back to my apartment. That's item two. Item three, $18.50, transportation to Newport, Rhode Island. After checking into the Ogden Hotel, I called headquarters. Captain Lewis wasn't in, so I left a message asking him to call me. Then I called the girl in question, Darla Mason. Johnny, hi. What are you doing back in Newport? Oh, just winding up a little unfinished business. Nothing to do with me, I hope. No, not a thing. Uh, Darla. Yeah? If you're not busy tonight, uh, why don't you meet me for dinner? Why, Johnny, I'd love to. Fine. You say where? Mm, well, how about the yacht club at eight? Go I can take the cruiser from our dock. And after dinner, we can go for a ride on the bay. Mm, sounds great. See you at eight ten, Johnny. Bye. Bye. 
Expense account item four, fifteen dollars worth of American Beauty roses for Ruth Dixon's mother. I rented a car and drove out to the Dixon home. The moment I stepped into the house, I could smell the heavy, sweet odor of oriental incense. While Mrs. Dixon put the flowers in water, I located the source of the incense. It came from an ornate burner on the mantel in the living room. Behind the burner, draped in black, was a large photograph of Ruth Dixon. And on each side of the photograph were two lighted candles. Oh, Mr. Darlow, these are the most beautiful roses I've ever seen. Well, I, uh, I'm glad you like them, Mrs. Dixon. Oh, yes. Ruth will, too. Beg your pardon? I said Ruth will like them, too. I'll take them to her in the morning. Uh, that is, if you don't mind. Oh, no. No, not at all. Mr. Dollar, I don't know how you feel about such things. But I believe those who have passed on never really leave us. What do you think? Well, I, uh... I haven't given much thought to the subject. But you should. Ruth will appreciate these roses as much or more than she ever would have. Do you believe that? Well, I... Well, I, I didn't know Ruth when she was alive... When she was here, Mrs. Dixon. Oh, that's right. You didn't. Well, she's still here. And if there's any doubt in your mind, why, you just come with me and visit Madame de Salle. Madame de Salle? Yes. She's been such a help and comfort to me these past few days. Well, without her and her teaching, I'd have been completely lost. This Madame de Salle, what is she? She's just an ordinary person, but she has wonderful occult powers. She can see beyond the veil, Mr. Dollar. And she's promised to let me speak to Ruth as soon as the conditions are right. Do you know when that will be? Lucille? In here, Henry. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Dollar. I have to put out these candles. Henry doesn't believe like we do. <coughs> Why? You've been at it again, haven't you, woman? Now, Henry. <laughs> Open the windows. <coughs> Get the smoke and the smell out of... Oh, Mr. Dollar. <coughs> Afternoon, Mr. Dixon. What are you doing back in Newport? He's trying to find the man that caused our girl to pass on. <coughs> oh, she didn't pass on, Lucille. She died. Henry, really? Well, anyway, I wish you luck, Mr. Dollar. I have a hunch I'm going to need it, Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dollar, wouldn't you like to stay to dinner? We aren't having anything fancy. Just left no this <coughs> boiled cabbage head. Oh, my. Now what? Well, I just remembered why I burned that incense. And it wasn't what you thought, Henry Dixon. It was on account of the cabbage. It, it covers the smell. <laughs> That's not the truth, and you know it. Oh, now, Henry. Look at that mantle, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> She's made a regular shrine out of it. Looks like a heathen altar. Henry. Well, it's the truth. And I wouldn't blame Mr. Dollar if he was afraid to stay to dinner with a woman like you around. You aren't afraid to stay, are you, Mr. Dollar? No, of course not, but I do have another engagement. Oh, well, any time you can come, you just let us know. Yes, thanks, I'll remember. Well, now, if you men will excuse me. <laughs> you will. And you open the windows in the back. Yes, Henry. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yes? When Madame de Salle arranges... That fraud... When Madame de Salle arranges for me to talk to Ruth, I'll let you know what she says. Good evening. Poor dear. She hasn't been the same since Ruth's body was found on the beach. Mr. Dixon, according to the medical examiner, Ruth's body was in the ocean for approximately six weeks. Mm, that's right. Do you remember if Ruth was going with anyone in particular just before the time she disappeared? The police asked me the same question. I couldn't answer it. You mean you don't remember? I mean that Ruth wasn't a girl to be tied down to one man and any more than she's content to live like she had to after my health failed. Did she date very often? Well, you know, she worked as a hostess at the yacht club. Yes, sir. She met a lot of rich young men there. And if you ask me, she dated too much. Of course, her mother took Ruth's side, said she had to if she was ever going to get herself a husband. But she went with no one in particular. No... She never settled down enough. Uh -huh. uh, what about her friends, Mr. Dixon? Was there someone she might have confided in? She didn't have any girlfriends. Like men a lot better. Uh -huh. But, um... Oh, there was somebody. Well, I expect you could say he was her friend. 
too old to have been a boyfriend. Besides, he doesn't have enough money. Who is he? His name's Sam Hood. He runs a small craft repair shop down by Viking Beach. Viking Beach is on the Atlantic side of Newport, approximately a mile from Land's End, where the Dixon girl's body had been washed ashore. Once there, I didn't have any trouble locating Sam Hood's repair shop. It was on the end of a large wharf. For a moment, I thought the wharf was deserted. Then I heard it. Below the wharf, sitting low on the water, was an old converted PT boat. And standing on deck, tinkering with the controls, was a heavy-set man wearing thick glasses and greasy dungarees. I was about to call him when he looked up. Afternoon. Hi. Can I help you? Yeah, I hope so. I'm looking for Sam Hood. He ain't here. Going on his vacation. Oh, fine. Can I do anything for you? I'm his brother, Leroy. Wow, yeah, Leroy, maybe you can. You want me to come up or you going to come down? I'll come down, but uh, how do I do it? Stairs over to your left there. Oh, sure. You're a stranger around here, ain't you? Yep, that's right. Well, I'm always glad to meet up with a stranger. This is such a little bitty place. Most everybody along the waterfront's heard everybody else's stories so many times till they're sick of it. What'd you say your name was? It's Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Well, welcome aboard the Connemore, Mr. Dollar. Connemore? That's an odd name for a boat. Sure is, ain't it? But I found it in a book. Sure fits her. And me, too. What's your line, Mr. Dollar? I'm an insurance investigator. Well, now, that must be mighty interesting work. Yeah, sometimes. Um, you chew tobacco? No, thanks. Oh. Well, I got a brand new plug of brown mule here. Ain't had it out of the wrapper. So if you want some... No, no thanks, Ryan. You sure missing something? Yeah. Oh, man, my teeth. Hey, you want to take a look around? Go ahead. Of course, the more ain't no fancy hey, yacht. Excuse me, uh, what did you say? I said the Conmore ain't no fancy yacht, but she's all mine and Sam's, and I'm proud of her. Oh. So where did you say your brother was, Leroy? Um, Sam? Oh, he's visiting our folks down in Augusta. I would have gone, too, but somebody had to stay in mind the store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know when he'll be back? Oh, um, not for sure. But anything Sam knows about, so do I. We got real runny mouths in our family. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Leroy, did you know a girl named Ruth Dixon? No one just to tip my hat to. But Sam did. Yes, sir. That gal and Sam, they used to sit up there on the wharf looking out toward Gooseberry Island. And they talk, talk, talk. You know what about? Nope. Get off that red and you whitewash butter cheater! <laughs> Leroy, you told me a moment ago Sam couldn't keep a secret. Well, he said she was full of dreams. Man, you asked me, she wasn't nothing but another two-timing. Uh, just like all of them. Oh, that's not a very good opinion of her, Leroy. I can't help it. Sam was crazy for her, but she didn't even lay on like she knew it. How did your brother take the news of her death? Oh, just awful. That when I left town? Yep. Does Sam own a thirty-eight revolver, Leroy? Oh, sure. Most everybody who has a boat owns something like that. But, hey, wait a minute. You getting ideas? No, just asking questions. No. Oh. Well, Sam couldn't have killed her. I know it. What makes you so sure? Well, because he's my brother. And how he was so broke up when he heard about Ruth. Why would you suppose anybody would want to put a bullet in a pretty gal like that? I don't know, Leroy. I don't know. I asked him a few more questions. Watched him chase the seagulls off the railing once more, then left. At 7.45, I was sitting in the Yacht Club bar waiting for Darla Mason. At 8.30, I was still waiting. And at 9.30, I gave up and went back to my hotel. I hadn't been in my room ten minutes before someone started pounding on the door. Dada! Dada, you in there? Yeah, yeah, who is it? Captain Willard, open up. Well, good evening, Captain. Uh, nothing good about it. Huh? Fine thing you pulled. You come over here to help, then you go gallivanting off where nobody can find you. I called your office as soon as I hit town. Because the people you're working for in Hartford told you to. 
Now, look, that insurance agent said you were skeptical about there being a connection between the Mason and the Dixon. I still am. You won't be when I tell you what happened earlier this evening. Okay, so what happened? Darla Mason was shot, and the bullet came from the same gun that killed Ruth Dixon. of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. It is a very well-known fact that symbols are important to men everywhere. Whether they be symbols of country, religion, or honor, they're a cherished part of the culture and tradition of all peoples. As in almost all countries of the world, the people of Spain are very religious. And in the Spanish town of Vendrell, the people were having difficulty with a symbol. A 300-pound angel sitting on top of a 150-foot church steeple. The angel had been there since 1784 and needed repairs to keep it from falling down on the heads of the parishioners. But 150 feet is a long way up. And 300 pounds are a lot of weight to bring down. Now, there was a great deal of head scratching over the problem until someone casually mentioned the problem to someone else who happened to be stationed at the United States Air Force Base in Zaragoza, Spain. It wasn't long before visions of a helicopter came to mind. Because Americans like to help other people everywhere, the Air Force Whirlybird lifted the angel from the church steeple, brought it down for repairs, and later returned it to its perch. So grateful were the people of Vendrell for this act of friendly cooperation that they held a mass celebration of American Day to show their appreciation. Television and newsreels carried the story of kindness. So did the newspapers and magazines throughout Spain. This gesture on the part of the United States Air Force created a new symbol, a symbol of friendship and understanding that became a symbol of freedom. The right of all men everywhere. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Dixon Murder Matter. <laughs> Expense account item six twenty cents for two cups of coffee at the Eat Right Cafe near my hotel, where Captain Lewis proceeded to give me the details surrounding the shooting of Dollar Mason. She had been on her way down to the Mason boathouse, where she'd planned to take the cruiser across the bay to the yacht club. As she neared the boathouse, someone had fired at her. And the bullets that wounded her came from the same gun that killed Ruth Dixon. So there was a connection between the Mason and Dixon girls. And if you want more proof, I have it. Like what? Well, they both spent a good deal of their time at the yacht club. Yeah, but for slightly different reasons. Ruth worked there before she was killed. But she must have known Darla Mason. No, no, that's no good, Captain. You go to the district attorney with that kind of evidence and he'll throw you out of his office. He'll want proof they knew each other and how well. Yeah, I suppose. What about Darla? When can we see her? When the doctors tell us we can. She still hasn't regained consciousness. Hey, Captain, do you know where the Masons have the work done on their cruising? Yeah, and that's another thing. That's Sam Hood's place. Have you questioned him? Never had a chance to. According to his brother, he's away on some sort of vacation down Georgia. Left the day the Dixon girl's body was identified. Are you sure he's still in Georgia? Well, I can ask the Augusta police to check up on him. If he is, have them tell him about Darla being shot up. And find out if he knew her. Okay. Well, you ready? Yeah. No one was seen prowling around the Mason place tonight, huh? Well, nobody else was down at the boathouse. Uh, thanks, Johnny. Sure, Captain. Then stop being so formal. My name's Pete. Okay, Pete. Well, I guess we've done all we can for a while. I'm not so sure. No, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm not sure about that either. But I have an idea. Or maybe I ought to call it a hunch. About what? Well, I... I'd like to sleep on it first, if it's all the same to you. Have I anything to say in the matter? No, nope. not a bit. It was late and I was tired, so I did the obvious thing and went to bed. Early the next morning, I called the hospital. Dalla Mason had regained consciousness and would recover. 
But she couldn't be questioned for another two or three days. So I finished dressing and went down for breakfast. I was crossing the lobby when someone called me. Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Mr. Dollar. Oh, Mrs. Dixon. I've been waiting to see you. Well, you should have called. I'd have come right down. Oh, no. I was afraid I'd wake you up, and I didn't want to do that. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you. Mr. Dollar, is there some place we can go and talk? Well, is my room. Oh, no. I mean, well, it wouldn't look right, you know. Oh, um, yeah, well, then, uh, how about over here? Looks like a nice, quiet corner. Uh, yes, this, this will do nicely. Mr. Dollar, remember I told you about Madame de Sal? Yes, I remember. Uh, would you like to sit down? Oh, no, I'm too excited to sit. Excited? About what? Well, I've been trying to tell you about Madame de Sal and what happened last night. What did happen? The conditions were right. I beg your pardon? The conditions. They were right. Remember, I told you, Madam was going to let me speak to Ruth when the conditions were right. Well, they were last night. Oh. Well, aren't you interested in what Ruth had to say? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, I am, Mrs. Dixon. She told me who killed her, Mr. Dollar. What? Yes, sir. Just as plain, I heard it from Ruth, and there's no doubt about it. It was her voice, all right. Uh, Mrs. Dixon, exactly what did Ruth say about the person who murdered her? Oh, Ruth described her to a T. Her? She said it was a woman. Young, dark hair, brown eyes, and a big red scar on the back of her left hand. I see. You seem disappointed, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> I, I guess I was doing a little wishful thinking, Mrs. Dixon. Well, wishful thinking or not, Ruth told me who it was that killed her. Oh, her name, too? Well, she didn't know her name. Oh. But that big red scar. Now, you find a woman who has a thing like that on the back of her left hand, and you have the guilty party. Yes, well, I'll look for someone like that today, Mrs. Dixon. Now, come on, I'll buy you some breakfast. <laughs> later, back in my room, I put in a call to Captain Lewis. Morning, Johnny. Morning, Pete. Anything new? Well, we heard from the Augusta police. Yeah? Sam Hood's in Augusta, all right. Been there for over a week. Uh-huh. Did they ask him if he knew the Mason girl? I said he did. Said the Masons used to let him and his brother service a cruiser. Uh-huh. Johnny, when are you going to stop playing games and tell me your idea? Uh, hunch, you mean, Pete. And I'll tell you just as soon as I get back from the library. The library? Oh, and while you're waiting, call back the Augusta police. Have them get hold of Sam Hood again. What for? Ask him who named his boat. What? Yeah, ask him if it was his idea to name it the Connemore or his brother's. Johnny, are you feeling all right? Never felt better, and I'll see you in about an hour. I found what I was looking for in the library, then went back to Captain Lewis's office and told him what I was now beginning to believe. While I was there, Sam Hood called from Augusta with the answer to the question the police had asked him. Then I went alone down to the wharf on Viking Beach. Roy Hood was sprawled lazily over the deck of the Connemore, trying to sleep and at the same time keep an eye on a fishing line he tossed over the side. I started down the steps toward the boat. Well, doggone. Hi there, Mr. Dollar. Ah, morning, Leroy. Man, I sure didn't think you'd be back down here so soon. You know, Sam ain't back yet. Yeah, I know. You having any luck? Hmm? No, no, no. Just making believe. For real fishing, you got to go out beyond Gooseberry Island. Oh, how about taking me someday? Why, sure. Man, you just say the word and we'll go right now. Well, no, no. I'm afraid I couldn't do that this morning, Leroy. Well, you just let me know any time. Yeah. How fast is this boat cruise? 25 knots. Now, ain't that something? Fastest boat between here and the Navy Station. How long would it take you to get over to the Mason home and back again? Why, well, wouldn't take no time at all. How come you asked that? Did you know Darla Mason was shot last night? Heard something about it, yeah. Do you know Darla Mason, Leroy? <clears throat> How could I know somebody like that? I don't know. But if you didn't know her, why did you try to kill her last night? You joking? No, not a bit. Oh, come on now, man. What do you mean I tried to kill her last night? Just what I said. That ain't funny. That ain't one bit funny. But it's the truth, isn't it? The truth? Now, who told you that? Dollar. What? What? She couldn't have. No, why not? Because the paper says she's still unconscious. Besides, she couldn't see nobody around that boathouse last night. It was too dark. Dark as it was the night she killed Ruth Dixon. You know, you're beginning to get me riled, Dollar. That's so. It sure is so. 
coming around here with all kinds of lies, saying I killed Ruth Dixon. I didn't say it. Your brother did. Sam? <laughs> oh, man, now you really lying. Sam's in Augusta. You ain't seen we him. We talked to him on the phone this morning. He told us about you and Ruth Dixon and the Mason girl and every other woman who comes around here. Well, just because I try to make a little time with him, that don't mean I killed nobody. Sam told us differently, Roy. He told us that you can't stand to have a woman laugh at you. Every time a girl has, you've tried your best to make her sorry for it. Sam, he really... You really did talk to Sam? What do you think? I, but why would he tell on me? Why? He never has before. He didn't want to, Leroy. That's why he left here when he did. He needed time to think. Decide what to do about his brother. About you. What you gonna do about it? What I have to do. Take you in. No. Nobody's taking me anywhere. I don't want to go. And anybody cries, they're gonna be sorry. Hey, Roy. Leroy, well, like, come out of there. I'm coming. You look out, dog. You look out, you don't pass stopping me. Leroy, well, like, come back. No! Johnny? You all right? Oh, yeah. I'm just fine. Come on up. All over. Yeah, Captain. I know. Tell me something. If I can. What put you on to him in the first place? Two things. You see, he liked the girls. Wanted to be a lady killer. But they'd only laugh at him. And he couldn't stand that. I see. But the big thing is, what he named this boat? Connemore. Well, I don't get it. Well, a man like Leroy, not much education. He'd have to have a real reason for wanting to name it that. But why? What's so special about that? You ever hear of Bluebeard? A lady killer? Sure, who hasn't? Well, Connemore was his real name. I saw Mrs. Dixon late that same afternoon. I'm afraid she was a bit disillusioned. Having been so sure that the person who had killed her daughter was a woman. But there was one funny thing. On the back of Leroy's left hand was a long red scar... Expense account total, including car rental, hotel bill, and transportation back to Hartford, $968.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case that couldn't be solved. Because there was no solution. And yet, well, join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Gene Tatum, Jeanette Nolan, Frank Nelson, Russell Thorson, Sam Edwards, and Austin Green. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking.